All right now, ladies and gentlemen, if you just keep together, thank you. Now, here, if you follow me, is the corner of Fleet Street and Bell Yard. And at this very corner, in a dirty little barber shop such as you or me would be ashamed to set foot in, it was so dirty, the notorious Sweeney Todd lived and breathed and had his being. What was Sweeney Todd famous for, Guy? He was notorious, lady. He was notorious for being a murderer. <gasps> a murderer? A notorious bloody murderer, he was. But this isn't a corner at all. I thought you said it was a corner of Fleet Street and Bell Yard. All done away with, sir. All done away with years back. But underneath these here stones, listen to the hollow sound of this memento of the 18th century, underneath these stones was the very vault where Sweeney Todd used to burn his victims and make them into veal pies. Oh. They need veal for that, guys. And that's what they had, sir. Human veal and human bow. Oh. Sweeney Todd used to murder his victims with a barber chair, he did. And at this very corner, in sight of St. Dunstan's Church, he had his notorious barber shop. Now, if we just gather in a bit more close, we'll penetrate into the very scene where Sweeney Todd raised his grisly hand in murder. <laughs> Stage 47. Item 16. Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. An early Victorian melodrama written in 1842 by George Dibden Pitt. Adapted for radio by Ronald Hambleton. Starring Maver Moore as Sweeney Todd. Produced and directed by Andrew Allen with an original musical score composed and conducted by Lucio Agostini. A melodrama of a London before the days of gaslight and handsome cab. Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Hear that? St. Dunstan's bell, just like it used to ring 200 years ago, ringing over these same streets and over streets that have gone long since. Streets covered with mud and filth. No street lamps in them days, mind you. Just a perfect breeding ground for thievery and murder. It was that very bell what brought Sweeney Todd down to his shop of a morning, watching his miserable little apprentice putting up the shutters, and then waiting in his shop like a spider lurking in his web. Boy. Yes, Mr. Todd? A little more activity won't hurt you, Tobias Rag. Come here. Yes, Mr. Todd? I would have you remember that you are my apprentice, Tobias, that you have of me board, lodging, and washing, except that you take your meals at home, that you don't sleep here, and that your mother gets up your linen. Now, are you not a fortunate, happy dog? Oh, yes, please, sir. How old are you, boy? Fifteen, please, Mr. Sartor. Old enough to have a memory, eh? I think so, sir. And remember this. I'll cut your throat from ear to ear if you repeat one word of what passes in this shop. Or dare to make any supposition or draw any conclusion from anything you may see or hear, or fancy you may see or hear. Do you understand me? Oh, I won't say anything, Mr. Todd. And for lesser misdemeanors, there's a place for you at Jonas Fogg's madhouse in Peckham. If I say anything, sir, may I be made into veal pies at Mrs. Lovett's in Bell Yard. How dare you mention veal pies in my presence? Do you suspect? Hmm, do you want to lose this nice job, boy? And on your first day? Oh, sir, I don't suspect. Indeed, I don't. I meant no harm. Very good. I'm satisfied. Quite satisfied. And mark me, the shop, and the shop only, is your place. Yes, sir. And if any customer gives you a penny, you can keep it. So that if you get enough of them, you will become a rich man. Only I'll take care of them, and when I think you require any, you can come to me. Understand? We need not. All right, boy. Into the back room with you. Well, good morning, Mr. Smith. How's the chair working, Mr. Todd? It seems to have picked up a bit of a rasp somewhere. Come over here and have a listen. Don't see why you should complain, Mr. Sweeney Todd, thing it's not yet paid for. What, would you have me pay for a chair that doesn't give satisfaction? Listen to it, Mr. Smith. A trifle squeaky, Mr. Smith. Perhaps something foreign has gotten into the works. Blood, perhaps, Mr. Todd. Ah. What the devil do you mean? After all, even the most careful barber's hand slips a little, Mr. Todd, through. It's a delicately balanced piece of mechanism. 
Barber chairs aren't made as a rule to tip down into the cellar, Sweeney Todd. Never mind what's the rule. Your job is to see it works properly. I have my customers to think about, Mr. Smith. Tip it again, Mr. Todd. <coughs> ah, here's rust in one or two spots. A little oil, I think. Then oil it, man, and get about your business. But, Mr. Todd. I've brought with me a little... You are surely not going to bring up again that little consideration owing to you in respect of this mechanical tire? Yes, Mr. Todd. I have with me an account for seven pounds, eighteen shillings, and ninepence halfpenny. And what may the ninepence halfpenny be for, Mr. Smith? A one pound of ten-inch nails, Mr. Todd. And has it occurred to you, Mr. Smith, that some parties might consider ninepence halfpenny a little excessive for a pound of ten-inch nails? It has occurred to me that I do not like your manner of haggling, Mr. Todd. Come a little nearer, Mr. Smith. What would you say to a guinea and a half? Certainly not. I want my... And perhaps a free shave, too? A really close shave afterward? I would say you are a rogue, Mr. Todd. I will make it 30 shillings. Let us say 30 shillings, Mr. Smith. Has it occurred to you that certain parties not very far up this street, certain legal parties, as you might phrase it, might gain a good deal of profit and instruction from a perusal of some of the items and specifications on this little account of mine? You mean about the chair, you dog? I mean the chair and I mean the old Bailey, too, Mr. Todd. I think the amount we mentioned was seven, eighteen, nine and a half, Mr. Todd. Hmm, I was speaking of a free shave, Mr. Smith. I discern a roughness about the region of your lower lip and a hairiness about your throat that makes my razor long to be at it. Pray come in and take a seat, Mr. Smith. I'll go now, you scoundrel, but I shall be back. Yes, yes, come back next week. I shall be back before next week, Mr. Todd. Considerably before next week. Ah, oh, he was wicked with Sweeney Todd. Glib as a sparrow and thieving as a jackdaw. Why'd as soon twist a young lad's arm as do an honest London tradesman out of his wages. But look, here's a first-rate sample of how Sweeney Todd used to do business. In fact, this is the little piece of work that finally brought him to the gathers. Too bad they didn't have electric chairs in them days. An electric barber chair would have been the thing for him. Now, young Tobias Rag was sweeping out the shop one evening. It was cold and drizzly, a regular sloppy day. And into the shop walks a chap what had sailor writ all over him. Is this barber shop open, my boy? Yes, indeed, sir. Come in. And tell your master I would use his services. Uh, but wait a minute. Do you live about here? I live over by St. Duncan's Church, sir. Do you know Miss Joanna Oakley? Oh, yes, indeed. She's a very kind-hearted lady. What you say is no surprise to me, though naturally I am delighted to hear it. Are you related to her, sir? She is my sweetheart. I've just come back from a voyage to India. I intend to marry her. Oh, that's what I should like to do. What, marry Miss Oakley? Oh, no. I mean, I should like to sail the ocean, too. The sea has its perils and its chances, my boy. I've been away for five years, not knowing when I would ever see my sweetheart again. But now I'm home again, bringing her a pearl necklace for a wedding gift. Ah, oh, Tobias, my dear boy. Oh. What a time you have been. What has detained you, my darling boy? Sir, Mr. Todd, I... Has Captain Pearson's peruke been sent home, my dear? I don't know, sir. I thought I gave you instructions never to speak to any person when other beside you, eh? You may have done, sir. Think of that! Oh! And remember for the future what it was for. Now go into the shop and attend to your business. The next time you disobey me, I'll cut your throat from ear to ear. Your pardon, sir. I am to blame. I asked him about a particular old friend. We got into conversation. Your apologies, I beg. Boys will be boys, and a little mild chastisement from time to time does them no harm. Perhaps you're right. But I must protest always against unnecessary severity towards young persons. But though you are hasty, you are no doubt possessed of a generous heart. And hang me if I don't patronize you this very moment. I'm going to meet my sweetheart presently, and I think a clean face will become so important an occasion. Happy to be of service to you, young gentleman. Is it a shave you need? What am I here for but to give you a shave? To give you a closer shave than you have ever had before? Thank you, Barbara. Take the father chair, please. It's the chair I keep for special customers. <laughs> and special occasions, eh? And special occasions. Head back when I tuck in the cloth, sir. I always like to leave the throat clear. That's better. You've been to sea, sir? I've only lately come up the river from an Indian voyage. Yeah. 
You uh, carry some treasure, I presume? Am I in the brush? Among others, this small casket. Uh, this here. Eh? Squidget workmanship. It is not the box, but its contents that must cause you wonder. For I must, in confidence mind, tell you it contains a string of veritable pearls of the value of 12,000 pounds. 12,000 pounds? <laughs> <laughs> what the devil noise was that? Only me. I laugh. Laugh? You call that a laugh? I suppose you caught it to somebody who died. That is your way of laughing. I beg you won't do it anymore. You will find me all attention to your orders, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ingestray. Mark Ingestray. Mr. Ingestray. It's well you came here. For though I say it, there isn't a barber in the city of London that thinks of polishing a customer off as I do. Fact, I assure you. <laughs> Shiver the lens. I, I tell you what it is, Master Barber. If you come that laugh again, I'll get up and go. Well, very good, sir. It won't occur again, if I may make so bold. Uh, who are you? Where did you come from? And where are you going? You seem fond of asking questions, my friend. Perhaps before I answer them, you'll reply to me. Do you know Mr. Oakley, who lives somewhere hereabouts? He's a spectacle maker. Oh, yes. Yes, to be sure I do. Jasper Oakley in 4th Street. He has a daughter called Joanna that the young bloods call... Head back a little farther, sir. The flower of 4th Street. She is respected, I hope. Oh, of course, of course. Now, bless me, where can I have laid Miss Drop? I had it this minute. Ah, I recollect. I took it into the parlor. Sit still, sir. I shan't be a minute. You can amuse yourself with the newspaper. The chair moved before I could touch the lever. What's happened is it's a trick. The chair must have life of its own. No, no. Courage, Sweeney. It must have slipped. Smith must have put too much oil on it. And remember the pearls. The pearls. <sighs> when I was a boy, the first for avarice was first awakened by the fair gift of a farthing. And that farthing soon became a pound, a pound a hundred, and so to a thousand, till I said to myself, I will possess an hundred thousand. This string of pearls will complete the sum. Who's there? Quick, speak up. Hmm? Tobias, you dog! How long have you been peeping in the door? Peeping, sir? Yes, peeping, don't repeat me words. See, sir, I wasn't peeping at all. You didn't see the chair tilt back? I didn't know it could tilt back, sir. It doesn't. Did I say it did? No, sir, but I thought... Never mind what you thought. <laughs> Who's there? Somebody else skulking about? I'll soon fetch him out. Well, what do you want? It's only the black servant of the gentleman who came here to be saved, sir. Only the black servant of the gentleman who came here to be shaved, eh? You know quite a bit, Tobias. No, sir. Tell this black servant that his master is not here. Tell him to seek elsewhere. I will, sir. Gosh, I should have remembered about industry servant. But no matter. The pearls have come to me. And Mark Ingestray has gone to Mrs. Lovett, the pie maker. <laughs> Sweeney Todd was sitting on top of the world. Twelve thousand pounds worth of pearls at one sitting, as you might say. But not an easy thing to turn into cold cash. That's not something he could do by killing, though he would have if he could have. But he bided his time until the right man came along. Good evening, neighbor. I would have you shave me. Your servant, Mr. Parmine. I think you'll find this chair comfortable. Well, thank you. You uh, deal in precious stones? I do, neighbor. To be sure. Everyone knows John Parmine, the lapidary and the jeweler. It's rather late for a bargain. Do you want to buy or sell? Head forward while I pin the cloth, sir. To sell. The only orders I get are for pearls, and they're not in the market nowadays. I have nothing but pearls to sell. I mean to keep all my diamonds, garnets, and rubies. The deuce you do. Will you look at the pearls I have? Where are they? Here. Hmm. Real, by heaven. All real. I know they are real. Will you deal with me or not? I'm not sure they are real, you know. Let me look at them again. Hmm. I thought so. Counterfeit. But so well done that just for the curiosity of the thing, I will give you uh, fifty pounds. Fifty pounds? Is this a joke? 
I will give you a hundred. Hark ye, friend Parmine. It neither suits me inclination nor me time to stand haggling with you. I know the value of pearls, and as a matter of ordinary business, I will sell them to you so you may get a handsome profit. Well, since you know more than I gave you credit for, and this is to be a downright uh, business transaction, I think I can find a customer who will uh, pay 11,000 pounds for them. Ah, that's better. Let me have the money tomorrow. Uh, Stop a bit. You must know that a string of pearls is not to be bought and sold like a few ounces of old silver. And you must give me satisfaction as to how you came by them. Sure, man, who will question you? You're in the trade. That's all very fine, but I don't see why I should give you the full value of an article without evidence to prove your title to it. In other words, you don't care how I came by the property involved so long as I sell it to you at a thief's price. Mr. Todd, I am a respectable trader. And on the other hand, if I want the real value, you mean to be particular. I suspect you have no right to sell the pearls. And to satisfy myself, I shall insist on your coming with me to a magistrate. Respectable tradesman, you'll go all right, but by the road I choose, this chair will carry you, Mr. Parmine. Ah! Off you go, Mr. Parmine. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> Sweeney Tom. He? Is it you, Smith? You! Not goodbye, surely, Mr. Todd, but how do you do? Dear Mr. Todd. So, you know the secret of the pearls now. It is enough. Your bill is paid. But it has to be receipted yet, Mr. Todd. Where is Mark Ingestry? It was you who sent him down to the vault, wasn't it? But I didn't cut his throat, Mr. Todd. You are a little too clever, Mr. Smith. I do not like to have such a clever mechanic in my confidence. It doesn't altogether suit. How do you like this? A little tire? <gasps> a pistol? Mr. Todd, it's not loaded. Not as big as a chair, Mr. Smith, but it works better. <laughs> ah. Mr. Clever Smith, you won't do much thinking now with that bleeding head. You can take all your cleverness down below now. You can have a ride in this particular chair of yours. It ought to work well now its master is riding in it. <laughs> ah, the secret is mine again. That's how Sweeney Todd went about his notorious bloody business. Lured him into his devilish barber chair, touched a lever, and down they went into the grisly vaults below Fleet Street. All he wanted was the smell of a bit of money, and he was after it like a ferret. Just one close shave, and he was cock of the walk, he thought. And all he had to worry about was doing poor old Mrs. Lovett out of her share of the swag. She was the lady that kept the pie shop next door. She was a fat, comfortable old girl, buried five husbands, and looked forward to five more. Why, here is Mr. Lupin, to be sure. Just fancy coming to see little me in all this rhyme. Do give me your umbrella this minute, Mr. Lupin, and sit down and talk something warm or you'll die of cold. Aye, dear sister, I bear this misfortune like all of us with fortitude, believing that our sufferings here will in a future world be changed to peace and happiness. Certainly, to be sure. Therefore, I beg you to take a little drop of tea. Dear sister, you are indeed an angel. Oh, Mr. Lupin, won't you draw your chair a little closer? Verily, I will. And is it true, dear sister, that thou hast gathered unto thyself much of the mammon of unrighteousness by the sale of those same pieces of manner, which the ungodly called, though, wrapped around the flesh of the petty calf? What a lovely way of saying, dear says. There is much of the mammon of unrighteousness in what thou callest by. Thou hast what the wicked call a stocking. Oh, brother, let us not talk of pears. Remember that all day and all night I think of nothing but pears. And sometimes pies aren't in dreams. Remember that all day I smell pies. And I might go for pies. And I thought tuppence for pies. Verily, sister, it is a delicious taste. Lo, the smell of gravy haunteth me nostrils and me soul quivers with delight. Then would you like a pie, brother? Me soul fighteth, me soul crieth out, oh, me sister, oh, me beloved. 
，人在船绕啊。嗯，因此他那只很累，哎呀。Why, sister, I'm sure it isn't. This is not a double bag. No, Mr. Newfin, this is a very special bag, such as I keep for callers and friends. And tell me, sister. There is great profit in the top of the pie. Must they put in a penny worth of the set of the car? No, Mr. Newton, how do you imagine I live? I'll put in a farthing's worth. No more. Verily a magnificent pie. Of a truth, thou art a woman in a thousand. And how much flour put is thou in a top of the pie? A heap of Newton. And whence cometh thy flour, my beloved? A bird from Miller Brown. And Miller Brown hath nearby his mill certain cavities in the earth containing chalk at the north. Chalk? Miller Brown is a respectable merchant, Mr. Lupin. I say, I say, did I say all tales? Ah, sister, what a pie, what a pie was that. <laughs> Behold, my heart yearneth after thy beauty. Behold, a great love welleth up in my soul. Who is to take me end? And as the stocking thou sayest, Hark, I will whisper, is it near thy bed? Oh, brother, brother, thou, you mustn't. Mr. you are a naughty man. Yes, the beloved, which call me Loopy now. Oh, not now. Not yet. <laughs> True, there are yet certain ministrations of the spirit I must attend to ere time for pleasure coming. You are such a godly man, brother. Yea, even today I was able to save a wandering soul from sorrow, even an unfortunate black whose master had left him alone in this teeming city. Uh, black, a gentleman's black servant. Verily. Even the heathen, dear sister, is... What did he say about his master, I mean? Verily, I am gratified, highly gratified to find studies of mercy in thee, sister. Wilt come with me to Joanna Oakley, who is suffering from a great depression of the soul, too. Joanna Oakley, a gentleman's back servant. We are undone. Undone, my beloved. Oh, Mr. Lupin, leave me at once. But, my beloved, this excessive pity for the unfortunate one seems to be a trifle, shall I say, excessive? What did you do with this back servant? I kindly took charge of a certain sum of money for him, lest he lose it, sister. What is he now? Swallowed up indeed. It do this team in city. Ah. The work of the Lord calleth his servant, and I must be gone. I will bear to Joanna out the expressions of your solicitude. Yes. Tell her, tell her that I weep for her sorrow. Verily a gracious sentiment. And I shall add, my dear sister, that in your eyes every tear is a pearl. Ah, Mrs. Lovett, rather late for a call, my dear. Can I do anything for you? My mind is disturbed, Pud. The wicked manner of our lives darkens every hour and colors all my dreams with blood. Can we not reform our ways and live good, righteous lives? What drivel is this woman? You sound like that ranting parson Lupin. Lupin, I know. Lupin, oh, yes. Don't uh, twist me arm like that. You hurt me. I'll do more than that. Now tell me exactly what are you talking about? William Grant died last night. And who may William Grant be? He was my baker, Mr. T. But, my dear Mrs. L., your baker's name was Jones. But he got discontented, Mr. Todd, surely he remember. So many of them, one gets confused. But never mind. Dry those tears, <laughs> little crybaby. Mr. T., the pie shop in Bell Yard must be closed. Closed, Mrs. Lovett. The conscience is aroused. I dreamt last night that I was being hanged with a rope of pearls. My heart goes out in sympathy to you, Mrs. Lovett. You must be tired of standing. Let me implore you to take a seat. Take this chair, Mrs. Lovett. In that chair? Do you think I'm such a fool, Mr. T? Well, why not? It's a perfectly good chair. You and I have profited well enough by it in the past. It's a wicked chair, Todd. <laughs> it works very well. A trifle squeaky. But then all old friends squeak a little bit, Mrs. Lovett. Eh, hey, Mrs. Lovett? Let me go, Todd. Please, please, Todd, my dear. The management of women is much like the management of horses. Horse judiciously applied. What are we going to do, Todd? People are beginning to suspect. Oh, do you know of anyone, Mrs. Lovett? What about that gentleman with the pearls? He'll never suspect, not anymore. But what about his servant? People will speak to him. He might go to the magistrate. Now, that, Mrs. Lovett, sounds very like an idea of your own. We're in it together, remember that? Uh, remember? Come, my dear. 
Let us sit down and talk like old friends. You know, you don't mean to do anything, do you? Pray forgive me, Anne. It's crushing it. I have always been noted for Miss Trink. I want to go out. I must breathe the clean air. Let me go. Let Why me go. Why this, Harry, to be out at this time of day, Mrs. Lovett? No, no. We shall sit here quietly and talk of your troubles. <laughs> you were speaking of the unexpected demise of this, let me see, what was his name? Not Jones. What was it? I've forgotten, Todd. You are not thinking of going, Mrs. Lovett? No. Too late now. Why, then, let me hold your hand. And we will sit here, holding hands like... like lovers. Now, while Sweeney Todd and his female accomplice were sitting in his barber shop, warm in their hands, so to speak, as there was only one candle in the old room in place, Dr. Aminadab Lupin was on his errand of mercy to see Joanna Oakley. She'd pretty near cried her eyes out for Mark Ingestry by this time, and her ma and pa just didn't know what to do with her. How is this, child, that you look so pale? I must speak positively about you to Mr. Lupin. Lupin may be all very well in his way as a parson, but I really don't know what he can have to do with Joanna looking pale. Hush, Mr. Oakley. I'm all right, Mama. Really, I am. Lupin has been kicked out of more people's houses than anybody else from here to Aldgate. If the sainted man has been kicked, Mr. Oakley, he glories in it. Mr. Lupin likes to suffer for the faith. And if he were made a martyr, it would give him much pleasure. Not half the pleasure it would give me, Mrs. Oakley. Joanna, I, I think I feel my old complaint coming on again. Your, your father's brutality always produces it. I, I must compose my nerves with the little cherry brandy. Let me help you, Mama. No, no. I, I will suffer alone, Joanna. Well... I suppose I must offer her crumbs of comfort, as Lupin would say. Damn, Mr. Aminadab, Lupin! Ah, oh, Miss Oakley, did I hear your parents retire? Yes, Mr. Lupin, I shall call them back. Oh, dear is Joanna, I come here at the bidding of my conscience to consort with you in your dire need. You will allow me free passage from the room, Mr. Lupin. Thou art disrespectful, but I will not snub thee, virgin. Thou knowest not me, mission here. I don't want your comfort, sir. What if I were to pour into your ears the knowledge that I have? If I whisper pearls in a black servant? <gasps> oh, servant, not Mr. Ingestry. Ah, I have touched a chord in thy bosom. Thou hast heeded the tongues of rumour that have been awagging. I do not listen to rumour, sir. Only by rumour do we learn of iniquity, virgin. It hath made a man of me and my carcass, which was as lank as an erring once, is now round and comely to look at. Oh, where is Mr. Ingestry? Have you heard from him? Oh, how long have I waited for news? I made in them news incarnate. Though I speak with the mouths of babes and saplings, I shall offer me news. If you know anything, speak, I pray you. For a consideration. Oh, anything, anything, Mr. Lupin. Then, maiden, listen. I have held converse with a certain black, for whom I was able to perform a small service. He had lost his master. He was as a ship without a rudder, as a principality without a prince. He told me of hours of waiting outside a certain shop on Fleet Street. A shop, mark you, from which his master never emerged. Where was it? I must go to him. Precipitation, virgin, is unwise. For next to this certain shop lives a lady for whom I hold a certain regard, and with whom, in fact, I have supped and drank. When I spoke certain words to her, she blushed, and they looked pale. All I wonder is this, did she blush from a lovely excitement of the pulse at the sight of me, or did she thus reveal a guilty secret? Then how will we know? What will we do? I know an unmannerly youth who might, for a consideration, ingratiate himself within this certain lady's shop. Stop riddling, Mr. Lupin. Whose shop? Who is the lady? The shop virgin is Sweeney Todd's, and the lady is Mrs. Lovett. The pie maker. Do you think them guilty? Verily, I believe this man Sweeney to be a man of sin. I myself have a mind to test his wickedness and to introduce this youth within Mrs. Lovett's shop. Then do so, Mr. Lupin, and let me find ways to thank you. Why, you can thank me with the aforementioned consideration. What is it, then? Briefly, let me take thee unto my bosom even as a wedded wife. Absurd! 
Have you been drinking? The fire of love rages. It consumes me very vitally. Oh, come no dearer, sir. And eventually I may extinguish the flame of my passion by the moisture of those ruby lips. Sir, are you insane? Maiden, I am resolved. Oh, one hand me, Ruffin. Oh, repent. Moderation, maiden, one last you later. Why, it's the hypocrite parson. Oh. There's a better correction for you, Lupin. Help! I am a steel robber. Fire! Help! was all that a confabulation with Lupin, Johanna? Oh, Papa, I'm afraid for Mr. Ingersoll. Ingersoll? Is he back again? That is why I kept it my secret, Papa. I thought you might still refuse your consent. It was because of you that he went to sea. And well, he might, the wastrel. But now he has returned. Rich from India, Papa. Rich? From India? Then why doesn't he show himself like a man? He, he has met with some misfortune here in London. Mr. Lupin believes him dead, I think. Where was this? He was last seen at Sweeney Todd Shop in Fleet Street. And his, his black servant... Oh, <laughs> buck up, Black. Dry your eyes. If Mark Ingestry is alive, we'll find him. And if Sweeney Todd is responsible for those tears of yours, he'll pay for it. And that's how the you and cry started against Sweeney Todd, the notorious bloody murderer. Of course, it wasn't the you and cry at first, because he was a slippery devil, but matters were coming to an end. Jasper Oakley was plotting to comfort his daughter, and as to Mr. Lupin, why he thought he might lie in his pocket. It is well that the children of the Lord should partake of the ill-gotten gains of the wicked and slip the villain of his so while he figured out a way to blackmail Sweeney Todd, he sent his unmannerly youth, Jarvis Williams, to worm his way into Mrs. Lovett's confidence. Go away, my good fellow. We never give anything to beggars. I ain't no beggar, Mum. But a young chap was trying to look out for a situation. Jarvis Williams is the name. I've seen better days, Mum. I kept of the Italy. Of the Italy? Yes. You never seen such a barrel of greens and taters as I used to turn out. But Monopoly made me a bankrupt. The big shops ruins the little shops and stars out the cost of mongers. Blow time, ain't it? I dare say when you get into better days, you'll have quite sufficient influence to make you intolerable. Are you, uh, from this bar? No, Mum. Nitrous. Better picking. You are unknown about here? Even old Bailey hasn't heard of me, Mum. Very well. You ask me for employment, and I will give it to you. Follow me. Where to? To the bike house, where I will show you what you have to do. You must promise never to leave it on any pretense. Never to leave it? Never, unless you leave it for good and all. As Shakespeare says, my poverty and not my will consent. Help me with his best daughter. Will will be working in the bowels of the earth? Shut <coughs> boy, it's only our vault. Coo, it's a dismal old. By this petty young Jarvis, we must descend to the furnace in oven. Well, I will show you how to manufacture the pot. Leave the files and make yourself generally useful. And that's it, I hope. I suppose I'm to have someone to assist me in this situation. One pair of hands would never do the work in such a place. Are you not content? Yes. Only you spoke of having a man. I had a man, Jarvis. He's born to his friend. He's gone to some of his old friends who will be glad to see him. Yeah, I don't like the sound of that. Have you any scruples? No scruples, Mum, but one objection. And that is? I should like to leave when I please. <laughs> yeah, my mind come I'm easy on that score. I never keep anyone many hours after they begin to feel dissatisfied. But now I must leave you for a time. What, down here? Yes, Jarvis. As long as you're industrious, you will get on very well. As soon as you begin to get idle and neglect the orders, you will receive a piece of information. What is it, Mum? I'm an inquiring young fella. You may as well give it me now. Now, I seldom find any occasion for that at first. But I'll keep time when you get well fed. If it is sure to want it, everyone who relinquishes the situation goes to his old friend. 
Friends, he's not seen you for many years. I shall return anon. manner of talking that respectable female is. There seems to be something singular in everything she says. And what a singular looking place too. Nothing visible but darkness. It would be quite unbearable but for the delicious smell of pie. Phew, what's that? A rattlesnake? It rattles anyway. You look at the field. Bones. Skull. Ribs. I must have stumbled into a surgery, because these are human bones. Wish I could find a funny bone, I feel a bit poorly. She was a nice looking old ma too. Strikes me that Lupin and her would make a nice pair. Why have this bag of bones is a fellow who's gone to his oldest friend. Might be it's more industry, the sailor. Now he's dead. Oh, what's that? Oh, ma. It's one of the murdered girls come to ask for his body. Maybe it's been made into veal pie. Please, it wasn't me, Sir Ghost. I was only I ten minutes ago. Silence, my friend. Are you in league with these fiends? I hope, Mr. Ghost, they aren't going to murder me as they did you before me. Whose ghost are you? My name is Mark Ingestry. <gasps> Merciful heavens, it's the sailor. Him that was murdered for his pearl. You know about that. You must be in league with the villain. Indeed, I am not. His wages is too high for an honest man. As Shakespeare says, mine only vice is honesty. Will you help me to bring Sweeney Todd to the hands of justice? Right you are, sir. But what are you stopping down here for? I don't know how it happened, but I suddenly fell into space. It was while I was being shaved. And I was knocked senseless on this stone floor. And when you come to? I suspected treachery. Since then, I've explored these vaults from end to end, seeking proof of the villain's guilt. How do we get out of here? Have you a stout heart? Me heart's stout enough, but my blood's running a trifle thin. What's your name? Jarvis Williams, sir. Do you know Joanna Oakley? Only by year, sir. You know where she lives? In Four Street, I think. Then go to her. No, no, that won't do. Go to her father, tell him I'm alive, and request him to communicate that intelligence to Miss Oakley. Let her know that there is yet hope. Are you going on living here? Yes, for the present. I must gather evidence and proof that Sweeney Todd is the malefactor I believe him to be. Can you keep a secret, Jarvis? Well enough, I suppose. And come with me through this passage. What more gory owes? Follow me. Up these stairs is a door that connects these vaults with Sweeney Todd's shop. This way. Right into the lion's mouth. There I will station myself, and there you will bring Mr. Oakley so that we may apprehend the villain. Quietly now. This must be Sweeney George's back room, sir. It is. And what of these walls not seen, Jarvis? Look through the door. It's Lupin. He's getting himself shy. Quiet, we may gather some clue. Listen to what they say. Ray, Mr. Todd, not so hard. Not so hard. What do you say? You lather me too hard. It's such a while since I had the pleasure of shaving you, Mr. Lupin. I wanted to make a good job of it. Mr. Todd, remember what a bountiful collection we had at church meeting yesterday evening. What of it? So the man of God can well afford that gracious offering known to the unrighteous as a tip. A tip, eh? Dear me, perhaps you are worth polishing off. What did you say, Mr. Todd? Uh, nothing, Parson. Pray shave me carefully, Mr. Todd, for I am to wear a wealthy heiress. I would fain make the wife of me booze. A wealthy heiress? And what's her name, may I ask? Mrs. Lovett, I'll wipe you. Silence. Would you ruin everything? Of a surety, she is not unknown to you. This Mrs. Lovett who owns the pie shop in Bell Yard, oh, that the Lord hath blessed with a trade both bountiful and ever flowing. What do you say, Mrs. Lovett? Then you are going to be polished off. Remain seated, sir. Lupin, sit down! <laughs> oh, uh, no, you don't pitch me so easily, Mr. Todd. I have always been suspicious of your doings, and I prefer to stand. I should have suspected the chair. Come here, Mr. Lupin. Mm. Uh, indeed. And now that I know how you manage it, and a sinful cunning trick it is, you'll pay blood money for it, Mr. Todd. Come back, Lupin. As you see, Mr. Todd, I am not ripe for killing yet. Oh! 
Yes, you are, Mr. Lupin. Very ripe. Very ripe indeed. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young and old ones come and die. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young and old ones come and die. When they sit in Sweeney's chair, off they go to heaven knows where. Me says love, it surely knows where they go to all the hemorrhoid goes. Where they go to all the hemorrhoid goes. Very ripe, very ripe, ripe, I cry. Young or old ones, come and die. Pull him off, Mr. Todd, we'll talk like you. I'll cut your throat from ear to ear when I catch you. Coast clear, Mr. Ingester. What unparalleled horrors. I can't say I'm sorry to see old Lupin doing a bit of honest running for a change. See, Jarvis, this is the very chair in which I sat. And... Here's the chain the assassin pulls to tilt the chair and drop the victim into the depths below. And then into the furnaces where the bodies are incinerated. Fetch Mr. Oakley and the police officers. I will return to the vaults, for Sweeney Todd thinks me dead. And as long as he thinks so, he has an adversary he does not suspect. That ranting parson has escaped me, but I fear no man of his kidney... A little money, an offering, he would call it. Blackmail, I should say. Merely a temporary disbursement to be returned along with all the other effects of the leg at all. <laughs> a pretty jest, the leg at all. And when he's been polished off, I'll deal with the rest of them. I have too many enemies to be really safe. My first step must be to get rid of Tobias Rag. I think he thinks. I need not take his life. But a close confinement of the boy in the lunatic asylum of Jonas Fogg will effectually silence him. <laughs> Mrs. Lovett too grows dissatisfied and scrupulous. I've had my eye on her for some time, and I fear she intends mischief. A little poison skillfully administered may remove any unpleasantness in that quarter. <laughs> So we need Todd. Spying, Mrs. Lovett. You may call it so, and since I discover that you intend treachery, I shall on the instant demand my share of the booty. Aye, an equal share of the fruits of our mutual bloodshed. Well, so you shall. I will balance accounts with you. What is the reckoning? I find it to be 12,000 pounds to a fraction. That is just... Six thousand pounds each, there be in two of it. But, Mistress Lovett, you will have to pay me for your support, lodging, and clothes. Clothes, Mr. Todd? I repeat the word, clothes. Why, I haven't had a new dress for these six months. Besides, am I to have nothing for your education? In killing, I mean, Mrs. Lovett. Oh, I have profited by that. To a degree, Mrs. Lovett, yes. For some years past, you have been totally provided for by me. And after deducting that and the expenses of erecting furnaces, purchasing flour for your delicious veal pies, we got the flour cheap because of the truck in it, and sundry other outlays, I find it leaves a balance of 16 shillings, fourpence, three farthings in my favor. In your favor? And I don't intend you to budge an inch until it is paid. You want to rob me, but you shall find to your sorrow I will have my due. You have instructed me in killing your side. Very well, Sweeney Todd. Tis you who purchased this knife. Don't be a fool, woman. Put your name to a deed consigning the owl of the wealth blood that's purchased all you perish. Idiot. You should have known Sweeney Todd better than that. I calculate my chances. I have also purchased this pistol. Todd. Throw down the knife. Todd, what are you going to do? Throw down the knife, woman. There it is, Todd. No, say your prayers. Your last hour has come. Well, my life, for the love of heaven, is I spared yours. Well, that's good, as you spared mine. <laughs> well, look, it's kind of the art to kill me. I'll stop before you spill my blood. I've been true to you upon my guilty soul. Take your hands off me, woman. What about Lupin? It was in our interest. 
Stop the lady man. Sir, take your hands from about my neck. I don't like things crawling over me. Oh, Todd, a good lady told me of all Morocco then my days in solitude and peace. Let me go to it again and beg it on my knees to show you the same mercy and compassion. Let us never see each other anymore. Let us lead better lives and forget we ever lived except in prayer. Will you loose your hold? It is never too late to repent, Todd, never. It is too late. Are you? But uh, Mrs. Lovett is dead, and there is blood upon me. Now Sweeney is alone. Now let the chair work, and let the furnaces consume the body, and destroy all evidence of my guilt in this, as it has in my manifold deeds of blood. <laughs> With Mrs. Lovett dead, Sweeney Todd had to do all his dirty work by himself. He lays her in the chair, tips it down into the vault, then hurries down the back stairs and through the dark passage to finish the job off. Ah, there you are, Mrs. Lovett. Somebody shot you. Tell me who did it. Tell Sweeney, and he'll cut their throats from ear to ear. Little crybaby, it's too bad you missed getting your share, isn't it? But don't worry, I'll revenge you. Hm, all right. Footsteps on the stair. No, in the passage. In the passage? Oh, but only Mrs. Lovett and that Ezekiel Smith knows about that passage. And they are dead. Go away! Your trade was a paying one, Mr. Todd. I am back, Mr. Todd. Go away, Mr. Taylor. You are dead. I denounce you, thief and murderer. I have caught you in the act of disposing of one of your unhappy victims. Wait a minute, Mr. Taylor. Would you like to go the way she went? I have lots of bullets left in this pistol, and Sweeney Todd has never been known to me. I do not fear you face to face, murderer. Come not a step closer. Then shoot! <laughs> Sweeney Todd. Curse you! Where? This pistol is too dangerous for you to handle. Now, Mr. Todd, with my own hands I shall break you to the gallows and the end you so richly deserve. Oh, Mr. Taylor, the fortunes of war, eh? One false move and I'll shoot you as I would a mad dog. That's a bargain indeed. But, Taylor, what? Behind you! What? Ah! How's that for a bargain, eh? <laughs> What a weakling. So, Mr. Sailor, you see, I am still master about here. Now, up those stairs, through the trap door into Mrs. Lovett's eye shop, and one lever locks all the door. <laughs> <laughs> You're lost now, Mr. Sailor. You'll never get out of this alive, and pretty soon you have company. <laughs> <laughs> Verily, I have no wish to be included in this pursuit, Mr. Oakley. Lo, the roaring lion is abroad, and no folk shall remain of a piece. But, uh, Mr. Lupin, our plan includes you, eh, Jarvis? We've got a place for Mr. Lupin, all right. My proper place is on guard, exhorting, keeping watch and ward. Let me be the encourager, Mr. Oakley. Uh, no, Mr. Lupin, you are to be the bait. <laughs> the bait? You are to go to Sweeney Todd's shop. Now, listen carefully. Engage him in conversation. You can do that well enough. Provoke him to some damaging admission. Yes, yes. Then, when he is about to plunge his razor into your throat to silence you forever... <gasps> as late as that! It would not trick him otherwise. Then we will burst in, overpower him, and win the day! Hurrah! St. George for England! Verily, it does not appear to be so much like an holiday. It will make a man of you, Lupin. However weary he is, I everybody. I never did see such a man for distraction of the mind. It's the sailor! <laughs> Mark Ingastry, my dear boy. Have you caught the murderer? At last I have the proof of his guilt. I've seen the murderer at work. What poor soul was it this time? He has done away with his accomplice, Mrs. Lovett. <gasps> what 
Sempronia gone. Woe to England and woe to Lupin. She was a nice old ma, too. She was round as the full moon and as fleshy as the goats that wanted on the delectable mountains. And thou perishes. Gone like the flower of the field. He thinks me locked in his vaults, but I escaped by a secret tunnel. He made a great mistake in not killing you, Mr. Ingestray. Uh, for his own good, I mean. It is an error he will bitterly repent. Uh, Mark. Uh, I may call my future son-in-law Mark, I believe. Fully for you, Mr. Oakley. I uh, may have dealt a pretty thoroughly toward you in the past, but uh, all that's forgot, eh? Of course, sir. Then let us call Johanna that you may greet your sweetheart before we take this murderer. Bully for you, Mr. Oakley. This young man is like the blackbird. He has but one song. I'll call her. Uh, Mrs. Oakley, bring Johanna at once. There is a good old friend of hers here. Now just watch her face when she sees you, Mark. What is this, Mr. Oakley? Why do you thus disturb my after-dinner rest? Calling for Johanna with a voice like the bull of Bashan. A pious phrase, good Mrs. Oakley. Uh, what's this, Mrs. O? Is Johanna not here? Well, how can she be here when she's with this gentleman? With me, madam? With you, indeed, Mark Industry. And I must say, too, that it is not the proper thing to do either. Sending a young woman notes like she was a trollop instead of an honest girl tenderly nurtured. I sent Joanna no letter, Mrs. Oakley. You have no call to lie about it, Mr. Ingestry. Where is this letter? Here. Naturally, I took it from her, but she would go. What devil's work is this? This is not my hand. Not your... <gasps> then she has been abducted. I got it. Yes. Only one man could be responsible for this subterfuge. And that man is... Sweetheart! <laughs> Thank you, the mind has given way. Leave her where she lies. There's man's work to be done to the rescue. Once more onto the breach, as Shakespeare says. Sweeney Todd is doomed. But is there time to save Joanna Oakley? He is like a lion at bay now, enraged and unscrupulous. <laughs> <laughs> this enticed maiden shall be my surety of escape. What do you think, Miss Oakley? Do your worst, you ruffian. Though my dear parents and Mr. Ingestry hold me dear, they will never let the reflection sway them in the performance of their duty. Have I not a singular grace in writing love letters? Oh, you do ill to taunt someone who is in your power, Mr. Todd. You would not dare do it if Mr. Ingestry were here. But he is here, my dear. And you shall see him in a little while. You shall join your lover in the vaults below. But first... <laughs> don't be frightened. I'm not going to harm you yet. <laughs> I just want you to be a witness. I'll be no witness to your doings, Sweeney Todd. I have a young apprentice who has shown distressing signs of madness lately. Fancy, I caught him yesterday stealing away to denounce me to the magistrate. Is that not an undoubted form of madness? I think he did well. Look, we'll have him in. It's near time for the keepers to arrive anyway, and you can judge his madness for yourself. I keep him in this room. Hello, Tobias Bragg. I won't enjoy it. I won't be knocked about in this way. You won't, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you are a designing, cruel, and cold-blooded murderer. There, you see, Miss Oakley, these are genuine ravings. Miss Oakley, have you lured her into your den, too? Now, don't you wish you'd been loyal to me, you dog, when we do such a brisk business? Have no fear, Tobias. Help will come. <laughs> <laughs> Tobias will be far from help, and very soon. We are safe! <laughs> Come in, Jonas Fogg. Now, Tobias, my boy, do you consider yourself saved? In it all, does my memory don't deceive me. You are right. I'm not easily forgotten, I believe. You have brought the water. They are outside in the carriage. Good. Now, Jonas Fogg, I have another apprentice here who has shown such symptoms of insanity that it becomes adequate to say necessary to place him under your care. Indeed, does he rave? He says I am a murderer. A murderer? <laughs> yes, isn't it? Could anything be more absurd? I that have the milk of human kindness flowing in me every vein. For how long, Mr. 
Carl, do you think this malady will continue? I will pay for twelve months, but I do not think between you and I that the case will last anything like so long. I think he will die like young Simpkins suddenly. I shouldn't wonder if he did. It is decidedly the best way. It prevents expense. We make no remarks and we ask no questions. Those are the principles on which we have conducted our establishment for so long. Those are the principles upon which we shall continue to conduct it and to merit, we hope, the patronage of the public. None questionably. Uh, but which is the patient, I perceive you have two of them. Pay no attention to the girl. This boy is the one. Quite young. Pity, isn't it? And, of course, we deeply lament his condition. Of course. But see, he raises his eyes. He will speak directly. Rave, I should say. Sweeney Todd is a murderer, and I denounce him. There, you see him? Mad, indeed. Save me from him. It is my life he seeks because I know he is a murderer. Miss Oakley, add your voice to mine. Mr. Fogg, if you have any sympathy or justice in you, you will help us. This seems to be communicable insanity in its most terrible form. I shall be upon the necessity of putting him in a straight whiskey. Mr. Todd, let me have both of them. No, the girl is a, shall I say, a deposit left for my safekeeping. But there, Jonas Fogg, why shouldn't you have both of them? Why shouldn't I deposit her with you? <laughs> Valuable security should always be thanked, Mr. Todd. Hmm. A pleasant little jest, Jonas Fogg. <laughs> <laughs> Take them both! A good day's business. Convey them to one of the dark, damp cells. As too much light encourages their delirium. Villain, do your worst! I shall always aver that Tisweeney Todd is an assassin. It is true. Take him away! I will die before I submit to you or your vile myrmidon. Why, then you'll die, for no power can aid you. Yes, there is one. Where? There is heaven, which fails not to succor the helpless and persecuted. Cushers! I am undone! Quick, bolt the door, Jonas Fogg! Too late, Sweeney Todd. Much too late, Mr. Todd. Mark! Hand off, you cowardly rascals, and I'll put the kibosh on the old con song. The kibosh? Yes, it's a word of Greek expression meaning the hop set of the heppel con. You'll hang now, Sweeney Todd. And Mark Ingestry. You? Yes, Sweeney Todd. Mark Ingestry, who, preserved from death by a miracle, returns to confound the guilty and to protect the innocent. <laughs> And that's how Sweeney Todd, the notorious bloody murderer of Fleet Street, was brought to justice and finally hanged at Tyburn. Mark Ingestry recovered his pearls, laid them at his sweetheart's feet, and gained her parents' consent. And what do you think Mark Ingestry did besides? Tobias Rag, do you still want to follow the sea? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Ingersley. Then I shall buy you a commission in His Britannic Majesty's Navy. Bully for you, Mr. Ingersley. And furthermore... Rah! Mr. Lupin, if you are agreeable, you shall perform the rites at our wedding. Bully for you, Mr. Ingersley. And furthermore... Rah! Jarvis Williams, I'm going to buy you the biggest cart in London and outfit it with the best greens and taters money can buy. That seems to have silenced the youth. Let me say it. A verily bully for thee, Mark Ingestry. And furthermore... Hurrah! Throughout our married life, Joanna, my dear... Yes, Mark? I will never ask you to make a veal pie. Hurrah! Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. First produced at the Britannia Theatre, Hoxton, in 1842. Was written by George Dibden Pitt. And here adapted by Ronald Hamilton as item 16 of stage 47. Produced and directed by Andrew Allen. With an original musical score composed with tongue-in-cheek. And conducted by Lucio Agostini. Starred as Sweeney Todd, Maver Moore. With Lister Sinclair as the guide. John Draney as Tobias. Bud Knapp as Mr. Smith. Lloyd Bachner as Mark Ingestry, Frank Wade as Parmine, Jane Mallet as Mrs. Lovett, Tommy Tweed as Parson Lupin, 
Kathleen Kidd as Mrs. Oakley, Glenn Burns as Mr. Oakley, Arden Kay as Joanna, Bernard Braden as Jarvis Williams, and Alan King as Jonas Fogg. Fred Tudor made all the sinister sounds, and Bruce Armstrong did the technical operation. I am the master of the headless dead. I say, God. Just call me Swiss, sir. Spelled with an E at the end. Uh, yes, 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 of course. You reminded me before. What were you about to say, sir? I was about to observe that this Tower of London is quite a historic place. That it is, sir. Historic indeed. And, uh... Haunted, I have heard tell. Oh, have you now, sir? Oh, yes. Don't tell me you haven't heard stories about the tower's ghosts. Perhaps I have. Perhaps not. Of course, I don't believe that sort of rubbish, you know. Rubbish? Certainly rubbish. <laughs> don't tell me, Mr. Swift, uh, with an E. Don't tell me you believe in such things as ghosts and, uh, and haunts. What I believe, sir, I believe. Certainly not the legend of the gambling spook of Wyketh Hall. The ghost invariably appears whenever a gambling game is in progress at Wyketh Hall here in the tower. And always wins the stakes. Yes. Don't tell me you believe such a fantastic yarn as that. Or, or such an unbelievable story as the one about the pig-faced specter of the rectory. I imagine Brother Randolph would tell you there's nothing fantastic about the story at all. Brother Randolph? Yes, sir. He's the overseer of the rectory. He's seen the specter many times. Well, it's probably just superstitious. Brother too. Randolph says the thing is always dressed in a long black cloak. As the body of a human, but the face is that of some grotesque and repulsive animal. <laughs> it sounds like an old wives' tale. Oh, mind you, sir, I'm, I'm not trying to convince you about such things. Uh, that's the entrance to the choir loft, the chapel over there. Hmm, chapel. I didn't know there was one in here. It's a chapel of St. Peter at Vinkira. Is it uh, possible for me to go in there? <laughs> Picking your body, sir. That's what the climb up the stairs was for. We always like to show visitors the choir loft, the chapel. Well, then, uh, let's have a gander at the place, shall we? Yes, it is, sir. Yeah, the key. We always keep this locked. No habit than anything else. Nobody ever climbs those steps unless they're showing them through the tower. Uh, here we are, sir. Yeah, I say. It's dark in there. Uh, how about a light, my man? Oh, no, blimey. I completely forgot to turn the lights on. The fuse box down below. If you don't mind waiting, sir. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Wait. I wouldn't ask anyone to climb those steps again. There's enough light coming through the stained glass panes. I say, would you lead the way? Yes, 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 of course. Uh, watch your step, sir. Uh, step up here. Ah. There you are, sir. You can observe the chapel below, sir. Yes. Deserted looking, isn't it? It isn't as deserted as you might think, sir. Hmm? What was that? You see... Only as far as you permit yourself to see, sir. Uh, I don't believe I understand. If you look for emptiness, sir, you see emptiness. But it is empty down there. Is it, sir? I suppose you're trying to tell me this chapel is haunted, too. As it a right to be, sir? Right. Yes, indeed. You see, sir, it's the burial place of... The Headless Dead. That's another of those idiotic legends. Hardly a legend. You see those flagstones down there, in front of the altar? Uh, faintly, yes. Those stones form more than just the sanctuary floor, sir. They are also tombstones. Why do you tell me such a thing as that, Mr. Swift? Because it's truth. You mean... People are buried beneath those flagstones? Including, I might add, 
two of England's queens. Not actually. Oh, yes. Actually. I've never heard that before. Few people have, sir. Then that's why you say the place down there isn't deserted. In a manner of speaking, that's what I mean. Yes. Have you observed the huge pipe organ here in the loft, sir? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. I noticed it when we came in. But getting back to what you were talking... It's quite a famous instrument, I must say. Been played by dozens of famous people. Oh, it has. Uh, uh, could I play it? Well, it's, it's against regulation, sir, but, well, if you play softly, sir. Oh, now, I say that's, that's mighty good of you. I do have somewhat of a reputation for playing the organ... Quite well. Thank you. A rather old instrument, isn't it? Hmm. Beautiful tone, though. Beautiful. Before it's too late, play. That voice, what is it? No one knows. He always speaks like that in Latin. Whenever a stranger plays his organ for the first time. Ghost of St. Peter's Chapel, but this is the first time I've actually heard him. He always does that? Whenever a stranger plays his organ for the first time. Will he return if I play again? No. He always speaks just once. Then he's never heard again until another organist plays for the first time. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. I, I say, sir, it's, it's about closing time. Do you mind if I leave you now? I, I know, I know, of course not. You recall your way out of the tower, I trust. Look around a while longer if you wish. And I'll return later to lock this car loft. But I... I don't know whether I want to remain here. Oh, <laughs> don't worry, sir. You're quite all right. Besides, you don't believe in such rubbish as ghosts. Yes, but I... I'm happy to show you around, sir. By the way, what did you say your name is? Holman. Frederick J. Holman. Well, then I'm very happy to have known you, Mr. Holman. Who knows? Perhaps your visit here will make you a changed man. Hmm. Now, whatever did he mean by that? I say... What's come over me? I feel so sleepy. Yes. Sleepy. <sighs> ah, I'd best sit here. Here in this pew. Hmm. Strange. Never felt like this before. Sleep here a while, then go home. Huh? What's that? Oh. Oh. Uh, went to sleep. 
Oh, I remember now. I slept here in this chapel pew. I say, the door's closed now. Mr. Swift definitely returned, locked me in. That's strange. Why didn't he awaken me? What's that? No. No. It can't be. Those stones at the foot of the altar. They're being pushed up by someone underneath. Hands. And arms. Long, bony arms. Pushing up the flagstones. And over to the right. Two ghostly figures. Rising out of the tombs in the floor. No. No, it's, it's not possible. It can't be. Figures. Dozens of them now. Leaving their tombs. Forming a procession down the middle aisle of the chapel. And each of them is headless. And carrying his head before him in his hands. Look at them. Marching. In a slow procession down the center aisle. armor. He seems to be the leader of those fantastic creatures. Oh, is this a dream? Is this a nightmare? No. It is not a dream. Uh, how did you get up here? Just a moment ago, you, you were down below, leading the procession. It is not our custom to hold our rights while an intruder is present. But I was locked in here. I didn't intend to be here. Now that you are here, you must make the most of it. What? What do you mean? You're now as one of us. It... It was you who prayed when I played the organ earlier today. Yes. I always pray when a stranger sits at the console. You see, it was I who first played this organ... And it was installed. Don't you think I play well? But why do you return when others play? Because no one could ever play it as well as I. Therefore, I pray for them. You, you're dead. And yet... And yet, you playing the instrument now. Yes. I always provide the music for our nightly meetings. I, I don't understand all this. Those others down there. They're ghastly creatures. Headless. Yes. They were less fortunate than I. You see, I managed to keep my head. They were executed. How else would they have come to be headless you see, we will become quite uncomfortable lying in our graves beneath the flagstone floor if we didn't arise occasionally and stretch ourselves. Good heavens. Look you, down below there. Will it amaze you for me to tell you that in that procession are some of history's most famous people? Surely this isn't happening. Indeed. Believe me, you're quite mistaken. Didn't you know that here in the chapel of St. Peter at Ventura? are buried such famous people as Sir Thomas More, Henry VIII's Queens, Anne Boleyn, and Catherine Howard. Do remember that, but As I... well as Lady Jane Grey, and Dudley, her husband, and Sir Walter Raleigh, and the Duke of Monmouth. But they have all been dead for hundreds of years. How true. How very true. Rick Holman, you will join us. What? I said, you will join in the procession with us. No, 
Not I. It must be so. No one can look upon the possession of the headless dead unless he joined them to save himself. Save myself? What do you mean? You will discover what I mean if you refuse to take part in the ceremony. But not now. Not tonight. Perhaps later. Yes, some other time. It will be more satisfactory for you to join us tonight. I, I can't tonight. Can't we make it some other night? I, honestly, I fell asleep here. It's later than I thought. It's exactly midnight. I must return home. My family will be frantic. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll return to join you tomorrow at midnight. What? Tomorrow at midnight. You will return to join in the possession. Yes. Yes, that's fine. You can count on it. Raise your right hand. My right hand? Yes. Raise it. Now, repeat after me. I solemnly swear... I solemnly swear... By the souls of the sacred dead... By the souls of the sacred dead... To return to this chapel tomorrow at midnight... To return to this chapel... Tomorrow at midnight... So help me heaven... So... Help me, heaven. Now, you may go. Yes, but the door to the choir loft is locked. It is locked. But you will have no trouble going out through it. And remember, Frederick Holman, tomorrow night at midnight... Frederick, dear, you're worried about something. I know you are. It was one o'clock when you came home last night. You've never done that before. No, I know, Laura, my dear, I know. You acted so strangely when you did get home. What's more, you didn't sleep. You tossed all night long. Laura, I must tell you something. Well, I certainly think I have some explanation coming. Yes. Yes, you have. I... I don't know how you're going to accept this, but... Well, here goes. I went to visit the Tower of London yesterday. I saw the prison cells... and the execution and torture chambers. Finally, the guard took me to the little chapel of St. Peter Adventure. So I... I promised to return to the chapel tonight at midnight. And they permitted me to leave the chapel. Frederick, surely you were dreaming. No, I'm sure it was no dream. It was all too realistic. I saw those people and heard them. Oh, but things like that don't happen. I'm very positive this happened, Laura. Oh, nonsense. You were just affected by those ghost stories that guy told you about the tower. Oh, dear, you're wrong. I've never believed in such things before. No. Surely you don't intend to go back there tonight. Do you? I don't know, Laura. I don't know. Hello. Hello, Laura. I say, Laura, are you there? Laura! Oh, I'm sorry, dear. I thought for a moment we'd been disconnected. Yes, I can hear you now. And what I called for, dear, was to say I'm dining at the club tonight. Yes, old Simon Joster is off to the Orient. We're having a dinner for him. Yes, I'll be home early. Huh? What's that? No, Laura. I've decided not to go to the tower tonight. I think you're probably right. It all must have been a dream. Good 
evening, Mr. Holman. Your car, sir. No, thank you, Henry. Uh, shall I drive you to the tower, sir? Tower? But of course not, Henry. Drive me straight home. Whatever made you think I'd want to go to the tower at, at this time of night? I, I don't rightly know, sir. I... Begging your pardon, Mr. Holman, I, I, I don't know what made me ask you that. Really, I don't. Don't drive me home, Henry. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, what time do you have, Henry? It's just a minute or two before midnight, sir. Hmm. Oh, very well. Take me home at once. Did you say something, sir? Did you hear something, Henry? Hear something, sir? Yes, the voice. Voice, Mr. Holmes. Don't you hear that voice? No, sir, I don't hear nothing, sir. Listen to him. You must be tired, sir. There, there, there's nobody. Good voice. Really, sir. Don't tell me you haven't heard of the gambling spook of Wycotor. In principio es verdad. No. Oh, it can't be. Or to the Randolph's pig face. Spectator of the rectory. No one could ever play the organ as well as I. That's what he said. The man in armor. You see, only as far as you permit yourself to see, sir. You see, I manage to keep my head. If you look for emptiness, sir, you see emptiness. Then, but it wasn't a dream. The flagstones of the sanctuary floor are also tombstones. It's true. It wasn't a dream. You must join our procession. Henry. The Agnes dead. Join our procession. The Agnes dead. Join our procession. The Agnes dead. Henry. In the name of heaven, man, look where you're driving. I can't stop, sir. Look out, you're going to hit that mark. Mr. Holmes. Henry, look out. <laughs> Mr. Holman, are you all right, sir? We hit that truck and... Mr. Holman, we, we hit that truck broadside and... Mr. Holman... Look at him! Greetings, Frederick Holman, and welcome. I am pleased that you have kept your appointment with us. You have heard The Headless Dead, tonight's original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop. Ben Morris played Frederick Holman, Eleanor Naylor Corrin was Mrs. Holman, Fred Wayne was Swift, Garland Moss was the leader of The Headless Dead, and Murillo Schofield was heard as the chauffeur. Next Friday night at this same time, we'll bring you a strange and weird tale of the unusual. Death is a savage deity, based upon Scott Bishop's novel of the same name. Listen for this breathtaking tale of witchcraft and black magic. Dark Fantasy originates each Friday night in the studios of WKY, Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. We present Dracula. <laughs> Leaving his fiancée, Mina Murray, to spend some time with her best friend, Lucy Westenra, Jonathan Harker, a young lawyer, journeys to Transylvania on business. Dracula. Oh, <laughs> 
No. Stop. Not going. Can't go. Dark forest. Dark things. Eyes. Eyes everywhere. Eyes. Red. Blood. Red. Eyes. No. Hush now, Jonathan. Hush. Easy now. It's a dream. Nothing. Blood. Not afraid to travel. I beg your pardon, sir. We are afraid. We only travel for necessity. I have no reason to be afraid, sir. <laughs> no reason, he says. You go far, Englishman? I am a lawyer with business in your country. Uh, laws won't protect you. Nothing can protect you. Not true. Not true. You can be safe. Who is the business with, sir? Our count, sir. Our count? You know what day this is? I, I, I don't understand. St. George's Day. Oh, tonight, midnight, all evil things in the world will have power. Are you a Christian? Yes, madam, I am. Then pray. This count, who is this count, sir? Count Dracula, is this your business? Oh, don't go. I beg you. Oh, don't go. I have business with him. I am expected. Please, before you leave us, take this. A crucifix is no use. Garlic, maybe. Holy, perhaps. For my sake, sir. For your mother's sake. For your soul. Take it. Wear it. Wear it round your neck. Please, sir. My church says these things are idolatrous. Faith is enough. Wear it, sir. Wear it in good health. Very well. To please the lady. Crucifix! Where's my crucifix? No, I need no. my crucifix! Easy now, Jonathan. Easy. Here. Take mine. Hold it if it gives you peace. Hold it. Every night... Every night, Sister Agnes, I see such things. Such things. Hear such things. Help me to sleep. I am so tired. So tired and so... I dare not sleep, Sister. We pray for you. We are all praying for you, Jonathan Harker. We pray for your peace. To escape the horror in your mind. Listen. Thank you. Ah, you're right, Uncle Miss. It is a pleasure. This way, Miss Murray. Mr. Hawkins said we were to show you into his room the instant you came. Is there news of Mr. Harker? Nothing, Mr. Pensmith. Nothing. Uh, come along, come along with the copying. No slacking now, or I shall know it. Do here, Miss Murray. Uh, Miss Murray, Mr. Hawkins, as requested. Oh, excuse me, my dear. Uh, do sit down. And Mr. Pensniff, you may have this copied, if you please. Yes, sir. Yes, of course. I would just like to make bold to say how we're all hoping to see Mr. Harker sooner rather than later, Miss. Excuse me, sir. Ma'am. Jonathan is well liked, my dear. Very strange, Miss Murray. Not a note, not a letter, not a sound, not a sight. But he's in safe hands, of course. Count Dracula is well known in Transylvania. But we checked his credentials before sending your fiancé. No harm will come to him, I promise you. No, of course. I just became worried. He said he would write. We are only just engaged, as you know, and to be separated so soon, not easy, sir. I regard him as a son, my dear. I have great hopes. And now with you alongside him, I double my hopes. <laughs> Mr. Hawkins, how kind you are. The business he is in is not dangerous. Oh, not at all. A matter of transferring some funds... Of buying some property, of arranging for some shipments, titles, deeds. 
English law and their law. <laughs> Unraveling the one from the other. Good experience for a common man. I see. I assure you, as soon as I have news... Uh, yes, of course. Nothing to worry about, huh? You told me you had a friend who went to Whitby. See air. Why not join her? I can telegraph you when he reports to us. I promise you. Welcome to my house, John Harker. Welcome. Come freely, go safely. Leave something of the happiness you bring. Count Dracula? I am Dracula. Come, sit down at the table and let me bring you wine. Uh, my people are not available now, so I shall wait on you while you eat. You will join me, sir? No, excuse me. I have already dined. Listen to them. The children of the night. What music they make. When you have eaten, sleep. And tomorrow we begin work? I shall be absent for a while, excuse me. The necessary papers will be in the library downstairs. I would ask you not to go elsewhere in the castle. It is an old building, dangerous in part. Doors locked in some part. Did you see with my eyes and know with my knowledge, you would the better understand. Our ways are not your ways. From you, I will improve my English also, so when I come to my new London estate, I shall not seem a stranger. You speak English very well, sir. <laughs> you flatter. The house you have found? Is old, very old, in Purfleet. Twenty acres surrounded by trees and walls. Maybe a little gloomy. Oh, I don't mind so gloomy a place. Neighbours? Only one close by. An asylum. Mm. Uh, a private lunatic asylum, not visible from the grounds. Good. I don't mind the darkness. Too old to look for the bright, voluptuous sunshine, the sparkling waters of youth. My heart is not attuned to mirth, Mr. Harker. I love the shade and the shadow, and to be alone with my thoughts. <sighs> that sounds so close. Yes. Yes, he is close. Hunting. You are tired, Mr. Harker. Tomorrow evening will be soon enough to work. He sleeps quietly enough, Sister Agnes, as if, as if at peace for a while. I pray he is, Sister. I pray he is. Sister, sister, we're going to go. I pray. 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 I Help me. I want to be blind. Take the sleeping drug. <laughs> blind me so I can't see anymore. Please, please, I beg you, please. Easy now. For your own good, you must sleep. No, no, please. Good morning. Oh, oh. Damn. I, I, I didn't see you in my shaving mirror, Count. I didn't... Uh, 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 are you un unwell, sir? No, Count, uh, Count, please. Please, what are you... I, I, I need a plaster. I, I've cut my face. I'm bleeding. Count, let me... Go, oh, sir. No. 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 He had me by the throat, sister. I swear, I never saw such demonic fury in any... Eyes blazing... I see it every night when I sleep. He comes to me, takes me, holds my neck and dips his head to my throat. Pray with me for deliverance from this evil. Pray. You think I haven't prayed? He, he touched the crucifix that woman gave me. It was round my neck yet and he, he backed away. 
almost snarling. What are you doing? The man, Mr. Harker! He threw it. Man's vanity. A foul bauble. He wrenched the window open and threw it out and out into the courtyard far away below. I think I am going mad. He, he locked all the doors. I was trapped. Doors. Doors. Doors everywhere. All locked and bolted. I was a prisoner. Am I mad, Sister Agnes? I... I don't know. Help me. I beg you. Help me. I do hope the journey was not too tiring, Mina, my dear. Oh, I'm so excited, dear Lucy. I almost forgot. Almost. Oh, I'm sure Jonathan will be home soon, Mina. Sure of it? Yes. Yes, of course. I never knew that Whitby was so pretty. Oh, the river there, running down to the harbour through that steep valley. Oh, and the houses ranged up the hillside over the harbour, so... Oh, it is lovely, Lucy. And see the abbey. Just a ruin, of course. Sacked by the Danes, they say. You remember Marmion, where the girl is walled up? Oh, yes, yes. And there, in Whitby Abbey. And over on the other side, my favourite place for walks. Over the town and looking down over the harbour and along the headland called Kettle Ness. <laughs> Such strange names. My own they are. But there, in the quiet graveyard, is a place of such beauty, such peace. People walk and sit there every day. We shall go tomorrow when you are quite recovered from your journey. You were very brave to come alone. Mm. Tell me your news. Your two suitors. Have they come to the point yet? <laughs> Three! <laughs> Dr. Seward has thrown his hat into the ring, I believe. <laughs> it could turn a girl's head to have so much choice. Oh. I wish it were only one. For you had no one to hurt when Jonathan asked for your hand. Have you decided? Well, they've not yet asked me. Now, we're nearly in the Crescent. I should tell you that Mother is not too well. But excited to be seeing you again. She's very fond. stepped into the light of the flare the woman carried, and I... and I saw... I saw the leather bag he carried... heaving... heaving... and... from the mouth of the bag... suddenly in the light... a small... tiny... hand... for one moment, and... and then... the man... turned... And I saw, in the light, Count Dracula. Come, come, my friends. Come to me. I have a gift for you. Mary, dear Lord, protect and preserve this your servant from evil thoughts. Give him peace and sleep without these fearful visions. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
Miss Westenra? Miss Murray said I might come in. Dr. Seward, of course. Please, won't you sit down? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, oh, not on your hat, sir. What? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, no, yes. <clears throat> I must come to the point, Miss Westenra. Lucy. May I call you Lucy? Sir. I'm a plain man. I have my own practice, as you know. My specialization is in disorders of the mind, and, to be frank, I feel as disordered as any man just now. Oh, please don't distress yourself, sir. I want you to know that I care deeply for you, and that life with you would be a joy to me. I, I want to tell you of my love, and... Oh, please... Please don't cry, my dear girl. I would only make you happy. Oh, sir, I am sorry. Could I not hope that sometime, maybe, you could love me? I am sorry, John. Truly. Oh. Um, may I ask? Is there anyone? Yes, there is. I see. I want you to know that I hope for your happiness. And if you ever need a friend, you must count me as one of your best. <laughs> Lucy, that poor man. Poor man. Oh, Mina. So kind and brave when I told him I could not marry him. What a dear man he is. Lucy, you have to bear up. A Mr. Morris left his card. Oh. He will call in a short time, he said. Oh, no, no! Wipe your eyes, my dear. Oh, I would not go through this for all the pearls in the world. <laughs> Yet I think maybe there is a bit of you, dear Lucy, that is flattered by it. Mina, you're unkind. <laughs> Perhaps. Well, I'll go right on in and see the lady. Oh. I don't have the hang of the manners, the formality of this place. It's more hedged around than a South American ritual dance. I'll go in and take my chance. Oh, dear, stay. Mr. Quincy Morris has such a way with him. I shall be in the conservatory, my dear. You can only tell the truth. <gasps> yes? Mr. Morris. Miss Lucy. I'll come to the point straight off the bat. I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixings of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you'll go to join them seven young women with the lamps when you quit. Won't you just hitch up alongside of me and let us go down the long road driving in double harness? Oh, Mr. Morris, you do make me smile. Your American ways are quite foreign to us here. I'm a beast and a monster, I own. I speak light of things I take serious, Miss Lucy. I'm not yet broken to harness, Mr. Morris, nor ready for the hitching, whatever that might be. You're angry because I spoke in a light manner. I may have made a mistake, maybe. This is a grave moment for a man. I am no lightweight. I own I never loved a girl like I love you. I never saw a girl with such eyes, such a sweet face, such a girl I would die for willingly die for no no talk of dying mr morris please lucy i reckon you to be clean grit through and through tell me like one fine fellow to the next is there anyone else you care for if there is i'll never trouble you one hair's breadth again but will be if you let me your faithful friend there is someone else Though he has not yet told me he loves me. What can I say to you to... to soften... Oh, no. No, girl. Brave girl. Don't cry now, my dear. If it's for me, I'm a hard nut to crack. I take it standing up. If that other fella don't know his happiness, he'd better look for it soon, or he'll have to deal with me. 
you and I will be friends. And that's rarer than a lover. Just give me one kiss to keep off the darkness now and again. So, that makes us friends, as nothing else can. Thank you for your sweet honesty. Goodbye now. Lucy. Oh, I don't want to talk about it, Mina. I could have loved them both. I seem to be able to do nothing for him, Mother Superior. My concern is also for you, Sister Agnes. He may be a violent man. No. No, he is a gentleman. He has been hurt in his mind, but nothing he says can be true, Mother. It is just his deranged mind. We must pray. You cannot believe. The child in the bag, the cut face, the mirror that did not reflect the man, you cannot believe. I shall pray for him, as will you. Mother of God, it cannot be true. What is that? Go and look. Go and look, Jonathan. Go to the window and see, see what makes that. What is it that flaps so out there in the dark? Go to the window. Oh, God. Oh, Below my window. Below my window, another and from it, under the pale moonlight, a paler face peered, and then slowly inched out of the window and began crawling slowly down the dark ivy over the wall, spreading a dark fluttering cape wide over the wall. The Count, the Count crawled over the wall of the castle. I must get out. I must get out. The worst thing, the, the, the thing that appalled me. He was crawling head down. Huge bat. Save myself. Search for a way. Oh, stop. tried doors and passages, dark rooms, and slowly, slowly worked my way through the castle and met no one. It was as if the Count lived entirely alone in the castle. We had, we had done a little work. I had made out some bills of lading for some things he wished taken from the castle to his new estate in England. I dreamed constantly of my dear, dear Mina. I, I, I had no idea if my letters were being sent or not. Now, now, with that fearful man out of the way, I could hope to find my way to freedom. He warns about going to other parts of the castle. How am I to escape unless I try? Oh, dear, dear Mina, your sweet face is with me. The room was in the corner of the tower. It had a dust-covered desk, a sofa before the window. I sat for...
for what I thought would be a moment. Fatally, I slept. Oh, oh God, I slept. Oh, I pray it was a dream. Let it please have been a dream. Take him. Now he's yours. You are first. And we shall follow. Oh, so young. So strong. Let's begin. Kisses. And see there, under the white flesh. <laughs> see, <laughs> take your I forbade you even to set eyes on him. <laughs> back, get back. He belongs to me. <laughs> you, you never love. <laughs> you never love. I too can love. You know I can. I promise you when I am done with him. You shall kiss him as you will. Now go. Go! We have nothing to learn. He'd thrown a leather bag on the floor by the door. I saw, from under half-shut eyes, I saw the bag move as if there were some living thing. One of them opened the bag and I heard, I swear I heard, sweet Jesus, have mercy on the soul of a poor child, sweet Jesus, have mercy. In Dracula by Bram Stoker, adapted for radio by Nick McCarty, the cast was as follows. Jonathan Harker was played by Bernard Holly, Mina by Phyllis Logan, Seawood, Peter Blythe, Quincy, Paul Burchard, Lucy, Sharon Maharaj, Pensniff, John Shedden, Hawkins, Peter Lincoln, Mother Superior, Stella Forge, Coachman, Frank Gallagher, and the three vampire women were played by Wendy Seeger, Monica Gibb, and Amanda Whitehead with a guest star appearance by Frederick Yeager as Count Dracula. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The theme and incidental music was composed and created by Malcolm Clark in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The producer in our Edinburgh studios was Hamish Wilson. We present Dracula. Jonathan Harker is somewhere in Middle Europe. While on holiday in Whitby with her friend Lucy Westenra, Mina waits to hear from him. Following a great storm and a shipwreck, Lucy starts sleepwalking. Dracula. Then Arthur came and I thank God he asked me. As you should, having turned away two worthy men already, my dear. <laughs> Lady Godalming, men, in time. Well, sadly, in not too long a time. His father's not well, which is why he can only stay so briefly. Oh, Mina. You know the joy of having a good man, a decent man, an honest man to love and cherish. And oh, I could wish I saw more of him or heard a word. It is as if he's fallen off the edge of the world, swallowed up and all for dry as dust business. Dear friend, come along. We can go up a little over the grass and 
Then there's a seat I often take looking down over the boats in the harbour. Come. Very well. My old friend is there before us. See on the bench near the end. The gentleman with the white hair. He's nearly a hundred, and he was a sailor. Sir, good morning. Oh, maybe it is, miss. Oh, you've a friend alongside you. Miss Murray, <laughs> Mr. Swales and I talk a lot about the old days. Oh, I, and about the fishing in the Greenland fleet. You know, I remember them days well enough. Ice on the decks and cracking your skin and salt water burning and wind and... Oh, you take a fish for your tea and think on, think on. I were on the banks then, when Waterloo were fought. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, tell my friend about the old bell, sir. Please. The old bell, you'll know out on the boy. See the water change his colour out there, offshore of the harbour mouth. Oh, yes. Mm. There's a reef there, like teeth. The boy rings out a bell in bad weather. Oh, it is a dreadful sound for a sailor coming in from the storms to hear it. There is a story. When a ship is lost, bells are heard out to sea. That's truth. It is. Not like these gravestones here that lie about proclaiming this and that man or woman is lying under them. Oh, what do you mean, sir? The stones must mark a burial, surely. Oh, happen they might if it's a woman. Eh? Oh, Mr. Swale, that can't be so. Oh, it is true. Graves and coffins empty as my bucky box on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> this one here, Edward Spencer Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of China. Oh. See, and this one, Braithwaite Lowry, I knew his father. Lost in the lively off Greenland in 20. And this. John Rawlings. Drowned in the Gulf of Finland. So. Who brought them all, I ask you? Eh? Mm. <laughs> but why the stones, Mr. Swales? Comfort for relatives. Lies. See this in here. George Cannon. Mm. Said to have died falling off the rocks at Kettle Ness. Not true. Blew his brains out with a shotgun to stop his mother getting any insurance she put on his life. <laughs> he hated her. <laughs> Glorious resurrection indeed. Never. Got to hell he did. And he hoped his mother might follow him. <laughs> Suicide? You frighten me, Mr. Swales. Oh, no cause, miss. No. I must go for me tea. Oh. My services to you, ladies. Uh, good day, good Mrs. Day. Wales. What an imp of an old man. <laughs> <laughs> like a gnome, almost. <laughs> Dancing away down the hill among the stones that seem to all be liars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I shall come up here to write my diary, dear Lucy. And to write to Jonathan. He would like it here. We shall come together, my dear. Often. Take care you don't wake him, child. Is he... Does he need to be tied so? He is afraid he will hurt himself. He told me he wanted to be restrained a little. Don't wake him, child. Oh, he frightens me. He talks often of his fiancée. He named her today. I shall write to her. Tell her he is safe. I will watch him. <laughs> it's all right. He is only dreaming. <laughs> no, no! Escape! Must escape! The window. If he can climb down, I can. Oh, God. So high. A key. He has a key in his room. I know his room. He crawled from it only this evening. The only way is down the wall and pray the ivy will hold me. 
I must try. Don't look down. Must not look. And hold. Hold onto the ivy. Now. Stop. Left. A little. Go, go. Go. Left. A little more. And... The window. Open. No one. Empty. Uh, key. Key. Find the key. Uh, 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 nothing. No key. Uh, door. Uh, his door. His door. Uh, 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 stairs. Another door. A vast box. Eighteenth July. Unseasonal fog surrounds ship, despite barometric readings. Yes? Begging your pardon, sir. The fog seems to be lifting a touch. The Twin Decks watch have searched all over for Mr. Hans. He's not to be found on board. You're sure, Mr. Mate? Aye, Captain. Looked everywhere, including the old. There's someone go in the old with them boxes. Makes them very uneasy, they do, for some reason. Their business is to work the ship, not anything else. So, overboard? It seems so. There was a little blood in the scuppers after the wheel, sir. Hit his head, went over. In a flat car. In a fog, Captain. We've lost two men already, Mr. Mate. The crew are becoming concerned. Rumor, whisperings. He fell overboard, Mr. Mate. Aye, sir. Two of them say they saw a dog, or something akin to a dog. Ah, the imagination. Drink, maybe. Cut the ration and see what they see then. Dogs. Crunched, sir. Look for a figure in the scuppers where the blood... I'll thank you to keep your imaginings to yourself, Mr. Mate. We'll make way and risk the fog. Carry on, Mr. Mate. Aye, sir. And stamp on any more rumours. Hard. Aye, aye, sir. Two men gone. Strange sightings. I don't like it one jot. Trouble is coming. Gentlemen, I think we should raise our glasses to the ladies, in particular to one lady. I second that. <laughs> To a very honest and brave little lady. And to a lucky man. Congratulations, <laughs> Arthur. Uh, what can I say? To have such good friends about one is reward indeed. To have friends who have the bigness of heart and spirit that you do. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> to Arthur and Lucy, may you both be very happy. Arthur, you make her unhappy and I'll come looking. <laughs> I think the port is with you, John. I, I beg your pardon. Say, Jack, how was that man you had in... What's his name? Uh, 
Ratcliffe, was it? Renfield. That's the one. Did you hear about him, Art? <laughs> he is a case. I don't know that I'd have the courage to work with such lunatics as you do, John. Oh, come now. Most of the time they are lambs. Renfield, on the other hand, is... unpredictable, I admit. Interesting. Now, I thought at one time he loved all God's creatures. He seemed to spend a lot of time catching flies. Flies? For pets? When your mind is unhinged, as his is. <laughs> then he started to catch spiders. Big spiders in boxes. He feeds them. The flies? Exactly. I was talking with him only two days ago, and a huge blowfly came in, filthy. He snapped it from the air very quick, and before I could do anything to stop him, he ate it. Oh, come now, John. <laughs> I'm a tickled stomach enough. I is there any reason? His latest pet is a sparrow. Part tamed. Easy to see how. The spiders have almost all gone. He is now asking for a kitten to play mm. with, to feed. And then, well, who knows where it might end. I'd like to see him. W what happened? Oh, I refused the kitten. And he began again putting sugar on the sill of his window and catching flies. I looked for the bird. The attendant showed me in Renfield's bed a few feathers and a blood stain on the pillow. No. He'd eaten the bird. Raw. Feathers, feet and beak. Everything. Oh. He is, to tell the truth, an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I have him heavily sedated just now. If you wanted to observe him, Quincy, you'd be welcome to join me. A bargain. I would look forward to it as much as the adventures I've had in the South American jungles or in the pompous of the Argentine. You, Arthur? I'm afraid my father is very ill. I have only stayed this long to wish you both happiness also, and I have to return to my home tomorrow. I shall leave dear Lucy to the tender care of her friend, Miss Murray. Then, a nightcap, gentlemen, and away early tomorrow. Close the window, Lucy, dear. Leave it open. I like it open, Mina. Oh, the rain will beat in, Lucy. We must close it. We shan't sleep if we don't close it. I, I wish I could sleep. I dream and wake up and dream again. I never know if I've truly slept or not. You're overexcited, Lucy. Your fiancé gone away so soon. A shame. He has to see his father. Arthur's sure the old man is dying. I'm sorry for that, but you must try to rest, dear. I'll go for a walk. I know it's stupid. I, I just feel so... So very restless. Uneasy. Lucy, get to bed and tell me how you came to meet Arthur. Go on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I will. Oh, how clever you are, dear friend. <laughs> I was to go to a dance in St. James. Mother. Bristol Bates! Who's at the wheel? Hawkins, Captain. The strongest helmsman we got. Then why the devil is he staring so ragged across? The weather is no excuse. Captain! Yes! Yes, Johnson! Okay, Captain, sir. He's gone, sir. Gone! No sign of him. Dear God, what is this? Five men left of the mate. What is happening on this ship, Mr. Mate? I hope I'm afraid, sir. It is almost as if we're cursed. Get sir. you followed and lash down those spars, Johnson. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Mate, I'll take the wheel. Aye, sir. Ahoy there! Johnson! Johnson! No tail, sir. No curses. Captain, sir, I seen him. I seen him, sir, and over him. God, over him, crouched like a huge beast, crouched with Johnson's neck in his mouth. I swear, and him screaming, and the next wave took him over. Gone. The shape, run, sir, along the deck on all fours, sir. He looked back at me, and 
his eyes. Come to Bob. I never seen such eyes. I pray. I pray. Red. In the dark. Red eyes. Like blood. Look at the waves, Mina. And the spray. Lovely. I'm afraid I'm not good company this morning, Lucy. Oh. I keep thinking... Oh, it's foolish, I know. I'm sure he'll write soon. You know, sure of it. Oh, it's nearly two months now, Lucy. He can't have forgotten me, can he? Oh, Mina, you know very well he will not forget you. And you know as well as I do that the post from France and Germany and, well, all those places, it's not half as reliable as ours. So, patience. You're right. Yes, I must look on the bright side. It is not easy. Oh, my! <laughs> How this wind does blow! You were very restless in the night. Was it the storm? Oh, I dreamt a little. Nothing more. I found you by the window at one time. You would only come back to bed reluctantly. You kept muttering something. What was it? Oh, he's coming. He's coming. Oh, dear. Have you mentioned it to Mother? I saw no reason to worry her. She seems so frail, Lucy. So weak. Oh, I'm afraid for her. She's not sound of health. Oh, we shall be blown away, Lucy, up here. Oh, I want to go to the top. Please, to our seat at the end. Oh. Oh, I declare... There's Mr. Swales, already ahead of us. See? Good morning, Mr. Swales. Good morning, miss. It's a rough old day, miss. Not a day for boats to be out, and yet there is one over there. You see, eh? I can't see anything amongst those waves and the spray. And he's there. He's there. See? She, miss. She is there and nowhere else. And heading for the teeth by the look of her. Bobbing about without a hand to manner from the set of her. She near goes about and then back again and then... It is as if no hand were on her wheel. Oh. She'll be fortunate to survive the day like that. We shall hear more of her, no doubt of it. I'm sorry for you, Mina, truly... You're like a daughter to me and a sister to my dear Lucy. And Jonathan will write. Be assured he will. If only I heard from Mr. Hawkins at the office, it would be something. <coughs> Mina, you remember Mr. Swales talking of that ship and saying it was in danger? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure enough. It's in the evening edition. <coughs> yes? Uh, read it to us, Lucy. What ship was this? Schooner with all sails set, heading back towards Whitby Harbour with the full roaring storm behind her. Watch as shuddered as the ship came on with no attempt to tack by the rocks across the entrance to the harbour. Um, well, one old salt said, she must fetch up somewhere if it is only in hell. <laughs> that sounds like Mr. Swales. <laughs> well, he was right. Um, the ship came on out of the sea and through white-topped waves and the crash of thunder and drove towards the rocks, veered sharply and came to rest in the harbour. Oh, God. Oh, there's more. At the wheel, a corpse lashed there. Oh. No other soul on the ship, it seems. Steered there by a dead man's hand. Oh. Mm. It rushed ashore with a great concussion and spilled spars and ropes and stays. Oh, and even as it came ashore, a vast dog leapt ashore and disappeared up towards the churchyard. The poor beast. I is there anything else? Oh, the, the corpse of the wheel had in his hands a crucifix. Is the Russian ship still berthed, dear? Over there, son. Over there. Yeah, not much left of it, though, said the old. Thanks. Excuse me. Get me through there. Echo reporter. Thank you. Excuse me. I have an appointment. 
I don't have any intention of making statements for the newspapers, Mr. Pierce. I am merely the recipient of the cargo. You have some concern for the crew, surely. I am a Christian, and I hope you are too. I shall pray for them, as any decent man would. Now, sir, if you'll excuse me, I have papers to sign and bills of lading to see to, and delivery documents to peruse, and customs dues to pay. Uh, on what, uh, sir? A cargo of what? Boxes, Mr. Pierce. Boxes. Filled with mould, it appears, from the manifest. For research purposes, they're all intact. Indeed. Do you know anything about the dog that went ashore? Dog? No, I don't. A bull mastiff. A fighting dog at that. Up over Tay Till. Was found with his throat torn out and his belly ripped open this morning. You any ideas about that, Mr. Billington, sir? I have not. Now, if you will excuse me. Funeral bell for the captain of that ship from Russia. So sad. So very sad. Why declare? Mr. Swales is not in our place this morning. See, a friend of his has his place. Good morning, sir. Swales. We expected to find Mr. Swales. Is he sick? He's always here at this time. He'll not be now, nor never. No? Yeah. He was here early yesterday. About uh, six I walked by. Old habits. Seafaring habits make us early risers. He was here. Sitting as I am. His head thrown back. And his face... His eyes staring, sheer terror, and his heart quite stopped. Dead? Yes. Oh. A fright, I believe. Oh, poor, poor old man. What did he see to frighten him so? My dog come up often to walk amongst the old gravestones and the memorials and such, and now, now it is all fury and eyes starting hairs bristling in fear. He'll not come by here now. He will not stir from the bottom of the path down there. Will not move. How do you think Lucy seems, Mina? She's resting now, Mrs. Westenra. I think perhaps she's too tired now to go sleepwalking again. I pray she is. Yes. I believe she has more colour to her face. More animation since you came to stay. And for that I must thank you, my dear. <laughs> Look after her, Mina. I I'm not well, as you know. I worry for her. Uh, Sir Arthur seems a good enough sort of man. He is of the best, Mrs. Westenra. Be calm about that. Yes. Uh, say nothing to Lucy of my concern, please. Now, take this key... If she seems to want to sleepwalk again, lock the door. Hmm? As is that, I go no further, sir. I've no liking for mad men in ones. And he got a dozen or more in there. As madness, if ever anything was. Well, <clears throat> oh, my bag's in. And uh, here's for your trouble. Oh, thank you, sir. Wish you good day, sir. Oh, the house next door? Been empty ever since the lunatics come by here. That's a big place by all account. There's rumour it's to be opened up again. Though who'd live beside the lunatic asylum, I don't know. Get up now! <laughs> <laughs> you know more than I do, Quincy, much more. Tell me... Did you see Miss Westerner before you came away? No, I did not. I thought it best not to tread there for a time. Mm. Sir Arthur has the right now, and you and I, old son, are cast off like gloves by as good a woman as ever drew breath. Agreed to that. So, I bury myself in work, and you? I don't really know as yet. Hmm... Is your man Renfield still eating spiders? Bastard. Bastard. 
In the morning, you shall see for yourself. Master is coming. The 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 master is coming. In Dracula by Bram Stoker, adapted for radio by Nick McCarty, the cast was as follows. Nina was played by Phyllis Logan, Lucy by Sharon Maharaj, Jonathan Harker, Bernard Holly, Dr. Seward, Peter Blythe, Quincy Morris, Paul Burchard, Arthur Homewood, Crawford Logan, Renfield, David McHale, Mr. Swales, John Buick, Sister Agnes, Wendy Seeger, Novice, Amanda Whitehead, Captain, Nicholas Gilbrook, Mate, Ian Sexon, Mrs. Westenra, Stella Forge, Pierce, Mark Coleman, Billington, Raymond Ross. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The theme and incidental music was composed and created by Malcolm Clark in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The producer in our Edinburgh studios was Hamish Wilson. We present Dracula. At last, after weeks of waiting, Mina receives news of Jonathan, though he's ill in a hospital in Budapest. Mina travels at once to join him. Dracula. Lucy, out there. 
Karen. Nothing but a nightdress. I'll help, dear Lucy. I'll bring you back. I know where to go. I know. I know. I'm coming. I am coming. Morning, Quincy. Is Renfield quiet now, Adams? He was asking and asking for you, sir. I wouldn't have bothered you, but he seemed so eager, sir. Almost in his right mind, you could say. Now, Quincy, I must ask you one thing. No surprise, no quick movements. Be calm and deliberate. He was once a very intelligent man, I believe. Mr. Seward, it's late for you. I, I do apologise. And your friend? Just a friend. Come to stare, have we, sir? At the disturbed of mind? I'm no more disturbed than you are, sir. Come now, Renfield, that's hardly polite. Manners, sir, are the prerequisite of the middle class and the bane of the natural rulers of the world. You couldn't leave us, sir. I never thought Americans much intellectually. Have you read Whitman? Yes, I have. Well, that may be something in your favour. Outside, here we find it rather pretentious. Indeed. What? I don't want to talk to you. You don't count now. Nor you, Seard. Nor you. It's like nothing so much as a hunting dog scenting out game. Mr. Renfield, sir. Still here? Leave. The master is at hand. He is at hand. The master? The bride maidens rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride. And when the bride draweth nigh, then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled. Leave me! Leave me! Leave me! Quincy, to the door. Easy now. Easy. I know the signs. <laughs> Mr. Renfield, try to sleep. Oh my God. Eyes. My God! Get out! Get out, Quincy! Now! <laughs> I am almost afraid to write this in my journal, but I must. She was there. I had run along the crescent without seeing her and then along the north terrace. I ran to the edge of the west cliff and looked across the harbour in the hope, no, fear perhaps, of seeing Lucy in our favourite seat. The storm seemed to be dying away and the clouds racing across the moon were clearing. The ruins of the abbey came into view and she was there. In the silvery light of the moon, I saw a half-reclining figure, snowy white. It seemed to me that I saw, before the clouds obscured the moon again, I saw something dark behind the seat. Something that bent over her. Man or beast, I could not tell. Lucy! Lucy! There was something long and black bending over her. I called out. Lucy. Lucy. The something raised its head and I could see a white face and red, gleaming eyes. I ran across the churchyard towards her. When I was near enough to see her again, she was alone. Her head lying back over the seat. Lucy? Lucy? Are you awake? Oh, my dear Lucy. My dear. Oh. So cold. Oh, so cold. Oh, here. Let me wrap you in my shawl. Pin it round you, my darling. Mrs. Weston, I brought her back still fast asleep with my shawl pinned round her to keep her warm. She was breathing great, tearing breaths. Did you wake her? Uh, slowly, very slowly. And she came home without knowing much of what had happened, I'm sure. She is asleep now, and none the worse for it, I promise you. You are a good friend, my dear. 
a good friend. When we're home in London, we might see a specialist and ask for help in the matter of sleepwalking. I'm sure it's just the excitement of the engagement. Hmm? I think so too, Mrs. Westenra. <laughs> Nothing to worry over. I shall make sure we spend a quiet day about the house. Did anything happen to make him suddenly turn as he has? <laughs> Nothing, sir. We were out in the garden. You know, he likes tending a small plot over by the far wall. He was there, sir, and looking through the gates. He was pointing and shaking, shaking and muttering to himself. Muttering what? Some rubbish I didn't really listen to. I was too eager to get the fork from him. You heard nothing of what he was saying? There was a carrier's wagon, sir, coming to the hall next door. We are two of neighbours, it seems. Renfield was pointing at the wagon and slobbering, sir, the master. The master, he seemed to say, and then he turned on me. And I own I was glad to see Jonas and Perks come over. They held him while we got the restraining jacket on him. Mm. You did well. Watch him if you please and report any changes. I stalked up. his employer from Exeter. Sit, my dear <sighs> child. Lucy, walk uh, No, no, I'm all right. I have no need. Jonathan is found again. Was he lost? In a hospital in Budapest. Oh. Nuns have been looking after him, it seems. His mind has been affected, but he is recovering. Oh, dear Jonathan, I must go to him. Oh, you must go indeed, yes. Mr. Hawkins... The dear man says they have already arranged my tickets and a passage on Monday from Hull, thence to Hungary by train and coach. I'm sure I don't know that a young lady should travel alone. I must go, Mrs. Westenra. Jonathan needs me. The nuns believe it would help him. Of course you must go. An adventure. How romantic. Would you mind? I'd like to think... To be on my own for a few moments, I won't be long. I'll come with you. Lucy, my dear. Mina needs a few moments on her own. Take the air, my dear, and calm yourself. Much the best. Pack tomorrow and take passage after that. But first, a little calm reflection. Huh? <laughs> dear Mrs. Weston. <laughs> Lucy. was seized by a thousand emotions, but above all, by joy that dear Jonathan was safe and in kind hands. I didn't care to think about what had caused his illness. I walked back to our little house in the Crescent and looked up at the window of our room. Lucy was sitting in the window, waiting for me. Beside her, on the sill, in the shadows, I thought I saw something. I waved my hand, and as I did so, a cloud shifted from the moon, and I could see her more clearly. Her eyes were shut, her head leaning back. I ran upstairs to stop her getting a chill from the open window. Lucy! Lucy! Oh, I'm tired. Very tired. My dear, come to your bed. Oh. That's it. In you go. Right. Now, let me let me pull the blanket around oh. you closer to you. Keep you warm. You're like ice. Why were you by the window? Mm. What was that thing on the sill beside you? Oh, I'm asleep now. Mm. Lucy? Lucy, why were you at the window? Mm. Nothing. I'm so tired. Let me see your throat. Is it sore? You press your hand to it. Those pinpricks. Are they from the shawl brooch the other night when I pinned my shawl to warm you? Sleep. You are so pale. And weak. So painfully she tries to breathe. Why by the window? Why? She won't answer me. Oh, Lucy. 
What is wrong with her throat? Be mad. Lying in that box, looking up, looking young, as if he'd been renewed. The white hair now dark iron grey, the cheeks fuller, the white skin ruby red underneath, and the mouth redder than ever. O on the lips. Oh, God, help me. On the lips, gouts of fresh blood trickling still from the corners of the mouth and running over his chin and neck, bloated, as if the whole filthy creature was gorged with blood, exhausted with his repletion, a filthy leech. There is a mocking smile on his face. There is. See it. See it. All I remember now is that that bloated face, blood-stained, fixed in a grin of malice that would have held its own in the nethermost hell. Gypsies came for him, and, and when they came into the castle in the dark shadows, I slipped away. I remember nothing more, only that face, the blood slipping thick from the corner of the mouth, thick, red blood. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. On! Get on! 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 Get on! You want to rest before you see your fiancé? No. Please. You must be prepared. He is pale, very tired, and sometimes a little agitated in his mind. The peace here must help him. Thank God. I thank God for your care. Now, he has been told you are coming. Go in to him, Miss Murray. I shall be in the chapel at prayer. Jonathan? I see that Renfield is at liberty again. He is calm now. There's no point in chaining him up, Quincy. He loves this garden. Yet he's a killer, for sure. Would you chain a dog for the rest of his life? A mad dog, I'd shoot. We can do neither to Renfield. He's an intelligent man when his mind is clear. Sure. S say, your neighbors seem to be moving in. I saw a carter's wagon there this morning. Oh, indeed. Well, perhaps we might stroll over there and see what's what. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Can I help you? I'm from the house over the wall. Just a neighbourly visit. Be careful, Jack. Don't drop it. The owner isn't here, sir. Just us, moving in a few boxes. Damn oh. heavy boxes from the looks of them. And to be put in a very precise place, sir. Down in the old end. The chapel? Chapel? That's what we were told, sir. It's a rough job, it was. Letter from a solicitor in Whitby to Messrs. Carter, Patterson and Co. London. Meet the goods at King's Cross, out here at the trot, you might say. Into the house, using closed keys, leave said keys in main room on departure. A real chapel in a private house. <laughs> My. Not much left, sir. Inside is a mess of screens and upturned stones, and only the door to the crypt in working order, oiled and locked. Frank, take the end round a bit. Easy, man, easy. Excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, I shall be locking the gates before we leave, sir, so... Uh... Oh, we're not staying, friend. Uh, you don't know the name of the new owner, do you? No, sir. Now, if you'll excuse me. Jack! Oh, Lord, love us. Lucy, my dear. Shall we take some air? If you don't mind, Arthur, 
I would rather sit for a moment. I'm still not entirely myself. My dear, I really do wish you'd see a doctor. There's no need. It's just the move. Coming down from Whitby to town and Mama being unwell. And we've hardly stopped since you came to town. I want to show off my fiancé. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> I've been selfish. No, no, dearest, not at all. I could ask John Seward to look at you. If it will make you feel easier in your mind. It will. I know we both trust John as a good friend. His opinion is worth a great deal. Very well, Arthur. Oh, isn't that Quincy waving his programme? Oh, what luck. Shall he come on to supper with us, my dear? Oh, I'd rather we had supper alone. Please. So would I. <laughs> Quincy, my dear chap. Hello, folks. Good to see you. Nice concert. Yes. Lovely violinist. My, Miss Lucy, you are looking pale and interesting, if I may say so. <laughs> Why, thank you. She's been overdoing it. We have been overdoing I'm it. I'm calling Arthur. John in for an opinion. Gentlemen, please stop talking about me. Why, ma'am, you must be the first living woman ever asked two men to do that. <laughs> I've just been down in the country with him. He has an interesting place there, some amazing people. All mad and some dangerous. Fascinating. I think I shouldn't like that, sir. <laughs> it can make you a little uneasy in your bed. Now, I have to miss the second half, sadly. I, I must leave if I'm to catch the train back to his place. Excuse me. I pity your friend Mina was already engaged. I thought the two of them would make a fine couple. <laughs> well, Mina sent a telegram. She's with Jonathan Harker now and happy. Oh. I'm so pleased. Oh, no. Hush. I prayed every night to God and St. Joseph and St. Mary for the poor man. He raved and had bad dreams. He refuses to tell me any detail. Just that he had nightmares and is still afraid to sleep. With you here, he will lose that fear and begin to heal himself. If only I knew what he did rave of. It worries me, sister. I can tell you it was not about anything to give you as his future wife cause for concern. He never forgot you, even in the darkest of times. His fear was of such dark, dreadful things, but it will go. You will help him. Thank you, sister. I wish I knew how to. Mina. Wilhelmina. Is it a dream? Jonathan. Dear Jonathan. My book fell on the floor. Oh. oh, you have been writing your journal. I, I told you I would never show it to you. Jonathan, it doesn't matter to me. I, I believe there should be no secret, no concealment between husband and wife. I have had a, a great shock, and I, I do not know if it be real or the dreams of a madman. I, I, have, I have been unhinged, I think. The secret lies in this journal. Will you dare share it with me? Take it and keep it. Read it if you will, but never let me know. Please. Then, we can be married and no secrets between us. Oh, Jonathan. Jonathan. I have asked Sister Agnes to beg Mother Superior to allow our marriage very soon. Now. I will stay here, and you will sleep, my dear. Sleep. Hold, hold my hand, please. I am still afraid of sleep. I'm good of you to come up, John. Sick, you said? Not exactly ill or no special disease. She's just very tired and getting lower every day. I dare not talk to her mother about it, as she too is very frail. Ah, yes. Her heart condition... She may not have long with us, I believe. Her doctor told her as much. Uh, Lucy does not know. John, I'm aware how painful it will be for you to... Well, to, to take on the role of doctor and not of suitor. If you would rather... I'm I... a friend, Arthur. To both of you, I hope. Quincy was concerned. He told me. So, come to lunch, and Lucy will make an opportunity for you to examine her. Her mother must not know of our concern, of course. Taxi! Cab! There! So pleased you could come for luncheon, John. Arthur is naughty not to be here himself. I think, my dear, he'd had a telegram. Oh, his father must be worse. Now, you're not to worry on that account, Lucy. He was indeed called away. We were in his chambers when the telegram came. 
We thought it best for me to come on alone and for him to take the train post-haste. Of course. Poor Arthur. Well, my dears, if you'll excuse me, I, I take a nap at this time, John. Yes, yes, of course. John will think us dull dogs, Mama. <laughs> I think you're very wise, Mrs. Westenray. Uh, thank you. And I'm so glad you feel able to call after... Mama. You shall be certain of one thing, Mrs. Westenray. I shall always call when I'm in town. <laughs> Don't tie yourself, child. Hmm? No, Mama. So... We must see to you. Arthur worries too much. You have lost weight. A considerable amount of weight. He is naturally and rightly concerned. Rightly? Are you sleeping? Yes. Well enough. Concealment will not help, Lucy. I'm not sleeping well, no. I hate talking about myself. Remember, whatever you tell me is between doctor and patient. You may tell Arthur everything I say. I do not care for myself, but all for him. Go on. Well, I have difficulty breathing sometimes. I sleep very deeply and wake tired still. Dreams. I, I have dreams that frighten me and I remember nothing. I see. I began to sleepwalk when we were in Whitby. Really? I even walked out of the house and onto the East Cliff. It was Miss Murray who found me and brought me safe home. Do you still walk in your sleep? No, I, I just feel so heavy, so... Yes, yes. <clears throat> I think... I was taught for a time by a very great man. He became my friend. I would like to write to him and to ask him to come and see you. He teaches from time to time in Amsterdam and is an expert on matters of the mind. I'm not mad. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course you're not mad. I, I just think... Maybe there is something weighing down on you and it needs to be found. Now, he can help. I'm sure of that. Oh, it seems to be a considerable amount of trouble over a little lack of sleep. Now, you listen to me. He is a most advanced scientist, a philosopher, a metaphysician. He also has a brain like ice. It seems abrupt, perhaps, but is full of virtue, a true heart. I think I'm hearing him recommended, Dr. Seward. <laughs> yes, you are. His name? Abraham Van Helsing. Ah, this propensity for hurry, for rush, for behaving as if ants in a heap. <laughs> Cities, the hive of madness. <laughs> so, Miss Westenra. Ah, yeah, Miss so pretty Westenra. Could I resist the request of my most promising pupil and also the men who saved me by quick thought from my gangrene? <laughs> I only did what anyone would have done, sir. I charge on to not turn away the gratitude of a fellow human being. <laughs> it's a rare commodity. Now, this girl we are to seek. Ah, yes. A girl of such charm. An exquisite good nature oh. and such looks. It's not possible to tell you. I sound like a moonstruck fool. If it's love we are looking for, I am home going now. No, no, I assure you it is not. Lucy Westerner is engaged to a better man than I. Oh, sure. Oh. So, so you say listless, you say tired, you say worn out by the slightest exertion. Yes, and since you received my letter, she sunk much further. She appears almost bloodless. Now, I've tested her blood, and it seems rich enough. Yet every evening she sleeps and wakes the next morning ever more listless. Indeed, indeed. She sleeps alone? She does, yes. And she also had a phase of sleepwalking, and she was brought back to bed only by the urgent ministrations of a friend who has since left the country, a Miss Murray. Sleepwalking dreams she claims not to remember. A Miss Murray who left the country already, so pity with her I would have preferred a word or two. However... We must see this paragon. Yes, but her mother must not know of our anxiety. She is very ill, a weak heart. Uh, it never comes trouble, but in groups like this. So, is her man to be here? He is coming from the country. Unfortunately, his father... Ah, also sick, no doubt. <laughs> this climate is no good for such people. <laughs> ah, we go in. Lucy? Lucy, are you awake? <sighs> Dear John, please don't look so frightened. Come in and bring your friend. The great Professor Van Helsing, I think. Mademoiselle, I am charmed to be meeting with you. But sorry only to find you not well. So, 
I want to look at you. I'm afraid I am rather weak. She was better than... From the patient, I will hear, not from her physician. You clog the issue with too much knowledge. If you please, Miss Weston, I want one word with my friend, and then I will make the examination. Hmm? Uh, John? John? She is worse even than before. She makes an effort on your account, but don't be fooled. What? The great von Helsing? I will not be fooled, as you say it. This girl is very close to an end. I see her, and I know. We have drastic things to do. Her fiancé? In half an hour at St. Pancras. Go to him, bring him back as soon as you can, and prepare him for, for... for something urgent. Something we must do for the child. But what shall I tell him? Nothing but to be aware she is going down. Let me caution you. All men are mad in some ways, and in as much as you deal discreetly with your madmen, so deal with God's madmen too. The rest of the world. We must keep what we know and what we learn in our own heads to share one with the other. You are afraid, sir. Afraid? The great von Helsing is not afraid, John. I urge you to make note. Learn, watch, rely on nothing you have heard or learned before. Nothing is too small. So, I will take in my bag and the ghastly paraphernalia of our beneficial trade and begin. Get her loving friend. Quickly. In episode three of Dracula by Bram Stoker, adapted for radio by Nick McCarty, the cast was as follows... Mina was played by Phyllis Logan, Lucy by Sharon Maharaj, Seawood by Peter Blythe, and Quincy by Paul Burchard. Jonathan Harker by Bernard Holly, Renfield by David McHale, Arthur Homewood was played by Crawford Logan, and Abraham Van Helsing by Finley Welsh. Mrs. Westenra by Stella Forge, and Sister Agnes by Wendy Seeger. Foreman by Ian Sexton, Adams by Tom Smith. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The theme and incidental music was composed and created by Malcolm Clark in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The producer in our Edinburgh studios was Hamish Wilson. We present Dracula. As Van Helsing and John Seawood struggle to save Lucy's life from the mysterious illness which assails her, at Seawood's asylum, Renfield's behavior becomes even stranger. Dracula. Arthur! Arthur! Over here! I have a cab waiting. Hurry! Is your man here? He is here. And he is afraid. I saw it in his eyes. I've never seen it before. Oh, Lucy. In the best of hands. Get in. Right, come on. John! Ah, uh, sir, my my lord, is it how I should address you, sir? Not yet, doctor. Now, my Lucy? You love her? Tell me she will live. She is very ill. We have no time for politenesses now. Come, come. I tell you, this is dreadful. There is no time to be lost. She will die for her want of blood to keep her heart's action. She has lost so much. There must be a transfusion. So, you will give her blood? You will give her blood, Sir Arthur. John, you may assist me. Of course. Come along. Oh, God! So pale. Like... Like... Alabaster, yes. She is on the edge, dear friend. Come, come. You are to help her. Your courage is the best help. I would give my life for her, sir. The last drop of blood in my body for her. Uh, I think, my young sir, I do not ask as much as that. <laughs> not the last. Tell me what I must do. You will have a vein opened, and she too, and we will pass the blood of one to the other. It is her only chance. I... Harry, sir, your coat. Oh, 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 kiss her once, if you must, and then let that... Is uh, John, John, the scalpel and the... Of course, Good, good, good. 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 Oh, see. Mm. 
Very well. I'm ready. So, we are done, Arthur. Now you must rest, sir. You have done well, Arthur. Well, she be... You see the colour back in her face. She sleeps. Now rest is what she needs most. Ah, my friend. What can I say? What can I do to thank you? Go, go, rest and let her sleep. John, a word. I have to go. I have some books to consult. But she is going to be all right. I, uh, I show you something. Come closer. You see around her show, white neck, a velvet band. Very lovely. I move it so. She will sleep with a narcotic I have given her. I show you what? Uh, a, a small mark on her throat? Mm. Two punctures? Quite so. Over the uh, jugular vein. Not large, as you see. Not diseased or poisoned in any way, but something unwholesome. Uh, describe to me. The edges of the wounds are white. Uh -huh. Torn a little, as if by trituration. Good, good, good pupil. So, I don't know. <laughs> I will to Amsterdam go this evening. You will remain all night here and not let your sight pass from her. I shall bring some things for the room. There is a market nearby. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Shall I have a nurse? <laughs> we are the best nurses, you and I. Make sure she is well fed and that nothing disturbs her. Later, maybe we may sleep. I shall be back as soon as possible, and then we may begin. Begin? What do you mean? We shall see. Remember, if you leave her and harm come to her, you shall not sleep easy hereafter. Gently now, Lucy. It is bandaged. Bandaged. That's all. I feel awake for the first time for months. Where is Professor Van Helsing? He has gone back to Amsterdam. Oh. Oh, excuse me. He will return very soon, he said. Hmm. Oh. That smell. What is it? Oh. I believe there's some joke here. His garlic round my bed and garlic flowers. Horrid smell. You must not move them. On your life, Lucy. He said there is a virtue in these common flowers. Wear them as a protection, he said. A protection from what? I don't know. I only know he begged me to ensure that you kept them here, close, and that you did not open the windows. He insisted that I warn you not to open the windows which he has rubbed with garlic, nor to remove the flowers, even if the room becomes very close. <laughs> I might begin to think he was working some ancient spell to keep out evil spirits. <laughs> well, nevertheless, please do not remove them. Oh, very well. Though I feel cured already. And you, you poor man, have you been watching me all night? I am told to watch you until he returns. I have my orders. This is silly, John. I shall be better now. You shall see. You must eat. And you must sleep. I have already told your mother that I shall be staying another evening at least. Oh. But today, I must go back to the country. I have some reports to write. Please, John, rest. Ah, no, I may not. I will tell your mother that you would like breakfast, and I shall return this afternoon. Dear John, thank you. I shall write to Mina and tell her what good friends I am blessed with. I'll go and have a little talk with him. Um, wait outside, will you, just to be sure? Right, you are, sir. Mr. Renfield, and how are you feeling this afternoon? You've been burning the candle at both ends, sir. You look tired out. I am tired, very. I've always been of the opinion that tiredness in a doctor is a dangerous thing, both for himself and for his patients. I had urgent business to attend to. Uh, may I beg a favour of you, Dr. Stewart? Certainly. Whatever happens, sir, please don't let them put me in a straitjacket, sir. Please. Sometimes for your own good... I'm, I'm trying to control myself, Doctor. I have to control. My master says I must. Your master? Oh, not for your understanding, sir. My master is close by. He will free me. He promised me. I see. No, I, I, I think not. You think this is Renfield being mad again, hearing voices. Crazed. I assure you, it is not so. I assure you. Promise me I shall not be in the jacket. Promise me. 
I cannot promise. Ah, help me! He's got a knife! It's us! Damn you, sir! Damn! Get off me! Get off! Get him off! In the corner! Kill him! Mind the knife! Hold it! You're sir! More blood than pain. What's he doing on the floor? Oh, God! He, he's licking up the spots of blood. Oh, God, no! Lucky to be alive, John. Hmm? Oh, no, no, I was to blame. He was so calm, so gentle. I really felt I was talking to a perfectly normal person, and then suddenly, suddenly he was at me like a, like a demon. Oh. Uh. John, can we please let the smell of this garlic out of the room? Open the window for a moment or two, please. The smell is so, so strong. No, I dare not. <sighs> Forgive me. My professor would be furious. So, time to sleep, Lucy. I shall sit here, and tomorrow Van Helsing will be back, and then I make it an hour's sleep myself, perhaps. You need to rest, at least. There's a room off this one. You can surely lie on the sofa there and be near enough to satisfy your old teacher. No, Van Helsing insisted. I know nothing would induce you to sleep while there's a patient on the horizon. I shall call out if I need anything. I shall not rest easy if you insist on sitting in my room. Please. Ah, oh, very well. I admit I am exhausted. <clears throat> it is nearly three days since I slept... Lucy? Lucy. Oh, darling child. No wonder you can't sleep. The room's like a furnace and the smell of garlic is disgusting. Now, out it can go. And the flowers. Oh, that's what's making you restless, dearest. I'll take them out. Depend on Dr. Seward, hmm? Poor worn-out man. I'll open the window. Let some air in. Let them sleep. Mm. Red eyes. I see red eyes. Sleep now, darling. You'll be better now. Mars taken away those smelly flowers. Yes, sir? Good morning. Announce from Helsing, if you please, my dear child. Yes, sir. No need. Please come in, sir. Ah. Come in and hear our good news. My dear Mrs. Vestendra, you two are looking less tired. Because your patient is sleeping like a babe. <laughs> I didn't go in in case I disturbed Ah, so? Good. I thought I had diagnosed the case. My treatment is working. You must not take all the credit yourself, doctor. Oh. Lucy's state this morning is in part due to me. Uh, explain yourself. Uh, please? I was anxious about the dear child in the night. Uh -huh. I went into her room and she was sleeping. But the room was awfully stuffy. And I feared the heavy odour of garlic would be too much for a child as weak as she, so I took it all away and opened the window. Sir up! Sir up! He was overcome with tiredness, Professor. He had to sleep. He couldn't help himself. Mrs. Weston, would it be possible for me to have a cup of so nice tea? Of course. Uh, you see the child. Sir up! John! John Seward! John Seward! John! Seward! 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 John! John! I'm sorry. I couldn't help sleeping, sir. No, 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 no. Three nights is too long. So, what is to be done? Oh, oh, what? Oh, look at the child. What? 
What have we done to be so... This is a pagan thing, John. The poor mother doing what she knew nothing of. We must not tell her what she has done, or it will kill her for sure. Now, oh, how are the powers of the devils come against us? Act. We must act. Devils or no devils, we fight him. We must fight them all the same. You will give your blood. I am too old. My blood is too thin to be of use. Now, hurry. Too late. Too late. Too late. You see. You see, the flowers gone and the window open. Wait. She has a little life in her. You see. So, first gain is ours. I see not light in life over her horizon. She is breathing now, Sir Arthur. The shock will kill the mother. Send one of the maids to look after her. We, we must consult what to do. I'll see how her mother is. I trust Lucy in your hands. Professor, hmm? have you seen the wounds at her throat? They are horribly white and mangled. Mm. God, cover them before Arthur sees them. We need more blood. Arthur cannot so soon give again. We need more. Arthur sent me in. Hmm? He's looking pretty, pretty rotten. Oh, my God. What the devil are you? We can provide the blood between us. Quincy, just in time. Fifth Cavalry, that's me. What do you want? Blood! John. The others? Sleeping. Uh, Lucy? Asleep. Is she better? You must know something, my friend. We have lost her. Come. I show you something I hope never to see in my life. She is sleeping now. I have replaced the garlic and the flowers. Too late. How beautiful she looks. You think? Yet her face is right. And see, the mouth open... Her teeth, my friend. Look at her teeth. Well, why? What is it, man? See the gums. Very pale. And the teeth themselves seem... Pointed? Longer? It's a trick of the light. Nothing. Hmm. Do not open the window, my friend, please. What on earth? It's a huge bat. See, it's away now, over against the trees. Yes, yes, I see. I beg you, do not take your eye off your charge. Wait. Oh, my God. What is it? Light. I want light. Let me be sure. Look, my boy. Before I cover her neck. They have disappeared. The marks, the holes. They've absolutely disappeared. <laughs> if I say it is best, you will not understand me. But I tell you, it will not be long now. It will be much difference, mark me, whether she dies conscious or in her last sleep. Lord, please help her to live and to be loved. Please save her. Please, God. Come, come, my dear old fellow. All your fortitude. It will be easiest for her. How can you say that, mister? Easy to lose a love? Better than what would be left, sir. Mother. Dear Arthur. My love. Come along, old chap, and leave them. Oh, never. On my life, never. Arthur, not yet. Don't kiss yet. Hold her hand. It will comfort her more. Arthur. Hmm? Oh, my love. I'm so glad you've come. Kiss me. Kiss me. Hold me and kiss me. Oh, 
my dear. Never. Never. Not for your life. Not for your living soul and hers. No. Kiss me. He shall not. He shall not. Please. Please. No. No, sir. No. <laughs> Thank you, my true friend. Guard him. Give him peace. I swear it. Come, Arthur. Take her hand and kiss her on the forehead. And only once, only once. We thought of dying while she slept and sleeping when she died. Oh, well, poor girl. There is peace for her at last. It is the end. Not so, alas. It is only the beginning. to attend on her. Indeed. Please, go. Go, sir. She will be a credit to our establishment. Beautiful corpse, sir. She is laid out as the foreign gentleman asked. Right. Now do as this poor man asks and leave us, sir. Just to be sure the formalities have been seen to, uh, authorities notified and so on, sir. I am a doctor. I assure you we have done everything necessary. Very well, then. Uh, tomorrow morning, nine sharp. Will there be many mourners? Not many, good day, sir. It's tragic when a mother dies after her own daughter. <laughs> Sad. Uh, she had a weak heart, oh, sir. In the name of go away, sir. Go. Flowers. Go. If that will be all. Mute. Halt. <laughs> Such a man. Now, Arthur, you must be busy to take your mind from it all. Eh? I have no doubt you have things that must be done. John and I... We'll sit with her. Quincy will come with you. Sure. 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 How the lawyers to see her. Yes. And they had no one to tell them. Oh, bear <laughs> apart her. Gentlemen, may I go and see? Cook and I wanted to pay our respects. Yes, of course. Tell the truth, sir. Some of the neighbours have already been. They were well liked. I don't know what's to become of Cook and me. You shall get good references, be sure of that. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, I'm sure. You're right, you'll see. I shall busy myself. Gentlemen, Quincy, I'm right here. Now, what are you hiding from me? Hiding? Hiding from my such best pupil? Never. You're not telling me everything. I have been through all her papers. Do you know she wrote a letter last night, an account of what occurred? I failed her, it seems. Oh, no. There were forces abroad then that you could never defeat. No blame, John, no. I'm searching this morning to find all papers she has written, diaries, and, uh, and so on. Before anyone should find... Uh... I will read a little, and you may understand... I was wakened by the flapping at the window, which had begun after that sleepwalking on the cliff at Whitby. I tried I to go sleep, to sleep, could but could not. I was afraid to sleep, and yet 
Perversely, sleep would come on when I did not want it. I looked out of the window and heard a sort of howl, like a dog's. And then a big bat buffeted his wings against the window yet again. Mother came in, and I was as if asleep. She took the garlic flowers placed by the nice professor and closed the door into the room in which John Seward lay sleeping. Having opened the window, she left. I watched, I watched as a myriad, myriad of little steps. specks seemed to come blowing through the open window. I remember nothing more until... Uh, the air seems full of specks floating and circling and the lights burn blue and dim. Uh, what am I to do? God shield me from harm this night. Goodbye, dear Arthur. If I should not survive this night, God keep you dear and help me. I feel so cold. Dear God. Indeed. So... I searched for her papers, everything. Already I put with her a crucifix from my own mother. It will give her some protection. Even now? Even now, my friend, yes. And from the kitchen we will bring more garlic where I put it before. And this evening, my friend, bring here a set of post-mortem knives. A post-mortem? In secret? Of a sort, my friend, of a sort. He seems to be bearing it well enough, John. God knows it's a dreadful business. A mother and a daughter together. It was to be expected from the mother, Quincy. Her heart was... Well, frail. Is he about? The professor? He's just gone in to sit with her. All night? Is this some old English custom or what? Well, he says... He says it's to protect her. <laughs> My word, but he is a strange man. Who took it? Who? Professor, please don't shout, sir. Took what? Shout! I shout that oh, the poor girl left defenseless. Too late for your, your knives and your post-mortem and... Someone took the crucifix from the dear girl. Too late now for protecting her. Now we have lost her. Now we must, with all haste to the burial, and then, after watching, waiting, praying... Arthur... I have grown to love you, my dear boy. I have a favor to ask you. If it concerns my dear Lucy, I know she trusted you. I do the same, sir. I ask permission to read Miss Lucy's paper and letters. And not from idle curiosity. She would have approved, I believe. I have them with me ready to return if you insist. I, I would not show them to you yet. Not to a soul, but through them I can see into her soul. You must do as you think right. You will tell me when the time is right. <sighs> uh, this Miss Murray, I would like, if possible, to have words with her. You can find her, this Miss Mina. I will try. Ah, we arrive. It will soon be done for the moment. I think, sir. If you would be kind enough to give me your arm, I can see you. Uh, of course. What did you mean for the moment? Nothing. Quite out. I'm so happy, my dear Mina, for the first time since that dreadful night. No, Jonathan, not a word about it. Just thank God for the generosity of dear Mr. Hawkins. We have been so lucky, my darling. I never thought to be left the whole practice and the house. It was generous indeed. So, I know he would not be unhappy for us to celebrate. We shall walk in Green Park, take in a theatre perhaps, and then dine at wherever Mrs. Harker shall decide. <laughs> Mrs. Harker. Oh, I like the sound of that so much. Mrs. Harker. Oh, Jonathan, to tell the truth, I would like a quiet evening with you 
and nothing more than a turn in the cathedral close at home in Exeter, and you playing the piano for me. Jonathan? Jonathan, are you listening? What is it? The other side of Piccadilly. On, on, on the corner. Under the lamp. See, see, see the man in the doorway watching. See, see, see the tall old man with the girl. The beautiful young girl in grey and silver, huh? Behind them, see it. Standing. Watching them. The, the man with the pale face, yes. You know him, my dear. I am sure it is he. The man himself. I swear it. Count Dracula. But somehow changed. Jonathan, Jonathan, dear, we have done too much. You're overtaxed. I know what I am seeing. The dreadful thing is, see, he moves closer as they get into that cab. He follows after. Dear, dear God. The dreadful thing is, he is, he is younger. Years younger. In episode four of Dracula by Bram Stoker, dramatized for radio by Nick McCarty, the cast was as follows. Nina was played by Phyllis Logan, Dr. John Seward by Peter Blythe, Arthur Homewood by Crawford Logan, Van Helsing by Finley Welsh, and Lucy by Sharon Maharaj. Adams was played by Tom Smith, Renfield by David McHale, Jonathan Harker, Bernard Holly, Quincy, Paul Burchard, Mrs. Westenra, Stella Forge, The Maid, Alexa Kessela, and The Undertaker, Peter D'Souza. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The theme and incidental music was composed and created by Malcolm Clark in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. We present Dracula. Lucy Westenra is dead. A funeral has been held, and following it, Van Helsing and John Seward are in Seward's London Club. Dracula. <laughs> Professor, oh, you really must not, not in here. I was thinking. <laughs> if only they knew what I am thinking. They would not lie about a leather armchair surrounded by unread papers. They would be writing learned letters to the Thunderer and... Uh... Be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, I beg your pardon, my dear friend. <clears throat> Do not think I am not sad, though I laugh. The laugh he come all the same. Laugh is the king. He asks not to come or to go. He choose. And he come and go as he please. <laughs> I grieve my heart away for that young girl. I give time and sleep and my heart. Yes? Yes. And yet, and yet, king laugh. Come and dance to a tune he play. Mm. Leading hearts and bones in the churchyard, dance to the music he make. Tears burn as they fall. This irony. The so lovely lady garlanded with flowers. She looked so fair in life. One by one we wondered if she be dead. Laid in that fine marble house in that lonely cemetery, laid with her kin and indeed her mother, and the sacred bell going toll, 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 sad and slow, and holy men pretending to read pages from holy books and never once looking on the page. For what? She is dead, is she not? Dear Arthur's heart breaks yet. Just so. Said he not that the transfusion of his blood had made her his bride truly. It comforts him to feel it, yes. Had you seen into my heart when I laugh in there? Had you seen? You would pity me the worst of all. I'm sorry. No need yet. She lies in her tomb, and the sun will rise over Highgate Hill... 
Quincy will take care of your friend down in the country, and you will go back to your work if you can. And I... I, I will see Miss Mina Murray to ask her a question or two, perhaps. You are hiding something yet. When we are professor, it is necessary to let out knowledge drip by drip, to let others expand their minds, their experience, their beliefs, so. Yes? Yes. I will leave this uh, tomb to you, dear pupil, for the moment. <laughs> Very good it was to come and meet with me from the station. You have no idea what good it does an old man to be met by such a girl as you are. <laughs> Sir, you hardly know me or what I am. <laughs> you forget I have the letters read that you wrote to that dear child. Madam Mina, I know of your faith and your marriage and your kindness to dear Lucy, and so forgive me, but I know you a little at least. She was such a good friend to me. Indeed. And Sir Arthur, Lord Godalming, as we must learn to call him, is he recovered? He is... <sighs> He is buoyed up by good friends, by my old pupil, John Seward, and by Mr. Quincy, the American friend. Uh, the cathedral is very fine. May we go in? If you wish. Uh, it is good sometimes to be reminded of other truths, other worlds, other... Such an institution, this tea in the morning, tea in the afternoon, tea in the evening. At home, we have no such customs. I like. Mm -hmm. I, I think you wanted to ask me something, something connected with Lucy's... Ah, to the point. It's the English way of things. I want to learn from you what happened in Whitby. I know you love Lucy, and I know you care for others in the name of that. And... Of her you loved, I ask you to tell me about your time together in Whitby. I can do better, sir. I can offer you my diary. Uh, I wrote it all down. I have it ready for you. For I guessed it would be about these matters that you came to see me. Madame Mina, what can I say? If, if I read it now, I may then ask you some questions? Of course. I will leave you in peace. Uh, more tea before I go. Uh, thank you. No. A little tea is lovely, but uh, excess. <laughs> no, thank you. So. Miss Mina Murray. Let us see into your private soul here. 8th August. Very well. Yes, begin. Lucy was very restless all night, and I too could not sleep. Uh, the storm was fearful, and as it boomed loudly amongst the chimney pots, it made me shudder. 10th August. The funeral of the poor sea captain today was most touching. We were in our seat on the headland near the grave. A cortege of boats took him up the river to the viaduct and came Perhaps down. Perhaps he had seen death with his dying eyes. One of the old men came up with his dog. The dog would not come to his master by the grave, but kept a few yards off, barking, howling, and with savage eyes and hair bristling. The man took it and dragged it to the tombstone on which the seat is fixed. And instantly the dog crouched and trembled, quivering and cowed. Here now, 11th of August, 11 o'clock p.m., I am so tired. If it were not that I have made it my duty, I would not open my diary tonight. Lucy at dinner, she in her old self, smiling and lively, and all her color returned. I only wish I knew if Jonathan were as happy. I see. 3 a.m. No sleep now. Too agitated to sleep. Such an adventure. I woke to find Lucy gone. Her bed empty and the door shut but not locked. I threw on my shawl and, fearing to wake her mother, hurried from the bed. Oh, wait, here, here. 
and I got to the top of the steps past the abbey, I saw her. I felt as if weighed with lead, but on the seat, her white figure with something, undoubtedly something long and black crouched over her. I called out. Lucy! I ran across the churchyard towards her. When I was near enough to see her again, she was alone. Her head lying back over the seat. Lucy? Lucy? Here. Yes. Yes. Same day, noon, Lucy slept till I woke her and seemed none the worse for her adventure. Um, I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the brooch I used to hold the shawl to her when I brought her home had caused a hurt to her sweet neck. I must have pinched up a piece of loose skin and have transfixed it. There are two little red points... And on the band of her nightdress, a drop of blood. <laughs> now, now, von Helsing, now. Oh, God, give me strength. Poor Lucy. I often walk to my husband's office at this time. We stroll home together. He needs me to be with him, you see. I want you to know, madame, that my admiration for you is unbounded... Your diary was like sunshine. It opened a gate for me. I am dazed. I am dazzled by it. You will not understand, Madame Mina, but if ever Abraham von Helsing can do anything for you and yours, I trust you will let me know. Your husband has married one of the lights in the world, believe me. My, my husband has been greatly upset again, sir. Oh, that is not good. Not after the events he suffered. It had to do with someone he saw. Huh? In London on Thursday last, he saw someone who recalled something that almost led to his relapse. You say you can and will help me. Yes. Dear God, please tell me what I can do. The pity for Jonathan is that he is afraid. He is so afraid that maybe he is mad. Listen to me. Sit on this wall and listen to me. I am so frightened. Listen. You are to understand that what I am here for is so strange, so a fool, that I cannot burden you with it. But I try to keep my mind open like the book, even to those strange things that make one doubt if they be mad or sane. So. I, I think I understand. <laughs> Your husband, he is lucky and you, and he is not, I think, mad. Why would he think himself so? When he knew you were coming, he said I could tell you of something. Huh? His journal, that he brought from that terrible place, all that happened, is in here. All. Maybe when you read it, you can tell me what you think. I will read it. And then perhaps your husband and I could meet, if I may. Have lunch with us tomorrow before you catch your train to Paddington. <laughs> now... Go to your husband and give him a nice supper and maybe a glass of wine. <laughs> I will go to my hotel and read. Journal of Jonathan Harker. So, to begin Welcome at the to my house, beginning. John Harker. Welcome. Count Dracula? I am Dracula. Damn it. There's a man there in the shadow with a plan. <laughs> Paper, pen. So, yeah, good, yeah, now. <sighs> Madame Mina Harker, what shall I say? I have read your husband's wonderful diary. He is a noble fellow. And let me tell you that to do as he did and go down into that room to find what he found, he is not anything but sane, I promise you. I have learned so much, I cannot know how I am to be thinking you. I am dazzled, dazzled more than ever. I have some work for your husband. I will write more fully. Forgive me lunch, yours, the most faithful, Abraham von Helsing. I get mysteries right again. Lovely lady fights child. 
I get mystery uh, stories boys, today. Boys. Thanks, Gav. I get mystery stories today. Lovely life. Oh, God. Man, hot so soon. So very soon. Cab! Cabby! You were deuced lucky to find me in town. I am neglecting my duty. Then neglect it for a few hours more, my dear friend. You have read the report? I have, yes. Why on earth should it interest you? You want to know who did the deed? Who is the mystery lady in Highgate? It's all a newspaper man's bid to sell newspapers, sure. Oh, no, sir. No. We are going, and I will show you why you should be interested, pupil of mine. Sister, I ask you, please. Dr. Seward, I don't think Matron would... Please, sister. The child is very young. There are newspaper men We demanding. will not tire him, I promise you, sister. Oh, very well. Through the doors and on the left. I'll show you. But be quick. Charles is in the end bed. Thank you, sister. Charlie? Some gentlemen to see you. Hello, Gav. Can I go home to be mum? Hello, Charlie. Here, I brought sweet for you. Mm-hmm. Oh, my. You want to hear about the beautiful lady, do you? Mm-hmm. Charlie, stop telling the tale. He tells the newspaper reporters this silly story. It was a rat. Or a bat, maybe, bit you. See the teeth marks on the neck, Dr. Seward? Mm-hmm. It was a lady. Long blonde hair and a long white robe. And like an angel, mister. No one believes me. Oh, yes, Charlie. Oh, yes. I do. You're in a hurry. I... Uh... I am anxious, my friend. Anxious. Where are we going, sir? Uh, here. Uh, we stop here and walk in here by the gate. A small space. Cemetery? I guess. I won't believe what I am beginning to think you... You oh, no. would never know the truth. Is your nerve failing? Come along, then. The western tomb is to the left. Oh, I know very well where it is. Key. Do we have a key to get into the mausoleum? I took it after the funeral. I thought perhaps... Well, no matter what I thought. See with your own eyes. Hear with your own ears. Believe what you will. Good. So, we go in. Here, hold the candle. So, yes, there, so. Now, I will show you something, my friend. Where is it? Where? Ah, here, so here. A turn screw. Good, hold the candle steady, John. What? What are you doing? To open the lid. This is... This is desecration. This is mercy, my friend. Mercy. Remember how she thanked me for keeping her from her lover. She will thank us all. Good. Now, we lift the lid. So. And with the candle we see, what do we see, my dear friend? No. I don't believe be empty? Oh, yes. It is empty. It is night, my friend, and the coffin can leave. Are you satisfied now? Get me out. Get me out. Let me get out. So, who made the marks on the child, I will tell you. Dear, sweet, lovely angel, the dead Lucy. No. 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 Wait. Wait. When we come next, my friend, you will bring a surgeon's bag with you. If you please, value the peace that dear girl deserved. Now, help me replace the lid and we can leave. Empty. Good God, man, you can't expect us to believe. God damn it, that's nothing to do with our Lucy. Tell the man, Seward, tell him. Quincy, you if you have traveled, have you? In South America, for example. Why, sure I have. Sure. So? Tell us about the bats there, Mr. Morris. Oh, hell, man. 
with their big, big bats, and they come looking for blood, and they hang on to a horse's rump or the cattle in, in the pampas, and they suck and suck and... Sure. You saying this kid was attacked by one of them bats? I'm saying nothing, my American friend, nothing. But Lucy has been absent from her coffin, and we know that. Taken. Taken. It happens. He's been stolen. Are you telling us that the holes in those kids' necks and those in Lucy's neck were made by the same critter? I'm saying much worse than that. In God's name, what? They were made by Miss Lucy. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. No! Arthur, Lucy is undead. There is a duty before us, my friends. Arthur, my dear young friend, it is you we must ask to help first. I cannot believe what I hear. Then you must believe what you see. Take care, sir. Take care. Arthur, wait. I can go on. And you shall know the limit of my purpose, yes? Go on. Miss Lucy is dead, is it not so? Yes. Hmm. Then there can be no wrong to her, but if she be not dead... Good God. Do you mean she may have been buried alive? No. I told you. She is of the undead. The... There are mysteries man can only guess at, which age by age they may solve in part only. We are on the edge of such. What would you do if you found her? I... I cut off the head of dead Miss Lucy. Not for the earth. Oh! Why do you torture me, sweet girl? You should know, Sir Arthur, that I loved that child. Between us, we gave blood and skill and honor, and if my death can do her good, even now she shall have it freely. I want you to come and to see and to decide then. I beg you. Courage, Arthur. John, you brought the things I asked, yes. Now, Arthur, your English upper lip, sir. I have the key. You were all here for the funeral, and you saw the dear child buried. This ain't right. I swear to you, she will bless the things we do for her now. So, John, please be good enough to help me answer. Hold on, my friend. <clears throat> Go through with this. You cannot. You must. Hold up a lantern, Quincy. Are you ready? Lordy, Lord. Now, this is a mystery indeed, sir. There are children which have suffered. Always at night, like now. Only at night the undead can move. And there are things that can hold them back. Garlic, for one. Garlands of garlic. The crucifix. Yes, my boy, yes. Now, I will seal the tomb that the undead may not return. Why? Let her rest in peace. That we shall do if you permit, but first... You shall see her. John, close the coffin and screw down the lid. I will take you back with me. Come along, Arthur. Think he's good enough to help our friend. Is he crazy, John? Or am I? I don't. No. If he isn't, then we owe it to that poor girl to help her. If even half what he says is true, and she is undead. Let's get out. This place stifles me. What are you doing? This wafer is the sacred host. I will close the tomb so that the undead cannot enter. You can lock the door, Professor. Good. John will lock. I will use this wafer, which I brought by special indulgence. Host indulgence? Professor Helsing, surely, as a man of science, you cannot... There are things you know nothing of. Things in this world, out of this world, part of this world. I seal the door with the pieces of wafer. So, and so... And our undead will not be able to return, even though the coming of the dawn will force her. So, now? We wait. 
We wait and watch and are very still. Long. Wait. Listen. Look. Over there. By the trees. You see? It's her. Lucy. What your lives do not move now. This the undead. She has the child still. Stop her. Stop her in God's name. She's bending her face to the child's neck. No. Van Helsing, stop her. She her face. She her mouth in the moonlight. She... Blood. Dear sweet Lucy and blood oozing from her mouth and over the grey clothes. Her lips are crimson and glistening. No. No. Stop her. So uncover the lantern. Now. Now she can see us. She's dropped. God above. Right. Lucy, 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 stay here, sir. Arthur, Arthur, leave them and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together. Come, my husband, come to me. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and in the sight of this crucifix, I forbid you. She can't get in. Look at her. She can't get in. Am I to proceed with my work? Tell me, Arthur, you must tell me, my friend. Am I to proceed? Do as you will, my friend. This opera. Do what you must. Very well. Look to your friend, John. Quincy, see to the child. I shall remove the host from the door so that she may go to her resting place. See? She changes form and shape and... The undead, my dear friend, exist on different levels. She is gone, I assure you. Oh, you are in bitter waters, my child. In the next hour, you will have begun to pass out of them and have drunk of sweet waters. Now, John, come with me and bring with you the tools I asked you to bring. I must see her. If she be there, I must see her. Take the candles and light them from the lantern. Good. Help me take the lid from the coffin. Very well. And don't be afraid of what you see, Arthur. What we do now is from the lore and experience of the ancients. It comes down the ages to us how to deal with the powers of the undead. They are cursed with immortality. They cannot die. And only add to the tally of victims age by age. So the circle widens like ripples in a pond. Arthur, had you met that kiss, you would in time, when you died, have become Nosferatu, as they call it in Eastern Europe. And you too would have made more and more of those undeads that fill us with horror. Those childs, she sucked the blood. They not yet will turn, but if she live on undead, they lose more and more the blood and become in her power. If she die, the tiny wounds on them disappear. And if we do the things we have to do, she will rest with the angels as she should. Amen to that, sir. Amen to that. I've wrapped the child in my coat. She'll be fine. Arthur. Will you strike the first blow, my friend? Set her free. Know that it was your hand that sent her to the stars. The hand of him that loved her best. The hand of him she chose. Will you do it? Tell me and I will do it. I must do it. Though it break my heart, I shall not falter. Just tell me. Brave lad. A moment's courage. It will be done. The stake done. This stake is of holly. It must be driven through. <laughs> it will be fearful for you to be not deceived. Do that as we pray for you, and we can do the rest. Give me the stake. Now, this is not Lucy, but a fiend. The blood on her mouth. The sharp teeth over her lip. The blood trickles even now from the corners. 
she seems almost to smile at it. Uh, where? Where? Her honeymoon? Over her heart, yes. So. And I have now. I have the book. I drew the power. Begin, begin. And when you are done, we take her head from her and her heart from her body and stuff the mouth of the lovely head with garlic. Begin. Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God our sister Richard, and we commit her body to its resting place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord bless her and keep her. The Lord make his face to shine upon her and be gracious unto her. The Lord lift up his countenance upon her and give her peace. In episode 5 of Dracula by Bram Stoker, adapted for radio by Nick McCarty, the cast was as follows. Dr. John Seward was played by Peter Blythe, Van Helsing by Finlay Welsh, Mina by Phyllis Logan, and Arthur by Crawford Logan. Quincy by Paul Burchard, and Lucy by Sharon Maharaj. Sister was played by Alexa Kesselar, and Charlie by Rosemary Evans. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The theme and incidental music was composed and created by Malcolm Clark in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The producer in our Edinburgh studios was Hamish Wilson. We present Dracula. Now that Arthur Homewood and Quincy Morris have been convinced of the existence of the vampire, the friends must find Count Dracula. But how? Dracula. John, you must listen to me. We must do something. We must act. I know. I know what we should do. I know it is important, but after... After what we did with that... That thing... I can see her still writhing and thrashing and foaming blood all over her coffin, and I... Do you think cutting her head from... We both work with people who are damaged in the mind. We know enough, Professor. We know what can happen. I feel sick every time I think of it. I just want to get on with my work. Very well. I will have to hunt down this Count Dracula on my own. Maybe Madame Harker and her so helpful husband will help me. Oh, damn you, sir! <laughs> damn you. Of course I will help you, but don't think I want any part of... I see her still with her mouth at that child's throat. So. So, so, so. A cheerful task for you before I go away. <laughs> ah, yes. I go to Paddington, and you come also. Very well. And Quincy? Oh, still in the country with Arthur. He, too, is not yet recovered. So, we work together again, John. And the esteemed Madame Mina Harker. Dear boy, she will easily be to recognize. I recognize her myself, but I cannot stay. Research is to do. A telegram to send to her husband, the estimable Harker. How on earth, in this crowd, am I supposed to recognize Mrs. Harker? Look for the sweetest face girl you can see, and she it will be. Now, take her to Perthfleet. I'm not sure my asylum is the place for a young lady. God says this is a strong girl. She has heard things and seen the result of such things you have never even dreamed of. So, a few locked-up lunatics will not disturb her sleep. In any case, I told her husband she would be there. Damn it, man, you have achieved... The devil, yes. Ha. You read her papers and the journal of Harker. It's dreadful. Oh, so good. You have them in your mind. Keep them safe until my returning from Amsterdam. I have a person I must talk with before we begin the hunt. So, good morning to you. Kirby. But, Professor, I... Damn the man, but he's infuriating at times. Dr. Steele. Oh. Yes, yes, I am, Doctor. Mrs. Harker? How on earth did you recognize me? I have read your description, sir, in the letters of our dear friend. And we met once, I believe. Though the circumstances gave you eyes only for one person, I am sure. It wasn't Whitby. Ah, oh, yes. Has marriage changed me so much? No, not at all. Come, we ought to go to my home. I believe your husband has been telegraphed? Professor Van Helsing is a determined man, isn't he? 
strange to be riding through these lanes, past Hawthorne and Cornfields, and to have such dark things over us. I pray that it can be beaten. I have every faith in the professor, Mrs. Parker. He said you too kept a record. May I read it as you have read mine? It is not exactly pleasant reading, Mrs. Harker, but of course. Is Mrs. Harker down yet, sir? She is reading. We can wait. I'm late. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Please. Um, we'll have dinner now, Hoskins. Very good, sir. Doctor Seward, I didn't know what to expect when I read you. I was most moved by the distress you suffered, sir. Oh, I'm sorry if what I wrote upset you. I was saddened, sir, because it showed me how much you have grieved. The anguish of your heart, your very soul, is there for all to understand. Well, we have things to do now, and bury our grief in action, eh? Your husband is already working for the professor, checking records, papers, reports. He is going to Whitby to follow some correspondence between his firm and the lawyers acting for the count in some matter. Is he fit enough? We owe it to dear Lucy. We owe it to all the others in danger, to ourselves even, to get some peace. Uh, nothing, sir. Nothing, Mister Acker. The late master kept a very close hand on some matters, sir. This was one of them. These overseas transactions were a mystery to me, sir. Half in French, half in German, a few in good old English. We need to find any papers relating to Count Dracula, Pensniff. Any, any file, any paper, letter, bill, any receipt, any there note. There was one thing, sir. Oh, yeah. here we are, sir. The, the private day book. Good. Let me see. Uh, dates, uh, six months back. Oh, earlier than that. Uh, I remember the first letter I penned, sir, was a year back, September. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mrs. Wilson's emeralds? No. Damn it. Here it is. Property. Oh, there was a deal of property involved. I, I, I think not only through us in Exeter, but others in London, sir, and the North, I believe. I will be taking the train. Mr. Arker, to Whitby. is not an easy matter. Nay, lad, I'm not prying into your business. I had knowledge of your late master and liked what I heard. So, if you say it's a matter of urgency, it is. And Billington, Billington and Hampton are at your service. You're more than generous. I have in my office a box or two of papers, relevant, I believe. I must admit some of the letters are a mite strange. We thought as much in our office, too. Uh, you met him, then, this, uh, Count Dracula person? I met him, yes. Uh, very well, Mr. Arker. Mum's the word, I see. Oh, no, 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 sir, no need between colleagues, of course. Uh, I, I, uh, I see here that the cargo the Count arranged for was billed as 50 cases of common earth to be used for experimental purposes. Fifty cases? Aye, it was a lot, I know. And main heavy they were, too, by all accounts. The ship they came on? Strange business, that. I think you'd best talk to the harbour master, Billy Dawson. You'll find him in the Mariners, on the quayside. And uh, <clears throat> you can tell him Percy Billington sent you on. You've been most generous, Mr. Billington. You seem agitated, sir, about the business. I don't understand why 50 cases of common or garden earth should be cause for agitation. Nor would it be, sir, if that were all that was in those cases. As lashed to the wheel, Mr. Arker. And his face, I swear. What? I never do have to see such a face again on any man, alive or dead. He looked to have seen the bottom of hell. And the, uh, and the cases? Uh, released to customs and excises, they should be, and gone on their way. Not sorry, neither. O on their way? Ask Johnny Griggs at the station. Station master should know what goes through his place, I would think. <laughs> now, you said something about a pint. I did, and so you shall. A pint of best over here, if you please. Cases come to my notice when the carter brung them down. Where were they bound? 
Well, I noticed it because the porters grumbled so as they shifted them. I thought then they'll need to pay a price to shift him on, London. He can't a Patterson for most. They'll know where they went after that. I'm glad to be shut of them, that's the truth. After they was all stacked in the wagon, one of the men said, Rum do all that. Rum do. Shot a chill in the air. You could ask in London office of Carter Patterson, sir. I have a telegram from Jonathan Harker. Oh, what's oh. the news? Is he coming to join us? I know someone would be a mite glad to see him. After he's done a little more investigation. Oh, it seems, Mina, that your husband fancies himself as Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he would join us, gentlemen. I feel... well, I do miss him. Ma'am, of course you miss him. A new husband. Sure, we understand. He won't be long away, will he, John? It seems not. He has some news. Tell us. If you please, John. Yeah, do tell. I will read it. I saw one of the men who brought the cases on. I am satisfied. I am satisfied it is all of them. They were brought... Oh, wait, uh, what did the man say? Uh, honest, Gov, the house was rum, all right. Ain't been touched in a hundred years. Dust so thick you might have slept in it and not hurt your bones none. You might have smelled old Jerusalem in it. The old chapel. Took the cake, took the cake. A chapel? Yes, a chapel, where, you may ask. Well, tell us. In the house beyond the wall of this asylum. There, we are neighbours. Do you have all the papers, Mina? More reading is not exactly my style, you know. I have made copies for all of you, and Professor Van Helsing begged you all to take the time to read them so that you were all aware of the situation. <sighs> Even the American man of action, he said. <laughs> what a lucky fellow her husband is. I think we had best begin our task, Quincy. Before the good professor arrives. When are we going to take a look-see at the house next door? I mean, if we know there were boxes brought from the ship, we should take a look at least. Surely. John said he'd look into that, so I think we may have some, what would you call it, action this evening. I never was one to sit and read when the action began. So, let's get to this. My God. What have we got here? What do we have here? Welcome to my house. Horrors, my Arthur. friend. Welcome. Count Dracula? I am Dracula. Oh, please! Damn it. There's a man there in the shadow with a bag. Oh, please! This is filth indeed. Vile stuff. Vile. Read on. Read it all. We must know it all, my friend. Mrs. Harker, are you happy to be here? I am happy to be with the friends of dear Lucy, yes. I shall be happier when my husband joins me. Ah, yes. But this garden is a peaceful place. Yes. Those patients we permit some liberty love it. I should think the calm of it good for their poor minds. I had a favour to ask you. Ask it? I wanted to see your patient, Mr. Renfield. When I was copying your diary, the entries about him interested me so much. May I? I have to warn you, he is not used to ladies, Mrs. Harker. I am not used to lunatics, Dr. Seward. Very well. Shall we go to him now? Renfield? Mm hmm? Renfield, a lady would like to see you. A friend of mine, Mrs. Harker. Why? <laughs> well, she is in the house and wants to see everyone in it. Oh, very well. Let her come in. Let the lady come in. Mina, be careful. He will see you, but if you feel for a moment uneasy, get to the door, and I will make sure you can get out. Now, don't be afraid. I am not afraid, John. Not at all. Come. Good evening, Mr. Renfield. You see? I know you. Dr. Seward has told me of you. You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? You can't be, you know. For she's dead. I... She was a dear friend of mine, Mr. Renfield. Then I am sorry for you. And for the doctor, of course. They say he'd make a good husband. I'm sure he would. 
I have a husband of my own. Then what are you doing here? My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward. Don't stay. But why ever not? Renfield, how did you know I wanted to marry? What an asinine question. I don't see that at all, Mr. Renfield. You will, of course, understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is loved and honoured, uh, as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest to our little community. Yes, of course. He's loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, who, being some of them hardly in mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I have been myself... The inhabitant of a lunatic asylum, I cannot but notice that the sophistic tendencies of some of its inmates lean towards the error of non causa and ignoratio elenchi. Professor Van Elsie, uh-huh. you're expected, sir. I am aware of it, my friend. Uh, Dr. Stewart is at home. Him and the others and the lady. Ah, so. I can find my way up to the house. I thank you. Good night, sir. He'll tell you I used to fancy that life was a perpetual and positive entity, and that by consuming a multitude of live things, one might infinitely prolong life. He will tell you I even tried to take a human life. No, I cannot believe that. You must. The doctor here was the man. I believed I could strengthen my vital powers by the assimilation of his blood. For the blood is the life. True, doctor? True, but Mrs. Harker may be upset. Mrs. By Harker should hear me. She should. I have heard you, Mr. Renfield, with great interest, sir. I hope I may see you often, under auspices pleasanter to yourself. Well then, goodbye, my dear. I pray God I may never see your sweet face again. May He bless you and keep you. We are fortunate gentlemen to have among us a lady of such talents. Madame Mina is not only to act as our secretary and to write out the records of our proceeding as she has. Uh, you have read them all? Yes. yes, 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 yes. Good. Mr. Harker, you did famous work in finding the route taken by those cargoes from yeah, the yeah. cloud. We are all pledged to destroy the evil they bring with them. Absolutely. Uh, this is no part for a woman. No. Oh. No, Mina, my dear child, even if not harmed... A heart may fail in so much and so many horrors. Mm. I know what these dangers are, sir. I wrote the records, copied the diaries, heard my dear husband. My shame. Oh, no, my dear, no shame. No shame indeed. I would not expose you, Mina, dear girl, to any further dangers. And tomorrow I must ask that you take no more part in the matter. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. So, final act for you. Make record of this meeting, if you please. Not more jawing, man. Let's be doing something. We know the house next door is empty, apart from this cargo of crates of earth. So, let's go (laughs) look-see. Always the American way, eh? Jump with the feet open and eyes shut, as you say. (laughs) Let me tell you something. Vampires do exist. Even had we not proofs from our own experiences, the teaching of the past tell us so. I could never believe until the proofs were as thunder in my ears. Alas, they do not die once they sting, but sting and grow more and more powered. A vampire is strong as twenty men, cunning more than mortal, for it grows by ages. He has the power of necromancy and is a devil without a heart. He may direct the elements, storm and fog and wind, and can command rats and owl and bat. He can grow... And become small. Sometimes he vanish and come unknown. It is a terrible task we undertake. Uh, we have to destroy them. We must. Yes, sure. We must. If it exists, we can destroy it. If we fail, then our fate is to be as him. Foul things in the night, a blot on the face of God's sunshine. I'm old, and those days of sunshine and roses are behind me. They are to come for you yet. If we fail, remember, we will be as dear Lucy was, with no dear friend to release us. I am with you, Professor Van Helsing. Mina and I are both with you, sir. Count me in. Let's get to it. I'm with you, of course. For dear Lucy's sake. Can we count on me? Good. Good. He lives on blood. He cannot die by the passing of time. 
They can grow younger if they blood be young. He throw no shadow and has no reflection. A wolf he may be, or a bat, as you saw him, Madame Mina. Yes. He can come on moon rays like dust and reassemble himself as whole man as he likes. He can see in the dark. Does he have anything going against him? <laughs> as far as I understand the question, yes. He may not enter anywhere unless someone of the household beat him. Mm. Then he may come and go as he please. He can only cross running water at slack or full of the tide. There is a legend in Hun literature and Slav also that say he hate garlic and also the crucifix. Oh, yes. A branch of wild rose on his coffin may keep him there. A stake through him and the head cut oh, off. Oh, no, no. No, to cut off the head will give him peace. So, we find... We destroy. Yes. This one, this one we hunt, is from the researches I have done and through my friend Arminius of Budapest, is Voivode Dracula. Say, come on, get to it, please. Uh, to point, yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. We trace each box mm -hmm. and then deal with each, each and every one. Yeah. So, this night we can begin. Yes. Madame Mina, please, now, you have done enough when you have written up the report of this meeting. By tomorrow, much may have been achieved. So, we will wish you good night. Good night, Mrs. Harper. Good night, Mrs. Don't be afraid for us, my dear. So like men to assume I can just go to my bed and sleep while you all... Oh, very well. Dear Jonathan, take care and know I love you. Good night. Excuse me, gentlemen. Yes? Sir, Dr. Seward, I have a message for you, sir. We are very busy at the moment, uh, Adams. Renfield asked me, begged me to ask for two minutes of your time, sir. He is very insistent, sir. Upset, it seems. Uh, you must go to him, John, of course. I'd like to come along and see the man again. I've read so much about yes, it. Too, too. Yes, mm. very well. Um, we shall come to him. Uh, warn him that some friends of mine wish to... Yes, sir. I come with friends, Mr. Renfield. Dr. Seward. Gentlemen, I'm honoured. Uh, you must forgive the circumstances. Uh, Lord Gottleming, I believe. Indeed I am, sir. I had the honour of seconding your father for the Wyndham. A much-loved and honoured gentleman. I grieve with you at his death. You remember Quincy Morris? How do you do, sir? Mr. Morris, you should be proud of your state, sir. Its reception into the Union will do honour to both. John, I thought... You thought me mad. I am... From time to time. I, I have to beg you, Dr. Seward, to let me free. Please, to let me go free from here now, tonight. Instantly away from here. I'm afraid I cannot do that. You must. You must do it. You, you have to do it. I beg you. Let me go free. I will do anything for you, but I must not stay here in this house. You are quite safe here, Renfield. Perfectly safe. I may be safe in your eyes. Others may not. I know... I, I know things. I have seen things, promised things. Time presses. The moment of our death is closer and closer, and I would die. And please, please let me. No? No, sir. Impossible. I cannot tell you my reasons, but be assured they are noble, honorable, good, and unselfish. If you but let me go... You would count on me as one of your friends, if you but knew why. Tell me the reason. Tell me the true reason, and I undertake Dr. Stewart will let you go. Professor, I... I have nothing to say. I'm not my own master in the matter. If I am refused, then the end of my responsibility lies there. Come, my friends, I'm sorry, Winfield. I entreat you... Send me keepers with whips, chains, manacle me, straight jacket me, bind me with iron. By all you hold sacred, I beg you from the depths of my soul. By all you hold dear, by all you love, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. I am sane. I'm no lunatic in a mad fit. I'm a sane man fighting for his very soul. Let me go. Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! Then do me the justice to remember I did try to convince you tonight! Pastor. 
Master. 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 I am coming. Oh, Jonathan. Dear Jonathan. Oh, love you. Now we go forward together. No separate things. Damn if I'd like to go off alone. It has the feel of the tomb about it. Indeed, it is just so. A tomb. A temporary resting place. Now come, keep the crucifix I gave each of you about your neck and the flowers of garlic, however they smelled. Keep them close and keep within the light of the lantern. Say, Professor, I see you got a life preserver and a good old coat. I have the gun for other dangers, should there be any. It will not stop the undead. Are we ready? Yes. So, you have the plan of the building, John? Yes, and I know the general shape of the house. It's filthy, and uh, and no footprints in the dust. So, no one has been here for a long time. Sherlock Holmes, indeed. John, <laughs> lead us to the chapel. Rats. Yeah. God, how I hate rats. I remember once, down the Orinoco... Shh, here. This nailed door, the chapel door. Now... We open and go inside, and there we shall see. Good Lord above! Did you ever see so many, so, so big, like, like cats? I once saw a pack of these tear down a full-grown bullet with bones in five minutes flat. We must, we above all, we must count the boxes left here. So, hurry, hurry! Here, they're here. This, the smell reminds me. I don't want to get any closer. I can't. Easy now, Harker. Easy, my boy. How can I stay here with our so brave friend? Jonathan Harker, my boy. Sorry. Scared, scared silly. <laughs> Bit of a coward, as I told you. Oh, no, sir. As brave a man as I know to come here. You have seen what you have seen and have, but oh, no. A brave man. Hurry! These, these rats are multiplying. Look at them. Waves of them. Come back, friends. Let's get out of this stench and field. Hurry now. Hurry. Shut the door. The door! In those rats, you see something of the power of the undead. Now, how many boxes are left? I counted 12 down the west side. Only seven up the aisle. John? 10 in the side chapel. It's 29 out of 50. So... We have inquiries to make, Jonathan Harker, from your friends, the Carters and the London solicitors. We must hunt down the rest. We must. So, come home to rest. Lord Harker, please. Master. Master, please. Come, come to the window. Yes. Yes, eyes, red eyes in the dark mist. Show me, show me like you used to show me. Send me flies to eat and birds, blood. Show me. Oh, oh yes, rats, thousands, thousands of lives, and cats too, and and. I like pale people. People with blood in them. Blood and life in each of them. Promise me, Master. If I let you into me, promise me. Yes. Come. Come in. Come in, Lord and Master. No. No, no! Stay! Stay here! Master! Stay! Not her! No! You promised! Her sweet blood. Her no! Sweet. I must stop you! Master! You begged me to come in, my friends. Now I may have whatever I want here. Your neck, your blood, or oh, that white neck. 
Her sweet breath, the pulsing blood at her throat. Mine, Madame Mina. Mine. In episode six of Dracula, written by Bram Stoker and adapted for radio by Nick McCarty, the cast was as follows. Van Helsing was played by Finlay Welsh, Dr. Seawood by Peter Blythe, Mina by Phyllis Logan, and Jonathan Harker by Bernard Holly. Pensniff was played by John Shedden, Billington by Raymond Ross, Old Billy by Ronnie Aitken, and Quincy by Paul Burchard. Arthur Homewood was played by Crawford Logan, Renfield by David McHale, and Adams by Tom Smith. With a guest star appearance by Frederick Yeager as Count Dracula. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The theme and incidental music was composed and created by Malcolm Clark in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The producer in our Edinburgh studios was Hamish Wilson. We present Dracula. In John Seward's asylum, Renfield has been attacked and badly injured. But who was the intruder, and where is he now? Dracula. Careful, careful. Don't you think I don't know? Careful, brother. We have to relieve the pressure on this poor brain. This ruined man. Now... A little more to drill by the gear, and maybe... Uh, uh, the master was here. Broke me. Broke me. Easy now, Redfield. Easy, old chap. Ah, Dr. Seward. That's... Mr. Renfield... Van Helsing, ja, gute, ich will schlafen gut. <laughs> Water. Here, a little brandy, my friend. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Quincy. I have something to tell before my poor crushed brain goes out. He came in a mist. He was laughing with his red mouth at the window. Don't talk anymore. His Rest. sharp white teeth glinting in the moonlight. He offered me rats, millions of rats, and each a life, and each more life for me. I saw the small red eyes of those millions of lives, and he offered them to me if I would worship him. I opened the sash and called him in, Master, Lord, and he came in as the moon often passed through the smallest crack. Then he came whenever he wanted, and never asked again. And then Mrs. Harker came and gave me tea. Oh, oh. I don't care for pale people. And she looked pale. He'd been taking the life out of her. I resolved to stop him. I'm mad. And the mad of the strength of ten, I'm told. Nina. I held him. And he flung me down. And there's a red cloud before me. And noise like thunder and... He broke me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jonathan? Jonathan? Mm. Mm. Wake up. Mm. Jonathan, wake What's the matter? What's that mist? No. No? Sound from you and I will dash your heart 
husband's brains out before your eyes. <laughs> you will provide me with more refreshment. No, please, no. Oh, touch me. It's not the first time your veins have slaked my thirst. Oh. Quiet. Lean back a little. Oh. So. Yes. Oh. Oh. So. Oh. <sighs> Good. Very good. You and others will pit your brains against mine, but you, their best beloved, are now flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, and later you shall be my companion. When I say come, you will come to me in your mind, across sea or mountain. And to ensure it, you shall taste my blood. Oh, don't, don't tear your own flesh. No, no. There, there's oh, blood from oh, my veins. Oh, oh, Suck. Oh, Suck. Oh, 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 oh. Professor Van Helsing, those eyes, those red eyes, dear God. One day, one day, Professor. Gone. She, that vapor through the open window. Gone. Get water. Wash your face. There's blood on her mouth. How is she? They shocked Arthur, but persuaded to come and take breakfast. She need to feed the inner man. <laughs> Woman's maybe I'm meaning, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, Jonathan needs as much comfort as she. He feels guilty, I think. Yes. So, breakfast, and then we plan, eh? We have little time. Ah, good morning again, my dear girl. Good morning, morning. Jonathan. Morning. Jonathan, come, morning. come, morning. sit. Would you be kind enough to pour the teas? Uh, yes. Of course. My dear, maybe you should have stayed in your room. No, 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 no. Under no circumstances. She is with friends. Nina, my dear, pour the tea. I feel unclean. You all may have cause to fear me. He made me... made me... Nina, you are our friend. Now, please. Sugar, Mr. Morris. Ma'am. I salute your courage. You were too kind. Madame Mina, you are not afraid for yourself, but for others from yourself, yes? No, sir. My mind is quite made up. To what? If I find in myself, and I shall watch keenly for it, any signs that I would harm any that I love, I shall die. You would not kill yourself. If there were no friend who loved me, who would save me the pain, yes. Mina. My child, there is such a one for you, but you must not die, not by any hand, but least of all by your own, for that is the way to the undead. To protect you, I have this. It is the host. It serves to protect in daylight. Will you allow me, Mina? Yes, yes. I place it on your forehead uh, in the name uh, of the Father and uh, of the Son uh, and of the Holy Spirit. Get it off, get it off. Oh, my sweet, sweet Mina. Oh, Even the Almighty shuns me. How oh, it hurts me. You may wear that scar till the day of judgment, but it shall be washed away then, for God will know what you are, Mina. We promise to release you from it and from that evil. So... We begin in Piccadilly. Arthur, time to do your act, my friend. Hello there. What's this, then? A breaking and a entering in broad daylight? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stupidly locked myself out. Ha! Deuce of a job fighting the locksmith. I know him, sir. Good man. Trustworthy. You can't be too careful, sir. <laughs> yeah. There we go, sir. Thank you. Indeed. Oh, thank you, sir. Really nice of you. Right, old boy. Sorry to keep you waiting on the step like this. <laughs> the old man would say. <laughs> Thank you, Constable. Very good, sir. Quite the fist, Bernard. I take my hat off. Enter, gentlemen. As I thought. The 
the smell is the same. We have little time. We search, we find what we find, and close them to him. I'll go upstairs. And you have the crucifix. You don't think he's here yet? At all times, my friend. Take it at all times. Harker and I will do this floor. Call if you find anything. Professor! Down here! I come. Yeah, good, good. Nothing upstairs. So, eight boxes here to deal with. Undo as before. I put in small piece of holy wafer on the earth bed inside each box. And so, no home for Dracula is available here. Good, my friend. Look, leases on three London properties. Ah, good man. Anything else? <laughs> Keys, damn it. In this bag. Keys. We have him. Quincy and I will go to these properties and search out any more boxes. And we wait here for the count. And I will wipe him off the face of creation with this kukri. I will take his head off. My dear boy, evil is not wiped out by evil. The vampire cannot change to sunset. Arthur, Quincy, you go do what you have to. We wait. I'll go. Be careful now. Be careful. Damn it! Six boxes in each place, each one destroyed for the vampire. Hermansy and Hackney, they were disgusting places. Still, it's done. Shh. Be quiet. Shh. Eight. Oh, oh. Dracula! He's mine! Mine! You think I have no place to rest? I have just been. We burn everything that may be of use here, and then we go back to Madame Mina and plan again. We know from the list of the shipper he has one more earth box, so he must go to it. And then we must find him. So. Hypnotize you. Yes, of course I can, my dear lady. Of course, but why? He said, he said I would go to him if I... Yes. I, yes, quite so. He is not about me now. I feel free of him. I wonder, though, if I can still go to him. Find him in my mind, my innermost mind. Oh, my dear Madame Mina, but you are a wonder. You are a miracle. Harker, what do you have for a wife but a miracle, yeah? <laughs> can you do it, man? Huh? You ask the Professor von Helsing hypnotize, eh? You ask if the moon follow the sun. Yeah, here, now. We do it now. Sit, relax, close your mind to everything but this watch in this hand. Very well, Professor. How will you begin? You will go to sleep when I count to five. You will hear me and answer me, and when I count backwards from five, you wake and not remember nothing at all. I count slowly now. One, two, three, four, five, and you sleep. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I want you to go deep into your mind. Deep, deep, deep. I want you to find... She's quiet. The... quiet. You are deep asleep. What do you see? It is dark. All dark. I hear... I hear water. Water and... Gurgling. Little waves slapping, slapping. Outside, I hear men stamping overhead. Yes. Yes, a chain and a clanking rattling, straining sound. What are you doing? I am sleeping. It is so still. Like death. Enough. Five, death. four, like three, two, death. one. You can wake now. Safe. Very well, Professor. How, how will you... Oh, oh. I'm sorry, have I spoiled it? <laughs> no, you were excellent. <laughs> <laughs> there is not a moment to lose. 
He is on the ship. We know that much. And it is weighing anchor. How can we know which ship? Lloyd's. I beg your pardon? Lloyd's. They register the movements of every ship in the port of London and where it goes and when. We can find which ship weighed anchor at... at what time is it? 9.15 exactly. Magnificent! He think he escaped, but we follow. Tell ho Go, get on your red frock, Lord Arthur, <laughs> and find the news from Lloyd's. Our fox is wily, but we... We can find him, and find him we must. But why, if he's leaving? <sighs> he can live for centuries, Madame Mina, and you are only mortal. He called you soon. Time is now to be dreaded since he puts that oh. mark on your throat. No, oh, no. Hurry, Professor. Nearly missed a train. Uh, I have some things to get. Also, a parcel for Mr. Morris. Hurry up! We're off! Uh, uh, Oh, yes. Quincy. No. Nothing like cutting it fine, gentlemen. On your account, it seems. Uh, not entirely. Uh, some bullets, Mr. Morris, for your excellent rifles. Thanks. And also the latest edition of Lloyd's shipping list. Uh, the ship we want to... Uh... The Tsarina Catherine. I talked to the agent before coming to the station, and he said there was a gentleman came with a box to be loaded. A heavy box. It is on the boat for sure. And if the box is, then Count Dracula is yes. too. We make progress, you see. And from the list, we see where it should come into port. Here. Serena Katerina, yeah. Calling at, uh, well, well, nowhere until Varna. I want to say something important. Mm. If... If I can go into his place, if I can see with my innermost mind where he is, as soon as we get closer, he may begin to use me to try to find what our plans may be. I ask you to tell me nothing. Madame, as always, we are in your debt. You have such clear sightings. And also, I have to ask what each of you will give, not your lives. I know you would do that to remove this scar from me. I know that. But will you give me this? Promise me, one by one, even you, my darling husband, that should the time come, you will kill me. Oh, oh, please. Please. Oh, what, what is that time? When you shall be convinced that I am so changed that it is better that I die. And then, when dead, cut off my head and drive a stake through me oh, and give me rest. Ma'am, I swear by all I hold dear and good, that should that time ever come, I shall not flinch from my duty laid on me by you. I promise that I shall make your rest certain. My dear friend. I swear it. I too swear it. Yes, I swear. Must I? Must I, my dear Mina? You too, my dearest, yes. We are one for all time, you and I. Remember the mercy Dr. Van Helsing showed in Lucy's case. Show it to me. I swear I shall do it. And now, please, read the service for the burial of the dead, that it may be done for me. In the midst of life, we are in death. Of whom may we seek for succor but of the evil? Now there you go, Lourdes. Sarge! Hold up here! In hot tunnel! Varna! 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 Oh, damn it, agent. Where's his office? He promptly said. <sighs> How do you think Mina's bearing him? Get out of the way, damn your eyes. I'm afraid for her. She is very quiet, not her usual self. Helsing is worried. Over there. Look, oh. that's the name. Ah, oh, these people stink. Come on, man. The Tsarina is coming, sure, but now is changed her mind. Not coming to Varna. But she is scheduled to... Uh, this is a tramp ship. Goes where the cargo is. <sighs> I tell him I have cargo waiting alongside his berth. He says, not calling Varna. Going to Galatz, he said. This is Varna, my friend. Fog. I see Fog. And I hear the sea very soft, very quiet, lapping, close inshore. 
now, nothing. Nothing. I'm very worried, my boy. Mina has been lethargic for three days now and gives nothing in the trance. No. Fog, she said. Ship close in. Just where? How close and where? She is being used, my friend. I am very much afraid for her. See her teeth? Huh? See, look. Nothing unusual? I watch and look every day. If they change, if they grow sharp, then we know our duty to her. At present, the Count does not want her. He is sure she will come when he call. We must find the ship. So, five, four, three, two, one. Awake now, Madame Mina. Was it the same? It was good. And when we get to Galatz, what then? How do we find the ship? Oh, the captain, according to Lloyd's list, is a Scot, it seems. Yeah. If a man with half a throat torn out is dead, then he's dead as mutton. Found in the local kirkyard, with not a drop of blood in his body, so it's... And the box. What that if a damn for that box? Delivered, passage paid, and I'm free and away from this god benighted place as soon as I can get up steam. Sure you don't fancy a drive. Oh, Good job. Yeah. He get the box away. He killed the only man knowing where he might take himself. Look, here, here, the mouth of the river. Madame Mina heard it, you see, the river, the oars, gypsies, no doubt, taking him home. But you say he hates water. Yeah, so? What you do if you're running? You want to reach safety, you go the way least expected. Of course. The pirate go by river, mm -hmm. going full speed for his castle, his refuge. Then yeah. all we have to do is get there before him. Yeah. We split up the party. I'm not so sure about uh, that. Lord Arthur, did mm -hmm. you purchase that launch? Oh, it's a beauty. River launch, steam, built in Glasgow. Uh, yes, I got her. Good. What is going on? We uh, go differing ways. I go with Madame Mina by coach. Uh, Mr. Morris, can you ride? You want me to buy horses? Yeah. Reckon it done. John. Yes. You go with Mr. Morris and Harker, upriver. If he does leave the river, telegraph to the towns along my route. Mm -hmm. So we take... The trail up the bank of the river. Seret, as far as uh -huh. the town of Funtu. And then the river is joined by uh, a country. Ah, uh, the Bistritza. Mm -hmm. And see the loop here? Mm -hmm. The Borgo Pass. And there, there is Castle Dracula. Had one of these on Windermere. My father was crazy about steam. Wonderful! Hey! <laughs> I say, old boy, I'm sorry. Worried about the dear girl. She's safe with Van Helsing. I was thinking back to the beginning. I have never, ever been so afraid and so alone. Yes. Well, we'll get him. We will. Stop, Quincy. Horses are good for another hour. How do you reckon Mina is bearing up? Van Helsing is desperately afraid. She is nearly out of our hands. Mina, are you asleep? No. I am afraid. We travel closer by the minute to that hellish place. I've read my dear husband's journal. I know what I might be. Part of that place where every speck of dust that whirls in the wind is a devouring monster in embryo. Have you felt the vampire's lips upon your throat? I am afraid. I wish we had not come. Did they tell you anything? Not a great deal. One of the younger men said something about a big flat boat coming up very fast oh. with a heavy cargo. Oh, can we get any more speed out of this damn launch? Not against the stream like this. If he's coming off the river, we're close to the gorge of Bistritza. And that's where Van Helsing thought he'd head. I told Arthur we'd meet just below the gorge. See, Professor, the snow. Don't think yet. Are you warm enough? I'm buried in furs. I'm warm and I'm sleepy. I want to sleep all the time. I know. Is it wrong? Who oh, no. knows? Does it mean... We must get on faster. We're close. We are close. How do you know? I know. I just know. You hear it? Yes, I hear it. We will meet on this road with the others. As planned. You see them? A dozen gypsies and a guard. And 
The box. See? Lifted off the boat and onto the ox cart. What say we take them now? Two against twelve? No. We find Helsing and take them in ambush, as planned. You must eat, Mina. Please eat. I'm not hungry. What are you doing? I am drawing a ring round us, and over it, I crumble the holy wafer, and we are protected. So, and so. You are guarded. Oh, it's cold. So cold. What's that? I'll see to the horse. No, no, wait. Don't go outside the circle. Don't. It's all right, Mina. It's for your safety, not mine. <laughs> I am safer than you. I am safer than anyone from them. See them. What? That the mist. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh. The saints of Jesus save us. Yes. Come, sister. Come. Come to us, my boy. You'll be with us soon. So white, so pale. It's over. They've gone. Mina, oh my dear child. They were here. It was not a dream. They were the same that Jonathan saw. Yes. And today... I have to go to the castle and do for them what we did for poor Lucy. You won't leave me. You are safe in this ring and in daylight. Listen. John Stewart and the good Quincy Morris. Welcome, gentlemen. Come, 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 warm yourselves. Did you see anything? The box. And a dozen or more gypsies about two hours behind us. Quincy... He must not get to the castle. I have my bowie knife, sir. I'll take his heart out. Here they are. See? Shooting sitting birds. Mm -hmm. Where the devil are the other two? Hold on. Oh, see? Through the trees? Back a bit. To the right. There. Yes, you're right. Harker and Arthur. Jonathan! You must keep your head down, ma'am. This is going to be ugly work. We must give the gypsies a chance. Or a shot over their heads. Uh -huh. Fine by me, you said. Yes. Come down with the rocks. down here. They're ripping up the horses. They're making a run for the castle. Stop them. Sure will. It's out of control. Oh, my. You can look at that. It's over. The box is burst open. I'll get his heart. No, Quincy. No, Quincy. I'm coming with you, Quincy. Arthur, cover me. Right on, boy. Go. Come on, you. I'll take you. Behind you, Quincy. I got him. I think, I think he got me, Jonathan. I'm going to give me that drop if I have to crawl to hell and back. Cover us! Turn him over. See? See? The blood's still running from his mouth. See? Dear God! Filthy, filthy! The kill! Get in for the kill! Oh, no! Oh, he never did a better job than this! And this! He's gone. Look at that. Gone to dust. Hush. Please. Quincy, you dear man. You are hurt. No, ma'am. Not hurt. Dying. Ask the doctors. They'll tell you Quincy Morris just cashed in. Oh, no. No, please, no. Oh, only too glad to have been of service, ma'am. It was worth this to die. Look, my friends. Look on her face, her dear face. There is no scar. No scar on that sweet forehead. It's gone. And left. Purity. Ah, it is done. In the seventh and final episode of Dracula... The cast was as follows. Mina was played by Phyllis Logan, Dr. John Seward by Peter Blythe, Van Helsing by Finlay Welsh, and Renfield by David McHale. 
Quincy Morris was played by Paul Burchard, Arthur Homewood by Crawford Logan, Jonathan Harker by Bernard Holly, The Locksmith was played by Michael Elder, The Agent by Andrew Conlon, and the three vampire women were played by Wendy Seeger, Monica Gibb, and Amanda Whitehead, with a guest star appearance by Frederick Yeager as Count Dracula. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The theme and incidental music was composed and created by Malcolm Clark in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Technical presentation was by Jim Ross, Lee McPhail and Christopher Lampton. Dracula was written by Bram Stoker, adapted for radio by Nick McCarty and produced in our Edinburgh studios by Hamish Wilson. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight... We escape to a lonely lighthouse off the steaming jungle coast of French Guiana and a nightmare world of terror and violence as we bring you again in response to hundreds of requests Three Skeleton Key, starring Vincent Price. <laughs> Picture this place. A gray tapering cylinder welded by iron rods and concrete to the key itself. A bare black rock, 150 feet long, maybe 40 wide. That's at low tide. At high tide, just the lighthouse rising 110 feet straight up out of the ocean. And all about it, the churning water. Gray, green, scum dappled, warm as soup. And swarming with gigantic bat-like devilfish. Great violet schools of Portuguese man-o'-war. And yes, sharks, the big ones, the 15-footers. And as if this weren't enough, there was a hot, dank, rotten-smelling wind that came at us day and night off the jungle swamps of the mainland. A wind that smelled like death. A wind that had smelled the slow and frightful death that came one night to this bare black rock. Set in the base of the light was a watertight bronze door. And in you went. And up. Yes, up and up and round and round, past the tanks of oil and the coils of rope, casks of wicks, racks of lanterns, sacks of spuds and cartons and cans, and up. And up and up, round and round. Over the light storeroom was the food storeroom, and over the food storeroom was the bunk room where the three of us slept. And over the bunk room was the living and cooking room, and over the living and cooking room was the light. She was a beauty, big steel and bronze baby with the sun gleaming through the glass walls all about, bouncing blinding little beams off the big shining reflectors, glittering and refracting through her lenses, the whole gigantic bulk of her balanced like a ballerina on the glistening steel axle of her rotary mechanism. She was a sweetheart of a light. And at night she'd lie there on the stone deck of the gallery with her revolving smoothly and quietly over your head, easing her bright white eye 360 degrees around the horizon. You'd lie there watching to see that the feeders kept working, that everything ran right. And it wouldn't be bad, the other two fellows snoring in their sacks two levels down. You'd smoke your pipe to kill the stink of the wind, and it wouldn't be bad. About those other two, Louis and Auguste, what a pair. Louis, he was head man, was a big fellow from the Basque country. Black beard, little hard black eyes, and a pair of arms that I tell you those arms were as big around as my legs. Yes, head man he was, and what word he let go was law. 
a silent fellow, and although I spent my first two weeks trying to strike up a real conversation, the most I could ever get out of him was... Jean, I took up this profession because I don't like people. They want to talk too much. It's quiet work, light tending. Let's keep it that way. You, you're getting to be as bad as August. I thought maybe for once they send me somebody... Who that was Louis. And when he accused me of becoming like August, I quieted down, because August was the talkingest man I'd ever met. The talkingest and the ugliest. He was hunchback, stood four feet high, had red hair and big blue eyes. It seems he'd been an actor in Paris. Yes, indeed. Played in over 200 different productions, dear boy, at the Grand Guignol. Oh, but it was monstrous horrible, the way we used to scare the audiences. I was hated. Yes, yes, they used to throw things and hiss and bare their teeth at me. Finally, it got too bad. I couldn't stand it any longer. I gave up the theater. My nerves, you understand. Yes, gave it up completely. I really did. Couldn't stand it any longer. It all started one morning at 2.30. I was on watch, lying on the cool stone deck, pulling on my pipe, staring out at the blackness, the phosphorescent combers, and the big yellow stars, when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something show up for a second, something the light had touched far off. I waited for her to come around again, and when she did, there it was. Green Master, a big one, about a half mile off and coming down out of the north-northwest, coming straight for us. You must understand, our light was where it was for a very good reason. Dangerous submerged reefs surrounded us and ships kept clear. But this one, this sailing vessel, was coming straight on. I went over to the gallery door and yelled, Louie! Louie! Couldn't understand it. I waited for the light to come around again. Why is that? Ship headed for the reef. Are you right up? I had the glasses out now. I couldn't read her name, but I could see her quite plainly. All sails set, the foam creaming away under her bow, her beautiful lines. A Dutch ship, I guessed her. But why didn't she turn? Every time it passed, our light hit her with the glare of day. Ship? Where? North, northwest. The light will touch her in a moment. Can't they see? Look at her. She just keeps coming on. Yeah, the square head. What is it? What is it? Watch north, northwest. I know. I know what it is. Huh? What? The Dutchman, the flying Dutchman. We did a play about her once. Oh, what a performance. You ghastly, gallian, hag-ridden, curse-driven, must on... Shut and... up, will you? She's loving. Yes. Sloppy way to come about. She's derelict, that's it. Derelict? Abandoned. The crew left her for some reason or other. But instead of sinking, she's gone on, running before every wind. She'll not run long. Not with these reefs to break her up. A beautiful ship. Now, why would men leave a beautiful ship like that? She didn't ram us, although we all expected it. But as we waited for the crash, she luffed again, caught some odd gust, and went about. We watched her the rest of those black hours, heeling and rocking, pushed and pulled by every stray wind, every freak current. Watched her until the dawn came, till the sea turned from black to a pearly gray. And on she came again, heading for us. We all had our glasses trained on her now. August. You can kill the light. Right, Chief? She doesn't look so good by daylight. Think she'll ground this time? What? I say, do you think she'll ground this time? Huh? This is impossible. Absolutely impossible. What? Here. Take my glasses. They're better than yours. All right. What is it you... I had to focus and then my breath froze in my throat. The decks were swarming with a dark brown carpet that looked like a gigantic fungus, but undulating. And on the masts and yards, the guys and all were hundreds, no thousands, no... I don't know, an endless number of enormous rats. See them? Yes, I see them. 
Now we know why she's derelict. Yes. Now we know. What are you two doing? Here, give me a look. Yes, give him the glasses. Take a good look, chatterbox. Give you something to talk about. She's still heading for us. Yes. <laughs> She's going to turn. She better turn soon. <laughs> Suppose she doesn't. You mean suppose she piles up on the key? It's slow tide. Yes. Yes, it is. Where's all the conversation, August? Huh? Here, want the glasses again? No. Want another look? No, no. She's still coming on. Go away! Go away! Turn, will you? Turn, I say, I pray you. Turn! She's cracking up. The rats. Look, on the water, like a carpet. They're swimming. Sure, they're swimming. Those are ship's rats. But they're swimming for the rocks. The door below, it's open. Come on. Down we went, racing down the stone stairs, taking them three and four at a time. Scared? You bet we were scared. August, you get the windows. Maybe they can climb. We don't know. Reggie, but hurry, hurry. Look. See them? No. Oh, yes, I do. Up at the other end of the rock. Look at the millions. They smell us. Uh, Here they come. Uh, Close the door. I can't. I can't. It's stuck. Here. Let me. Oh, move. You move. He made it. Holy. That was close. One guy in. Look. There. Get him. Watch it. He, 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 he. He was as big as a tarmac, bigger. And his eyes were wild and red, his teeth long and sharp and yellow. He went for us, hard and ravenous, and we fought him, fought that one rat all over the room. It was, oh, believe me, I do not exaggerate, it was like fighting a panther. Got him. We better get aloft. We ran up the winding staircase. We passed the tiny windows of the various levels. And at every one was a thick, wriggling, screaming curtain of brown fur. I was ahead of Louie, and I turned at each successive level. Suppose they had found a way in. Look at them. Will you look at them? It's a nightmare. Will you look at them? The air of the gallery was thick and fetid with the stink of them. The light was dim, brown filtered through the crawling mass that swarmed over the glass all about us. We could not see the sky, nothing, nothing but them. Their red eyes, their claws, their wriggling hairy snouts, and their teeth, the rats. They screamed and howled and threw themselves against the glass. They were starving, and we three, we stood very quietly. Oh, very, very quietly in the center of the glass room under our beautiful light, we wait. What can we do? What can we do? Take it easy, old man. Take it easy. I can't. I just can't. It won't do. It won't do any good to stand here and shake. Yeah, that's right. Anybody who want a cigarette? Yes. Yes, I have one. Thank you. Good boy. We've got to keep calm about this thing. Here's a light. Yeah, they don't like the fire, do they? Guess not. <laughs> Give me another match. <laughs> you don't like that much, do you? Like don't it? rile them, August. <laughs> Give me some more matches. I'll strike them and strike them and strike them until they get scared and go away. They won't <laughs> go away. Not until... Let me see, Jim. Not until what? Not until they've been... Fed. You can take just so much horror and then you get used to it. And they were interesting to watch, you know. They couldn't understand the glass. They could see us and they could rush at us, but that thin, invisible barrier held them off, stopped them. From time to time, we caught a glimpse of the rocks below. More rats down there, swarming brown velvet in the bright tropical sunlight. And then the tide began to rise. 
only it'd drown some of them. Ship's rats don't drown. <laughs> No, sir, you cannot drown one of them. They're all climbing up the tower. This bunch around us is getting thicker. Yeah. Say, what's the time? Quarter six. You've got first watch, John. Right. Uh, wake me at ten. I will. Come along, Abbas. It was getting dark. One side of the room was lit a soft, filtered red. Sunset through the racks. Oh, very pretty. I set the wicks, checked my fuel, and then lit the lamp. It caught them. Lit them in their gigantic wriggling web of pale, hairless bellies, twitching red tails, bright eyes. Then I started the rotary motor. Life drove them mad as she swung slowly and smoothly about. She blinded them in the fierce stabbing bar of light, moving continually about of a turning, of a touching, of a moving around and around, and they twitching and shuddering, eyes flaming when they were struck by the light. The bright light moving, and behind on the dark side of the room, so close, so close, I did not turn my back, but you cannot help turning your back when you're in a room made of glass. On the dark side of the room, you could not see them, but only their eyes. Thousands of points of blank red light blinking and twinkling like the stars of hell. Louis relieved me at ten, but I didn't get much sleep that night, and when I came up into the gallery early next morning... There stood August, his back to me. He was bowing to the rats, waving his arms and making a speech. I am going to play once again that magnificent role which made me the toast to the Paris theater. Prelate, the evil genius of the medieval underworld. I am he who did guide the dark soul of the Marechal into the nether part. <laughs> Do not be frightened, little children. I will it not hurt turning. you. I much. stood staring at him horror struck, but he didn't notice me. The man had gone mad. He kept turning, telling his stories to all the rats, leaving no one out. August! August! Ah, another one. A late comer. Take a seat on the aisle, dear patron. August, Move stop over it, there. Stop it. Let the gentleman be but seated. But he didn't come, stop. Come, he went on, come, bowing and scraping to the rats, his big blue eyes rolling and winking, his wild red hair waving about him. I grabbed him by the arm. Cracked his face. He looked at me like a child. And then his face screwed up. He looked as though he were about to cry. Go below. Go on. Oh, very well, then. Later, my dear audience, later. Matinee today. Sure, he was crazy. But I guess we all were. A few hours later, he came back up and caught Louie and me teasing the rats. Yes. Sounds horrible. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> We could get right up against the glass and make faces at them. It drove them crazy. They would scratch away trying to get at our eyes. Louie was even cuter about it. He'd pull a piece of bread out of his pocket and press it against the glass. The rats would scramble into a solid ball, biting each other, clustering like grapes. From time to time, a whole knot of them would slip and fall 110 feet to the surf below. Sharks. They're eating them. Ah. Yeah, the sharks are our friends. Yeah, yeah. I'll get another bunch together. <laughs> yeah, my beauties. That's it. Pile of kill each other. <laughs> there they go. Auguste joined in, too. Oh, very ingenious, Auguste. He learned that if he spread eagled himself against the glass, they'd bunch and bundle against his figure, and then he'd leap back. Look! My portrait in rats. It went on all day. And then I was lying in bed. It was about midnight. I was very tired and I was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I became conscious of a new sound. Couldn't figure it at first. I got up, lit the lamp, and went to the window. 
Even as I looked at it, I saw one of the panes begin to sag in. They had eaten the wood away. Louis, Louis, come uh, quick! What? What is it? They found a way in. I held the glass with my hand. Now they were all going crazy, and assured of the success of this maneuver, were all nibbling away at the wood. Louis ran below and then returned with a large sheet of tin. We spread it against the window and hammered it into place. Even as we did so, we felt the heavy body scudding against the other side as the window gave way. That ought to hold. If it doesn't, we're done for. Rats can't eat tin. No, they can't. So what was that? I don't know. It came from below. The storeroom window. Oh. They're in. They're swarming up the stairs. Drop the trap. Right. Two of them got in. Let's go after them. We didn't have to go after them. They came at us. I leaped to one side and grabbed a marlin spike, swung, and smashed one in midair. No! I whirled to see Louie with the other. It had ripped his hand open, and the blood was pouring all over the place. He held his hand aloft and kicked at the snarling rat. I stepped and swung and got him. My hand! He got my hand! That's both of them, Louie. I'll, I'll get you something to tie that up. Blood! Look at it, my... My blood, I'm bleeding. Now, don't worry about it, Louis. Here, look. I'll, I'll wind this kerchief around it. It'll be okay. Blood. Uh, there, now. It's not bad, just the flesh. And then I became conscious of another new sound. They were gnawing their way through the wooden trap door. I watched the wood fascinated. Even as I did, it began to give way. And a bristling, whiskery nose showed through. Louis, Louis, we've got to go up. Next level was the middle quarters in the kitchen. I slammed the trap door there, too. But it, too, was wood. Uh, my blood. What are we going to do? Hell no. We'll be through this one in a moment. The gallery. The trap door in the gallery is metal. Good. Come on. We made it. We lay across the trap door exhausted While below us the rats took over the entire tower I could hear them howling and fighting over our food supply, our water, our leather And all about us the others screamed and glared in at us Swayed in a tangled mass hypnotized by the ever-turning light By morning, the air in the little room was horrible. Until now, we'd been getting air from the tower below. Now that was sealed off. And so was all our food and water. We lay exhausted, panting, waiting, waiting. The hours crawled on. I was almost dozing from fatigue when I saw a sight that brought me too fast. <laughs> Would you like to come in, my beauty? Would you? I hold the powers of life and death, and I can let you in, you know. August was standing <laughs> by the glass, and in one hand he held a wrench. He was tapping the glass gently, not quite hard enough to break it. I used myself to my feet, and slowly, very slowly, tiptoed toward him. All I have to do is tap just a little harder. Oh. As a... Uh. I found a coil of wire in the tool kit and I trussed him up, fastened him to a stanchion in the center of the room. Louis was of no help. He lay on his side looking at his bloody hand, weak and sick as a baby. So there I was, a lunatic and a coward for company, and all about watching our little drama, The Rats. <laughs> The day dragged by. The supply boat wasn't due for another 12 days. I don't know what they could have done if they had come. We had only one way of summoning them, and that was to shoot off distress rockets, but the rockets were four floors below. And even if they'd been right there in the gallery, I couldn't have opened a window to fire them. That night, I tended the light but its flame was devouring our oxygen. The following day, we lay, thirst-tormented, starving, waiting, waiting, and the following night, I again tended the light, but this 
small supply of spare wicking we kept in the gallery had become exhausted, and quite suddenly, about midnight, the light went out. There was nothing I could do. Wicks were stored three levels below. Nothing I could do. Nothing. From time to time, I'd strike a match to see the clock. When I did, it lit up the million red eyes about us. All of us. Watching. Waiting. Below, it had grown quiet. They'd cleaned us out, and now they, too, were waiting. All waiting. And then, the rats, quite suddenly, were silent. And then I heard it. And then I saw the sky and the stars. The rats were gone. I went to the glass. Out there on the water, a small freighter, a banana boat, showing a few lights, came softly and innocently at us. The light was out. They didn't know. I wanted to open the windows to call out to them, to warn them somehow, but I was afraid. What if, what if the rats were hiding from me, tricking me? So I waited. She grounded very softly on a reef not 200 yards from the quay. Grounded so gently that the man playing the cornet was he a passenger or crewman off watch? Didn't even stop playing. They tried washing her back off. I could have told them to save their fuel. The tide was rising, would have floated her free. And I waited. That's all. That's the story. The sun came up and there wasn't a rat on the whole key. Every last one of that terrible army had left us, gone back to sea on their new ship. August, insane asylum, he never recovered. And Louis, they took him into Cayenne where he died of blood poisoning from his bite. Uh. Oh, yes. Well, that's the whole of it. And if you'll excuse me now, I must go set my traps. No, no mouse traps. No rats in this lighthouse, I should say not. Life in the lights isn't bad. But sometimes when I see a strange vessel approaching, I get a little nervous, sure. Somewhere on the seas, there's a little banana boat without a crew. That is, without a human crew. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Three Skeleton Key by George Tadeus, adapted for radio by James Poe and starring Vincent Price as John. Supporting Mr. Price were Harry Bartell as August and Jeff Corey as Louis. Sound effects on Three Skeleton Key, created by Cliff Thorsness and executed today by Mr. Thorsness, Gus Bays, and Jack Sixsmith, have been awarded the best of the year by Radio and Television Life magazine. Harry Essman was at the control panel, and special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are swimming for your life in the dangerous waters off the Florida Gulf Coast about to be smashed by a launch carrying a vicious criminal who must kill you or die himself. And on shore 500 yards away, the police are waiting to arrest you for murder. And there can be no escape. Next week, we escape with an exciting tale of temptation and death on the Gulf Coast of Florida as John and Gwen Bagney tell it in Danger at Matagumba. 
Goodbye, then, until the same time next week when once again we offer you... Escape! A patch of weeds, a boxer's biography, and a mild, lukewarm bath. They're all clues that lead the police of Jackson, Michigan, to a killer in the gangbuster story on CBS this Saturday night. It's the case of the double push to be heard on most of the same CBS stations this Saturday night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Dance of the Devil Dogs. Hello? Anyone out here? You don't think... I don't know what to think, Chuck. We'd better take a good look around. There's something strange about this whole setup. I don't know. Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer us, Chuck. You mean... That's right. He's dead. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present... The Dance of the Devil Dolls. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne entitled... The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Have you heard of avoutement? Literally, the word means face image. The practice of avoutement is as ancient as Egypt and Assyria, and still found from Ceylon to the United States, Europe to Africa, South America to Scandinavia. A figure is made to resemble that of a hated enemy, then methodically injured or destroyed, resulting in pain and death for its human counterpart. Charles and I had gone up for a weekend of fishing. Saturday night at dusk, when the sky had dulled from blue to gray, and the gray was shading darker every minute, we were walking back up to the cabin. Not a bad haul, huh, Emery? For you, not for me. I'll bet you the smallest of those three bass weighs over four pounds. What bait were you using? A spoon. Fish just wouldn't leave it alone. Anyway, we'll have a good fish dinner tonight. And maybe tomorrow my luck will change. Well, I hope so. What time is it? About nine. We've been out five hours. Chuck. Yeah? There's someone coming down the trail towards us. Where? Oh, yes, I see. You can't be going down to fish this late. Oh, well, we can't tell. Some guys really get the bug. There's a guy I know named Lloyd Erskine who will fish Excuse off... Excuse me, gentlemen. He means us. I wonder what he wants. Excuse me, gentlemen. I lost something. I wonder if you found it. <laughs> I don't know what you're looking for, mister, but we haven't found it, whatever it is. Perhaps you saw it lying on the ground. It was a doll. A doll? Yes, about 12 inches tall. It looked something like... like me. I'm sorry, we haven't seen it. Of course you can always buy your daughter It doesn't belong to my daughter. Oh. Well, we haven't seen it. Are you staying at a cabin on this lake? Yes. Only until tomorrow night. It's right at the head of the trail up there. You must have passed it as you started down. If by any chance you do come across it, I'll stop in before I leave this area, if you don't mind. Well, that's perfectly all right. Thank you, gentlemen. I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Well, what do you make of that? Search me. He talked so strangely. I must have the doll for the dance tonight, or the old woman will be angry. <laughs> I think he's off his rocker. Well, it's not our worry, Emery. Come on, let's go. We went back up to our cabin, cleaned the fish, and had one of those fish dinners you talk about for years. 
It was about 11 o'clock, and we'd started to go to bed, intending to get up as early as possible the next morning when there was a knock on the door. I wonder who that is. I don't know, but we'll soon find out. Oh, it's you. Yes. May I come in? Of course. I see you found the doll. Yes. I wanted to let you know that I had. Well, thanks for telling us. Now I must take him to the dance. Well, the dance ought to be just about over. Oh, no, it it hasn't begun yet. Well, you'd better get there or your wife will be angry. You misunderstood me. I said the old woman, not my wife. You see, I'm not married. Oh. I hope you'll forgive me. I see that you're just about ready to retire, but I'm afraid. Afraid? Of what? The old woman is already angry with me. I told her I'd lost the doll, and she swore that if I didn't find it, she'd kill me. That's why I've come to you. If you hear that I'm dead tomorrow, that I committed suicide, you'll know it's not the truth. If I could only get in touch with Dr. George Kaltman... He could help, but I'm caught up in something I can't stop, and it's too late to get out now. I've tried to... Oh! Oh! My head! You dropped your doll. I didn't drop it. She caused it to move. She doesn't want me to talk. I've said too much already. I must go now. Here's your doll. Thank you. Remember what I told you. If I'm dead tomorrow, it's murder. Good night, gentlemen. After he dropped the doll. Did you get a good look at him, Chuck? Yeah. The doll hit the floor on its forehead. A few seconds later, there was a heavy bruise on the right side of his forehead. You know, he said if he was found dead tomorrow, that it would be murder. It was about 11.30 when we finally got to bed. We'd opened the windows of the cabin... The sound of the alarm clock we brought with us mingled with that of the crickets outside. The old woman said you must die. I heard something. I didn't know what it was. It sounded strangely like words, but they were uttered in a voice so tiny and shrill that I thought I was imagining things. But then, I heard his voice. No! No, I won't die! That will help me! Emery, I didn't know you were awake. I couldn't sleep. I thought I heard a tiny little voice. I thought... Hey, quiet! Hey, go! Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I had retired for the night, but neither of us could sleep. Suddenly, from outside, we heard the voice of the man we'd met earlier, and another voice, high and shrill, and somehow deadly. The old woman will take care of them, too. But I'm not going to die! I'm not going to... Ah! What's going on out there? We'd better take a look. There's a pair of pants and some shoes, huh? Remember what he said about dying? Yeah. You ready? Yes. All right, let's go beginning to think that guy belongs in an institution. Maybe. Maybe not. I think his scream came from the left. I'll take a look over there, then. He didn't tell us his name, did he? No. Well, I'll try calling him. Anybody out here? Hello? Anyone out here? You don't think... I don't know what to think, Chuck. We'd better take a good look around. Something strange about this whole setup. I don't know it. Emery. What? Look. It's him. Come on. No wonder he didn't answer his Chuck. You mean... That's right. He's dead. That little doll that looks so much like him. I don't see it any way around. Neither do I. You know, Chuck, it sounds crazy to say it. But that shrill, high little voice we heard... You're letting this thing run wild with your imagination, Emery. Even though it looked like him, it's just a doll, nothing else. It 
It had to be my imagination. Of that I was sure. But the mere thought of it, of the doll which so resembled the man with its shining face and beady little eyes, caused a strange sense of apprehension and fear to come across me. And I glanced out into the darkness and saw only the lumbering shadows of the trees and heard the rustle of their leaves as they brushed together. I saw nothing. Yet I had the feeling that something with beady little eyes was watching us. We notified the authorities. They came out, found no evidence of foul playing, diagnosed his death as being caused by heart failure. Our luck was exceptionally bad out on the lake Sunday, and we drove home that night, speaking but little, thinking only of what had happened the night before. About ten days after we returned to the city, both Charles and I were home one evening. We shared an apartment together, and that night neither of us had anything to do. We were playing gin rummy. One more hand like that and you'll be out, you lucky dog. It was pure skill, my friend. No luck involved. Cut? No, I trust you. It's a good thing Pamela stood you up tonight. She knew that you wanted a gin partner. <laughs> Don't be humorous. Proposed to her yet? No, but I'm uh, working on it. You know, you deal like a card shark. I have nothing but... Expecting anyone? No, you. Mm -mm. Well, I'll see who it is. Whoever it is, get rid of him. I got a good hand. Coming right up. Is this the residence of Mr. Emery Ryerson and Mr. Charles Hunter? Yes, it is, but... I have a package for you. Are you expecting a package, Emery? Just bills, no packages. It's for both of you. All right, I'll take it. Thank you. And good evening, sir. Oh, yes, yes, good evening. An old woman. She had a package for us. Well, set it down on the table and open it, man. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So I'll open it. Oh, it's wrapped very well. Maybe it's a bottle of scotch. Who is be sending us a bottle of. Someone has a real fine sense of humor. It's like the doll that fellow had with him. It's the same doll. Notice that little nick out of its forehead? That happened when he dropped it on the floor. What are we going to do with it? I don't know. We can keep it, I suppose. Well, let's get back to the game. No, I'm not in the mood now. You know, Emory, I can't help but remember what he said. The man who died? Yes. He said, I must have the doll for the dance tonight. Or the old woman will be angry. Yes, that's right. What brought that back to your mind? The woman who delivered this package... put the lid back on the box and left it on the kitchen table with the cards we'd been using. Neither of us entered the kitchen again that evening. We went to bed a short time after twelve. Again, I was restless and couldn't sleep. I had the same feeling I'd had that night in the cabin. And I remembered the words I'd heard spoken in that unearthly little voice. The old woman will take care of them. And I wondered if I'd only imagined those words, or whether they had actually been uttered by the creature in the box in the other room. It was then I heard it, like a thin, reedy piping. It sounded like music, a rhythmic, discordant melody I'd never heard before. And then, I heard another sound. Henry? Yes? Am I going crazy? I hear it, too. I think we'd better see what it is. All right. I don't like this, Emery. It sounds I like... I know what it sounds like. Emery. No. I can't believe my eyes. The box is open. And the little doll, Emery. It's moving. It's dancing on the table. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Dance of the Devil Dolls. Charles and I couldn't believe our eyes, for the scene before us was as bizarre and fantastic as the wildest dream of an insane imagination. 
moving. It's dancing on the table. Yes, I see it. This is something that... I'm going to destroy that thing. Be careful. Look out, Chuck. It's running. I'm going to get it if it's the last thing I do. It's running over toward the window. It's gone. It's gone through the glass. Maybe it's down there on the sidewalk. It's possible, but that's a two-story drop. I can't see it. No, Emery. It's gone. They turned again to the old woman. The man who had died had mentioned a name that night in the cabin. The name of Dr. George Kaltman. Now it came back into my mind. Kaltman was associated with occult research. If Kaltman could have helped the man who died, perhaps he could explain what was happening to us. We got in touch with him and made an appointment for the following evening. You have told me everything that has happened. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yes, everything. We'd like to know what it all means. Well, I shall explain it to you as best I can. Have either of you ever heard of envoûtement? No. Not that I recall. Well, envoûtement is the practice of making little dolls to resemble a hated enemy and then methodically injuring or destroying it, thus bringing about either pain or death or both in the doll's human counterpart. Dr. Colton, this doll we saw last night, it, it moved, it danced. I know. What you witnessed last night was the dance of the devil dolls. You say these dolls bring about pain or death, Dr. Colton. Why should we be singled out? The man who died told you about the old woman. Is that not correct? Yes. Therefore, you must be destroyed. She feels that you are dangerous to her, that you know too much. Undoubtedly, the woman you saw last night, Mr. Hunter, was the manipulator, controller of the little figures. Since you saw her, she has probably made little figures of both of you. But before it will live and be subject to her will, she must have a part of you, a lock of your hair, a fingernail clipping, anything that will make yours and the doll's identities one and the same. What should we do? Go back to your apartment. I shall return with you. She will send the little doll back to your apartment tonight. I'm sure of that. We must capture the doll, for it is the only thing that will lead us to her. Altman, Charles, and I returned to our apartment and took up our vigil in the bedroom, for that was the place the doll and the old woman would expect us to be. We made dummies of the extra blankets and arranged the bed so it looked as if we were sleeping. You left the apartment door unlocked? Yes. But why? It only makes it easier for it to enter. See, it is what we must do. One way or the other, the doll would find means of entrance. If not tonight, then another. You have no idea what those little creatures are capable. Listen. It is coming. Be quiet. Wait until it is in here. Then close the bedroom door and put on the lights. We understand. Now. There it is, over there. This time it won't get away. Don't let it get near the window. I've got it, I've got it. Quickly, put it in here. Ah, there. We have it. Now, what do we do? The star will lead us to the doll woman. You mean now? Tonight? Yes, Mr. Ryerson. She will know that we have captured her little messenger if it does not return in a few hours, and she will be prepared to stop us. We must find her, destroy her if need be, before she has a chance to destroy you. Then began one of the strangest sights I've ever seen. Kaltman took the doll out of the box in which we'd imprisoned it, tied its arms and legs while it writhed and twisted in his hand. Then he began speaking to it, softly, rhythmically. Slowly putting it into a hypnotized yes, sleep. The you eyelids of the little figure finally closed. And it was in an hypnotic trance. Sleep and tell me. Now, listen to me. You must tell me where your mistress is. You must tell me where your mistress is. The house. The house of dolls. The house of dolls. 
a strange answer. Not for strange, my friends. I know what it means. What is it? She is a diabolical person, this doll woman. The house of dolls is a toy shop with rare and unusual dolls. What better place to hide? No one would suspect what was behind those burning eyes of hers. I myself have purchased dolls for my little granddaughter from her. We must go there immediately. We have no time to lose. This is the place. Let's go. Right. It's past two. There's no one on the streets. Oh, it's a better. Try the door. It's open. Probably waiting in the rear of the shop for the creature she sent out. Well, let's go in. As quietly as possible. We must catch her by surprise. All right. There's a light coming from beneath that door back there. That is where we must go. Listen. It is the dance of the devil dies. The door's ajar. They're in there. I can see them. Yes, so do I. Be quiet. And soon, my children, you will be joined by two others. <laughs> and then, no one can harm you. <laughs> but when the new doll returns, he will bring with him what I need for the spell of the dancers. We must take her now. And they will join you in the dance of, of the devil doll. Now! What are you doing here? We've come to stop you. Look out, Bob, she has a gun. So have I. She is dead. She will cause no more harm. It seems strange to see those little creatures on the floor. All of them so quiet and still. And just a short while ago. They were participating in the dance of the devil dolls. Yes. Do not feel pity for them, Mr. Hunter. The dolls did not really live. They were a creation of evil, sparked by the malevolence of the old woman. When she died, they died with her. Perhaps the humans they resembled will rest quietly now. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Yeah, 
three pounds on the Jack of Diamonds. You should tear your money up, Humphreys. It would last you longer. (laughs) Perhaps you're right, Crane. But this way I get a sense of honest toil. I say, isn't anyone else betting? Oh, let's quit. I'm tired of losing. Oh, look here, old girl. Could I loan you a few pounds? No, thank you, Crane. (laughs) I... I have enough to get me back to London, if we ever do get back. Now, why do you say that, Clara? It's only a matter of a stage getting through here to the resort and taking us out of this beastly place. Beastly place is right. Why people come here for a rest is more than I can determine. Honestly, I've never spent such an uncomfortable week in all my life. Well, think of me. I've been here three. So have you, Humphreys. Mm. Oh, well, look here, you two. It's three o'clock. And they're expecting the stage around eight tonight. Uh, what do you say the three of us go for a bit of a walk through the forest? I say, why not? Oh, here comes Danvers. Perhaps he'll join us. Anything to get away from this place. Uh, good afternoon, Danvers. And greetings, good people. I take it you're no happier than when I left you a while ago. Oh, the place is as gloomy as a morgue. We've just agreed to take a walk in the forest back of the inn. You're invited to come along if you like. Sounds like a good enough way to pass the time. Oh, good. And we all go together. Besides... I'm quite interested in that forest out there. You remember, of course, the story the night clerk told us last evening. Yes, I don't like him. He talks through his nose. People should talk through their mouths. No, no, no. I mean, what he told us about the forest. What about the forest? I didn't hear it, Humphreys. Well, the clerk said it was a gorgeous place. Lots of beautiful foliage, vivid colors, clear water lakes. But nobody goes there. So beautiful. That's just it, Clara. You see, people have gone there and never come back. Rubbish. A lot of nonsense. Why, the clerk is just superstitious, that's all. I am inclined to agree with you, Danvers. Why, he even told us an absurd story about... about a tree out there in that forest that's supposed to strangle people. (laughs) Strangle them? How? Oh, I don't know. With its branches, I suppose. Just some absurd legend the people around here like to believe. I believe it's more than just a legend, Crane. Eh? And what makes you say that, old man? Uh, Here. I talked to the clerk again later last night. He dug out this old newspaper clipping for me. Read it, Danvers. Aloud. Hmm. Old is right. Almost illegible. Well, read it. It says... London, England... April 21st, 1857. It is reported that Sir Horace Wakefield, Earl of Dorsha, was found strangled last night in Barlow Forest. His body was discovered entangled in the branches of a huge oak tree. Oh. Go on. Read the rest of it. Earl's death recalls to mind the weird tale of the witch of Barlow Forest, who is said to have lived in the 16th century. An evil old hag who, upon having a falling out with Sir Thomas Holly Wakefield, cursed him and warned him that any of his descendants who entered Barlow Forest would surely perish. Mm, Charming old girl, wasn't she? No, no, no. Don't scoff until you've heard the rest of it. Go on, Danvers. She also added that any person or persons with the Wakefield descendant would also die. She is said to have planted an acorn. Smeared with her own blood. The acorn is supposed to have grown into a towering oak capable of moving about from place to place in Barlow Forest. Sir Horace is the sixth of the Wakefield line to have perished by strangulation in the forest. Thomas Hurley Wakefield. I wonder. Hmm? You wonder what, Cray? Uh, my mother's name was Wakefield. I was just wondering if she was related to Sir Thomas. Oh, of course not, Crane. It's just a story. Uh, What an extraordinary story, wouldn't you say? Yes. Wouldn't do very well as a bedtime story, would it? A demon tree. I wonder if we could find it. (laughs) Well, let's have a try, shall we? (laughs) I'm game. Don't let anybody say I'm not. Then let's go. Oh, Humphrey's going along. I say, Humphrey's, are you daydreaming? Hmm? I was just thinking. Wouldn't it be odd if the whole thing were true? If we all went in there and didn't come back. Do 
you gentlemen see any way we can get into that forest? It's as dense as Father Time's beard. Doesn't seem to be an opening anywhere. I think we can get in over here. Oh, all right. Coming, Danvers. There seems to be a footpath over here. Only one along this line of the forest. There, see? Oh, yes, you're right. Uh, come on, I'll leave. Uh, we'd better remember the way back. It would be hard to get out of here if we didn't know where this opening is. And don't worry, I'll remember it. I'm good at landmarks. Go ahead, Clara. I'm right behind you. I say, do any of you feel that? Feel what, Danvers? The chill. I feel like... like it's 20 degrees colder in this place. I feel that way, too. So do I. Well, it's naturally cooler in the woods where the sun doesn't shine. But not this much cooler. I don't like this place. I'm for going back to the inn. Oh, let's get on ahead a little ways. I say, it is pretty in here. Pretty or not, it gives me the creeps. It isn't the kind of cold caused by climatic changes. What was that, Denver? I said, it's a different kind of cold. It's the kind that creeps up your spine when some... Some evil comes over you. Oh, now, Danvers. You're just letting that newspaper story play on your mind. Wait a minute, sir. Look! That tree there in front of us. It looks like a human giant. Jove! You're right, Danvers. I could swear it moved just a moment ago. It did move. I saw it, too. That's the strangest-looking tree I ever saw. Look at that bark. I wonder if... Clem! What's wrong, man? I... I just touched the bark of that tree and... It... It didn't feel like bark at all. What? No. It felt like... Like human skin. Oh. Here. Let me feel it. By heaven. It's true. It does feel like skin, warm and smooth and soft. Yes, it feels that way to me, too. Here, Humphreys, you touch it. No, thanks. Go ahead, Humphreys. Feel it. I have no desire to. You see, I'm sure you're right. What's that? I feel that this is the demon tree of Barlow Forest. Oh, I, I think we've seen enough of this place, haven't we? Let's get back to the end. Yes, let's. All right. Come on. I say, wait a minute. Have you noticed how dark it is? All of a sudden. The sun's behind a cloud, probably. It's impossible to see the sky through this foliage. It is darker. I can hardly see where I'm walking. Are you quite sure this is the right way? I don't remember this clearing. I don't either. Wait a minute. By heaven, this isn't the way. It must be. We're on the path, aren't we? No. No, I don't think we are. It's so dark. Do any of you have a flash? I certainly don't remember this clearing. I think... <gasps> what was that? What was what, Crane? Ah. You... You'll think this is foolish, but... I swear I felt the branch of a tree brush across my face and shoulder. That's... That's impossible. There's not a tree within 50 feet of us. But I felt it, I tell you. It rustled like a branch covered with leaves, and yet it... It felt warm and soft, like human flesh... Are you sure? Yes. Look. We're lost here. It's dark. Dark as night, right in the middle of the afternoon. And we've lost the path in that tree. Easy, Crane. Keep your head, man. I'm getting out of here. I'm not going to stay here and be murdered. Crane! Stay with us. No, no. I'm going to find the path and get out of here. Crane, stay here. We'll find a way back. I don't want to stay here and die. I want to get away from this place. Crane! Don't be a fool! Crane! Gone. 
Now he is in for it. We're better off by staying together. I don't know whether we are or not. <laughs> Listen! It's great. Sounds like he's strangling. Come on! Oh, we couldn't have gotten far. Right over here, I think. Well, take it easy now. Be careful. <gasps> oh, there he is. Yes. Stretched out on the ground. Like... Like he was... Dead. Look. Look at him. Marks on his throat. Like hands would make. That wasn't done by hands. See? Stains on his skin. Green stains. Thomas Wakefield Crane. Oh, what a horrible way for him to die. Clara, a tree. This is where we first saw it. Now it's gone. Humphreys, you're right. This is where it was. I'm sure of it. Then what's happened to it? The important question is, what are we going to do with Crane? We'll have to leave him here until we can find a way out of this place. Poor Crane. It happened so quickly. One minute he was with us and the next... We warned him not to leave us. Now the three of us had better stay close together. Oh, yes, for heaven's sakes, let's not get separated. And do come on. There's nothing we can do for Crane now. We've got to find our way out of here. It doesn't seem right leaving him there. It's all we can do. Come on. How do we know which way to go? We don't. All we can do is keep moving and hope to find the path again. Oh, it's horrible. Wandering about like this, like... Like nothing but a group of marionettes. Controlled by what strange puppeteer? What? What's that, Humphreys? I said... Controlled by what strange puppeteer? Humphreys, surely you don't think we've been purposely led into this? Who can say? Oh, now, Humphreys. Crane went off the deep end. We've got to keep our heads. We found a way in. Surely we'll find a way out. Yes. Yes, we did find a way in. But what about the chill? The darkness? There's some explanation. Perhaps a storm is coming up. Yes. That could be it. Couldn't it? Storms don't rise that quickly in this part of the country. And the darkness. It came down on this forest like a shroud. Yes. It came so quickly. Hmm. Reminded me of how a corpse must feel in his coffin when the lid is put over him. Look here, Humphreys. I'm about fed up with that sort of talk. Only a fool refuses to face the facts, Danvers. You know this isn't any ordinary situation we're in. The chill of winter and the summertime. Darkness and mid-afternoon. And a tree that strangles. It was probably just an, an accident, Crane's death. Why don't you stop trying to tell yourself that the tree was only an imaginary thing? We all know that it's real. Hundreds. And as alive as any of us. The bark did feel like human flesh. Danvers. Humphreys. Look. What? What is it? A glow of light there ahead of us. It's the tree. There. Now what do you think, Danvers? Look. It's the tree moving along in a glow of phosphorescent light. Good heavens. It's the same tree. It looks like a human giant. It was nowhere near here. It was back there. Do you two see what the tree is carrying? It's carrying Crane. It's got him tucked up under that huge branch that looks like a human arm. It's fading now. Disappearing again. Fading away. Yes. Gone. He's gone. Now do you believe, Danvers? Now do you admit that the tree is alive? 
What else can I believe? I don't know. Don, the look out! He's fallen into a water. Oh, help him, Oswald! It's quick, Don! Pretty thinking. Help! I'm into my waist! Get me out of here! Stand still, Dabbers. You just sink deeper. Quick, help me out of here! Get something I can get out to! Here, Dabbers. Dabbers, grab the end of that pole. He'll let you help him. Grab it, Danvers. Grab it. The pole, Danvers. Grab it. I can't. That tree branch. It's bearing me. Good Lord. Listen, Clara. A tree branch. But we can't see. I can't get near the pole. The branch keeps beating me back. Oh, Humphrey, do something. He's up to his shoulders now. I can't. I can't make it. I can't help. Take me. Take me. You go under the quicksand and strangle. Danvers, there's nothing I can do. That tree, the demon tree, there's no saving from it. Ah! He's gone. Poor devil. Didn't have a chance. Oh, please. We've got to get out of here. We're all doomed. It's the Wakefield curse. Clara, stop it. It is the curse. We're helpless. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Clara, stop it. Oh, please. Now, we can't give up. We've got to find a way out of this place. Follow me. Be careful where you step. And whatever happens, keep your head, Clara, for heaven's sake. a little lighter. Clara, up ahead there. Isn't that a path? What? Oh, you're right, Humphrey. It's the path we came in on. And look, there's an opening through the trees. Yes, I remember the landmarks. Oh, thank God for the light. Come on, Clara, out of this place. There's nothing we can do for Danvers or Crane now. feel as I do. I thought we'd be safe back here in the hotel. I don't know how to describe it, but I have a feeling that this whole business isn't over yet. I know. I've had the same feeling. A feeling that we're not finished with the demon tree. Or that it's not finished with us. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, my room. Better go in and have a drink, Clara. Heaven knows we need one. Yes, I certainly do. What's worrying me is how we're going to explain what happened to Craig in Denver. Yeah, wait a minute. I'll get the light. There. Humphrey, <gasps> on the bed there. Good Lord. The branch of a tree about two feet long. Humphrey, don't touch it. Look at it. Look at it. A fresh living branch. Put it down. Oh, Humphreys, I'm getting out of here. Where are you going? Down to the lobby and wait for the stage. Oh, hold on. I'll go with you. Wait, Clara. Wait. It's three flights down. Let's take the elevator. All right. We can get the thing up here. It's automatic. Just push the button. It'll come up. Humphreys. Look. Someone left the steel gate open. I say, that's dangerous. It certainly is. <gasps> Humphreys, that branch is pushing. Drop it. Drop it. Ah! Clara! Clara! That branch! It pushed her down the shaft! It's 
Dad's after me. Get away. Get away. Help me. Help me, somebody. The tree. The demon tree. It's talking me. descendant of Sir Thomas Hurley Wakefield, who enters Barlow Forest, is doomed to die. And all who enter the forest with him are likewise doomed. just heard The Demon Tree, an original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop. Tonight's cast included Eleanor Naylor Corrin as Clara, Ben Morris, who was Humphreys, Garland Moss took the part of Danvers, and Murillo Schofield was heard as Crane. Next Friday night at this time, the National Broadcasting Company will bring you another unusual and fantastic adventure thriller, Men Call Me Mad. The story of another world and the people who inhabit it. An exciting and weird tale of dark fantasy created by Scott Bishop. Dark fantasy originates in the studios of station WKY, Oklahoma City. From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis. And that's the top of the news as it looks from here. G. Marshall, welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. For the next 52 minutes, I'll be your companion on a journey to a place in the past. It used to be that only the mystics believed you could go back, relive your life. But didn't so eminent a scientist as Albert Einstein say that the past, the present, and the future are all intermingled somehow? Well, why should we question a gentleman named Spencer Chadwick, who is asking a very vital question? Inspector, do you believe a person can do it again? Do what again? Go back. Where? To that point in his life where it went wrong. It turned sour and corrected. No. No, I don't believe it's possible. Well, I'm doing it, Inspector. I'm doing it. I'm changing it. I've gone back. Inspector, I've gone back. Our mystery drama, You Can Die Again, was especially written by Sam Dan and stars Richard Mulligan. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. evening, we are concerned with bright young men. That is, those who began as bright young men, like Spencer Chadwick. Bright young Spencer Chadwick married his boss's daughter, but that was 23 years ago. And today, young Spencer has arrived at comfortable middle age. This morning, he will pick up his phone and dial the private number of a highly placed friend. Chief Inspector Faraday's office, Sergeant Melrose speaking. Sergeant, this is Spencer Chadwick. Oh, good morning, Mr. Chadwick. Connect you right away. Spence, I hope you're not calling to cancel our golf date. No, no, Martin. I'm 
I'm calling to tell you I murdered my wife. I won't believe it, Spence. I can't believe it. Marty, look at her. She's dead. I see she's dead, but I won't believe you killed her. She's been stabbed, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant, yes. And that's the knife, Marty. Now, Spencer... You'll surely find my fingerprints on it. What's that bruise on your head? We had a fight. She hit me with the candlestick. Inspector, a glass door here leads to a terrace. It's been broken. Spence, an intruder, a thief. Did he slug you and kill Margaret? No. No, I killed Margaret. But that broken door... She tried to get away. I dragged her back into the room. Whose place is this? Mine. I didn't know you had an apartment downtown. I've been staying with a girl. Spence, you're talking to me, your closest friend, Marty Faraday. Excuse me, Inspector. Shall I start the routine? Yes, of course, Sergeant. Are you going to arrest me, Marty? I have to. I'm ready to go now. But I'm not ready to go. Look, I can't believe what you're telling me. I can't even believe you were cheating on Margaret. How can I believe you killed her? You've been a policeman for 25 years, Marty. Do you still have illusions, faith, ideals? If I do, it was because of people like you and Margaret. I'm sorry, Marty. Look, Spence, is, is this the way it happened? You were having an affair. Margaret found out about it. She came here, confronted you. One thing led to another, and you killed her. Now, is, is that the, the, the story? Yes, yes, yeah, that's it. Well, where's the girl? I suppose she's dead, too. You suppose? Yes, yes, we can say she's dead. Well, how did she die? I killed her. What? When? Oh, a long, long time ago. A long time? Spencer, you're not making any sense. How could you have killed her a long time ago if Margaret confronted the two of you here today? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Now, just arrest me and don't ask me any more questions. I have to ask, Spence. I can't accept what you're telling me. Now, think. How could you have killed her a long time ago? Or, or did she kill me? Oh, Spence, please tell me what happened. It doesn't matter. Look, I want to help you, Spence. I'm your friend. You, you, know that. you, you won't believe me. Try me. Just try me. It's even hard for me to believe it. But it's true. Spence, sit down, will you? Will you just sit down and try to pull things together? Tell me what happened. What happened? It started one morning. It was three months ago. I came downstairs. Margaret was at the breakfast table. Morning, darling. Coffee? Ah, uh, thanks. Yes. Uh, any any mail, Margaret? Nothing worth delaying breakfast. Card from my brother. Uh, where is he now? He had to put in for repairs at Pago Pago. That's Pango Pango. Uh, when is he coming home? Oh, next year, maybe. Or the year after, when he gets bored or tired or needs money or decides to get a new girlfriend or another boat. And he's 38 years old. And he'll never get anywhere. Don't say that. It seems to me he goes everywhere. Oh, his life and yours, darling? A study in opposites. You were born poor, and you wound up rich. He was born rich, wound up poor. Um, dinner tonight with the Satterfields. What for? What for? Oh, my God. <laughs> I practiced for almost five minutes before you came down, tossing off what I just said in an offhand, casual way. Dinner with the Satterfields. This is the coup of the century. A dinner party at the home of Senator Satterfield. Ask me how I did it. Why... Why do we want to have dinner with Senator Satterfield? Spence, you asked me to arrange for the invitation. I disagree completely with the man's principle. Oh, we understand all that, but you're the one who decided to give politics a whirl. When did I decide to do that? Well, <laughs> they say the sign of a really solid marriage is if the wife can accept jokes at breakfast. <laughs> Shall I remind you of that Chinese or Indian saying that you've been spouting lately? Hmm? A man spends his first 20 years living for himself, his next 20 living for his family, and his next 20 living for his country. It was you who decided. Dinner's at 7.30, black tie. So be home early, hmm? Ben? You're not listening. Darling. Why are you looking at me like that? Is, is there something wrong? Who... Who are you? What did you say? I... I said, who are you? Oh, Tell Spencer. me. Spencer. What, what are you doing here? Now, look, darling, if this is a... Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. What am I doing if here? If this is a joke, it's not in the best of taste. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I don't know where I am. Or, uh, or who you are. Do you know who you are? 
Yes, I, I, yes, I think I know who I am. I'm, I'm Spencer Chadwick. All right, now listen. Sit quietly for just a minute. I'm going to call Dr. Berger. Oh, uh, please, uh, please, I don't want to put no, you to any trouble. Don't get up, Spencer, please, don't get... Ju- Where are you going? Where- home. This is your home, Spencer. Uh, please, uh, don't be alarmed, please. I, I hope I haven't frightened you. I'll, I'll leave this minute. <laughs> After 23 years of marriage, you look at your wife one morning and you don't know who she is? Yes, Martin. All right. You walked out of the house. Now, where did you go? I hailed a cab. Now, where to, pal? I don't know. Ah, it's all right. None of us knows where we're going. Just answer this, sir. Where do you want me to take you? Just drive. Okay, you're the doctor. What do you think, the Redskins got any kind of chance this year? All right, let's try politics. You think Satterfield's going to run again? Well, as my old man would have put it, you wasn't exactly vaccinated with a photograph needed. Driver, why are you headed north? Well, you said to drive. The Chadwick building is down on Jefferson Square. I distinctly told you, you to take... You distinctly told me nothing. What would I be doing in your cab at 9 o'clock in the morning if I didn't intend to go to my office? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good morning, Rose. Oh, good morning, Mr. Chadwick. Uh, there's a uh, Dr. Berger sitting in your office. Dr. Berger? Yes, Dr. Berger. Come in here, Spence. I don't have all day. Well, come in and shut the door. May I remind you that this is my office? Fifteen minutes ago, I received a call from Margaret. Margaret? Is she all right? About you. Me? I thought it important enough for me to stop off here on my way downtown. Hold out your wrist. Wait, uh, why did Margaret call you? She told me about that little episode. What? What little episode? You don't remember saying certain things? Paul, please, what is this all about? Paul seems to be a little fast. What am I supposed to have said to Margaret? I, uh, want you to report to the hospital right now. You can't just walk into my office and tell me to report to the hospital. Who says I can't? But what's the matter with me? I don't know. That's why I'm putting you into the hospital. What did Margaret tell you? That you didn't know who she was. Well, <laughs> how could I not know who she was? Have you had moments when you didn't know people, or you didn't know where you were, or what you were doing there? Well, certainly not. Now, level with me, Spencer. Listen, those things, they happen sometimes to everybody. How often do they happen to you? Well, the I... incident with Margaret, was it the only one? Well, Spencer, I'll see you at the hospital in 30 minutes. Well, you did it. You're here, Spence. Of course I'm here. I won't keep you an hour longer than necessary. Probably get you out by the end of the day. Paul, you do what's necessary. That's a good attitude. Most of you high-powered business types are so self-important. Don't don't... start to lecture me. I'm here. I agree I need some help. Now, Now, what's holding us up? I am. I'm talking to you, and I should be arranging for tests. Now, you just relax. Listen to some music, read, take a nap. (laughs) I'll see you. Hello? Spencer? Peggy? Is everything all right, Spence? Peggy. Peggy, where are you? I'm at the apartment. Where else would I be? Tell me, are you all right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm certainly... All right, now. Oh, Peggy. Peggy, I almost lost you. How could you lose me? It could happen. How? Dr. Berger. Dr. Berger, he could could make it happen. But not now. Not not anymore. Do you know why? Why, Spence? You called me just in time. You warned me just in time. And I'm getting out of here this minute. Chadwick. Yes, Ruth? Uh, aren't you supposed to be at the hospital? I'm not supposed to be anywhere except in my office during the business day. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, this Dr. Berger, he's been calling just about every five minutes. And your wife. Uh, Shall I get them for you? No, no. I left Dr. Berger a note saying I changed my mind about the necessity for what we were discussing. Now, tell him I have nothing to add. Oh, yes, sir. 
Oh, uh, call my wife and remind her we have a dinner date with Senator Satterfield. And no calls. No calls. I don't want to talk to anyone. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Except, except uh, a young lady. She'll call herself Peggy. Well, for 23 years, you hum the same tune. And then, suddenly, one morning, you hear the music of a different drummer. A drummer named Peggy. Or is she a piper named Peggy? Who will have to be paid? We shall return shortly with Act Two. And so we have Spencer Chadwick in complete command. Ready to take hold of his life and run it his own way. Starting with his wife. Spencer? Is that you? There's no problem, no problem. It's not even a quarter of seven. I can be dressed and ready to leave in 20 minutes. Spencer, there is a problem. You made Dr. Berger look like a fool today. You read my note. It explained everything. You made yourself look like a fool. You admitted to the hospital, and less than an hour later, you sneaked out. I did not sneak out. I got dressed, went to the desk, and said, I'm leaving. Send me the bill. But, Spence, you're not well. I've never felt better. You should be in the hospital. Margaret, please stop running my life. What did you say just now, Spence? I'm sure you heard me. I wasn't aware that I was running your life. Spencer, would you be good enough to explain? Can you show me how? Uh, you did say this thing was black tie? Spencer, I, I'm entitled to an explanation of that remark. Margaret, if you can't understand what I'm saying, how can I explain it? Quite a man, this husband of yours, Miss Chadwick. Uh, some brandy? Yes, thank you, Senator. Uh, we need men like you in public life, Spence. Fellas with their heads screwed on straight. You know, I have an opportunity to recommend a man for a presidential advisory commission on... The... I, I don't think I'd be interested, Senator. I like your style, Chadwick. You play hard to get, but you do it convincingly. The public eats that up. No, no, Senator, it's not a pose. You see, sir, it seems to me that I've spent all my life working for other people. Serving others is the most richly rewarding profession a man can follow. Uh, that's if he happens to be a selfless person. But I never saw myself as a manufacturer of farm equipment. I wanted to study languages, the basic structures of human communication. An admirable calling. Margaret and I were going to leave for Tibet on our honeymoon, but my father-in-law became seriously ill. Somebody had to look after his affairs till he could get on his feet again. That was 23 years ago. He never did get back on his feet, and I never did get out of his office. But you transformed that little factory into the third largest enterprise... I know, Senator, I know, I know. I did it for my wife, my in-laws, my employees, the stockholders. But now, finally, at length and at last, I'm going into business for myself. What sort of business? The Spencer Chadwick business. The let's please and amuse and excite and develop and enhance Spencer Chadwick. Thank you for your offer, Senator. But there are many others who are more worthy, not to mention more willing. Spencer, when did you decide you were no longer interested in public service? Oh, it's been building for a while. We'll have to talk. Oh, about what? About what? I don't know if this is a pose or... Margaret, I'm sure I can explain. Now, let's drop in somewhere for a nightcap. No, let's get home. Now, do you remember what you said to me this morning? No. You insist you don't recall our little scene at breakfast? No, I'm, I'm very sorry. You looked at me this morning and you said, Who are you? You said it with sincerity and conviction. You meant it. Look, I, I don't... I may have been... You may have been what? I, daydreaming. No. It was not daydreaming. It was wishful thinking. Oh, Margaret, what are you saying? Spencer, you're having an affair. Uh, what? Please don't deny it. But I'm, I'm, I'm not. It fits in with what Dr. Berger told me. A about what? When you say to me, who are you? It means you no longer want to know me. 
You're trying to wish me out of your life. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, I can tell you... Now listen, Spencer, don't try to insult my intelligence or yours. And then, what just happened at Senator Satterfield's? What just happened? Well, suddenly you're no longer interested in public service. Why? If you heard me talking to him, you'd know that finally I want to do things for me. But he as much as offered you a post that you dreamed about. A sensitive post. And you could become an important man nationally. You've spoken about it a dozen times. Margaret, Margaret, I no longer care about it. Well, of course not. Because you become controversial. Make enemies. And then they try to get something on you. And now that you're having an affair, you're vulnerable to scandal. But I am not having... Oh, don't lie to me. That just makes it worse. But you were lying to us, Spence. We know you are lying. We know about Peggy. Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. If you'll come into the bedroom, Inspector, I didn't want to move anything. All right. Now, sir, here are these pictures. Are these Peggy... Are they, Spence? Yes. Well, sir, if you look at the hairstyle, that went out 25 years ago. Hmm. I'm no expert, but these don't look like pictures that were taken recently. Now, the clothes in the closet, skirts, blouses, dresses, are these Peggy's? Are they, Spence? Yes. The styles are about 25 years old. Now, here's a label in a skirt. It's a Lydia Carter. She was a designer who was fashionable 30 years ago. Well, Spence, tell us. I can't. Why can't you? I don't think I know how. Never mind how it sounds. Just tell it. Martin, did you ever think you could somehow get a second chance? To do what? To live your life over. To answer your question, no. Did you ever think you could go back to a point in time when you made a decision which changed everything for you? Where you crossed your own particular Rubicon and... And if you could go back, start again, and do the thing you really wanted to do? To answer your question again, no. That's because you never regretted the course of your life. And you did? Are you trying to tell me that you did? Every day for 23 years. All right, Spence. Uh, I won't press you. No, no, Ma no, Marty, don't put that sympathetic tone in your voice as if as if you think I'm some kind of nut. Look, you could plead insanity. Once again, Marty, Marty, I'm not crazy. Temporary insanity. Not for one minute. I asked you a question. Can you go back? Can you live your life over again? And I gave you my answer. No. But you can. You can do it. I did go back. Not for long. But I did go back. All right. All right, Spence. You did go back. And... If I hadn't lost my head, if only I ha hadn't killed Margaret, I could have stayed. I could have started over. Peggy, hmm? want to go to a movie? No. I missed the news broadcast. Anything happening? They think a war just started. Oh, come on, Peggy. Come on. There aren't going to be any more wars. Everybody knows that. People may be crazy, but they're not insane. <laughs> Where? I think the man said Korea. Someplace like that. But maybe I didn't hear it right. Hey, if you don't want to go to the movies, what do you want to do? Sit home and just listen to you. Tell me about the trip you're planning. Well, first, uh, don't call it a trip. We may never come back. It may take all our lives. Fine with me. And we may never find it. Great. What are we looking for? The origin of language. For instance, we say brother in English. German, Dutch, Scandinavian, so on, say a form of bruder. Same basic word. Latin, Greek, frater. The BR becomes FR. Russian, obrak. The differences are all in pronunciation. Okay. How did this one language spread so far and wide to cover so many different kinds of people? Abite. How? That's what I want to find out. And we will travel and study and research and one day, maybe... Maybe what? This Indo-European language, it's only one of 30 language families. At one time, was there one single language, the mother of all? Was there? I don't know. One day, I hope to find out. Are you, are you sure you wouldn't mind scrounging around Europe and Asia? Oh, I've been to Europe and Asia. Ah, but not with a backpack. <laughs> Now, with a sleeping bag. I'm going to love it. Uh, now, one thing must be clearly understood. At no time 
regardless of the bind we may find ourselves in, shall we ever, ever, under any circumstances, wire your father for money. <laughs> promise? I promise. <laughs> Hello, Margaret. Where have you been, Spencer? Oh, excuse me. I hope that doesn't sound shrewish. Well, no, no, it doesn't. Or as if I'm trying to run your life. Please, Margaret, cut it out. The reason I ask is because I had prepared dinner. I know. Didn't you get my message? Yes, I did. I got it at eight. Meanwhile, at seven, the Millers, the Brownsteins, and the Gladwells arrived. No, no, the Gladwells were here at 6.30. But what? Why? You had asked me to invite them to dinner. And these are your friends, Spencer. I'm sorry, Margaret. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. Well, if they were people I like, I would have been humiliated. This way, I was merely embarrassed. Well, I got through the evening, somehow. Spencer, tell me. Who is she? Margaret, Margaret, believe me, there is no... I start with the premise that it's my fault. Somewhere I must have failed you. I've gone wrong. But I don't know where, and I don't know how. Tell me, Spence, tell me. Margaret, please, Margaret. Please, Margaret, what? Oh, Spencer, I've been happy. You've been happy. Our marriage, it's been the envy of so many of our friends. Oh, darling, has it been a lie? Have we been living a lie all these years? Do you want the answer? I demand an answer. The answer is yes, yes, it's been a lie. Who is she, Spence? Who is she? Who is she, Spencer? Who is Peggy? I won't tell you, Martin. I should say, who was Peggy? Inspector, do you remember some time ago you saw Mrs. Chadwick? It was on business, I remember. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I do. It had to do with a burglary, Spence. A burglary in your house. Believe me, Margaret, this is no bother at all. You see, I felt if I called the local precinct, I'd have police traipsing all about the place. It just isn't worth it. Well, what happened? Well, it's silly, but... (laughs) Well, you know us. We never throw anything out. It's a sound idea. The worthless junk of yesterday has suddenly become expensive antiques. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yes, Margaret. All right, I'll be brief. (laughs) We have a storage space where we keep old things, clothes, knickknacks, you know, stuff that you say you'll throw out sometime. You never get around to it. You never do. And? Well... It's all been stolen. Stolen? It's missing. Well, it must have been stolen. I don't care about it, but it's just unnerving to consider that the house has been broken into. Mm. Well, send a list of the stuff to Sergeant Milrose. Huh? It's not important. But but I feel that since a crime has been committed, it, it should be reported. Did I do the right thing? Of course. Of course you did, Margaret. That list. I gave you that list, Sergeant. It's on my desk, sir. I'm sure most of the items in this closet were on it. Spencer, you were the burglar. Technically? Yes. She needed clothes, Marty. That girl, she's a fantasy. No, no, not Peggy. All right, look, for reasons that I may never understand, you feel you wasted your life. So you fantasized a way to go back, to start over. It was no fantasy. Sergeant Uh, Hill, it wasn't. You were sorry you married Margaret, Mm -hmm. which all by itself proves that you're insane, Spence. You created this Peggy, and you had to dress her in the period of 25 years ago. There is no Peggy. This whole thing happened in your mind. Thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, Sergeant? Uh, Sir, uh, that was from the lab. They scraped some grass samples from a skirt in the closet, and it's been identified as Duke of Wentworth Fescue. All right. Uh, It's a new kind of seed, just been planted for the first time. When? Well, about a month ago, which means somebody wearing this skirt was sitting in the grass in Benton Park... Very recently. You figure if a man's been married for 23 years, he may have a tendency to fantasize a bit. But Spencer Chadwick has created more than an illusion. He has brought forth flesh and blood. Particularly blood. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. While Peggy was only an illusion, she was Spencer Chadwick's private affair. But a living Peggy, or even a dead Peggy, is a serious matter for Police Chief Inspector Faraday. Spence, make it easy for all of us. Tell me, who is Peggy? Or who was Peggy? 
We can find out, Spence. We can check with the neighbors, the janitor, circulate your picture in the neighborhood, ask people if they've seen you around with a girl. You'll never find her. Don't say that. It's virtually impossible for a person to disappear without a trace. I still say you'll never find her. Damn it, Spence, I can't get used to it. You and Margaret and then you and Miss Peggy. How could you live with both of them? Didn't things get rough at home? Yes. Well, what brought on the showdown? Well, after a while, we couldn't go anywhere without Margaret seeing her. She's been looking at you all afternoon. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, believe me. Why don't you invite her down here? She'll have a better view from our box. Oh, Margaret. No reason we shouldn't all behave in a civilized manner. Introduce her. Margaret, I never saw that girl before in my life. Margaret, you're staring. No, not me. That girl's been staring at you all evening. Margaret, Margaret, believe me. Wherever we'd go, there'd be no peace. She always suspected somebody. Last week, it even happened when we were playing golf with you and Henrietta. You're up, Margaret. I'd use a three-wood on this hole, Margaret. All right. Oh, too bad. Well, you go up there and show me how, Marty. You rushed the shot. You lifted your head. I really don't care about golf. You made the date with Marty and Henrietta. We simply can't drop out of circulation. Spencer. That girl in the foursome behind us. Margaret, Margaret, she's not the one. Spencer, where were you? I had a meeting. Oh, well, we progress. <laughs> Used to be you didn't know, you couldn't remember. And now at least you're courteous enough to lie to me. You've been drinking, Margaret? Yes, yes, that's true. I have been drinking. Margaret, it's not good for you. Oh, I don't know. Let's consider that. Drinking is not good for me. I, I won't fight that. However, what you are doing, that's good for me, hmm? Although I must say, you're treating me nicer these days. You started off by asking, who are you? As if you didn't know me, and now at least you don't ask. The phone rang today, and I answered it, and the line was dead. What's going to happen, Spence? I intend to go away with her. Well, finally, you've admitted it. You are having an affair. Yes. Who's the woman? Who? Yes, who? I'm not sure you'd want to know. I have a right to know. Well, then, perhaps you do. Who is she, Spencer? She's you. Me? Yes, Margaret. The girl is you. <laughs> what kind of... No, 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 no. That's not quite right. She, she isn't you. Then what were you trying to say? She was you. She isn't Margaret Chadwick. She was Peggy Wainwright. Spencer, don't look at me like that. I'm scared. Do you want me to prove it to you? Come with me. Come with me right now. This is what Dr. Burbick was concerned about. Spence, it's no disgrace to have a breakdown. It's no shame to need psychiatric no, help. No, no. We're past all that, Margaret. Come with me. I want you to meet Peggy. Come with me. No, Spencer. You come with me. You come with me to Dr. Berger. You know, you know, Margaret, people like you have one answer. Whenever you're up against something you don't understand, you have one answer. Whenever you're faced with something that's beyond your experience, you have one answer. See a doctor. That solves everything. That takes care of everybody. And it never occurs to you that yours might just possibly be the wrong answer. Now, why are you so sure of yourself, Margaret? Why are you so sure that I'm the one who's wrong? Come with me, Margaret. I want you to meet Peggy. Or are you afraid? Does it look familiar, Margaret? Spence. This is 32 Benton Boulevard. It's our first address. I remember. Do you remember... The apartment number. Three. Three A. Oh, don't tell me it's still there. See for yourself. Spence. Oh, where did you... How did you... Our first table. And this bronze candlestick, our very first wedding present from my brother. 
these clothes. My clothes. How did they get there? They're here because they're Peggy's clothes. Oh, let's stand for Lydia Carter's skirt. Oh, you love me in that. Do you know that style's come back? I want to put it on. Do you remember what we used to do? We'd go for a walk. In the park. Dinner at Luigi's. We never had dinner at Luigi's. Oh, that's right. We couldn't afford it. And by the time we could, we weren't living here anymore. We stopped at the burger shop. What's tonight? Thursday. That means there's a free concert in the park. And then, free dancing. Oh, let's go, Spence. Let's do it all again. I never realized how much fun we had in those days. They were... They were great days, Peggy. Peggy? I always liked Peggy better. And somewhere along the line, you stopped calling me Peggy. When exactly did you stop calling me Peggy? When you became Margaret. I always wondered about that. How did I become Margaret? Why? Take a look around. See, Peggy? All the bags? The trunk? We're packed for the trip. The trip? The trip. You could to bed. Oh, oh, yes. We were all set to go. Yes. You remember? Yes. As a matter of fact, you were a little bit sick from the shots, remember? Remember? Yes. And then the telephone rang. The phone? Yes, yes, the phone rang. It was... It was... It, it, it was my mother. Yes, yes, it was your mother. I remember. Answer the phone. Go ahead, go ahead, answer it. You answered it that night. Hello? Yes. Y yes, mother? Oh, no. Yes. Oh, all right. All right, we'll go there. Right away. What is it, Peggy? My dad. He's had a stroke. How bad? Well, we don't know yet. Oh. Oh, Spence, I don't think we can... I mean, I... I can't leave Mother alone right now. No, we won't. Oh, Spence. I knew you'd understand. That's when you became Margaret. That's when you were no longer my wife, but your father's daughter. Take off the skirt. Leave it here. Go home. It belongs to Peggy. Spence, what's the matter with you? I'm Peggy. That night was the start of the it. The start of what? The start of a campaign to mold me into the kind of man you had in mind. The man who would enjoy the kind of existence you always had and always wanted. Safe, comfortable, secure. All you were asked to do was to help my father, who was deathly ill. Who else could have done it? My brother? It was supposed to just be a temporary arrangement. But it suited you, Spence. It suited you. I started making the kind of money your folks never dreamed of. I built an empire. I never wanted it. You, you wanted it. You wanted it so badly you stopped being Peggy. You went somewhere else. You, you became lost. But not me. I'm, I'm, I'm not lost. I found my way back. And when I got there, I found Peggy again. Now, take off that scratch and give it back to Peggy. Spencer, I listen to you. Now you listen to me. I've been listening to you for 23 years. And now we've come to the end. The bags are packed and it's not too late. We're leaving for Tibet. Peggy and me. Peggy? Peggy? Yes, Spencer, darling. Spence, get this straight. I'm Peggy. Don't listen to her, Spence. She was always out to destroy you. She almost did till you came back to me. I'm Peggy. The only Peggy you have. She's lying. She's trying to stop you. We are going to Tibet. That chance... You'll take that appointment from Satterfield. That refusal was just a ploy. You know it. He knows it. Shut up, Margaret. Shut her up, Spencer. Shut her up. I didn't destroy you. You destroyed me. You have to kill her, Spencer. Go ahead. Live with this fantasy of yours, this Peggy who rewrites history. She's all yours. I want my skirt. Take off that skirt. It's mine. It's all I want from you for 23 years of marriage. Don't say 
Now put you away, Spence. Get away from that door. No. Spence, keep away from me. No. You, you won't get out that way. Yes, I warn you. I'll hit you with this. Oh, no, I, no, you asked for it. You asked for it. Use a knife, Spence. Use a knife. Peggy. Peggy. Where are you? Peggy. You... You killed us both, Spence. Oh. Margaret. Oh. Margaret. Margaret. Office, Milrose speaking. Sergeant, this is Spencer Chadwick. I. I just murdered my wife. Well, as they say, all of us are two people. One is the person we think we are, and the other is the person we really are. And the secret of a long, happy life is to make sure the twain never meet. I'll be back shortly. This is WOR New York, your station for Mystery Theater. Well, the jury's still out. Oh, not on Spencer Chadwick. With him, it was open and shut. But on the basic idea, can you go back? Can you do it again? Well, to end on a non-controversial note, here is something everybody can do again. Tune in again for more suspense and excitement. Our cast included Richard Mulligan, Mandel Kramer, Marion Seldes, Bryna Rayburn, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. You know what I'm going to do, Laurie? I am going to turn this car right around and head back to the city. Oh, no, George. Please don't. What's that? We all fall You hear something like, like, like singing? Ring, a ring, a rose. Let me open the window. It's a pocket full. It's a woman. Pose. Singing that old okay. nursery rhyme. A two. We all fall down. But what's that snapping ring, sound? Ring, it sounds rose, like a piece of leather. It sounds like a whip. George, what are you doing? I'm getting out. No, oh, don't leave me, George. I'm coming with you. Wait. Okay, but stay down. close to me. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant dreams. Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. The Mystery Playhouse, a rebroadcast for the service men and women of the United Nations. Good evening, this is Peter Lorre. (laughs) 
Would it bore you to hear a tale of tragic murder? Are you unwilling to sit through the telling of a strange and horrible story? The brief narrative of a man caught in a web of evil? You're not? <laughs> Then, my friends, keep right on listening to the Mystery Playhouse. <laughs> Humor, I've heard it said many times, is of real benefit to him who possesses one. This particular sense has come to be so generally admired that it has attained the stature of a first-class virtue. Well, the fellow whom you're about to meet, while while hardly falling into the virtuous category, he does have a sense of humor. <laughs> Things like murder, or hate, and madness, or, or someone telling him his mother just died, <laughs> practically rolls him in the aisles. He loves a good ghoulish joke. Oh, and he loves to tell them too. He's about to start one now. So follow me, please, to the inner sanctum, and your host Raymond. <laughs> Friends of the Inner Sanctum. Now come in, won't you? This is your host Raymond again, disturbing the peace. Did you ever, ever had the screaming memes? Did you ever get an attack of the yelling and wailing jitters? You walk in your sleep. Did you ever wake in the middle of the night, shrieking at the top of your lungs? Oh, you do. Well, you must be an awfully hard person to live with. Friends, it's time for our story to begin. From this point on, forget everything pleasant. Get a finger ready to chew on. Turn the lights down low, and listen to Peter Lorre tell you the blood-curdling tale. Death is a joker. Come with me to the criminal courts building. A tense hush falls upon the spectators as Charles Luther takes the stand. Gentlemen of the jury. I'm accused of murder. I'm an actor, a comedian. Look at my face. Ugly, huh? Yes, so ugly that whoever looks at it laughs. I'm not telling you this to win sympathy for myself. I, I tell you this because it is important to your understanding. The strange events that brought me to this courtroom today to plead for my life. Shortly before midnight of November 28th, I went to the apartment of my friend Robert Langwell, the famous actor in Matinee. Good job. Well, this is a surprise. Come in, come in. Thank you. Would you like a drink? No, don't bother. I don't want anything. No. Well, here, may I take your thing? Mm. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Oh, George. Yes, I have the money for you. You'll be up. When? Twenty minutes. Yes. Goodbye. George Galvin. You know him, Charles? Yes. Rotten actor. But an excellent poker player. So I heard. Mm. Robert. Robert, before leaving the theater tonight, someone told me that you and Julie Winthrop are going to be married. Is it true? Yes, we'll be married in two weeks. Right after my wife gets a decree in Reno. You must not marry Julie. Not marry Julie. Well, who are you to tell me what I can do? I know Julie well, and I, I also know you. That's why you must not marry her. Charles, it might be better for you to mind your own business. Julie and I are in love with each other. No, you are not. She's fascinated by your good looks. She, she's impressed by your fame, but she, she does not love you. Now look here. We may be old friends, but I've stood all I'm going to. I. Ah, wait a moment. Hmm. I get it now. You're in love with her yourself. I. I'm in love with Julie. 
No, we we are just friends. Friends? <laughs> You're madly in love with her. That's why you came here tonight, isn't it? No. <laughs> friends. Stop your laughing. You, in love with a girl like Julie. <laughs> Why should my love make you laugh? Oh, so you admit it, huh? All right, I do. Why is it so funny? <laughs> do you think she'd have you? You, a, a clown, ugly, clumsy. <laughs> you, in love with Julie? <laughs> and why not? Why not? You! Stop your laughing. Stop it. <laughs> Can I? Look at yourself. Stop. Let go of me. No. You're choking. Let go. A joke. A joke. A joke. Laugh. Go ahead. Laugh now. Laugh. Robert. Robert. I didn't mean it. Robert. Lord, what have I done? I rushed out of his apartment, trembling. I turned my coat color up to hide my face. The streets were crowded with people coming from the late movies and restaurants. I tried to make myself act naturally, but it was impossible. Everyone I saw, every pair of eyes that looked at me seemed to accuse me of my crime. I stopped, waited for the light to change. Paper, mister. Morning paper. Read about the Reynolds execution. Here, let me have one. There you are. I I didn't know Reynolds was to be executed tonight. They burned him. Well, he deserved it. Murdering his friend like he did. Oh, wait a minute, mister. You forgot your chain. Never mind, never mind. I went to my apartment and I looked at the newspaper I'd bought. There was a photograph of Reynolds on the first page. In his face, I saw my future. The shattered hopes. The torture of the trial. The horrible, nerve-wracking experience of waiting for death. I flung the paper away. I went to the window. I opened it. I looked down 17 stores to the ground. <laughs> How tiny people look. The automobile lights move like so many fireflies. I climb out on the edge. I braced my arms. I took a deep breath. One last look. I closed my eyes and... I hesitated a moment. I decided to answer it. I closed the window. Went to the door. Hello, Charles. Julie. Why did you rush away from the theater tonight? I was anxious to talk to you. Talk to me about, about what? I, I need your advice, Charles. What's wrong? Well, it's Robert. What happened? Well, nothing happened. It, it's just that I'm not sure I love him. I'm not sure? Yes, when I'm with him, everything seems all right. He's mm. handsome and charming, but when I'm alone, I begin to wonder and to doubt. Why? Can't you guess why? Guess? You... You love someone else? Yes. Well, who is it? You... Me? Yes, that's what I came here to tell you. That's why I don't want to marry him. Me? Yes, I would have told you before, but I was so afraid of making a fool of myself. Me? You didn't seem to care. I didn't care. Julie, this is crazy. I loved you from the moment I saw you. You loved me? Yes. But, darling, why didn't you tell me? I tell you? How could I? You, you are too young. You are so beautiful. And I look at me, ugly, clumsy. How could I speak to you? Oh, you both were. How you lost me was nothing to me. Nothing? Of course not, darling. How lucky we are we found out in time. In time? 
In time. Oh, merciful heavens. What a joke. <laughs> what a joke. Charles, what's wrong? Oh, what what a tears joke. Tears down your face. <laughs> Charles, you're hysterical. Now stop it. What a stop joke. It. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Julia. Something you must know. Yes, sir. Tonight I committed a murder. Murder? What are you talking about? I killed Robert. Killed Robert? Oh, out of your mind. You don't know what you're saying. But is it true? I went to his apartment and we quarreled and I killed him. Oh, no. You told me a moment ago that you loved me. <laughs> do you still love me? Yes, Charles. And, and tell me what to do, Julie. Help me. I, I, I can't think. I, I don't know where to turn, but... What can I do, Julie? What can I do? Oh, pull yourself together, Charles. This may not be as hopeless as you think. Why? Was Robert alone in the apartment when you called? Yes. Were you seen entering or leaving? No. Are you sure? Yes, his apartment is on the second floor. I, I walked up and down. What time did you get there? Shortly before midnight. And what did you do before that? Went to a movie. Movie? How long did you stay there? Oh, only about 20 minutes. Do you have the ticket stop? Huh? Yes, here it is. Charles, do you realize what this means? They, they may never find out about you. Never find out? That's right. They won't suspect you since they can't know your motive. No one saw you enter or leave, and you have an excellent alibi. Motive? Alibi, Julie? Do you realize what we are doing? We are talking of this as, as if we planned this crime as, as though we were criminals. But I committed a crime, yes, but I'm no criminal. I, I didn't mean to do it. I know, darling, I know. But you must think of your own life now. Oh, and mine. Yeah. Yes, Julia. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm not a criminal, but I must play the role of a criminal now. A subtle, clever criminal who is cunning enough to escape punishment. Can I do it? Can I do it, Julie? Charles, listen to me. We must find out how much the police know. If it's hopeless and they have found out about you, then it would be best to give yourself up. But let's not make any decisions until we know. But how can we know? Did Robert expect anyone tonight? Yes, George Galvin phone probably was there, and he... He said he'd be up in about 20 minutes. Then the body must have been discovered by now. Yes, I'm, I'm sure the police must be there by this time. I think that I'll go to Robert's apartment. No, Julie, no, no. I, I don't want you to become involved. I'm already involved. Went for me, this horrible thing would never have happened. The least I can do is to help you now. But Julie... Promise, promise me you'll not leave this apartment, Charles. All right. I won't be long. Julie. Yes. If something happens, if, if something goes wrong and is separated before you return, I, I want you to know that I don't know what to say, Julie. You don't have to say it, darling. I know what you mean. Goodbye. Goodbye. A criminal. I have to think like one. To act like one. Have to be one. What question would be asked? Where were you at twelve o'clock midnight of November twenty-eighth? Uh, I was in a movie. I'm here's the stop. No, no, no. They, they can see me because that I'm lying. My voice must not tremble. I, I shouldn't be so quick with the answer. Where were you at twelve midnight of November twenty-eighth? Where was I? Let me see. Well, I, I left the theater and I went to a movie. It was a very amusing picture. <laughs> very amusing. Can you prove what you say? Prove? Well, I don't know. I, I, it would be difficult, I. Well, I may have to pick it up somewhere. Yes, here. <laughs> Let me show it to you. Here it is. Did you ever quarrel with Robert Langwell? Quarrel with... We were friends. We played in many shows together. We were on the best of terms. That's all, Mr. Luther. You may leave now. Yes. I can, please. 
It is possible. I can escape punishment. Police. Can it be the police? Or maybe it is Julie. Good evening, Charles. George Gill. I know it's rather late for an unexpected visit. Yes, it is. But this is important, Charles. A matter of uh, life and death, you might say. What do you mean? Have you a cigarette? Hmm? Yes, here. Thanks. Well, what's the matter, Charles? Your hand's trembling. <laughs> it's nothing. You don't seem to be your usual self this evening. No quips, no jokes. What's wrong? I don't always feel like joking. Yes, Charles. It's strange about human nature, isn't it? Who would have ever dreamed that tonight, a few minutes before midnight, you entered Robert Langwell's apartment, quarreled with him over Julie, and choked him to death? What are you talking about? Uh, you're an excellent actor, Charles. But you're wasting your talents on me. Save them for the footlights. Or the police. Police? Will you please tell me what all this is about? Still acting, hmm? Now look, Charles. You killed Robert shortly before midnight tonight. You are mistaken. I was in a movie at that time. Oh, so that's your alibi. Very clever. No, Charles. Either we discuss terms now or I go to the police. Wait. How did you find out? That is my secret. What do you want? Money. All you have on hand. All you can dig up. All right. Come with me. I I have some money in the bedroom. All right. Uh, just a moment. What is the business? Yeah. What is... Why? I'm taking no chances. Let's go. All right. Well? Where's the money? Charles, stand back or I'll fire. Stand back. No! Let go of my hand. Let go. I'll twist it. I'll, I'll twist it till the gun points to your head. There. There. Charles, let go of my hand. You don't know what you're doing. Come on, come on. Fire now. The bullet will enter your brain. Fire. Charles. Fire. Charles, don't. I'll make you fire. I'll squeeze your fingers. Charles, let go. Go on. This is all a joke. I'll make you. Stop it, Charles. Um. Ah. Ah. Just a second. Just a second. Charles. Darling. Darling, there's nothing more to worry about. Everything's all right now. We can be married and go on living and never fear anything. What makes you say that? Darling, you didn't commit a crime at all. What do you mean? Robert's alive. Alive? Yes, he's downstairs now paying the taxi. Robert? He's alive? Yes. I spoke to him about the marriage and he was wonderful about the whole thing. Darling, aren't you happy? Her worries are all over. You can smile and be gay. That must be Robert now. Hello, Charles. Robert. I thought you were... Well, I'm not. But, but how did you... You see, I fainted. George Galvin came in and brought me to. George Galvin. Did you tell George Galvin what happened? Yes, I did. Look here, Charles. As I told Julie... I'm willing to forget the whole thing, if you are. Forget? Forget? Yes. It might have ended tragically, you know, but... Thinking it over, I realize I'm as much to blame as you are. So if you're willing to, shake hands. Shake hands? See you now, darling. There's nothing more to worry about. I feel so happy I could... Charles, what's the matter with you? It's... It's nothing... <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> Gentlemen of the jury, I became a criminal. Well, because I thought I had committed a crime and I had to think like a criminal. 
my motives were those of all men. I wanted happiness and wanted marriage to the woman I loved. What would you have done in my place? And I still think I know that guy. I wish I could place him. Well, it must be wonderful to have a sense of humor, but I don't think Charlie feels much like laughing. Do you? We'll pay a return visit to the inner sanctum and its fun-loving host, Raymond, soon, but don't go, please. Not until we drop in at the green room, where the players are rehearsing our next performance in the mystery playhouse. Come with me, please. Come, come. <laughs> Change the dressings at midnight, and again in the morning, nurse. Yes, doctor. Well, doctor, what did you find? Will I be blind? Is it very bad? Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Denton. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. You... You're sure? You aren't just saying that. I'm quite sure. Valerie. Valerie, did you hear that? I... I'm not going to be blind. Valerie? Valerie, where are you? Right here, darling. Did you hear? I won't be blind. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, darling, it's marvelous. You... You don't sound very excited. Valerie, don't you realize I'm going to see you again? She doesn't sound excited because I don't want you to be excited, Mr. Denton. You've got to relax. Try to sleep. Sleep? With this ungodly pain? My eyes feel as though they were on fire. That will stop as soon as the opiate I gave you takes hold. You'll be comfortable, I'm sure. Now, good night. You're going now, Doctor? Yes, I'll... I'll look in on... on your husband in the morning. Stephen. Yes, Valerie? Do you mind if I step out into the corridor for a moment? But you... You promise not to leave me. I, I'm afraid, Valerie. Everything's so dark, I... The nurse will be here, dear, if you want anything. I just want to ask Dr. Wade some questions. Questions? But he's already told us... That yes, he... Stephen, I know. But I'd like to find out about the treatment and how I'm to take care of you when we get you home. You know, just little things. All right. But, but hurry back. I, I want you near me. I will, dear. A good night, Mr. Denton. Good night, Doctor. And thank you. You're quite welcome. After you, Mrs. Denton. Thank you. I suggest we step into the consultation room across the hall. We'll have more privacy. All right. Here we are. Thank you. Well, it's been a long time, Valerie. Yes, Paul, it has. Almost ten years, isn't it? About that. Strange that you should have called me, of all people, to treat your husband's eyes. Oh, I, I was panicky, Paul. I didn't know what to do. It all happened so suddenly. Stephen was working in his laboratory at the house when suddenly I heard a violent explosion. I ran in and found him clutching his eyes and screaming, I'm blind. First thing I thought of was an ambulance. Then you... Why didn't you think of me ten years ago? It's not fair, Paul. Is it fair to turn your back on me and then to marry a man almost twice your age? Paul, please, why bring up ancient history? It isn't ancient history to me. I've never forgotten you. Paul, about Stephen's eyes. What about them? I have a feeling that you weren't telling him the truth. You're right. Oh, you mean he's not going to regain his sight? He's going to be blind? Oh, Paul. You don't expect me to be to be terribly concerned, do you, Valerie? After all, he did take you away from me. Don't be vindictive, Paul. It wasn't Stephen's fault. He didn't even know of your existence. And you never told him that we were on the point of being married? No, never. <laughs> it's rather ironic that we should meet again at the bedside of my rival. 
your husband. A man who may forever walk in darkness. Don't say that, Paul. It's horrible. But unfortunately true. A moment ago, you told me not to be vindictive. I'm not, really. But if I were, I could have my fill of vengeance if I told him about us. And then told him that he'll be blind forever. You wouldn't, Paul. Or I might take another form of revenge. I could tell you that an operation is called for. A very delicate operation. Are you trying to say that there might be a chance? Yes. But supposing I refuse to perform the operation. Paul, you're joking. You can't mean that. Perhaps not. But you call me vindictive. Suppose I operate and my scalpel slips. What if he dies? That would be murder. You're not a murderer, Paul. You wouldn't risk your professional reputation. Why must you torment me this way? You really love him, don't you? Yes, I do. Then forget the things that I've been saying. I want you to think of me as a friend. I want you to trust me. I do trust you, Paul. Thank you. Now as to the possibility of surgery. Here is the situation. The transparent film over your husband's eyes, the corneas, were burned and torn with the explosion. They've been so damaged that blindness will result, even though the eyes heal. But you think an operation would cure that? Possibly, although it's a very delicate job. The injured cornea must be peeled away and replaced by a fresh, healthy one. Where can you get healthy corneas? From the eyes of the dead. Oh. It isn't quite as horrible as it sounds, Valerie. You know, dying peace, people often will their eyes for just this purpose. We maintain what we call a corneal bank. It's much the same as a blood bank, only but there's this difference. Corneal tissue can't be stored more than 48 hours. It must be fresh, or it's no good. You have some available in the bank? No, that's the trouble. I'm afraid we haven't. But there's got to be some, Paul. I don't know where, Valerie. Unless... Unless what? I was just thinking. Last night, one of the interns asked me to look at a charity case that puzzled him. The patient is a Hindu or a Persian named Chandra. He lives in a dirty little shack near the waterfront. Yes, Paul? I stopped by and examined him. I found an incurable condition. There's no way to save him. He won't live more than a day or two, but his eyes are healthy. You mean, you think he might... I don't know. You'd have to have his consent, of course. Take me to him, Paul. I'm sure I can make him understand. Oh, it may not be so easy, Valerie. He's a strange person. A mystic and a spiritualist. Let me try. Just take me to him. All right. We can go there now. to sound familiar to you, huh? <laughs> That's right. It's Boris Karloff, up to his old tricks. I think it might amuse you to be on hand for our next performance, when we present Mr. Karloff and Creeps by Night. This is Peter Lorre closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. the Armed Forces Radio Service.
Metacom presents Arch Obler's Lights Out Everybody. It is later than you think. This is Arch Obler bringing you another in our series of stories of the unusual. And once again, we caution you. These Lights Out stories are definitely not for the timid soul. So we tell you calmly and very sincerely, if you frighten easily, turn off your radio now. The Immortal Gentleman. A melodrama about something every one of us has thought of at one time or another. If I could only live forever... Our star, Mr. Franco Tone, in Arch Obler's newest radio drama, The Immortal Gentleman. Beautiful that the hands of the sisters, death and night, incessantly, softly remold again and ever again the face of the soiled world. Be frightened, John. Please, don't be. Yes, I know I screamed, but don't be afraid for me. I'm all right, really, I am. No, no, don't say anything. Just listen. The reason that I screamed, it made me happy. Oh, what are you Oh, I know it sounds confused, but I can tell you freely now for the first time since I've known you. Tell me what? About what happened. Tell you about myself, and then you'll understand, and then we'll both be happy. Remember, you once said you never could be happy with me. Oh, please. No, please, don't say anything. If you do, I want to hold you in my arms. And I've got to talk this thing out first. Talk it out from the time before I knew you until a few moments ago when I screamed and frightened you. You know, you were right. I've been a coward. But not of men or things or living. Just of not living. You don't know what I mean, do you? Must I say it? Must I say the word? All right, I will. I've been afraid of death. Yes, believe me, Joan, all my life it was that way. Even as a boy, I couldn't be happy because of him. So one thought was in me all through life. If I could only live forever, if I wouldn't die, if I could only live forever. The thought chasing itself in a never-ending circle. So there was no happiness. And the fear in me was in my face and in my work, and you knew it and everyone knew it, but they didn't know why. No, Tonight, the echo that is still in my ears, I cried out in fear in front of everyone. And I'm going to tell you why I cried out, and then you'll understand me. And why, I say, I'm free and happy for the first time in my life. And, Joan, if it's too strange to believe, just listen patiently. We were sitting in the auditorium, you and I, the politician up on the stage, talking, talking... In this coming election, I repeat again, the issue will be clear... An issue made clear by our glorious party. You young men and women... Sitting there, you next to me, I wasn't listening to him on the stage. I was thinking the same infernal thoughts I thought all my life whenever I was alone. Of him. Him. And then... Yes, to you. To every one of you here. A challenge that we must accept. Face and challenge in turn. Speaker's voice wasn't the same. I looked up. No, not the same. The other one, an old man, this one young. Couldn't quite see his face, so dark in the hall. Had something happened to the lights? I turned toward you, said, Joan, when did the lights... I stopped. You you weren't there. Believe me, not there. Another woman. Did you speak to me? She said that. I said, where... where's Joan? Joan? Well, she was sitting right next to me. She... You have her chair. Where did she... I mean, the young lady who was sitting here, where did she go? I've been here for hours. But she was here. Here, I tell you. Quiet, quiet, the speaker. The time has passed for pleadings. The time has passed for petitions. We are representative of youth. And youth is the time for action. So we must act. The speaker, what did he matter? I sat there, couldn't figure it out. You, Joan, where had you gone? Could I have dozed off and you slipped out and this other woman taken your place? Yet, 
How strange you're leaving without a word. And then... Wind. Wind in the auditorium. I looked up. The sky. No roof. A single star and clouds. No roof. Sleep? No, awake. I got up to go. No, no, sit down. No one can leave. But my friend... You have sworn to stay. You must. I sat down. Sworn to stay... What in the world? I sat down. You know there can be no compromise. There will be no compromise. For if we compromise, we are doomed as they have always doomed us. Speaker, what did he matter? No roof on the place. Crazy. How could a roof disappear in a moment without... I said to the girl, where's the roof? What's happened to this place? Where are we? You know. No? No. What? Well, I'd get out of the place. I'd find you, Joan. Started to go again with the girl's hand tight on my wrist. No, don't. You swore to stay. Swore? You swore. They swore. He speaks the truth. But what? Listen. Listen. Good, then now, good friends, let us put an end to words. This meeting of ours was destined. For 500 years, destined. What was he saying for 500 years, destined? For what? None of us can say we have moved quickly. For in the meditation of these 500 years has come the essence of truth. A truth that burns bright in the hearts of all of us. What kind of a political speech was that? And so an end to words. In this meeting we have spoken words which none dare question. Now the time has come for action which none dare deny us. The girl leaned close and whispered. None dare deny us. Deny us? Deny what? Wanted to yell out just the way I did a few moments ago, but I couldn't. Something about the place, the speaker, people around me. I, I could only sit there, questions pounding in my head. Youth is action. Action is youth. We will act together and make ourselves a new world, a better world, our world. Meeting over, everyone getting up, the girl said... Come with me. Where? You know. I know. Crowd pressing around me, dark, strange faces, young, angry faces, none of my friends. My friends? Well, where were they? Joan, where were you? The auditorium in ruins, as she led me out, I saw that. It was madness. Yet a strangely intriguing madness, so I walked with her. Led me through a door. I could hear voices. She said... Stand here a moment. I want to talk to you. Tell me, why do you act so strangely? Don't you want to go through with it? Through with what? There. That's what I mean. You talk as if you don't know. I couldn't speak. Stood there. It's a glorious morning for all of us. We've waited 500 years, some of us, for this. 500 years? What was she... I said... Five hundred years? Well, perhaps not you, but I've waited three hundred and fifty myself. What? What did you say? Three hundred and fifty years, and now I can't wait another moment. The thought of another empty day suffocates me. Am I insane or you? Insane? I don't know the word. Out of your head. You or I? You are a strange one. And yet you came here. Why? Well, to hear a speech. So, to hear but not to act, eh? You will. You will. All of us will. And then... The moonlight from under a cloud, and then her face. I saw her face clearly for the first time. Hers was a loveliness beyond the word. Sixteen, seventeen, she couldn't have been more. Freshness of the morning. And yet her eyes, old, bright, wise, so strange, her old eyes and that young face. I stood there, staring at her. I tell you this, if one of us fails, we all fail, and that can't happen. Remember that. Now come. They're waiting. Followed her. A room quite dark. Many people in it. Quiet, please. Quiet. There is little time to waste. We will now draw lots. Each of you take a paper as the box is passed. Most of the slips are blank. Only 24 are numbered. Whoever draws a numbered slip stays. The others go. Slips? Draw lots? What was this? Draw lots for what? Someone came close, held out a box. The girl said... Take a paper. I did. She did. The others did. She said... Look at the slip. I did. A number. Eleven. She said... Good. I too. Held out the paper in her hand. I saw the number twelve on it. You and I. You and I. She and I what? All those without numbers leave. All those without numbers leave. The push of bodies around me. And in a moment, there were only a few left. The girl at my side, motionless. Now we can risk lights. And in a moment, lights began to glow. I stood there, blinking, and then... 
I saw. Twenty-four people in that room, men and women. Twenty-four, I counted them, and all of them looked alike. Yes, alike, I tell you, men and women. And their faces as the girls. Twenty-four faces alike as copies of pictures strung along the wall. They, in turn, were staring at me. Who is he? A voice said. Who is he? Another said. I don't know. I've never seen him before. Who is he? They came close around me. Not one of us. Who is he? Who is he? Not one of us. All those faces alike, staring, talking, staring, talking. The girl spoke. I knew it was she because her hand was on my arm. Leave him alone. He is an Atavar. An Atavar. Oh, an Atavar. Atavar. Atavar? What was an Atavar? I wanted to speak, but she spoke. He'll be all right. I'll see to that. But an Atavar is unpredictable. But I tell you, he'll be with me. He drew 11. I drew 12. He'll be with me. But they're undependable. You know that. Never can tell about an Atavar. But I'll take care Never of him. Never can tell. I'll take care of him. They stood there arguing about me, Joe. Yes, arguing about me. Whether I could, whether I would, whether I was reliable, unreliable. And always that word, Atavar. Atavar? Atavar? Mad dreams or mad adventure, whatever it was, I didn't know. Their argument stopped. Apparently, the girl had won. The leader said, All right, Atavar, you'll be with her. Now, all of you, listen. This Atavar is with us, and with us, he'll stay until it's ended. Ended? Ended? What had begun? What would end? One question, Atavar. What is your age? My age? You want to know my age? Well, didn't you hear, Atavar? What is your age? The girl said, Tell him. My, my age is 25. What did you say? 25. Do not joke. Tell us your age. I told you, 25. For a moment, no one spoke. They looked at each other, shook their heads slowly, shoulders shrugged. A Natavar, just a Natavar. The girl said... Don't worry, any of you. I'll take care of him. He'll do as he's told. Do as he's told? Do what? Told it or what? I wanted to open my mouth. Then I didn't, because the leader said... All right, our last word. There are 24 of you, 12 pairs. Each pair will go out together. If one fails, the other will succeed. But when? Now, at once. We have waited long enough for them. I alone have waited 400 years. And I 200. 300. I 425. I understood. Like a blow on the head, I understood. These people, mad. <laughs> that was it. Talking of living hundreds of years, out of their heads all of them. Listening to them, I knew that. 340 years. I've waited 170 years. And that explained the likeness of their faces. Some sort of weird interbreeding of a family resulting in feeble-mindedness. Well, how did I come among them? Went outside. The girl with me, everyone going off in pairs. Their faces tense, angry, going off to some strange madness. The girl said... Wait here. I'll get what we need, then we'll keep our appointment. Wait here. Joan, believe me, as she went off into the darkness, leaving me there alone, I swear my head was spinning as if it were on a pivot. And as it spun, the thoughts in my head spun with it. Madness. Dream. Madness. Dream. Madness. Dream. Madness. Dream. Madness. Dream. Madness. What was happening to me? And then a thought. Had what I'd feared all my life happened at last? Had I died? The wind dead. suddenly was cold about me. Dead? But I was... Dead? Colder. Dead? Was I? And then someone was standing by me. Not the girl, but a man. Smooth, young, handsome face with those old, wise eyes looking at me. He said... You have not started yet, Atavar. No. No! Strange I've never seen you before. There are so few Atavars. You know, generally, they are not permitted to develop. And looking at him, I knew I was alive. Of course. And dream? This was no dream. Yes, there are so few Atavars. I said, Atavar? Atavars? What the devil are Atavars? <laughs> you are a strange one. Well, tell me, what are Atavars? Why call me an Atavar? Well, because you are. You are not like us, you know. You are a throwback to the individualistic, unconditioned, embryonic development. What? <laughs> but then, of course, you don't understand, do you? No, an Atavar wouldn't. Well, tell me. It is strange that they should have permitted you to develop and not to have explained to you the difference. What difference? What? 
once in every 2,000 births, and that means once in every 2,000 years, we don't have many new ones in this world, you know, something happens in the incubation process, and instead of one of us perfected ones, one of you develops. A throwback to ancient times, an imperfect creature out of the past. In other words, an atavism. Understand? An atavism. Atavism? Atavar? Atavism? What the devil's name was this? But he kept talking. He said, Yet, Atavar, though you are, life must be miserable for you as it is for the rest of us. Life? Miserable? Well, of course. Why else would you have joined with us? Oh, this is going to be a glorious night for us. But not for them. I... I don't understand exactly what <laughs> Of you... course not. Things would be confused for the Atavar mind, wouldn't they? That's the infernal trouble with our minds. Things are much too clear and concise and understandable. And they bred all the confusion out of us a long time ago. Well, now they'll pay for it. Please, tell me... Just look at me. I've lived just a handful of years. 250. He said that, Joan. Yes, believe me, 250 years. And yet, believe me, Atavar, I'm weary unto the death we'll never know. Death we'll never know. What good is there in it for any of us living forever? Living forever. For the first 50 years of our lives, they condition us. All right. We come out with our brains filled with all knowledge of all time. Paragons all. Geniuses all. But what good does it do us? What good? Always they are in the way. They? Look, Adava, you can't be so completely a fool or they would never have let you out. They are the old ones. And what is interesting and exciting in the world, they do. They and no one else. And we who came after them, after they conditioned the world against sickness, illness, age and death... We have nothing left to do. I see. They hold the key positions. They. And we stand by and grind the weary years away in nothingness. A world of youth full of the want to do and there's nothing to do. And yet there are worlds out there where we might go. But again, they stand in our way and say, no, it shouldn't be done. They. They, the old ones, all around us, holding us down, giving us everlasting life. And then giving us nothing to live for. But this night will change it. You and I and the rest of us, 24. Well, here comes your partner, and I must go with mine. Goodbye, Atavar. Good luck. He was gone. And then the girl at my side, under her arm, a small black box. All right, we can go now. She took my arm. We walked along. In almost a moment, we were in a straight, broad street. Straight, shiny, glistening, bright with a light I've never seen. A quiet, empty street. Clean, bright, and strange. As if in a dream... A dream? This was no dream. And then she said... In here. We stepped upon a platform, part of the sidewalk. It was moving, carrying us swiftly, swiftly down the street. An escalator, moving sidewalk, I, I don't know what. Faster, faster, things rushing by. Strange, towering buildings. And then I heard that she was talking to me. I saw you talking to Aro. He has the easy one. We've a hard one. Two hundred and fifty years, he said. Aro? Yes, that's true. Lived two hundred and fifty years? It isn't much, I know. You must be older. Or are you? Hard to tell with an Atavar. How old are you? I? Four hundred. Four hundred years, but not of living. What do you mean? You know. They, with all their years. Before we were born, they took the work of the world. And what is left for us? To wander up and down. Pretty ornaments with empty lives. But they forgot one thing. They left ambition in us. And this night we'll find a place to use it. How? Adavar, you are a fool. You know and yet you don't know. How can we find a place for ourselves as long as they do as they please? Listen. In the very ancient world, men lived a few years and then died. And they thought that was horrible, but that was good. For when they died, there was a place for youth. Yes. One would fall in his place, and a young one took his place. Sometimes he did better than the one who had gone before, so the world progressed. But now no one falls, no one dies. And so the old ones stay and stay and stay, and we, the young ones, have no place. And when we want to make a place, the old ones say no. The thing we were riding climbed higher. Higher. And still she talked. We pleaded and petitioned, and they do not listen, so tonight we act. You and I, Adavar, one of twenty-four. Act? By turning back the time to when men died and gave the younger ones their place. What? The wrong of each man died with him when he died in that old world. And so tonight we'll see that wrongs are given their belated rest. How? You and I, Adavar, we'll do our part. Up there. She was pointing up. I looked up to where the building ended. In a cloud. She sits up there. 
5,000 years she's lived every day since the day science shut out death. 5,000 years, but tonight we begin to live. Here. Into my hand, she thrust the black container. I said, what? You do it. You. In a moment, we reach the spire. She'll come out all smiles and happiness. They can be happy, the old ones who have the work. Do it then, you must. What? Throw it at her and she'll be free of life and we'll be free of life without living. You'll do it at her while you will. Throw it at her. Throw it? What? The thing in my hands? What did she mean to free that person up there from life? The weight in my hands. Then suddenly I realized some kind of explosive. She expected me to throw it at that person up in the tower. Me to kill. You will. You will. No. No. The word tore through my head and with it tore away confusion. I knew... I understood. This was the world of the future where science had doomed the death I feared. Men lived forever, and these young ones had no chance. And now they were out to kill and make their chance, and I was to kill for them, with them. You will. You will. You will. No. You no. will. Not you will. My world. Not you will. Mine. You I will. Go back. You will. I'm saying that. You I will. will. There she is, the matriarch. Throw it. Throw it. I won't kill. Not I, and I won't. Give it to me. Get me there! Get me there! No! I jumped. Falling. I was falling through the horrible space of that horrible future. Down and down and down. The glistening sides of the building rushing past me. Down. Twisting. Clawing at the air. Down and down. And then I remembered in my arms that explosive. I tried to throw it, but my hands kite around it. I couldn't unlock them. The ground coming up. I screamed. And there I was. Sitting next to you in the hall where I'd been before. The politician upon the stage. My friends around me. You next to me frightened at my cry. <laughs> and the roof quite intact above me. So here it ends, Joan. Sitting there, I stepped ahead in time until a day when men had conquered death. And so somehow I... I'm not afraid of him, the one at my shoulder anymore, because I think it's good that men should live, then die, and so end the evil in them and give their place to others. Tell me, Joan, do you agree? Beautiful that the hands of the sisters, death and night, incessantly, softly remold again and ever again the face of this soiled world. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. All right, men. I guess that's all. Put him on the stretcher and take him to the morgue. Oh, must I stay, Inspector? For a while, Mrs. Bunting. Oh, dear. I... I need all the details for my report. Oh, that such a thing could have happened here. Here in my own house. Each week at this hour... Peter Lorre brings us the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces 
culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Lodger, by Mrs. Bellock Lowndes. Peter Laurie is The Lodger, and Alan Bunting is played by Miss Agnes Moorhead. Mystery in the Air, brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Yes, let your T-Zone decide which cigarette you like best. Your T-Zone, that's T for taste and T for throat, is your true proving ground for any cigarette. So try a camel on your T-Zone. Introduce camel's rich, full flavor to your taste. Acquaint your throat with Camel's cool mildness. See if you don't decide, like so many other smokers, that Camel's suit your tea zone to a tea. On, Mrs. Bunting. You said you were looking for a lodger? Uh, yes, yes, Inspector, we had to. But I never dreamed such a thing could happen here to us. Why, it was only last Tuesday night my husband and I were sitting before our fire reading the newspaper about the latest murder. It was the fifth. By, by the Avenger. Yes. Yes, I remember saying distinctly. Robert. Robert, that he could be the fellow standing next. To you, or maybe the man you bump into. It's a terrible thought. Yes, but it appears to me that the Avenger's too quick for the police. And look here. Look here, it says this girl he got last night was like all the others. Pretty blonde, and she just come from a music hall. Exactly like all the rest of his victims. Oh, what a pity. Ellen, have you stopped to think who fits that description perfectly? Our own Daisy. Oh, sure. What a pretty thought, Bunting. The good thing she's with her aunt instead of here. London isn't a safe place for any girl now. Just the same. I can't help thinking how fine it would be to have her here with well, us. Well, there's no sense even talking about it. We just can't afford it. I know that, Ellen, but I hope we could manage it some way. How? Haven't I script myself half crazy trying to keep us going? I know, Ellen. Well, don't you go worrying about it. I think we can... Now, who do you suppose that could be? Could it be someone looking for a room? Oh, I wish it were. Then you could have your daisy back. Well, I went to the front door. And when I opened it, there stood a man wearing a black cape and hat. He carried with a single piece of luggage. Good evening, sir. I saw your sign. It says you have a room to rent. Yes. Sir, yes, sir. Please, uh, won't you come in? Thank you. Uh, could I, yes? Uh, uh, could I take your cape, sir? No, uh, I'm looking for a quiet room. But it should be very quiet. Oh, we have that, sir. Just that. Mm. Above all, our house is quiet. Good. Your bag, sir. May I take it? No, just show me the room, please. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. It's right up these stairs, sir. This way. You see, sir, there's just my husband and me here, and we're ever so quiet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll find this room to your liking. Well, here we are. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I like this room. Yes, it is pleasant, isn't it? Well, there's not many rooms with such pretty pictures, now is there? I don't know. Pretty pictures interest me very little. What I like about this room is... Uh, the simplicity. I like the bareness. Yes, I, I think I'll take it. What is your name? Mrs. Bunting, sir. All right, Mrs. Bunting, uh, I'll take the room. Oh, yes, sir. And please uh, let me help you with your luggage. No, don't I... you touch it. Oh, but I, I only wish to, to... I know, I know. You only wish to help, Mrs. Bunting. It's, uh, it's just, uh, forgive me, it's, it's just that I... I'm weary. I'm, I'm very tired. Uh, 
See, I do a lot of studying. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, sir. Of course. Well, anyway, you can see how few things I need. It's, it's just what, what's in this bag. But this... This here is my favorite book. Hmm? It's the Bible. Good book, Mrs. Bunting, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed it is, sir. Yes, it says, uh, he brings them to their desired haven. Hmm? Beautiful words, huh? And now at last I found my haven of rest. Now, Mrs. Bunting, uh, if I pay you 30 shillings a week for this room, that satisfactory? Oh, why, yes, sir. Yes, sir. That, that'll be quite all right. My name is Sleuth. Mr. Sleuth? Yes, Sleuth. S-L-E-U-T-H. <laughs> Think of a hound, Mrs. Bunting, and you'll never forget my name. And here. Here are your 30 shillings. Oh, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, would you be wishing anything now? Supper, or tea, or... Mm, no, nothing. Uh, good night, Miss Bunting. Uh, yes. Yes, good night, sir. Please stop that. You hear? Oh, oh, sir, I... What did I do? You were humming. That's music. Oh, but I... I music oh. is an instrument of sin. Oh, yes, yes, sir. And you did tell me, Mrs. Bunting, that your house would be absolutely quiet. Oh, but it is, sir. I, I didn't mean any harm. Believe me, sir. I, I believe you, I... I'm sorry I spoke sharply. I, I know you. You are trying to be considerate and kind. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank oh, uh, uh, by the way, Mrs. Bunting, uh, I think I would like some bread and some tea. Oh, certainly, certainly, sir. I'll have it in an instant. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he took the room, eh, Ellen? Yes. He, he took the room at, at 30 shillings a week. Yes, in advance. Oh, hurry now, Bunting. Is the water for the tea hot yet? Yes, what a stroke. Put the bread and the butter on the tray. I'll pour the water. You know, Ellen, it's wonderful. Yes, it is. Do you realize what this means? We can have Daisy back with yes, us I now. Yes, I know, I know. Hurry with it now, hurry. Why, why, we can have her back with now, us tomorrow. Now, the water and the tea, and I guess... Yes, it's all ready. Open the door, Bunting. I'll take it up to him right away. There you go, old girl. First thing in the morning, I'm going to fetch Daisy and bring her home. Oh, it's a wonderful night, Ellen. Wonderful. <gasps> oh, oh, I mustn't do that. Yes, 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 Don. Many wounded from her. Yes, many strong men have to swing by her. Come in. And to know how the wickedness of folly... <gasps> oh, why, why, Mr. Sleuth, you, you... Yes? What is it? Those pictures, hmm? those pretty girls you've turned all their faces yes, to the wall. Yes, I've turned them to the wall because they are wicked and sinful. Oh, but, sir, I... Don't you I... agree, Mrs. Bunting, that everything wicked and sinful should be purged from the earth? Huh? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, I do. I'm happy to hear that, Mrs. Bunting. Now, if you'll excuse me, I... I have to leave. Oh, but, sir, here's your tray. I... I... Good night, Mrs. Bunting. You know, for a moment, I was stiff with fear. I set the tray down. He hadn't so much as noticed the light supper I'd prepared for him and rushed to the winter to watch. He came out of our cottage and moved off down the street, his black cape swirling about him. Finally, he was lost in the fog. And I don't know why, but I stared after him for a long, long while. Well, I did the dishes and got ready for bed. I lay there thinking, and it was almost dawn before I had convinced myself that at most he was a trifle odd. And after all, paying 30 shillings, maybe... Maybe he had a right to his strange ways. It was daylight when I was suddenly awakened by the newsboys shouting in the street. Horrible murder! Read all about murder it! Murder at King's Cross last night! Avenger strikes the again! Slowly I realized what the newsboys were shouting. Horrible murder! Avenger drops <gasps> six victims! Oh no! Avengers, wake again! Another girl falls in the In a 
few moments, Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air when camels present Act Two of The Lodger. Any sports champion can tell you how true it is that experience is the best teacher. Don Whitfield, for one, he's the world's outboard speed champion, you know. It's taking the turns around the marking buoys just right that makes that extra speed. And boy, how Don Whitfield worked out on that problem. Don Whitfield recently said, Experience is the best teacher in outboard racing and in smoking, too. Smoking whatever brands I could get during the wartime cigarette shortage taught me there's no other cigarette like a camel. And many other smokers had the same experience. Yes, during the wartime cigarette shortage, when people smoked whatever brands they could get, then's when we all compared cigarettes, whether we wanted to or not. And then's when so many people decided that their taste liked camel's rich, full flavor, and their throats liked camel's cool mildness. The result? More people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. As the inspector takes notes of the terrifying event, Alan Bunting continues the story. And now, Mrs. Bunting, what did you do the morning you learned the Avenger had murdered his sixth victim? Well, I was a little frightened to meet our lodger, yet I kept my thoughts to myself. After all, you know, there still wasn't much to go on. Robert had gone to make Daisy, so Mr. Sleuth ate breakfast alone. I watched him through the crack in the door. Finally, I went in with more tea. Hmm? Uh, uh, tea? Uh, no. No, well, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bunting. I, I don't care for any more tea, thanks. Uh, you're very kind. But I have to go on with my work now, if you'll excuse me. My fear really changed to pity then. Oh, he seemed so helpless and tired. And he was so considerate. This man couldn't be a murderer. It was all a coincidence. Besides, we just couldn't afford to lose that 30 shillings a week. Well, around 10 in the morning, he left the cottage. And I decided to go upstairs and have a look about his room. I had to find out what he carried in his one piece of luggage. It wasn't a bag. It was more like a case. Yes. Yes, a case. A case for a knife. I rushed upstairs, my heart beating wildly at the thought I'd had of the case. No, no, there wasn't anything in his closet. I went over to the chest of drawers against the wall. Nothing in the top one. In the next one, there was just some socks and some underclothes. The next one was empty. There was only one other place for the small narrow case. The bottom drawer. And it was locked. I pulled and pulled at it. And then suddenly I heard the front door open downstairs. In a panic, I rushed out of the room and down the hall. Oh, you're upstairs, Ellen. Oh, Look, Ellen. Daisy's here. Oh, thank heaven. Oh, my. It's oh. so good to see you. It's so good to be home. Oh. Why, whatever's the matter? Yes, you're quite right, Ellen. Oh, I... It's... it's it, I'm on them all right. I'm all right. It's just that I wasn't expecting you so soon. Uh, well, it's good to be back. The country's <laughs> all right, but there's nothing like London now, is there? Oh, no. No, no, there isn't. Well, as long as that Avenger's about, you're going to have something to do to keep this young lady indoors, London or no <laughs> London. <laughs> oh, don't you worry. <laughs> Mother will see to that. Oh, well, Daisy, I... I might as well get you settled. You see, Father? What did I tell you? You'll have a dust cloth in my hand oh. before I have my coat on. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sleuth. Why is my door open? We, we, we were just leaving, sir. Have you been in my room? Oh, oh, oh uh, not at all. Not at all, sir. From now on, Mrs. Bunting, I shall keep my room locked. Oh, uh, if... But you see, sir, I, I was just tidying up a bit, and, and Mr. Bunting, he brought our daughter home. Uh, 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 she just arrived. Uh, this, is, this is Daisy. Pleased to meet you, sir. 
Uh, she, she's been away for quite a while. That's why we're a bit excited, you might say. Yes. Uh, you were probably surprised to hear us laughing and carrying on. Yes, yes, I, I must say I was, I was, but, uh, but then, uh, there are different kinds of joy, are there not, Daisy? Yes. Yes, I'm sure there are. Yes. There is the despicable evil joy of the abandoned, and, and then there is the divine happiness of the blessed. It's a great difference. You understand that, Daisy, don't you? Why, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Smith. Good, dear. There are so few young women nowadays who do. I'm Mr. Sleuth. You mean a girl's not to enjoy life at all? Not to have any fun? Enjoyment and fun, my child, are the devil's breeding ground. All his implements are there. Pleasure and impropriety. The temptation of music, dancing. Oh, that's crazy. Why, there's nothing I like better than dancing. And I'm not... You like to but dance? She, you know what she was saying, Mr. Sooth? She's just a child. Daisy, you know you've never been one for dancing. You mm. never learned how But to... I did learn, Mother. While I was away. What's so wrong about it? What's the harm in dancing? It says she lies in wait as for a prey... And increases the transgressors among men. I don't know what you mean. I've never heard such nonsense. Nonsense? You call it scripture nonsense? Daisy! Daisy, go into the front room. It's all right, Mrs. Bunting. It's all right. Uh, I'm used to that kind of talk. Good day. Daisy. Yes. Daisy, listen to me. What, Mother? I've, I've got to tell you about... About, about what? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I, I've got to go out for a while now. I'll be back. For a moment, I was about to tell her my awful suspicions, but I stopped. They were only suspicions. At the same time, I had a thought... I'd go to the coroner's inquest they were having for the Avengers' latest victim. I was hoping to hear something said that would clear my suspicions of the larger. At least I'd give him this last chance. A lady was testifying as I took my seat. She'd seen the Avenger from her window, she said. And her description of him didn't tally with Mr. Sleuth at all. Oh, I can't tell you how relieved I was. Till it was pointed out she couldn't possibly have seen anyone that night from her window because of the fog. <laughs> then the next witness was a Mr. Cannot. I leaned forward anxiously as they swore him in and began asking questions. You say, Mr. Kennedy, you're positive that you saw this man? Positive, sir. It was only a few moments before the murder that I saw the Avenger. Ah, uh, describe him. Well, he wore a black cape, I believe, and was very gaunt looking. And was carrying a small handbag. A handbag? Yes, a small, narrow handbag. Such a one as might contain a knife. <gasps> And it's in the court. Uh, proceed, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, well, uh, he had a low, hesitating voice. I'd say with something of a continental accent. An educated man, I'd judge, but quite mad. And what do you mean by that? Well, as he emerged from the fog, he was talking aloud to himself. Oh, believe me, sir, he was reciting scriptures from the Bible. Oh, oh no, it can't be. It can't be. <gasps> Could there be any doubt about it now? Mr. Sleuth, our lodger, he was the murderer. I got out of the courtroom as quickly as I could. I didn't even notice it had started to rain. I hardly remember going home, running and walking somehow, while the nightmare of fear and terror grew bigger and bigger inside me. It was three streets from our cottage that I saw my husband, Robert. One thought hit me clearly. I realized Daisy must be home alone with the Avenger. Bunting! Bunting! Why, Ellen? Ellen, what is it? Bunting, where's Daisy? Where is she? Where's Daisy? Why, she's at home. Oh, listen, listen, Bunting, listen. Sleuth! Sleuth is the Avenger. What? 
What are you saying? Ah, oh, Larger, he's the Avenger. Daisy's alone with him right now. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> Listen to me carefully, my child, and and rejoice with me in your heart, for for the moment is at hand, and you are not afraid, Daisy, are you? No, I'm not afraid. You are very beautiful, and and you should live in the ways of righteousness. You hear me, Daisy? You want to live in the ways of righteousness, don't you? Yes, yes, I do. I know you do. I I know, and. And that is why I've been sent to purge your soul so that you will be elevated beyond all sin and evil. You like to dance, Daisy, don't you? Already six have gone on before you and they are beyond all sin and evil. You are the seventh to be elevated, my child, and my work is almost done for the seventh I have promised at this appointed hour. <laughs> Be still, Daisy. And, and don't listen to the temptations of the crowd when they call out your name, because I am here to save you from all evil and wickedness that consumes you like a wildfire of scarlet and crimson. You like to dance, don't you? Look at me, my child. Look at me and don't fear me. And do not tremble. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness. And therefore I must bring you down like the lamb to slaughter. And now I lift my hand with a flaming sword. For now comes the vengeance and the time... You know that such that are for death to death, and such that are for the sword to the sword, and no one, no one dare to have pity on them. He, 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 and he's burning. He's burning in me like a fire. Oh, it... It purges me and, and consumes me. All sin and evil are falling away. Praise. Praise and glory. For it is I who is the seventh in this... The vengeance... Is fulfilled. the makers of Camel cigarettes and free camels to service men's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, U.S. Army Letterman General Hospital, San Francisco, California, U.S. Naval Hospital, Charleston, South Carolina, U.S. Marine Hospital, Ellis Island, New York, Veterans Hospital, Fort Meade, South Dakota. Yes, everywhere, more folks are smoking camels. Many of those camel smokers are doctors. You know, three leading independent research organizations asked 113,597 doctors, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. <laughs> Next week, Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you one of the world's great stories of the strange and unusual, The Horla by de Maupassant, with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Hey 
there, Mr. Pipe Smoker. Do you know that more pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco? Well, it's true. So why don't you give PA a try? Prince Albert is specially made for smoking pleasure. It's choice tobacco, specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. See if the extra rich, full flavor of Prince Albert doesn't give you added interest in your pipe. Be sure to listen to Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry Saturday night for a half hour of folk music and laughter with Red Foley, Minnie Pearl, Rod Brassfield, and the rest of the Opry gang. And as Red's special guest this week, you'll hear Salty Holmes. Remember, Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry, Saturday night, over NBC. Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Lorre in Mystery in the Air. Next week's play will be The Horla by de Maupassant. The artists supporting Mr. Lorre tonight were Agnes Moorhead as Ellen, Henry Morgan as the voice of mystery, Barbara Eiler as Daisy, Eric Snowden as Bunting, Raymond Lawrence as the inspector, Rolf Sedan as the witness, and Conrad Binion as the newsboy. And on behalf of Mr. Laurie and the entire cast, our sincere thanks to Agnes Moorhead for her great portrayal of Ellen Bunting. <laughs> this is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night for Camel. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Now is the time to tell of the unaccountable, of apparitions by night and phantoms in shadow. Time to tell strange tales of fantasy and the supernatural. Mystery Theater presents The Hitchhiker by Alan King. The stretch of road between Bainville and Bowden is about 15 miles. I used to drive over it about once a month by Alan King. The stretch of road between Bainville and Bowden is about 15 miles. I used to drive over it about once a month with George Kirby. George was supervisor for the J.K. Land and Land Company, and we used to make a monthly inspection trip over his territory. We usually worked it so that we ran into Bowden at night. It isn't a big town, but there's a good hotel there, and we could always make it back to our hometown before dark the next day. We would take turns driving... When George was driving, sometimes I'd sit with him. If I was pretty tired, maybe I'd move into the back seat and sleep for a while. This particular night, about six months ago, he was driving and I was sitting in the front. It was a poor sort of night. It had been raining and there were patches of mist that came at you when you least expected them. I'd been telling George about a farmer I'd met. <laughs> this will kill you. The guy looks me right in the eye and says, Boy, you won't sell me one of those things. I invented one myself ten years ago. <laughs> Did you see it work? Sure, he showed me. You should have heard the noise. Sounded more like a young threshing machine. <laughs> you got to hand it to those farmers. You know, those guys can make anything and fix anything. Well, I remember one once in Indiana someplace. George, yeah, what? look out. There's someone in the... Where? Oh! <laughs> Come on, quick. Where is he? He must be underneath. I hit him, I know that. Yeah, he's underneath. Looks like he's wedged under the crime cases. Well, is he alive? No, no. Are you, are you hurt badly? Can you move? 
must be knocked out. Now, wait, I see. His legs are clear. I think we can get him up. Tell you what, son. Get in. Put the car below him. Ease her forward when I tell you. Okay, George. But easy, son. Go very, very slow. <laughs> We got him out. I'm not sure if he was alive. His face was all mucked up with gravel and oil. But he was dead when we got to Bowdoin. We talked to the police. There was an inquest later. George wasn't held. It was an accident. George Kirby and I went about our business. I'm uh, Larry Mason. I'm a salesman. I drive that stretch of road between Bainville and Bowdoin once a week. In one place you come to a curve where there's a sort of ravine on one side and quite a drop on the other. It's not dangerous. There's a good strong guard rail, clearly marked. The locals just call it the Gap. Uh, this night, oh, a few weeks ago, I was driving alone, just coming to the Gap, when I saw somebody ahead of me at the side of the road. It was a man giving me the thumb. I pulled up and opened the door. Want a lift? Thank you. Come on in. Going down to Bowdoin? Yes. Be there in ten minutes. Uh, don't often see anybody around here at night. Cigarette? No. Thank you. Think I'll have one. Don't blow that light out, eh? Hold it there a moment. Well, what's the matter? Why are you looking at me like that? It's all right. You can put it out now. Well, thanks. What is your name? Larry Mason. Why? You're not the man. I'm not what man? I'll know him when I see him. Well, who, who is this man? Uh, what do you want him for? He killed someone. Killed someone? It was here. On this road. He ran him down and killed him. Oh, an accident. He said he wasn't to blame, but he was driving the car. The man was just standing there, hitching a ride, just as I hitched a ride with you. Well, maybe it was foggy or something. A driver should be careful in a mist. Look, uh, suppose you find this guy, uh, what are you going to do? Kill him. What? Now, wait a minute, you, you can't go around killing people like that. They said it wasn't his fault, didn't they? Yes, but I know better. I will find him. I didn't like it. I was sure the guy was batty. Anyway, he didn't say any more then. He seemed to shrink back in his seat, almost as if he wasn't there. I stepped on it. The sooner I got to Bowdoin, the better I'd like it. And just as we were pulling up, I spoke to him again. Look, about this guy you say you're looking for... You're not really going to kill him, are you? Yes, I am. But why? Because he killed me. What? I'm the man he ran over in his car and killed. Whether the door on his side opened or not, I hadn't any idea. But I do know that suddenly he was gone. I just sat there. I lit a cigarette and kept telling myself the guy hadn't been in the car. He hadn't talked to me. And all the time I knew I... I didn't know what I knew. I threw the cigarette away and went in for a coffee. Biddy Kirk was behind the counter with the usual grin all over her fat face. Hiya, Larry. Hi, Biddy. Coffee? Yeah. And what else? We got some nice... Hey, what's the matter with you? Looks like you want something stronger than coffee. Uh, coffee will do. Nothing to eat. Are you sick or something? No. Well, I'm not sick. Okay. 
Hey, yeah, here's your coffee. Thanks. Look, are you sure you're okay? You don't look very good. I'm okay. Say, uh, Biddy. Yeah? Do you remember about... Oh, I guess it must have been a few months ago. There, there was a... Hey, bat- Biddy! Jack! Larry? Hi. How's the coffee tonight, Biddy? Strong enough for you. Swell. Coming up. Anything to eat? I don't know. I'll drink the coffee first. Okay. Here. Well, call me if you want something. Gotta get back in the kitchen and get some sandwiches made. You just drive in from Bainville? Yeah. Why? Oh, I, I just wonder. What's on your mind? Lose a big order or something? No, I... Well, I, I gave a guy a lift down here. So what? So did I. I. Do it all the time. What's new about that? There's something funny about the guy. I picked him up just the other side of the gap. Gave me the creeps. Wait a minute. What'd this guy look like? Oh, uh, pale sort of hair. Dead-looking, grayish sort of face. Yeah? Go on. He, uh, he talked about an accident. I lit a cigarette and he, he sort of peered into my face when I struck the match. And then he said, I wasn't the guy he was looking for, or something like that. Where did you drop him? I brought him right into Bowden. Stopped the car and he was gone, just like that. Larry, I picked up that guy myself. Just the other side of the gap. I shouted at him. It wasn't the same man. He was kidding me. It, it wasn't possible. It... But the description tallied. The only difference was he'd only ridden a couple of miles with Chuck and hadn't said anything about the accident. Accident? What accident? I'll tell you in a minute. First of all, when I'd brought him into Bowden, how did he get back to the other side of the gap in time for you to pick him up? You were right behind me. He couldn't. Not unless he's got a twin brother. Or unless he's a ghost who likes hitching rides. Yeah. That's about the only explanation. <laughs> hey, what is this? You trying to tell me you believe... Uh, just a minute, chum. Biddy? Yeah? Getting hungry out there? Can you come out a minute? What'll it be? Corn beef on rye? Biddy, uh, I want you to tell me something. Can you remember an accident between here and Bainville? Oh, I can remember plenty of them. Oh, yes, I know. But this one... Well, I, I, I don't know the name of the man who was driving. I don't even know when it was, but he hit a hitchhiker. A hitchhiker? Can you remember it, Biddy? Sure, yeah. Yeah, that was George Kirby. He was driving not very long ago. And Sam Henderson was with him. Yeah, they have the inquest up in Bainville. Yeah. It was a misty night, I remember. George said at the inquest he couldn't see very well, and he hit this guy before he even saw him. Who was the guy he hit? Do you know? Oh, he lived up by the gap. I No, I didn't really know him. I'd seen him in here a couple of times. He was a writer or something. But what's all this about? Well, what did he look like? Pale sort of guy... Looked like he needed a good meal. Kind of mousy colored hair. That sounds like. What sort of a voice had he? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah, kind of quiet and slow, I think. That's what I wanted to know. Okay, thanks, Biddy. Anything to oblige. I guess I'll go back to my sandwiches. Give me a shot when you're hungry. Okay. Come on, Larry. What is all this? Chuck? The guy you and I picked up is the guy George Kirby ran over and killed. Are you out of your mind, Larry? He's dead. Dead or not, the guy I picked up looked right into my face and said he was after the guy who ran him down and killed him. And when... You're making this up. And when he found this man, he was going to kill him. I don't know how long we sat there arguing it out. In the end, we didn't know whether we were sane or crazy. We had all the facts. They'd only fit into one pattern. And that pattern was impossible. In the end, we did come to one conclusion. It seems to me, whatever way you look at it, this George Kirby may be in danger. Yeah, but from what? Or from whom? Somebody's threatening him. Or trying to scare him. Somebody pretending to be a ghost. It must be two people pretending to be a ghost. There's one thing certain. The man you picked up tonight can't be the same man I picked up. It's not physically possible. Chuck, I don't believe in ghosts any more than you do. 
But what happened tonight can't be explained. Can it? Must be. Well, maybe these two men we picked up were twins, triplets. The third one was the guy who was killed. Well, that's fantastic. Is a ghost any less fantastic? No, but. Well, anyway, we gotta warn this guy Kirby that someone's after him. We don't even know him. Oh, we can leave a message with Biddy. Uh, give her a shout. I want something to eat anyway. Well, Biddy, uh, how about a sandwich? Ah, I'm getting hungry now, eh? Yeah. Uh, give me a corned beef and rye and a dill, and uh, another cup of coffee. Now, how about you, Larry? Uh, that'll do for me too, I guess. And uh, Biddy. Yeah. Will you be seeing this uh, George Kirby sometime? Don't guess so. He comes in pretty regular. Could you give him a message? Sure, sure. What is it? Well, just tell him that... Well, we found out that somebody's threatening him, see? Threatening him? Who is? Well, we, uh... We don't quite know. Tell him not to pick up anybody between here and Bainville. I don't get it. It's all right, Betty. He's in danger. And we don't know him, so the only thing we can do is leave the message with you. Well, I'll tell him. Well, he'll probably laugh in my face. Well, maybe he will. But tell him anyway, see? What's the matter with you, Biddy? Something on your mind? Yeah, I, uh, I got a message for you, George. Message? <laughs> Too bad you weren't in a week ago. The guys could have told you themselves. What guys? Oh, Larry Mason and Chuck Reynolds. I've never heard of them. Well, they left this message anyways. Said to tell you somebody's threatening you. Threatening me? Yeah. And to not pick anybody up between here and Bainville. <laughs> What's this, a gag? Well, I don't know. I tell you, George, I don't know what it's all about. Well, who was threatening me? Well, I didn't hear much because I was back in the kitchen. But they did ask me about that accident. You had asked a lot of questions well, about it. Well, it was an accident. They said so at the inquest. Yeah, yeah George, I know that. Nobody's got any right to rake that up and threaten me. Sure, George. It wasn't your fault. We know. It wasn't, you hear? It wasn't my fault. Who's this, this Larry Mason and, and Chuck, whatever his name is anyway? I don't know. Then what right have they got to now, come around? don't get excited. They wasn't threatening you. They said somebody else was. Yeah? Well, I'll bet they're trying to put a scare into me or something. Well, you can tell them from me. They can keep their trap shut or there'll be trouble. The next time I saw Biddy, I heard how George Kirby had taken the warning. That's what you get for trying to help somebody. Anyway, I'd done what I could. And as the days went by, I began to feel as though I'd dreamed the whole thing. It was all too fantastic. Then one day I met George Kirby face to face. I'd gone to Indianapolis for a sales meeting. And I was sitting in the hotel lobby after dinner when a big man came up to me looking full of fight. Are you Larry Mason? Yes. I'm George Kirby. I want to talk to you. George Kirby? Yeah. I just want to tell you I don't like being threatened. Now, look, I wasn't... I got your message. I don't like that sort of thing. Don't be a fool. I'm not threatening you. Sounds like it to me. Listen. I picked up a guy between Bainville and Bowden. He looked me over carefully, asked my name, and then said I wasn't the guy he was looking for. But then he said he was looking for the man who killed somebody in an accident on that road not long before. Go on. He said when he found that man, he was going to kill him. Is that all? I figured he was a kind of a nut. He tried to make out he was the man who was killed. I'm supposed to believe all this? I don't care whether you believe it or not. But I'll tell you this. That same night, a friend of mine picked up the same man. And we both talked it over and decided the least we could do was to warn you. Thanks. Well, we figured maybe the man you killed had a, a brother who maybe thought you'd got off easy. David Quinn hasn't any brothers. I found that out. Well, anyway, that's what happened. Now you know about it, you can do what you like. The way he treated me, I didn't care what happened to George Kirby... But whether I cared or not, I was to be there when it did happen. And because I was there, I found myself giving evidence before a coroner's jury. A jury inquiring into the death of George Kirby. Now, Mr. Mason, will you tell us what you saw on the night in question? Well, I was driving from Bainville to Bowden. I, I guess I left Bainville about 11 p.m. 
Did you see the Kirby car? Well, there was a car ahead of me. I, I could see its taillights. Uh, but I didn't know then whose it was. Yes, go on. As a matter of fact, it passed me. I could see it for a while, and then it went around a curve, and I lost sight of it. But when did you see it again? A few minutes later. I came around a curve myself, and there was this car picking up the hitchhiker. Before I caught up to it, it was on its way again. You're certain that someone got into the car? Yes, yes, quite certain. In fact, you will swear to it? Well, I... Yes, I will. Is there some doubt in your mind? No, no, someone did get into that car. I see. And then what happened? It, uh, it drew ahead of me again. Then I came to the place in the road they call the Gap, and there was a car piled up against a rock on the south side. The car you've been telling us about? Yes. When you say it was piled up against a rock, is there not a sort of cliff at that point with guardrails protecting motorists? Yes, although there are a couple of places where there are big rocks. You mean the guardrail runs a certain distance, and then there is a rock, and then the guardrail continues past it? That's right. And this car was piled up against one of these rocks? Yes. What did you do? Well, I stopped and ran over to the car. It must have turned over at least once. The top was all smashed in, and so was the front. Kirby was behind the wheel. He seemed to be crushed, and there was another man in the back who didn't seem too badly hurt. That was Samuel Henderson. Yes, I, I got him out of the car. And then I tried to get at Kirby, but I couldn't move him. So uh, all I could do was watch for a car passing, which I did. I flagged it and sent Henderson down to Bowden for the police and some kind of a tow truck. And you waited there until they came? Yes. Was there anyone in the front passenger seat of the Kirby car? No. Are you quite certain? Quite certain, and there couldn't have been. Why do you say that? Well, because the front was so badly crushed, he would still have been there. But you told us a moment ago that you saw the Kirby car stop and pick up a hitchhiker. Do you still say that? Yes. Then how do you account for the fact that there was no one else in the car when you found it? I can't account for it. Maybe he was in the back seat and got out before I arrived. Perhaps. We shall see about that. I may wish to examine you further on this point. You may step down now. Mr. Henderson, you were riding with George Kirby on this trip? <clears throat> yes, sir. Will you tell us what happened after you left Bainville? Well, I was dozing in the back seat. We take turns driving. I was asleep, I guess, till, till something woke me up. What was that? The car stopping. I sort of opened my eyes and saw George lean over and open the other front door, and a man got in. No doubt about that. None at all. I didn't see him very clearly. I... I didn't really want to wake up. I, I was tired. Did you, in fact, stay awake? More or less. George was talking to this hitchhiker, but the man said almost nothing. That is, until just before the accident. What did he say then? He said, uh, you are George Kirby. And George said, yes. And the man said, you killed David Quinn. That woke me up. David Quinn was the man Kirby had killed in an accident some months before? That's right, sir. I was, I was startled. George looked at him and said, so what? Then the man said, I have been waiting for you. George started to say something, and then suddenly the man said, look out, there's something, there's someone ahead. And he seemed to reach over and grab the wheel. The car swerved, and we crashed. I don't remember much else till Mr. Mason pulled me out. Mr. Henderson, you realize that all you have told us is on oath. I realize that. But it's true, every word of it. Was there any person sitting beside George Kirby in the front seat when you recovered consciousness? No. Yet you insist that there was someone there till the moment of the crash. I do. I have said that on my oath, and it's true. How do you account for the fact that there was no one there afterwards? I can't account for it. I only know that's how it was. Very well. You may step down, but do not leave the court. You are a trooper with the state police? Yes, sir, I am. I understand you were called to the scene of the accident in question between 11 and 12 at night. Yes, sir. What did you find on arrival? I found the Kirby car piled against a rock on the south side of the road. It had hit the guardrail and bounced off it and then turned over. Mr. Mason was waiting for me. I found George Kirby pinned behind the steering wheel, apparently unconscious. I had brought up a truck from the police garage 
and we had to use tools to get the door off on the driver's side so we could get Kirby out. How badly was he injured? He was dead when we got him out. What did you do then? I took a statement from Mason, and then I went back and examined the marks of the car on the road. I saw that it had apparently swerved right over to the guardrail. How do you come to that conclusion? Uh, By the skid marks. Kirby must have applied the brakes, and they left marks. Did you examine carefully the front of the car and the roof? Yes, sir. The whole front and top had been smashed. In your opinion, if anyone had been riding in the front passenger seat, could he have gotten out? He could not. I will swear to that. You have heard the evidence of Mr. Mason and Mr. Henderson to the effect that Kirby did pick up a passenger. Yes, sir. All I can say is he must have got out before the crash. But Mr. Henderson says he did not. I don't know about that, but I will swear that no person was in that front seat at the time of the crash. It couldn't be. They had Henderson and me back on the stand, and they made monkeys out of us. It wasn't so bad for me. A hitchhiker could have got out of that car without my seeing him. But Henderson wouldn't budge an inch from his story. Now, in the end, we both slunk out of the inquest with everyone convinced we'd both committed perjury. Henderson took me over to the hotel to have a drink in his room. I sure needed it. Who was he, Mason? Who was he? You know, don't you? Yes. Yes, I know, and yet... And yet it couldn't have been. You imagined it. And I imagined I gave him a lift three or four weeks back. I imagined he said he was going to kill George Kirby. And Chuck Reynolds imagined he gave him a lift, too. I imagined him. And I'll never forget him. Neither will I. Neither will I, because he... Oh, don't say it, Henderson. After all, we don't believe in ghosts, do we? I believe in what I see, Mason. Then you didn't see anything. Mind if I help myself? I need it. Now, please go ahead. Thanks. There's just one other thing I didn't tell him at the inquest. What was that? Where the hitchhiker grabbed the wheel and swerved the car. Well? It was precisely at the spot where David Quinn was killed. The Hitchhiker by Alan King was item three in a four-part series of Tales of the Supernatural, written for and presented by the Mystery Theater, with John Vernon as Sam Henderson, Cease Linder as George Kirby, Frank Perry as Larry Mason, and Hugh Watson as Old Quinn. Beth Lockerbie was heard as Biddy, Tom Harvey as Chuck, Jack Creeley as the coroner, and Alan DeRamus as the state trooper. Sound effects were by Alex Sheridan. Technical operation by John Skillen. This is Bill Lawrence speaking. Please. Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called The Thing on the Purple Board. Me, I'm a roughneck. Well, I was a roughneck, I mean, 20 years ago, a little too old, too slow now. Besides, I got a dollar now, I don't have to be a roughneck, you see. Married, got a nice home. Had to meet my wife. Hey, Mike. Her name's Maxine, but she likes to be called Mike. Mike! I guess she's busy out in the kitchen someplace. Besides, she doesn't hear very well. Shame, too, she's so pretty and everything. Well, you'll meet her. 
Sit down. I was saying I was a roughneck. Well, no, that doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. A roughneck is an oil field worker, specifically a guy in a drilling crew. Call them roughnecks like you call a section hand on the railroad a gandy dancer, a garage hand a grease monkey. Same time you work around a drilling crew for a while, you're going to be a roughneck in every sense of the word, boy. A derrick floor or a four board is no place for a guy with a bow tie. Because you know, when you have to fool around with drilling holes that go farther down the ground than it is from the top of Pike's Peak down to sea level, yeah, sure they do. By the time I was a roughneck, we'd got this one well down to 7,313 feet. That was a record. But last May, Pure Oil brought one in out in the Trona Valley in Wyoming at 14,309 feet. That, friend, is almost three miles. Quite a hole, that, huh? Sure, I don't think there's an oil man in the world that don't wonder one time or another what's down there besides rock and oil and gas. Oil that's made out of trees that died 20 million years ago. Oil that's made out of dinosaur bones. Oil that's maybe made out of the flesh and blood of men, maybe, that beat each other to death with a stone axe. Ate saber-toothed tiger for lunch. Hey, you get to wondering... You look at the cores that come up from way down there, and sometimes the little shells, trilobites mostly, that was alive when Manhattan Island, where New York is, was under half a mile of ice. We found something once, me and Billy Grunwald, and something found us. I'll tell you about it. We were down to around 5,400 feet. We'd set casing. We began to get water, so we hadn't stopped drilling and cement off. Well, you see... When water begins to seep in the hole, you pull your drill pipe, then you let down a cementing shoe inside the casing, and you plug up the bottom of the hole, casing and all, with quick-hardening waterproof cement. Then when it's hard, you drill through the cement, go on down, and the cement outside the casing at the bottom keeps the water out. Well, we had the drill pipe all pulled and racked. The cement was setting, see? So we was shut down, waiting for it to harden. We'd been coring just before... Well, you see, a, a core drill is hollow. And as the bit digs down, it stuffs the drillings up inside it, so when you pull it out, you got a sample of the kind of stuff you're going through. And a geologist can tell a lot from that. So there's nobody around the rig except me that night. The rest of the crew's going into town. I was toasting some pork chops over the forge for myself, but I heard a car pulling up. Look out, it's Billy Grunwald, the geologist. And I give him a hello. Hi, Billy, come and have a pork chop. Hi, Porky. Ah. Where's everybody? They all went to town. I'm the whole crew. You know, I had three blowouts between here and Oxnard. Yeah, I wondered where you was. Ted said you'd be in here about three. Yeah, I would have been, except for my tough luck. Oh, oh I'm dead. Yeah, hungry? Starved. Yeah, I got six, no, oh, seven pork chops. And bread. And some coffee, kind of. Swell. Yeah, I got a bottle in the car. <laughs> if we going to have a banquet. Hey, where's that core? That's what I came up here to look at. Yeah, back there on the bench. Yeah. Look at it after supper. Hey. What? Didn't you say you were all alone here? Uh-huh. I thought I heard somebody talking. Mm-hmm. I don't see anybody. We'll keep an eye on that pork chop. You won't have any supper. Yeah, I'm watching it. Yeah, let me put the coffee on. Like so. When did you finish cementing? This morning. Last tower only made about ten feet of hole, so Ted shut down before we get flooded out of house and home. Funny about that water. Mm, how? Oughtn't to be any at that level, according to my figuring. Well, there is. Is it salt? Sure, right out of the bottom of the ocean. Hmm, that's funny. Well, maybe I'll be able to tell something from the core. Yeah, I hope so. The last core I looked at, I'd have sworn we were getting into shale. Mm, ain't seen none yet from the cuttings. That's funny. Here, your pork chop's done. Yeah, take some bread. Yeah, thanks. Oh, man. Good, huh? <laughs> yeah, put on another. I had two already before you come. Yeah, much obliged. Yeah, you know, you never can tell what's down there. You get it all mapped and plotted out, all the straighter. And all you know is what comes out of the hole. Yeah, yeah I'd like to go down there sometime if I was little enough. <laughs> never get you down a hole. Yeah, you'd fit. You're skinny. I'll stay up here and look at the cores, bud. Where is that one? Behind you. Over there. Hmm? Oh. Well, I'll have a look at it. Well, why don't you wait till you finish your supper? I'm just going to look at it. 
Uh, put on another pork chop for me. Okay. Well, I wish I was free, Charles. If you... What's the matter? Hey, wait a minute, Porky. Well, what? It... Listen. What's eating you? You, you know, I'd have sworn there's somebody up there in that portable board. Ah, you're crazy. There's nobody up there. You're going to get those stands of drill pipes. Ah, they're just rack crooked. One of them slipped. Come on back and eat your pork chop. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. Only I... Ah, what you so jittery about, Billy? Come on, eat your sandwich. Here. Yeah, well, thanks, Porky. I don't know. I, I'm just naturally that way, I guess. I'm always scared of the dark. I'm scared. Doc, I, I, I hate to be a baby, but I can't help it. Scared of the dark? Honest? Stupid, ain't it? Oh, I don't know. Everybody's scared of something. Me? Spiders scare the tar out of me. Black widows. Oh. <laughs> I know how you feel, Billy. There another light over here? Yeah. yeah. Here. Ah. Oh. That's better. Hey, listen, uh, Porky. Go out to the car and look in the left-hand door pocket and bring back that bottle, will you? That's what I need. Okay, kid. Okay. So I picked up a flashlight. I turned around and went outside. I found a car. And I got the bottle. And the floor of the derrick was all lit up. And when I saw a beam of light suddenly flash up toward the foreboard board, <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> Billy Grunewald and his ideas... Sure, I looked up. There wasn't a darn thing up there, except the drill pipe racked against the fingerboard. Oh, this, uh, forble board. Well, you've seen oil derricks or pictures of them. You know that little platform that runs around the outside of the derrick about halfway up? Well, that's the forble board. Well, you see, drill pipe comes in lengths, and you handle them with several lengths screwed together so as to save time getting them in and out of the hole. Two lengths is a double, three is a thribble, four is a forble. When you pull the pipe, you heist it up inside the derrick of the traveling block, which moves up and down from the crown block at the top of the derrick. And then when a forble of pipe is pulled out, it's held in the rotary table. You break the joint with tongs, like a great big stilts and wrench, you see. Snub a cable that's fastened to the handle over the cat head on the draw works, and that breaks the joint. Then you hold the tongs on the pipe, give the rotary table a few turns to unscrew it. You heist away with the traveling block and swing it over against the fingerboard, lean it against the derrick. The guy up on the forward board takes off the traveling block. You do it all over again till you got all the pipe out, you see? Well, there wasn't anybody up on the forward board to, except a screech owl, and it flew away. So Billy turned his light off, and I come on inside. And just as I come up the steps, he let out a yell. Yay! What's the matter? What's the matter, Billy? Hey, come here. Look here. Well, what's it? Look, Porky. My... Where did you find that? Now, listen, Porky, I give you my word. That was embedded in the core. Why, it couldn't be. I tell you, it was. Look where I dug it out. Hey, you know what? That rock there comes from a mile underground. And it's been a mile underground for a million years. And look at this. And I did look. And what he was holding was a gold ring... And it was all carved and filigreed, just like jewelry. And there wasn't any kidding about it. It was real. No, 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 wait a minute. Hang on, I ain't done. I poked at the Cora rock that looked like a uh, kind of petrified salami or something. And then it was my turn to pretty near jump out of my pants. Because right alongside the place where Billy dug out the ring, there was a mud-covered, but very unmistakable, finger. I picked it up. And it was cold. And it was heavy. And... It was solid rock. At least it felt like solid rock. And I looked at Billy, and Billy looked at me. He started to rubbed the mud off this here stone finger. And as he rubbed it, it began to disappear. No, he could, he could still feel it, he said, but when the mud was gone, neither one of us could see it. And he dropped it to the derrick floor. It went clunk and... 
We couldn't find it any place. So you know what we've done. Well, we took that bottle and we took and finished it, Billy and me. We finished it in one slug of piece and it was a full pint of bathtub gin. It tasted just like so much well water to me. And then we sat down on the derrick floor and we looked at each other. We didn't say a word. My eyes got heavier and heavier. The last thing I remember was I heard some kind of noise that seemed to be coming up from down in the forbal board 80 feet above us. I shut my eyes a minute. I guess I went to sleep. And I had awful dreams. Black widow spiders crawling all over me with gold rings on their legs. Things I could hear, but I couldn't see up on the forbal board. Billy Grunewald climbing up the ladder outside the derrick in the moonlight. Faces looking at me, and I couldn't figure out who they were. Then I was waked up by a horrible scream. The crash came inside me that shook the whole derrick. I opened my eyes to see Billy Grunewald lying on the floor two feet away with a broken neck. With a broken neck and his left hand. Well, he put the gold ring on the little finger of his left hand and the way his arms were spread out, his left little finger and the ring were gone. Well, friend, I got out of there. I ran down to where Billy had left his car and I got in. I stepped on the starter. I couldn't get it to go, and then I remembered after I'm pretty near run down the battery that Billy had taken a key. I wasn't going up there and go through a dead man's clothes to get it. So I sat there in the car and shivered all by myself till daylight. And then Ted and the crew came. Afterwards, a state cop and everybody in the world was asking me questions. Did you and Billy have a fight, Porky? I told you we didn't, Ted. But you had been drinking. We only had that little pint, Ted. Well, what was he doing up on the formal board? Did you threaten him and did he run up there to get away from Listen, you? Listen, cop, don't be a chump. Billy Grunewald and I were good friends. Then why'd you push him off the formal board? I didn't, I tell you. I, I wasn't up there. Well, what did he go up there for? I don't know. I was asleep. How do you know he was up there? I didn't say he was. You said so. Besides... How would he break his neck if he didn't fall from way up there? Well, look, officer. I think it was just another accident. I mean, we haven't got anything on Porky, and personally, I don't believe he did it. Well, so. it's mighty mysterious. Well, so it is. But we got work to do. Now, how about it? That cement's hard down there. I want to start drilling again, and I'm short-handed. Will you let Porky stay here till I run in my pipe again, and... Well, then you can take him and ask him questions till you're blue in the face. Well, all Okay. Right. Let's get rolling. You got steam up, Happy? I'm all set. All right. Porky, you go from the formal board. What? Not me, Ted. Oh, don't be such a boob. There's nobody up there to shove you overboard. And you can put a safety line around you if you want to. And besides, you're getting paid to do what you're told. I've lost too much time already. Okay, I go up on the forbo board. And you can bet I took a good gander around before I did anything else. Now I couldn't see a thing. So I signaled to the driller to let down the traveling block, and he did. Came sailing down from up above. I was just reaching for it to pick up the first forbo of drill pipe. Gave a big jerk, and the cable broke. It dropped and nearly pulled me off the forbo board. And it landed right on top of Ted. And if you have any idea what a guy looks like after two tons of metal land on him from 80 feet up, yeah, you keep your ideas to yourself. Well, that was enough. Two accidents in a row. The whole crew quit. They, they wasn't going to wait for a third. And it was Ted's money that was paying off. There wasn't any more. And as far as I know, the abandoned Derek is still there. And that was 20 years ago. Oh, I forgot to tell you something. That traveling block was right in front of my face when it broke loose. It was hanging by steel cable, three-quarter-inch steel cable, 
And I saw that cable break right before my eyes. It looked just like a piece of string when you snap it between your fingers. I could almost see the fingers. And you know what? There was something up there on the forble board with me. And so a couple of days later I came back. I, I don't know if there's anything in the world as desolate, as dismal, as dead-looking as an abandoned oil well rig. There it stands like a skeleton off on a deserted side road in the bare yellow hills surrounding it, and, and it's the deadest thing you ever saw. I sat in my car for a long time looking at it. Everything was just the way we'd left it. I, I looked in at the floor. The smashed traveling block was there alongside the rotary table. There was a little mutter of steam from the boiler. That was all. Then I heard a tinkle of something as it hit the ground alongside me. I looked around. There wasn't a soul in sight. But at my feet was the gold ring that Billy Grunewald and I had found in the core of rock that came from a mile underground and from a million years ago in time. And I heard a little sound. The sound of a kid crying. And there wasn't any kid up there. And I heard it again, and it came from above my head, and, and I... And I took out my revolver. I loaded it carefully. I started up the ladder to the forble board. Well, there wasn't anything up there, nothing I could see. But there was a voice crying. The voice of a little kid. And then there was a movement behind the rack of drill pipes, and I saw the pipe move, and I yelled, Come out of there, whoever you are! Come out, or I'll start shooting! And the stand of pipe shivered, and I thought, what can it be that can handle that heavy pipe like, like Jack Straws? And then there was a crash. <laughs> the whole stand of pipe fell over, and I just got out of the way in time. And I was alone on the forble board with the thing. But I couldn't see it. I felt the platform tremble under my feet again as something moved toward me. I fired two or three shots. And nothing happened. I started backwards. I knew it was following me because I could hear it meowing like a cat. My feet tripped over something. I saw it was a big can of red lead that somebody had left up there. Without thinking, I picked it up and I threw it at the sound and it splashed. And there it was. And I wish I... I wish... The face of a little girl, frightened, crying with hunger and terror. Hands like a human being and a finger missing from the left hand. And a body. Well, I'll tell you about that. I told you how I'm scared of spiders. But I knew where it came from. It had come from the bowels of the earth, come riding up on the drill pipe as we yanked it out of the well. Come to an alien world and was lost. It stood there dripping with red paint, blood red from head to foot like some horrible dream. And it put its hand on my arm. Its hand was stone. Living, moving stone. And it looked into my eyes and mewed like a lost kitten. Twenty years ago, I discovered many things about it, what it used for food, that it was deaf, that it was invisible and couldn't see people when it was invisible, that if you sprayed it with mud or paint... Or grease paint, makeup, then it could see people. And believe me, I didn't want to see its body. I can see that in my nightmares. But its face. I can't help wanting to see that pathetic little girl face. I'm afraid maybe I've fallen. Ah, but it's very beautiful. And when it's well made up, it's... But making it up, rubbing grease paint on a stone face that looks at you and smiles and it makes sounds like a lost kitten yet. I can disguise the body in long dresses, 
She can't hear very well. And when she's hungry, I have to stay out of her way. I found out what she likes to eat, remember? No, no, sit still. Sit still, do. Sit still or I'll have to shoot you. I want you to meet my wife. Or rather, my wife wants to meet you. Mike. Mike. There she is. Come on in, dear. The title of tonight's Quiet Please story is The Thing on the Furble Board. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper and featured Ernest Chappell. And Dan Sutter played Billy Grunwald. Pat O'Malley was Ted. And Cecil Roy was also a member of the cast. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Sound? Sound by our good friend Albert April. Now, for the word about next week, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Well, I'm reasonably sure that all the characters in tonight's stories were completely fictional. At least I, for one, hope so. Next week, the story is called Presto Change All, I'm sure. And so, until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Listen to them. Yes, they they still laugh and dance and, and play the night away, but... Oh, I, I shouldn't have drunk so much wine. I must hurry now to the villa where, where she's waiting, yes. Waiting for him, for her Fortunato. Oh, you, you at last. Oh, oh, you're like a beautiful painting, soft. Soft in candlelight. But your lips, they are cold. And your face, what has happened to your face? And your eyes, your white staring eyes, and the lie that grows in them. No, no, you. You don't wait for me, you. You wait for him. Yes, sir. Uh, I should have known, uh, but I did not want to know. Uh, I could not believe that you would fall for that, for that too pretty face, for that pretty voice, those, those pretty things set in so pretty a way. Oh, but now I, now I know you. You wait, while I'm, I'm wait, 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 wait for your Fortunato. <laughs> you know, know you. You couldn't know, no. You, you only fear, yes. And and while there is fear, there's life, huh? Just a little life, but it burns. It burns like a candle. The little wind of fear blows softly, and and it whispers, "He will not come." And then the candle flame flickers and almost goes out. But then, then a soft wind of hope whispers, "He will come. He will." And the little flame struggles up with light. Yes, but... But he will not come. He... He will not come. Ever. Hmm? Have I seen him? Have I seen your lover, Fortunato? Oh, of course I've seen him in the street. And I... I knew it was he because I heard the jingle of the little bells on his cap. And... And I knew him despite his jester's costume and... And beneath the mask, I, I could read his foolish, pretty smile. And I, and I took him and, and went down to the dark passageways under my house on a hill. And, and he followed me laughing and, and excited at what I promised at the end. 
There, I said, there you shall taste my greatest treasure, my, my finest wine, a cask of ancient Amontillado. <laughs> then I, then I took him by the hand and I, and I pulled him toward the solid rock behind the shadows where I had prepared an opening, yes, uh, an opening to fit the form of your Fortunato. I, I put down the candle and I said, now, now you shall taste the Amontillado. And, and he turned and, and I was upon him as he turned and I, I shoved him and, and he, he fell forward into the opening that was waiting for him and, and then I, I slammed the stone into place. And it was done, and when I flung away the trowel, and I, and I cried out to him, "Hear me, Fortunato!" But he could not answer me now, for in his mouth there was stone, and in his heart there was ice. And I heard him shriek, and and faintly the sound of his pounding hands. Faintly, faintly, the little bells on his cap, jingling, jingling, jingling. Then, then there was nothing, and I left the place where Fortunato is waiting. Yes, he waits, and you wait, and you shall wait. Wait forever. I have condemned you and I... I've counted my words as they slowly killed you. As I looked into your eyes and watched the little flame slowly die. <laughs> now go down to him. Sit with him. Play for him. Sing for him. And cry to him. Whisper to him. And listen. Listen, and perhaps, perhaps you'll hear him breathe, and, and perhaps you'll hear a soft tingling, tingling, tingling of his cap. Yes, the tingling, tingling, tingling of the bells. And so, dead among the living... May you wait for your Fortunato as he waits for you. And me, I'm condemned too, condemned forever by my own love. as it looks from here. Come in. Welcome. I am E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. For the next 52 minutes, I will be your trainer. I say trainer because we are concerned with a horse, a remarkable, powerful stallion who not only runs, but who thinks. And what does he think about? In our spine-tingling tale, he will think most about revenge. Go, Spartacus, go! You'll find him. You'll catch him. And when you do, he's yours. Oh, yours! Emily! Emily, here I am! I am Spartacus. See him? I'm here, Emily! Get him! Well, go, get him! Go! 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 Our mystery drama, Death Rides a Stallion, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Sam Dan 
and stars Mason Adams. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. big five-year-old chestnut stallion. He's in the prime of his glorious life. He has fire in his eyes and steel springs in his legs. The powerful muscles ripple beneath his shiny, velvety coat. And he also has a mind of his own. He's a rebel who acknowledges no master. That's why he's called Spartacus. But if he has no master, he does have a mistress. A slender, freckle-faced girl named Emily. And he will respond to her slightest touch, her softest whisper. Whoa, Spartacus, right here. Uh, Steady, boy. Steady. Good boy. Listen, Spartacus, here he comes now. Here I am, Frank. Oh, good morning, Uncle Harry. Oh, Morning, Emily. Do I uh, detect a faint tone of disappointment? Disappointment? Oh, why, Uncle Harry, you're my favorite human being. Oh, I have the impression that you were expecting someone else. Who? Me? Well, I wasn't expecting anybody. Oh. But look, I, I don't say that Lollygag here is in a class with Spartacus, but we challenge you to race. Uh, well... How about here to Parsons Creek? Uh, now? Unless you just want to stand around all day. The, uh, the truth is, Uncle Harry, I I am waiting for somebody. Oh, oh. oh, that's the secret of your early morning ride. And who is your partner in these assignations? Frank. Oh. Well, there's no counting for taste, I suppose. I think I'll commune with nature on my own. Oh, Lolly here. Uncle Harry, wait. Whoa there, Lolly. <laughs> Emily, if, if everybody listened to you the way the horses do, you could rule the world. Uncle Harry, do you know what I think? No, ma'am. You're too deep for me. I think this morning Frank's going to ask me. Ask you what? Ask me what? Ask me to marry him, of course. Why would Frank do that? Why would he... Oh, I suppose I'm not really pretty enough for a man to ask. No, no, Emily. I, I never meant to imply that I... Why, you're even prettier than Judy. No, I'm not. Nowhere near. Well, it's just that, that I thought... That... Oh, what did you think? Well, Emily, it's, it's, it's obvious that Frank really... What's obvious is that you dislike Frank, and therefore you don't even bother to know him. Frank looks for more than a pretty face. Uh, has he uh, given you any uh, indication? Well, of course he has. Really? Well, what, what did he say? He didn't say anything. Does he have to? It would help. Uncle Harry, I know by the tone of his voice, the way he looks at me, everything about him, everything tells me he loves me. And I love him. Oh, how I love him. You think I'm crazy? Uh, I think I'll ride back to the house and have some breakfast. This is the last time I'll bear my soul to you. Darling, look, I, I, I wouldn't want you to get hurt. I'm a big girl now. You don't know very much about men. Maybe, but I know what I like. Well, sounds like company's coming. Hi. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Frank. Well, look who's here. Kind of early in the day for you, Judy. I know, but we're out to spread the news. What news? Oh, Emily, darling. It's only right that you should be the first to know. After all, you introduced us. Frank and I, we're engaged. And we owe it all to you, Emily. We owe it all to you. And I want you to be my maid of honor. Now, promise. Oh, Emily, darling, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Judy and I will never forget what you've done for us, Emily. Can you believe this wild man? This fantastic Frank? He asked me just five minutes ago. I mean, I've been proposed to in my time, but never on horseback. <laughs> it's another Judy Montgomery. Fabulous first. Frank, let's ride back to the house and tell Mother. See you. Go, boy. 
Emily. They used to say, always a bridesmaid. But this time I'm doing better. Emily, I, I, I tried to I'm tell you. I'm of honor. Maybe I'm getting there. Emily, he's not worth it. He is to me. Darling, please don't ride this morning. Why not? You're upset. I'm not upset. Oh, I can tell. All right, I'm upset. Emily, you'll get over it. I'm over it now. Emily, dear, one day you'll, you'll meet me. I'll never get over Emily, it. Emily, believe me. Let's go, Spartacus. Go! Oh, Emily, Emily, wait. Emily. Go. Emily. Come on, Spartacus. Emily, Emily. Come on. Slow down. Faster, Spartacus, faster. Emily, you hurt your heart. Faster, Spartacus. Emily, please, you kill yourself. Go, Spartacus, go. Emily. Emily, look out. Jump, Spartacus, up. Emily, Emily, stop! I'm starting to stop! Emily! Oh. Oh, no. No. Emily. Come in. You wanted to see me, sir? Oh, it's you, Frank. Yes, yeah, sit down. Thank you. Wait uh, till I shut off this music. Oh, let it play. It was her favorite Rhapsody. So it was. Well, how are the ladies? Well, Judy and Mrs. Montgomery have gone to bed. It's been a terrible ordeal. Mm. But with the coroner... Wh- why was all that necessary? You have to establish the cause of death. Well, wasn't it obvious? What a thoroughly obnoxious man... Why did he have to ask so many questions when he knew from the start that his verdict would be accidental death? There isn't anything that I could do about it. But I disagree with the verdict. Well, what other verdict is possible? Murder. Murder? What? Do you mean someone killed her? Yes. Who? You. Me? Yes, you. You. It's impossible. Why is it impossible? Well, because I because I, I wasn't even there. You were there. What are you saying, sir? You don't have to call me sir. Don't pretend with me. I can see through you. You're a young hustler on the make. You have no right to accuse me of it. You a... used Emily to get to Judy. You're going to marry Judy for her money. I don't think I have to sit here and listen to I... it. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with marrying for money. Does anyone seriously believe that poverty improves the quality of love? I married Mrs. Montgomery's sister for her money. Yes, I married her for her money. She married me for my looks. And both of us knew it. And we've had a perfect marriage. But you're a scoundrel. And you won't even give Judy her money's worth. Now look here, sir. I said don't call me sir. You can relax with me. Don't be afraid. Even though every word I say is true, I couldn't prove any of it. None of it's true. You accuse me of killing Emily. That's a lie. You say I was there. You know I wasn't there. I was with Judy. We were riding back to the house. You know it for a fact. (laughs) Have a drink. I don't drink. Don't say it so smugly. You have other vices that are worse. I say you were with Emily. I was not. No, don't interrupt. Since the very day you met Emily or arranged to meet her, you've been with her always. I think you're mad. That's my saving grace. But to say that I was with Emily when you know... You were with her as far as she was concerned. I don't know what you're talking about. So few. So few girls like Emily in the world. Oh, what a shame that you had to waste one of them. You knew that she was in love with you. Well, love, I'd, I'd, I'd say it was a crush. Girls like Emily don't have crushes. They fall in love only once, and it's forever. She was in love with you, and you know it. Admit it. What is this, an inquisition? I don't have to put up with it. Of course you don't, but don't try my patience either. I'm doing this for your good. For my good? Make it difficult for me, and I'll wash my hands of the whole business. Why do you say for my good? If she fell in love with you of her own accord, well, that's a tragedy, but it's her tragedy. But if you made her fall in love with you... You're guilty of murder. Why? Because you knew it would kill her. The fact that you were only playing with her would kill her. The fact that you were only using her would kill her. All right. Maybe I did lead her to believe that I was in love with her. 
And it's murder in the first degree. Premeditated. I didn't know she'd take it this way. You knew. You knew it would destroy her one way or another. Okay, Harry. I killed her. That's what you want me to say, isn't it? Yes. Well, maybe she'll forgive you. Oh, come on, Harry. That's unworthy of you. Sure, I killed her. And you know why it doesn't destroy me? Because she was a girl who walked around saying to the whole world, kill me. Please, somebody kill me. She was so trusting, so naive. Anybody could have broken her heart. Anybody could have betrayed her. Nobody has the right to be that defenseless. I was just the guy who happened along. Yes. Well, despite it all, she'll forgive you. Sure, Harry. Don't humor me. She loves you. And when she loves, she loves forever. A little thing like death isn't going to stop her. Good morning, Mac. Morning, Mr. Frank. You going to ride? Who do you want? Spartacus. You do, huh? Saddle him. Saddle him, the man says. What's the problem? The problem's right there in the corral. You can look at the problem. You can listen to the problem. You want to ride Spartacus, Mr. Frank? You go in there. You put the saddle on him. How long has he been acting up? More than a week now. Since we lost Miss Emily. How long can he go on like that? Oh, for another five minutes. Or for the rest of his life. Poor Spartacus. He's kind of in mourning, that's all. Oh, Miss Judy said she'd wait for you at Parsons Creek. I got Bolivar saddled up. You know, Frank, ever since I was a little girl, nice things have always happened to me here at Parsons Creek. You're not listening, Frank. Judy, darling, I wait breathlessly for each word. No. Your mind is somewhere else, and I won't have it. I want all of your attention. Now, what have you been staring at for the past few minutes? Judy, look straight ahead toward that clump of birches at the edge of the field. Why? There's a horse standing there. I don't see anything. Big chestnut. If I didn't know that Spartacus was back in the corral... Have you had breakfast? No, but that doesn't... (laughs) It's the most important meal of the day. You're probably seeing things because you're faint with hunger. What do you mean you don't see anything? And it gives you a bad temper, too. Judy, don't joke with Missing me. Missing breakfast is no joke. We're going to go right back and get you some. That's Spartacus standing there, and someone is on him. Wait. Whoever it was, just moved behind the trees. Come on. Where? We're well, right over there. I'll prove it. I didn't see anything. I don't have to prove anything. Wait here. been all week. Emily. I've been waiting for you here every day. You're not angry with me, are you, Frank? Emily. Where would you like to ride this morning? You know, I never did thank you for that piano rhapsody. It was so thoughtful. Come on, boy. Let's go, boy. Frank, don't go. Don't go, Frank. Ready to go back for breakfast, Frank? Yeah. Yeah. Well, was anybody there? Oh, no. There was nobody there. Nobody at all. It could be a bad dream. And everything will be all right when Frank wakes up. But how can he wake up when we all know he hasn't been sleeping? We'll return shortly with Act Two. And now, Act Two of Death Rides a Stallion. Frank has gotten over the shock of seeing and hearing a dead Emily, but not completely, it seems, as he has breakfast with Judy. More coffee, Frank, darling? Thank you. You know, you weren't exactly filled with chatter and high spirits this morning. Sorry, Judy. You hardly said a word, all during our ride. I guess you're right. I 
should never skip breakfast. Oh, no, that isn't true. You should always skip breakfast. Or you'll wind up fat as a pig. <laughs> <laughs> the wit and wisdom of Uncle Harry. <laughs> morning, sir. And how are the true lovers this morning? Oh, I'm fine. Frank is a bit gloomy, I'm though. I'm not gloomy. Yes, I would say you are. I'm an expert on gloom. I was once engaged to a boy. Do you remember him, Uncle Harry, the tall, blonde? Uh, the one whose father owned uh, all that oil? No, no, he was a redhead. <laughs> the blonde's name was George, something or other. Oh. Anyhow, he was undoubtedly the gloomiest human being east of the Mississippi. Well, Frank, what's the problem? There isn't any problem. Frank's been seeing things. Is that a fact? Now, Judy. Now, Frank, don't deny it. He was actually convinced he saw Spartacus out riding this morning. Spartacus? And somebody was on him. Whoa, that's... Remarkable. Not to mention impossible. In the first place, nobody's been able to ride Spartacus since... Since poor Emily. And, and in the second place, Spartacus hasn't left the stable in all that time. Who was supposed to have been riding him, Frank? Look, the whole thing was a kind of a... A hallucination. Now, please forget it. All right, darling. Will you be judge at the competitions this year, Uncle Harry? Well, it's still on, after all, darling. We're in mourning. Oh, would Emily have wanted us to call off the show? What better way is there to remember her? Poor child. Frank, do you think that we should... Where's Frank? Uh, well, he was just sitting here. Where'd he go? Come on, Spartacus. Come on. Calm down, boy. Calm down. Everything's all right. Everything's going to be all right. I want to talk to you. Uh, oh, good morning. Uh, that's Spartacus. Still can't do a thing with you. You don't have to play that game for me anymore, Mike. Game, Mr. Frank? Tell me the truth or I'm going to beat it out of you. You raise your hand to me and I'll be forced to break your jaw. There's nothing the matter with Spartacus. He was out riding this morning. Well, that's news to me. Who's paying you off? Mr. Frank, the jaw of yours is starting to look like a good target. You saddled Spartacus after I left here. I saw him. He was near Parsons Creek. Oh, you ain't well. You want to sit down? I'll get you a glass of water. Now, now, get, just get, get your down. filthy hands off me. Frank, Frank, what's the matter? Nothing, 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 nothing is the matter, Judy. Jack. I think the, uh, the sun's a little strong this morning, Miss Judy, and you know these city fellows, they... They never wear hats. Frank, you don't look well at all. I'm fine. Now listen, darling, listen to me. I'm going to call Dr. Stone. I don't and... need a doctor. Yes, you do. You do? I don't want to hear another word. You just go to your room and rest. Come in. Oh, it's you, darling. I don't want to hear another word. Just go to your room and rest. <laughs> Well, I could tell who's going to wear the pants in your family. Not to mention the shorts and the slacks. When $26 million tells me to go up to my room, I go. There's a bit of an exaggeration there. She only has 23. Well, it won't change my style of living. What's this I hear about you uh, hallucinating? <laughs> I'll admit you had me going, Uncle Larry. I had you going? Never been back there. I believed. Oh, did I ever believe. What did you believe, Frank? I believed, and listen to this, I believed that the dead return. I believed that I actually saw Emily sitting on horseback, sitting on Spartacus. Oh, of course it was your imagination. No, it wasn't. You mean she was sitting on Spartacus? Let's say somebody was sitting on Spartacus. Somebody you hired, an actress what? made up to look like Emily. Why would I do a thing like that? Because you know I hate your guts. Oh, come on, Frank. You don't really... Oh, I do. And once I marry Judy and start assuming some control around here, you will be thrown out on your ear. Frank, you wouldn't... And you can either starve to death or you can find somebody else to sponge on. Oh, I see. That's why I'm trying to drive you crazy. Exactly, but it won't work. Yes, I could have hired someone to impersonate Emily, but I could never get her on Spartacus. 
That horse is completely unmanageable. I think you're bribing that fool down at the stables. Oh, don't let that pose of his throw you. He's far from a fool. Actually, he's a physicist. You plan to put this girl, this actress, on Spartacus, and my vivid imagination would then do the rest. He just realized one day that live horses were more interesting than dead mathematics. Oh, I blew it this morning. No question about that. I panicked. I lost my cool. First, when I actually thought it was Emily. Second, when I tried to put muscle on that moron at the stables. Frank, believe me, his IQ is higher than yours. I lost points with Judy, but it'll never happen again. Sorry to end your fun so soon, Uncle Harry. Come in. Frank, darling. I came by to check. Has he been resting, Uncle Harry? Oh, yes, yes. He's been as good as gold. My darling Judy, won't you believe I'm all right? You didn't look all right, and you didn't sound all right just a little while ago. I'm fine right now. I'm just fine. Oh, that's good, darling. Because we're having dinner with the Farrington. Far- oh, Judy, he's such a bore. Oh, of course. But he has one of the biggest stock brokerage firms in the country. We were talking about making you vice president. Judy, I'm not interested. Frank, darling... You'll have to do something. I don't know anything about... And there's no reason you can't learn. Now, Uncle Harry knows all about finance. Let him teach you. Will you, Uncle Harry? Oh, gladly. I'll pop in again soon, just to check on you. (laughs) Does she know your plan to assume control after the wedding? Don't you worry about me. I know how to handle women. Well, Judy has all the money. But you know you'd have been much happier with Emily... I was so proud of you this evening, Frank. You were so attentive and so interested. You hung on Jim Farrington's every word. I'm going to work for him. No, dear, not for him. With him. After all, Mother and I are major stockholders in Farrington and Company. But don't you find stocks and bonds? Slow down, Judy. What? Slow down. Look look out, Judy. Judy, you all right? Oh, of course I'm all right. Why did you make me skid off the road? Uh, There was, there was, there was somebody up ahead. I didn't see anybody. There was somebody up ahead on horseback. On a horseback? At 11 o'clock at night? I could have sworn I... Maybe, maybe, maybe it was the shadows. Oh, you have this thing for people on horseback, Frank. I'm never going to get out of this ditch. We're less than a mile from home. Let's walk. Oh! Oh, no! We'll have to wait till it lets up. Oh, we could wait all night. I tell you, I can run to the house, pick up another car, and be back in ten minutes. <laughs> I was waiting for you to suggest a gallant thing, darling. You mind waiting alone? Why should I mind? These are my woods. Well, there goes. Uh. Hello, Frank. What? Emily. Poor Frank. You're getting soaked. Climb up. Ride with me. Emily, what What do you want? I want you to come with me, Frank. Where? Where we can just be together all the time. Just you and me, Frank. You love me. This is some kind of trick. But it isn't working. Harry, he hired you. No, Frank. I'm Emily. Really? When I saw you this morning, you mentioned the piano rhapsody. Harry knew about it. He coached you. No, Frank. Only you and I know about the day we met. Only you and I. Excuse me. I think this is my seat. Oh, it's... Look, my ticket stub says R1. So does mine. Hey, look at the date on your ticket. It's for tomorrow. Oh. Well, look, you, you... You take the seat anyhow. Oh, but I couldn't. I insist. Now sit down and enjoy yourself. And we met in the lobby at intermission. And you bought me a lemonade. And when I said my name was Emily Montgomery, you said... Of the Montgomerys? Well, yes, that's what we're called. Hey, I had no idea I was buying a lemonade for an heiress. Oh, I'm not an heiress. My stepsister, Judy, has the money. Come with me, Frank. No. Don't be afraid, Frank. I love you. I wouldn't harm you. Come with me. I I can't go with you, Emily. 
Why, Frank? Why? Because, because you're dead. Oh, no, Frank. Love never dies. And neither do lovers. You remember that verse you once recited? So speak to me of parting never. For all who love shall live forever. Keep away from me. Frank, I forgive you for Judy. Keep away, I said. You were poor all your life, and when she smiled... Keep away, please. But I'm the one you love. I'm the one you want. Come with me, Frank. Keep away from me. Frank! Don't go, Frank! Keep away from me. Keep away from me. Keep away from me. And so, we have here a man who is sprinting down a country road at midnight, in a pouring rain, shouting, Keep away from me. And his urgent plea is directed to a dead young lady. And yet, 12 hours ago, he was convinced that the dead do not return. We'll return shortly with Act Three. A lonely country road in the dead of night. It can try the souls of the most practical of men. Pragmatic, sensible Frank is now terrified, delirious Frank. Keep away from me. Keep away. Keep away. What? 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 Lie back, Frank. Lie back and be quiet. What? How? How did I... How did I get here? What am I... What am I doing in bed? Judy found you lying on the road unconscious. I waited in the car for almost an hour. I thought you'd taken this as an excuse to run out on me. Oh, Judy, don't say that. Right, darling, now don't excite yourself. No, I'm fine. I'm okay. See, the rain had let up, and I started to walk home. And there was someone lying in the road. And it was you. What happened, I, 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 I must have tripped over something. Or maybe I, I ran to a low-hanging branch. I, I guess I was knocked out. And, and you kept moaning, keep away from me. Why? Well, Who? I don't know. I, 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 I just... I guess I must have been having a nightmare. Well, listen, the first thing in the morning, we'll see Dr. Stoneman. But right now, what you need is some sleep. And we'd better leave you alone. Are you coming, Uncle Harry? Yeah, in just a minute. Frank, dear, you look very tired. You try to get some rest. Good night, my darling. Good night. <laughs> so, you were running, you tripped, you fell, you were knocked unconscious. Oh, no. No, that story won't do. You don't have a mark on you. What are you talking about? She's starting to have second thoughts, Frank. Bad move. You should have chosen Emily. No 23 million there, but she wasn't exactly a welfare case either. It won't work, Uncle Harry. You can't hope to psych me out of it. Nobody can psych me out of it. Little things, Frank. Little straws in the wind. For instance... She just said, I waited in the car. I thought you'd taken this excuse to run out on me. What she really meant, Frank. She might be looking for an excuse to run out on you. Enjoy yourself, Harry. I've been with that girl through... Oh, it has to be at least a dozen engagements. Each one is like a fever. It runs a predictable course. And you can always tell when she's reached the crisis. She becomes thoughtful. Pour you another glass of wine, dear. Judy, more wine? No. Oh, thank you. What a glorious spot for a picnic. Frank, did you tell Dr. Stoneman everything? Of course. You heard what he said. I am 100%. Did you say anything about that mysterious rider? What mysterious writing? Oh, I know for a fact you've seen it twice. Once yesterday morning and again on the road last night. The rider who's supposed to be on Spartacus. What's there to say about it? It's impossible. Who can even get a saddle on Spartacus these days? Then why do you keep seeing him with someone on his back? Julie, darling, didn't you ever have a momentary flash? Well, an illusion? No. Not really. I take after Dad, both feet on the ground. 
You know, it's a pity you never knew my dad. There was a man for you. You're a lot like him, except... Well, except when you get these... What do you call them? Delusions? No. He wasn't like that at all. Who's that coming? I don't see anybody. Oh, Frank, not again. Hello, Frank. What's the matter, darling? Nothing. Nothing is the matter. I'm fine. Well, you don't look it. Come with me, my dearest. Frank, are you sure you don't have some deep, dark secret? Come with me. She won't mind if you come with me. I always thought I wanted to marry a man of mystery, but... Judy and I, we grew up together. We loved each other as sisters do. Frank, are you sure you haven't been drinking? She wouldn't have taken you if she knew I loved you. Judy, let's go back to the house. But we just got oh, here. Oh, no, but please. Don't go with her, Frank. Come with me. All right, we might as well. I can tell you're not going to be much fun today. Good morning, Mr. Frank. Do anything for you? Matt, Spartacus has been here all morning, hasn't he? This time you don't have to take my word for it. The vet's in the stable. He's been here all morning. Ask him. Want me to call him? No, no, no. Never mind. Hey, you, you look you look nervous, Mr. Frank. You ought to get some rest. Yeah, sure. Sure. The vet's been here all morning, and so is Spartacus. Why do you keep asking? How, how, how long will it take you to saddle, Spartacus? The way he is now? Forever. I'm going to ride, Spartacus. Mr. Frank. Now, that is a damn fool thing to do. If you won't saddle him, I will. I tell you what, Mr. Frank. This is a bad time. Toward evening, he kind of simmers down a bit, and that's the best time to try. Right now, he'd kill the both of us. That's five o'clock. Oh, I'd say five o'clock's just fine. Come in. Well, I'm here to attend your education as a budding financier, as per your fiancé's instructions. So, let's begin with something right up your alley. Let me tell you about watered stock. Oh, shut up. People have been talking about you. Mac in the stables, for one. He tells me that you intend to ride Spartacus. That's right. Why? Harry, at first I thought you were out to destroy my mind with an actress who was impersonating Emily on Spartacus. But that's impossible. <laughs> Might have been fun at that. Now I know for sure that I am having hallucinations. I keep seeing Emily. Oh, that's bad. But as long as I'm aware of it, I can handle it. It's my own mind, and I can control it. Hooray for you. The key to this thing is Spartacus. If I can break that horse, I can break this whole psychological hang-up. Well, that's what you think it is, a psychological hang-up. Absolutely. Judy's also been talking about you. She's uh, a little disturbed. I didn't notice. Yeah, key sign. Tell me, did she talk about her father yet? No. You sure? What? She she happened to mention him briefly. But his name did come up. Uh, just in passing. Oh, bad news for you. Why don't you get out of here? I don't think she'll ever marry anybody. None of this is going to work, Harry. Her daddy was just too overwhelming a man. She's attracted to guys who resemble him. And then when she finds out the resemblance is only superficial... She's done it no fewer than 12 times. Oh, my goodness. You're number 13. Will you get out of here? I'm supposed to teach you how to be a stockbroker. Cut it out. Well, here you are, you two. Hard at work, I hope. How are the lessons coming? The lessons are coming to an end. <laughs> you mean you've learned everything already? I don't intend to learn anything. I don't care about finance. I won't go into an office with that idiot Farrington. And when we're married, I intend to make the decisions. Well, uh, of course. Now, what I... did you want to see me about? I, I just came up to find out if you were all right. Obviously, I'm fine. Oh, well, uh, I'll see you at dinner. That's how you handle women, Uncle Harry. That's how you regain control of your mind. And now, I'm going for a walk. Oh, if you happen to see Emily riding Spartacus, say hello for me. Hello, Frank. Emily, you're either in my mind, or you really are out there. 
I'm out here, Frank. Either way, I can live with it. You won't destroy me. Oh, my darling. I'm not here to destroy you. I'm here to save you. Emily, I don't love you. Believe me, I used you. I used you to meet Judy. No, Frank, that's not true. You love me. Some stranger. Something. Someone who's alien to your very nature was attracted to Judy. Oh, Frank, she won't marry you. She doesn't love she you. She will marry me. I've come for you, Frank. We'll be together always. Go away from me. Speak to me of parting never. For those who love shall live forever. Emily, I don't want you. Yes, you do. Oh, how badly you want me. How you need me. I can me. live with this. I can keep seeing you and talking to you. It won't destroy me. I'll just get used to it. I will get used to it. So soon, Frank. Have a nice walk. Of course. Thought Judy would be here. Wanted to find out what the plan was for dinner. Aren't you the newly appointed planner? No, not when it comes to dinner. That's a woman's prerogative. Well, Judy isn't here. Where'd she go? She left for the airport. Why? I wouldn't know. Did something come up suddenly? Probably. Oh, she uh, left you this note. Thanks. Frank, darling. How lucky we are to find out sooner rather than late. Obviously, it isn't going to work. The one thing I must have in my life is someone solid, dependable. Someone who has a clearly defined goal and purpose. You're wonderful, Frank, but so moody, so unpredictable. How ironic. You would have been just right for Emily. I realize that now. Had she lived, I'm sure you would have found each other. I hope we can meet again as friends. Judy. Well, Frank, I'm sorry. Uh, Let me pour you a drink. I'll ride that damn horse. I'll kill him. Frank! Yes, Mr. Frank. You saddle Spartacus. No, sir. Saddle him. I have strict orders from Miss Judy that no one's to ride Spartacus at this time. Anyhow, sir, he's impossible. No, no, no. He's standing there very quiet. But that's just for the moment. Frank. Oh, Frank, darling. There's Miss Emily. She's getting ready to ride him. Miss Emily? There she is, right beside him. You see Miss Emily? Of course. Come with me, Frank, darling. We'll be together now. Yes, Emily, I was so foolish. Mr. Frank, please tell me, who are you talking to? To Miss Emily. Come, Frank. Yes, Emily, you're all I have. Climb up behind me. We'll ride Spartacus together. Hey, Mr. Frank, Mr. Frank, where do you think you're going? You can't go in that corral at her, it'll kill you. Spartacus, look at him, so still, so gentle. I can't let you go in there. It's all right, Emily and I will ride him together. Come, Frank, let him go, Mr. Frank. No, Mr. Frank, quick, 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 come on, give me a hand, I can't hold. I'm waiting, Frank. Let me go. I'm coming, Emily. Mr. Frank, get out of that corral. Climb on, Frank. Climb on. Get away from that horse. Get away. Don't be afraid of him, Frank. Climb on. Don't touch him, Mr. Frank. Back away, back away. Here. Let Don't me touch help him. you. Back away. Take my hand, Frank. Yes. No. Take my no. hand. Yes, Emily, yes. Don't touch that horse. Don't be afraid, Frank. Emily, give me your hand. Emily, where are you? Emily. <laughs> Emily, help me. Help me! Mr. Frank! Help! Help! Bert! Get a rope! Jerry! Call an ambulance. As you can already guess, the ambulance was too late. But... As the poem says, those who love shall live forever. If Frank truly loved Emily at the end, then both of them will be together somewhere forever. I'll be back shortly.
This is WOR New York, your station for the Mystery Theater. Do you believe the story of Spartacus? Well, maybe you should, because whenever we vouch for something, we say it's from the horse's mouth. That's because everyone knows that horses never lie. Our cast included Mason Adams, Marion Seldes, Paul McGrath, Barbara Worthington, and Harry Belliver. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. I want my house. If I could just have my house back again the way it was when I moved in. It's the cat. She's back. <laughs> my beautiful Eva. What did you call her? Eva. That's her name. How do you know what her name is? Because I just named her. Eva is a horrible name. No, it isn't. Think about it, Miss Thrift. Evil spelled backwards is Liv. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for terror. Stay tuned for shivers and excitement. Listen to Craig Dennis in The Boogeyman Will Get You. Written by Robert Block for Weird Tales magazine and adapted by the author especially for this program. You'll hear it now if you... Stay tuned for... Craig Dennis in The Boogeyman Will Get You. You're a 
afraid of the dark, aren't you? Oh, but you are. I know all about you. Do you understand? You were afraid of the dark when you were a child. Not because of robbers or thieves or murderers. Children don't think of such things. You were afraid of the dark because of the boogeyman. That's the name your parents used, boogeyman. One of those smart, sophisticated, grown-up words. But there is terror behind it. When you were a child, you knew what the boogeyman looked like. You would see him in your dreams. That black, grinning shape with the wicked red eyes and the clutching claws. You heard his buzzing voice mumbling to you in sleep when you had nightmares. And you'd wake up screaming for your mother. <laughs> You did scream, didn't you? And now that you're grown up, you laugh about it. But deep down inside, you're still afraid. You say you don't believe such things? It's all superstition. <laughs> then why are you still afraid of the dark? Why do you keep the lights on when you're home alone at night? I'll tell you why. Because you know it's true. There are such things as monsters. There are such evil beings. And the boogeyman will get you if you don't watch out. Well, what do you think of it? Marvelous. I don't know how you do it, Walter. Great stuff. You say it's part of a new essay? That's right. Looks like I'll have it finished this week. But, Walter, you work too hard. Cooped up all day long in that cottage of yours. Why don't you relax? That's just why I rented the cottage. To stay cooped up and get some work done. A book doesn't write itself, you know. I don't see how you fellas do it. Writing, I mean. Me, I'll stick to the insurance business. Life insurance must be a wonderful thing. You mean to tell me you're not insured, man? Oh, wait a minute now, darling. Walter, you'll have to excuse that husband of mine. He's always trying to sell something. Lewis, let the poor man alone. We invite him over here tonight for a visit, remember? I appreciate it, too. You folks are very kind to ask me in, but I'm apt to bore you with my essays. Bore me? Oh, nonsense. You nearly scared me stiff. Is that why Nancy isn't around? Do I scare her, too? Oh, of course not. The child's probably out with her gang, you know, the Bobby Sox crowd. Nancy is a very remarkable young woman. She didn't strike me as a typical member of the younger generation at all. Well, she isn't really. Nancy is very mature for 17. Too mature, I'm afraid. Sometimes she comes out with something that surprises me. Really? Yes. Now, take what she was saying about you the other Lewis, day. Lewis. Oh, <coughs> I guess I put my foot in at that time. Nancy said something about me? What was it? Oh, uh, nothing. Nothing at all. Matter of fact, I've, I've forgotten just exactly what it was. Please, tell me. I won't be offended. I'm curious. I've noticed that daughter of yours watching me, and I've wondered about it. Well, you'll have to excuse her, Walter. She's just a kid, after all. She said, well, we were talking about why we never saw you in the daytime, out in the tennis court or at the beach. And she said, that's not so strange. Vampires always sleep in the daytime. Vampires? Don't adolescents get the funniest notion sometimes? Yes. Yes, they do. She's aw awfully interested in you, really, Walter. After all, you're handsome, stranger here at the resort, an older man. I do believe she's getting a crush on you, but tries to hide it by crazy remarks. Calling you a vampire. Where does she get such ideas? Reads too many books, I'd say. Yes. Sly kid, though. I asked her why she thought you were a vampire. Know what she said? What did she say? Said it was because you didn't eat any food. She said what? Nancy said she'd asked around town at the grocery store and the butcher shop and that you never bought any food. I shut her up in a hurry, though. Young lady, I said, apparently you don't know much about bachelor's eating habits. Did you ever hear of places called restaurants? You should have seen the look on Nancy's face when I... Why, hello, Nancy. We we were just talking about you. So I heard. Well, your manners, dear. Aren't you going to say hello to Mr. King? Good evening, Nancy. Nancy, Mr. King spoke to you. Nancy, what are you doing, child? <laughs> She's making the sign of the cross, an ancient custom... It's supposed to ward off vampires. That's a good one. Well, young lady, 
How come you were running around in the dark tonight? Aren't you afraid of evil spirits? Don't joke about things you don't understand, Father. Nancy, that's no way to talk to your father. Where were you? Oh, just walking. It was Billy Leggett. Up in the hills under the hemlock trees. I suppose that's where you lost your scarf, young lady. My, my... Oh. Oh, yes. I... I didn't know I'd lost it. Well, folks, I've got to be running along. It's getting late. So soon? Yes, it's, it's getting a little late. All right, Walter. See you around. You sure you don't mind walking home alone? Oh, of course not. Maybe we could send Nancy along with you to protect you from vampires. Nancy was a silly little girl. I knew it. But still, she upset me. Maybe it was because she was so beautiful and she hated me so. Thought I was a vampire. Just a silly little girl with a queer idea in her pretty head. I wondered what she was trying to do. At night, when I got back to the cottage, I found out. I stood in front of the door and saw something lying on the path. It was Nancy Scott. What had she been doing here? She said she had gone for a walk to the hills near the hemlock trees, but here was her scarf. And as I opened the door, my hand touched something. A wreath on the doorknob. A wreath of hemlock. Hemlock. That's what you put on the door to keep vampires away. I thought about it all night. What was that girl up to? The next day, I investigated a little. I found out plenty. Nancy had spread talk all over the village. Talk about me, about my habits, how I stayed in all day and came out at night, about my not eating at home. She'd even tried to call New York to check up on me, whether I really had a job and so on. She told the minister I didn't dare come to church and said I had no mirrors in my house because a vampire couldn't look into mirrors. This wasn't funny anymore. The foolish kid was making trouble for me. Somehow she had this mad obsession about vampires. I had to talk to her. So that night I started over for her place, but before I arrived, I ran into her by accident on the path. Oh! Oh, you startled me. Sorry, Nancy. I didn't mean to frighten you. But say, I've been looking for you. Let's take a walk, shall we? Well, um, really, Mr. King, I have a date. Only for a few minutes, my dear, and why so formal? Call me Walter. By the way, I seem to have a speck in my eye. Have you a mirror in your purse? A mirror? Why, yes. Uh, uh, here it is. Oh, good. Let me see. Ah. There, I've got it. Oh, thank you. You looked into the mirror. Of course. And I found that hemlock on my doorknob last night, too. Oh, oh don't look so startled, Nancy. I know all about your ideas. You thought I was a vampire, didn't you? Just because I work all day and eat in restaurants and walk at night. But you're wrong. You know that now, don't you? I look in mirrors and touch hemlock and all the rest. Yes, I... I see. I... I guess you think I'm an awful fool, Walter. Not at all. I think you're a very lovely girl. I wish it wasn't so dark out here so I could see your hair. You have beautiful hair, Nancy. Look, the moon is rising. I can see you now. Nancy, you aren't afraid of me anymore. No. Walter, I... I never was afraid. Not really. I, I just thought up all this vampire stuff to, to make you notice me. And besides, all vampires are tall and dark and, and handsome, like you. You're a very clever little girl, Nancy. Very clever. Only I... I wish you hadn't gone to the police today. Police? Then you know? Yes. I found that out, too. A search warrant for my house. Oh, but... But that was all a joke. And, and you aren't really a vampire, so it doesn't matter. When they come, we'll laugh at them. I'll laugh at them. You won't. Walter! What are you doing? Let go of me! Walter, what's happening to you? You're changing. Walter! Too bad you were such a meddling little fool, Nancy. I can't let you get away now. It would spoil everything. You guessed too much. Walter, let me go. Walter! Oh, good heavens! 
And it is true. You are a vampire. No, my dear. I am not a vampire. I'm just a werewolf. have just heard Craig Dennis in The Boogeyman Will Get You, written by Robert Block, author of stories in Weird Tales magazine. The original music was conceived and played by Romel Fay. In just a moment, we'll tell you about the next story in... Stay tuned for terror. In the meantime... Yes, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for terror. Stay tuned for thrills and excitement. Listen to Craig Dennis in Lizzie Borden Took an Axe. Written by Robert Block for Weird Tales magazine and adapted by the author especially for this program. You'll hear it now if you... Stay tuned for... And now, here is Craig Dennis in Lizzie Borden Took an Axe. Morning Bulletin, Jim Daly speaking. Jim, Jim, help me. Anita, what's the matter? I, I can't tell you, Jim, but, but it's happened. 
come out at once. You, you must help me. That's how it started. On a hot morning in July, with Anita's fear-filled voice pleading with me over the telephone. I left the office, got out the car, and raced down the long, lonely road leading to that house in the hills. I didn't know what I might find when I reached that house. Anything could happen there with Anita locked up all alone with her crazy guardian. The thought of my fiancé alone with that madman almost terrified me. For old Gideon Godfrey was insane. That's what I was afraid of. Anita told me that her uncle was hexing her, putting the curse of the evil eye on her. Nonsense, of course. And Anita was too intelligent to believe such superstitions. But living there all alone under the power of that demented man, her sanity was going, too. I could see it. Lately, she had told me about something black. Something black that came into her bedroom at night. It was a sort of trailing mist, but it had a face and a voice. Both were horrible. It seemed to whisper to her when she was asleep, and then she would fight off the inky tentacles that clutched her body and wake up screaming. She called it an incubus, a night demon. She said Gideon Godfrey sent it to her. Yes, I had good reason to be afraid. A cunning maniac and a frightened girl, alone together in a lonely house, and now that phone call. When I pulled up before the house, I jumped out and made for the door. I didn't knock, but walked right in. Anita stood in the parlor at the far side of the room, waiting. She said nothing, just held out her arms. I moved across the room to embrace her, but as I walked, I stumbled over something. I looked down and saw what I had stumbled over. The body of Gideon Godfrey lay on the floor. The head split open and crushed to a bloody pulp. Jim. Jim, help me. You must help me, Doc. Of course I'll help you, but what happened? Well, it... It was hot this morning. I was out in the barn. I... I felt tired. I dozed off in the hayloft. Then all at once I woke up and came into the house. I found my uncle lying here. Wasn't there any noise? Nobody around? Not a soul. Somebody killed him with an axe. But where is the axe? The axe? I, I don't know. It should be by the body if someone killed him. Well, just a minute. Jim, Jim, where are you going? I'm going to call the police. Oh, no, Jim. Don't you see? If you call them, they'll think... I did it. Yes. That's right. It's a pretty flimsy story, isn't it, Anita? If we only had a weapon, fingerprints or footprints or clues... You're sure you were out in the barn when this happened? Oh, yes. Can't you remember more than that? No. It, it's all, all so confused. I had one of my dreams... You know, the black thing came. I seem to remember I went out there for fishing sinkers. Fishing sinkers? Yes. In the barn? Listen to me. You're not Anita Loomis. You're Lizzie Borden. Yes, she was like Lizzie Borden. I told her the story then, the story of Lizzie Borden. It was like the old jingle that began running through my brain. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. They had accused Lizzie Borden of murdering her parents one hot summer day after she came in from sleeping in the haymow. They said she took an axe to them. It was a famous case and now, Anita was shuddering in my arms. Oh, Jim. Jim, don't tell me stories like that. Are you trying to compare me to that woman? Are you hinting that I took an axe to my uncle? I'm not hinting anything. Just pointing out how similar your case is to Lizzie Borden's. Maybe that's the explanation of, of her case, too. 
Maybe she was possessed of a demon. Maybe the black spirit of murder descended upon her when she slept. Told her to wake up and take an axe and... Take it kill. easy. Take it easy now. I need it. Stop it. There are no such things. You're, you're just upset. You've got to think this thing out now. Eventually, we must call the police. We can't get around that. But right now, the thing to do is try and find that axe. <laughs> We started to search for the murder weapon then. We covered every room. There was no axe. Finally, I sent Anita to look upstairs while I went over the parlor again. There was nothing. My head began to swim. It was hot, quiet. There was only silence and that body on the floor with its ghastly grin. And then, all at once, I saw it. It was like a cloud, a black cloud. But it wasn't a cloud, it was a face. A face covered by a mask of wavering smoke. A mask that leered and pressed closer. I couldn't move. Then I heard something swish. I turned. It was Anita. As I grasped her wrists, she screamed and fainted. The black cloud over her face disappeared, oozed into air. As she fell, I pried something loose from her rigid hands. It was... A blood-stained axe. I put her down on the sofa and went into the other room. I carried the axe with me. No sense in taking chances. I trusted Anita, but not that thing. Not that black thing that swirled up like smoke to take possession of a living brain and make it lust to kill. In the other room, I phoned the police and sat down to wait. What could we tell them? The truth? They wouldn't believe it. Wouldn't believe that an incubus could enter a human body and make it attempt a murder. But I knew how it must have entered into her, made her kill Gideon Godfrey. I felt the cool axe blade in my hand as I leaned back. The verse kept going in my head. Lizzie Borden took an axe. What was that? I woke with a start. At first, I thought the police had arrived. And I realized it was thunder. A heat storm was breaking. I blinked and got up from the chair. Then I realized that something was missing. The axe was gone from my hands. Anita! She must have awakened while I slept, come in here and stolen the axe again. Yes. What a fool I was to sleep. A demon. It had come back to her, entered into her. I faced the door, saw the trail of blood. It was true. I ran into the other room. Then I gasped with relief, for Anita was still lying on the couch. I looked at the trail of blood on the floor. For the first time, I noticed that it seemed to lead away from her, not towards her. What did it mean? It meant she wasn't possessed of the demon now while she slept. Maybe, maybe the demon came to me when I dozed off. I was trying to remember. Where was the axe? Where could it be now? Then I knew. Knew everything. Knew that the demon had entered me while I slept knew what I had done because I saw that axe now, crystal clear, that axe buried to the hilt in the top of Anita's head. You have just heard Craig Dennis in Lizzie Borden Took an Axe, adapted for radio by Robert Block from his story in Weird Tales magazine. The original music on this program was conceived and played by Romel Fay. In just a moment, we'll tell you about the next story in... Stay tuned for terror. In the meantime...
Now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense! Tonight, Autolite brings you Mr. Ralph Edwards in Ghost Hunt, a suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. Friends, replace worn-out narrow-gap spark plugs with a set of those new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Your motor will idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save gas. These winning benefits are all made possible by a newly developed Autolite 10,000-ohm resistor built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug, making practical a wider spark gap setting. And that's what does the trick. What's more, Autolite resistor spark plugs with this exclusive Autolite resistor have greatly increased electrode life and cut down on radio and television interference. So, folks, see your Autolite dealer and have him replace old, worn-out, narrow-gap spark plugs with a set of the new Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And also remember, the Autolite suspense show is now on television. Every Tuesday night in many parts of the country. And now, Autolite presents Ralph Edwards in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Didn't that leave you high, huh? Left me feeling treetop tall. That was Louis Armstrong's I Can't Give You Anything But Love. And that's all we have time for on the Hot and Mellow Hour tonight. Yes, 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 this is Smiley Smith, your favorite disc jockey. I hope, I hope, booting the Hot and Mellow Hour home for this evening. I'll be back again tomorrow night, minus the music, but with a little surprise for you. Tomorrow night, Friday night, as you know, is stunt night here at Station WXP. And have I got a stunt for you. Last week, if you remember, I planted my wire recorder in the steam room at a lady's Turkish bath and then let you listen in on the playback, remember? (laughs) Well, tonight, as soon as I leave the studio, do you know where I'm going? Hmm? Your friend Smiley is going to spend the night in a haunted house on a spook hunt. You heard me, a spook hunt in a haunted house. I'm bringing my little old wire recorder along with me, and if you tune in tomorrow evening at this time, you'll learn what it's like to spend a night in a haunted house. Ain't that something? <laughs> yeah. A real haunted house. No kidding. Four people are known to have committed suicide there. So tune in tomorrow night and share a real thrill with your old pal Smiley, I Must Be Crazy, Smith. Good night. <laughs> Care for a cigar, Mr. Thorpe? I got some cigars in the dash there. No. Well, no reason for you to carry a chip on your shoulder, Mr. Thorpe. Oh, really? Well, I don't like this fool stunt. Well, I don't see it as a fool stunt at all. I really don't. I think it's the only way you're going to unload this house. Ordinary selling methods won't work in a case like this. I don't forget the reputation saddling this house for suicide since 1939. You know what people call it, the death trap. Yes. Yeah. A lot of nonsense. Sure, but try to convince people of that. Anyway, when this disc jockey offered me this chance to kill all the rumors about the death or... About the property, I just naturally jumped and took him up at it. Especially since it don't cost a cent. You sure about that? I'm not liable for a penny. Not a cent. We're doing him a favor letting him use the place, he said. Thanked me for the chance last night when I drove him out here. So one hand washes the other, as the feller says. He got a chance to pull off a stunt, and the wire recording will prove the people the property is A number one, and we increase the chance of selling the place. Well, as long as it doesn't cost me anything. Not a thing. He's using his own recorder, and I'm paying for the rental of a couple of walkie-talkies he hooked up to it. Well, uh, what about this, uh, Reed? Does he charge anything? He comes gratis, too. Dr. Reed is, uh, uh, what you call it, a psychic investigator. Belongs to a couple of societies that do nothing but hunt ghosts. <laughs> He showed me articles he's written about it in the magazine. Uh-huh. Well, here's the house. Yeah, looks real nice in the sunshine, don't it? Yeah, man, smell that sea breeze. You don't have to sell me. Well, let them know we're here. <coughs> yeah, probably asleep up all night and everything. 
Why don't they come out? Do you think they've gone? Well, I told them last night I'd pick them up around 11. Uh, Smith! Smith! Hey, Smiley! Dr. Reed! Yeah, fast asleep, I guess. We better go in and wake him up. Of course, they may have taken the bus back to town. Oh, no, no. It's a two-mile hike to the main highway. Uh, Smith! Hey, uh, Smiley. Where are you? Wake up. You don't suppose, uh, do you? Oh, no, no. Uh, Smith? Uh, Dr. Reed? What's that, that, uh, clicking noise from in there? Well, it's his wire recorder. He left it running. <laughs> These machines cost a lot of money. Doesn't he care if he uses up his batteries? Well, where is he? And where's this Reed? Maybe they're upstairs. Uh, Smith? Hey. Anybody home? They must have walked to the highway and taken the bus. Well, you wouldn't have left these machines. Well, where are they, then? Where are they? No, no, no. Don't get excited, Mr. Thorpe. Don't tell me not to get excited. If something's happened to them in my house, I'm liable. Well, you try this side. I'll try that one. All right. Uh, Smith. Hey, Smiley. Smith. Smith. Oh. McDonald, come here. So what? What it? Oh. No. Reed. Dr. Reed. No, no, don't touch him, Mr. Thorpe. You'll get your hands off. Look. Blood. Is he dead? I can still feel his pulse. We better get him to hospital fast. Care for a cigar, Mr. Thorpe? No, no, thanks. Well, why not try to relax? The nurse said Reed would be all right as soon as he's had a blood transfusion. You told the radio station to be sure and call us as soon as they had any word about Smith? Yes, I told them. Uh, why don't you sit down? No, oh, I'm all at sixes and sevens. What do you suppose happened out there last night? Well, we're going to know in just a second, just as soon as I can get this, this recorder set up. You don't suppose Smith and Reed got into a fight, do you? Yeah, there. Huh? A fight? I don't know. Well, what's wrong? Won't it work? Yeah, it works. Uh, take it easy. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. There. Testing. Wait. One, two, three. All set, Dr. Reed? Miss McDonald? Hey? Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> this is Smiley Smith speaking. Smiley Smith, the ghost hunter. I don't know whether to hope this will turn out to be a success for the sake of the program or a failure for my own sake. Anyway, all the preparations have been made now, and it's up to the spooks. I better tell you where we are. Right now, we're standing on the lawn of a house about 12 miles above Malibu Beach. The ocean is 100 feet away, straight down. The house is perched on a cliff, and there's a sheer drop of about 100 feet right into the old Pacific. Maybe you can hear the surf pounding. I'll turn up the volume. You hear it? Now... I'm going to have you meet two gentlemen who are here with me. Incidentally, we're the only people around for miles and miles. First, I'd like you to meet Dr. Clarence Reed of the British and American Psychical Research Guild. Dr. Reed is a famous investigator of uh, psychic phenomena, and I'm very honored to be associated with him on this ghost hunt. He's smiling in an embarrassed sort of way. You're not too kind, Mr. Smith. Dr. Reed has conducted experiments in this field with such great believers in spiritualism as Oliver Lodge and Arthur Conan Doyle. He looks a bit like Santa Claus. He's short and stocky. You don't object, do you, Dr. Reed? Hmm? <laughs> no, 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 indeed. <laughs> and he has a magnificent white beard, a truly great beaver. Dr. Reed is so enthusiastic about ghost hunting that he got out of a sick bed this evening to be with him. <laughs> Excuse me. My lungs. Mm -hmm. I was uh, gassed in the First World War. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Dr. Reed and I are here on the lawn looking at the house. Can't see much. It's around, oh, 11 p.m. now. Seems to be a rambling sort of house, two stories high. Since it was built, there have been four suicides here. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Now, in, into the mic, please. Oh, yeah. 
Four suicides since 1939. I better tell them who you are so they won't think you're a ghost. Huh? Standing with the doc and me is a real estate agent, Mr. Charles McDonald. He handles his property, and he can tell you a lot more about it than I can. Well, the house was built by a man named Marcus. Toby Marcus, an orange grower. Built the house as a wedding present for his wife. A month after they moved in, she took her own life. On the day of her funeral, he committed suicide the same way. There have been two other cases since then, and did, I... Did they all uh, jump into the ocean? Yeah, yeah, all four of them, right over there. Well. The last one was actually seen doing it about three years ago. He was seen running like all get out the edge of the cliff, and he was shouting and laughing and yelling as though there was people at his side running right along with him. You kidding? Huh, it's fact. He was laughing and yelling and running, and when he got to the edge, uh, right over there, huh? he jumped and never came above water. <laughs> as good an argument against cold baths as ever I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since then, people just refuse to live in this house. Silly, I call it. Anyway, if you and Dr. Reed find any sign of a spook, I'll advise the owner to pull the house down and rebuild. But if you don't find anything, I'm hoping this will convince folks that here's a real buy. Yeah, okay, Mr. Smith, you and the doctor are on your own. I'll be by in the morning to pick you up around 11. Goodbye, Mr. McDonald. I hope yes. there's something left for you to pick up in the morning. <laughs> well, it's almost pitch black, folks, and I guess Dr. Reed and I ought to begin... I don't believe in ghosts, never have, but what I say is this. If you're dead set on looking for them, this is a dandy place to do it. So long! Mr. McDonald just checked out. And then there were two. Well, three. Hmm? Oh, my dog, yeah. Uh, folks, I have my dog, Jeff, with me. He's a wire-haired terrier, three years of age, and he can talk. Yeah, say hello, Jeff. Come on, Jeff, say hello. Come on. Well, anyway, he's a wire-haired terrier, and he's three years old. Uh, shall we go inside now, Dr. Reed? I was about to suggest it. Now, uh, how do we hunt ghosts, Doctor? How do we do it, huh? Well, we don't really hunt them. If there should be any in the house, they will come to us. How cozy. And please, not ghosts. Do not refer to them as ghosts. We know them as apparitions. Now, remember, I've no desire to hurt their feelings. Where ghosts are concerned, I say live and let live. <laughs> Well, we've opened the front door now. Maybe you heard the hinge squeak a little. Now we're standing here looking in. Can't see much. It smells sort of musty and damp. But... What's the matter, Jeff? What's the matter, boy? Jeff. Oh, come on now. Come on. My dog seems to object to entering this house. He has all four feet braced and he's straining against the leash. Perhaps he senses something we don't. Like apparitions, maybe? Perhaps. It's not unusual. Animals lack the veneer of sophistication we humans possess. And are more sensitive to such an initial. Yeah, come on, Jeff. Now, stop this nonsense. He probably smells a mouse or rat or something. Come on, Jeff. We're going in whether you like it or not. Well, there's a short entrance hall, and over there at the end of it is a flight of stairs leading to the second floor. Jeff! And uh, over here at the left is what seems to be a large reception room. We're entering this large room now. There are windows over there, French windows. And through them I can see the ocean. The electricity hasn't been turned on, so all I have to see by is a flashlight. Not a very powerful one at that. Dr. Reed is now adjusting his walkie-talkie. It's hooked up to my recorder so that he can cut in while he's hunting and tell us what he's found. Here's a few words from Doc before he sets forth on his investigation through the house. Ladies and gentlemen... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Smith has introduced me as a ghost hunter. He spoke, I think, in a spirit of skepticism and, and levity... I'd like to assure you all that my purposes here are serious. I have spent my entire life seeking reliable proof of the appearances of apparitions. Mm. Have you ever seen any, ever? I have seen phenomena which lead me to believe in the possibility of their existence, although I have never seen any. I account myself sensitive to the evidence of their existence. This house, for example, affects me profoundly. It doesn't seem to affect you in the same way. I'm not too happy about all this, if that's what you mean. You are not psychic and therefore not sensitive to these matters as I am. I imagine the question in the minds of those of you listening to us is, shall we find apparitions? I don't know. But I feel they are here and that they are evil. I sense danger. I shall soon know. Dr. Reed's leaving the room now to make a tour of the house. First thing I'm going to do is open the windows and let some fresh air in. Ah, feels better already. Cooler anyway. I know that. Ow! What was a bat? A, ba a bat just flew flew into the room. I I think it's a bat, not a bird. I didn't actually see it. Just it's its shadow as it fanned my face. There it is again. It touched me as it passed. Oh, oh, oh. Jeff, 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 come back here. Jeff! 
Yes, you fool dog. Come back here. Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed! <laughs> For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ralph Edwards in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Yeah, hello. Hello, snap out of it. Huh? Oh, oh, uh, I'm reading a letter about the new Wide Gap Autolite resistor spark plug, huh? Oh? It's from Mrs. Clark Perry right here in Hollywood. She says, our 1948 station wagon has given constant trouble. Finally, the garage man said all the difficulty was spark plugs, and he installed a set of Autolite resistor spark plugs. Now the car runs beautifully. The very first time my husband has been really pleased. Well, smart garage man. Smart people to take his advice. Half, you know, as more and more people learn about wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs and how they make an engine idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save on gas, why, then more people will replace old, worn-out, narrow-gap spark plugs with sensational new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Any more letters like that, Harlow? Plenty, Hap, plenty. Why, here's another one from New York City. Oh, uh, read it to me later, Harlow. We haven't time because here's suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Ralph Edwards as Smiley Smith in Ghost Hunt. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Oh, oh, oh. Jeff, Jeff, come back here. Jeff, you fool dog, come back here. Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed. Reed speaking. What is it, Smith? Uh, Jeff has run off. My dog, he, he jumped through the window and ran off. Oh, so? I told you he said something about this house, didn't I? Yeah, you want to come and see if you can determine what it was exactly to set him off? Uh, soon. I'm making my way slowly up the stairs toward the second floor now. I'm halfway up. I'll be down with you soon. <laughs> Folks, my dog's run away. You probably heard him howling. He jumped through the window and took off. Never did anything like that before. Frightened by the bat, I guess. Personally, alone here in this big room, I can understand how he must have felt. This isn't a cheerful spot by any means. I may not be psychic, but I sure have a feeling this house doesn't want us here. Read again. <coughs> Excuse me. I have something of great interest to report. I'm now standing in an alcove on the second floor trying to recover my breath. As I reached the head of the stairs, I felt what I think is a definite psychic manifestation. I felt suddenly as though I had been punched in the solar plexus. That's the only way I can describe it. At the same time, I began to perspire. Uh, my head is still swimming slightly, uh, and I have difficulty in swallowing. My pulse rate is around 110 in a minute. The sense of evil is very strong. I feel very, uh, what shall I say, profoundly depressed. Do you want me up there? Uh, no, I prefer to remain up here alone. The presence of a disbeliever such as you might interfere with my investigation. Folks, I'd like you to get a picture of what it's like here. It's very quiet, for one thing. I've never been in such a quiet place. And it's pretty dark. No light except my flashlight. Tell you what, you go now and douse all the lights you have on. Go ahead, put out the lights, and that'll give you a clearer feeling of how it is here with me. Go ahead, put out the lights. Hey, did, did you hear that? <laughs> Real estate agent told me I'd probably hear rats and mice in the walls. Well, I can certainly hear them now. Even you can hear them, I think. It's as though... Dr. Nate speaking. I've been working my way toward the front room, the one directly above the one in which Mr. Smith is now. The vibrations have become stronger more and more pronounced as I approach it. I think I am on the verge of an important discovery. Important discovery. Did you get that? Now I can hear Dr. Reed moving about in the room above. I don't suppose you can. Have a try anyway, huh? Hear him? I hope he finishes his investigation soon because, quite frankly, I, I'd like to get out of here. I can well imagine people becoming unhinged in this place. Right now I find myself pretty jumpy. Not being very brave, am I? Being alone in this room down here, that does it? This, this darned old house, it's, it's a very, I mean, you know, the atmosphere, it's so very... I wish only to make this hurried report before continuing with the investigation in this room. I have carefully sounded out all the parts in this room, and the emanations are most strong from what appears to be a closet, before which I am now standing. 
As soon as I open the door to this closet, I will have, I think, a thing of great interest to communicate. I find no key to the lock, and so I will attempt to remove the hinges with my penknife. And I will tell you what I find when I open it. I'll tell you what it would cost to get me to open that door. In the basement at Fort... <laughs> There's that bat again. It seems to like me the way it keeps... Each time it passes, it touches my face or my neck with its wings. <laughs> Smelly thing, bats. I don't suppose they bathe very often, if at all. I wonder how... Get the way you bat! That bat'll be the death of me! Yeah, it's like a jingle, isn't it? Bat'll be the death of me, the death of me, the death of me, bat'll be the death of me. It isn't far from London. No, that isn't the way it goes. It's uh, come down to um, Q in lilac time, in lilac time, in lilac time. Come down to Q in lilac time. It isn't far... I haven't thought of that since I was a kid in grammar school. Yeah, I had a lonely childhood when you come right down to it. I mean, uh, oh, that's my affair, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. It, well, it certainly is. I have succeeded in removing the hinges to the door, and I find inside it is not a closet, but much larger. It is, I think, a dressing room. I have not yet been inside, but I am about to enter. Uh, what were they talking about? Uh... Oh, yeah, bats. Well, the bat flying back and forth in this room. It... Did you hear that? Did, did you hear it? Dr. Reed must have knocked something over in the dressing room. A chair, a chair, yeah, a heavy chair by the sound of it. The chair or whatever it was must have fallen right right over my head. That's the way it sounded. I, I, I can see a small stain forming right on the ceiling, right right over my head. <gasps> something ran across my foot just that rat, I think it was. I've always hated rats. Most people do, of course. That stain up there bothers me. It, it's gotten so big so soon. I think I'll take a chance and bother Reed and ask him what it is. Dr. Reed... Reed, can you hear me? Are you all right? Hello? Well, he didn't answer. I, I, I think he's just a little bit deaf. I think so. What do you suppose he's found, huh? I'm afraid this is rather dull for you listeners. I, I'm not finding it so, of course. There. Hey, I, I heard him cough. Did you hear that cough? Hope he's all right. He's, he, he got out of a sick bed to come here this evening, you know. He was gassed in the First World War, and this place is beginning to get on my nerves a wee bit. Just a teensy weensy bit. <laughs> Reed, speaking, I... Hello? He switched off. That's the bad cough he's got. I feel so lonely. I've been alone so much in my life. Not so much now, of course, but when I was younger, I was alone so much of the time. You know, struggling to get ahead, living in a hall bedroom, wondering where my next meal was coming from. I get the blues just remembering it. Seem sad, young people having to spend so much time alone. Sad for old people, too, of course. I'm saying of course a lot. Of course I am. Hey, that stain on the ceiling, it's grown amazingly. It's, it's actually beginning to drip. I mean, form bubbles. They'll start dropping soon. Colored bubbles, they seem to be. Odd-shaped stain, like a, a, a body lying on its back with its arms stretched out. <laughs> it's cheerful. <laughs> oh. I'll certainly advise Mr. McDonald to have this place pulled down. I'll go upstairs in a minute or two to see how Dr. Reed's making out. You know, listeners, I, I really believe I'd go completely crazy if I had to stay here much longer. Wears you down. That's exactly what it does. It wears you down. It's so close and musty in here. I feel sort of trapped. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. That's, that's what they call this place, you know, the death trap. There, what did I tell you? That stain started to drip drop. Drip drop. Drip drop. Drip drop. Drip. I'll catch the next one in my hand. Let's... <laughs> Reed! Dr. Reed! I'm, I'm going upstairs now, listeners. I'm, I'm afraid something has happened to Dr. Reed. I'm not kidding now. I mean, this is on the level. I, which room could it be now? Right? Left? No, right, right. This is it, I think. Well, <laughs> oh, evening, gentlemen. And, and madam? I'm so glad to see you. I, I, I was just aching to see somebody, anybody. I, I've been so lonely down there. Uh, what have you done with the doctor, huh? I know, I know he's been hurt. See the color of the bubble on my hand? What have you done with him? Make way, please, gentlemen, make way. Well, well this isn't the, the funniest darn thing. <laughs> this, this can't be Dr. Reed lying here. He didn't have a red beard. Now, don't crowd me, gentlemen. Don't, don't crowd me, please. Huh? You want me to go where with you? You want me to do what? Speak up, gentlemen. To the cliffs. Down to the cliffs? You mean right now? <laughs> well, well, all right, if you'll come with me. I don't want to be alone anymore. You will come with me? All of you? All four of you? You too, ma'am? Oh, good. Come on, then. To the cliffs. To the cliffs. To the cliffs. To the cliffs. 
jumped over the cliff. He jumped over the cliff. McDonald, he jumped over... Mr. McDonald, Mr. Thorpe, you may come in to see Dr. Reed now. What? Uh Uh-huh. Dr. Reed is conscious. You may see him now. Is... Is he able to talk? Just for a few minutes. In here. Come in. Come in, gentlemen. How are you, Dr. Reed? We've been waiting to see you. Yes, and I must apologize, gentlemen. I had a most unfortunate accident. Hemorrhage. Uh, Hemorrhage? Yes. My lungs, you know. Now, gentlemen... Hemorrhage? Dr. Reed, what happened in that house? What happened to Smith? We've just been listening to a playback of the recordings you made out there. Smith? Isn't he with you? We've just heard the recording, Dr. Reed. Smith jumped over the cliff. Into the ocean. Oh, that poor boy. Dr. Reed, will you please tell us what happened? From what we heard on the recording, there were ghosts in that house. Ghosts? I didn't see any ghosts. But Smith, what about him? If he went over the cliff, it was fear that drove him over. Gentlemen, I didn't see any ghosts. As for that unfortunate young man, who can say now what he saw or thought he saw? Thank you, Ralph Edwards, for displaying your versatility by appearing as guest star on Suspense. Say, Harold, that Edwards does everything. Uh Uh-uh, half. No, does. Don't use that word on our Autolite show. Oh, come now, Harlow. I can make you use that word, as you call it. How? (laughs) Now, don't you say that Autolite resistor spark plugs make your car engine idle smoother? Yes, but... And your car gives better performance on leaner gas mixtures. Saves gas. Sure does. I mean, do. (laughs) I mean, does. (laughs) Aren't we devils? (laughs) Ah, Ralph, you tricked me. Well, anyhow, it does my heart good to tell people that Autolite resistor spark plugs are ignition engineered... By Autolite, which makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, spark plug wire, battery cable, coils, distributors. All ignition engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. The lifeline of your car. So, folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Remember, you're right with Autolite. And now here again is Ralph Edwards. I want to thank Tony Leader and his great cast of actors for helping to make my appearance on Suspense a very pleasant consequence. (laughs) Like all of you, I'm a great Suspense fan. And I'm looking forward to next week when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you Joseph Cotton in The Day I Died. Another gripping study in... Suspense. Tonight's suspense play was adapted for radio by Walter Newman from an original story by H.R. Wakefield with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Make it a point to listen next Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Remember next Thursday, same time here, Joseph Cotton in The Day I Died. You can buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stay full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Page 51, item 31. 
the season's concluding broadcast. Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Adapted, directed, and produced by Andrew Allen. With original music composed and conducted by Lucio Agostini. Conrad's Heart of Darkness. I had just returned to London after a lot of Indian Ocean, Pacific, China Seas. First, I was glad to loaf about. I got tired of that and began looking for a ship, the hardest work on earth. The ships wouldn't look at me, so I got tired of that game, too. There was one place on the map of Africa I had always had a hankering to go to ever since I'd poured over maps as a little chap. A blank space of mystery, a place of darkness. There was in it one great river that you could see on the map like an immense snake uncoiled head in the sea, its body curving over the vast country, its tail lost in the depth of the land. I remember there was a big concern, a company for trade on that river. Company headquarters was in a European city where I had an aunt living. So I crossed the channel and in that continental city that always makes me think of a whited sepulchre, I saw my aunt. My dear Charlie, it's a delightful idea. I must say, Aunt Moore, this is the first time I've set a woman to get me a job. Nonsense, Charlie. You've always been far too independent, you seagoing men. Get away from the sea and get into the to Africa with the company. And you may become a rich man after all. Glorious idea. What do you advise? Leave it to me. I know the wife of a very high personage in the administration. You'll hear from him. I was summoned to the company's offices. A narrow and deserted street in deep shadow... Immense double doors ponderously ajar. I went up a swept and ungarnished staircase as arid as a desert. And two women, one fat and the other slim, sat on straw bottom chairs knitting black wool. Even when they spoke, they continued knitting with downcast eyes. There's someone you wish to see, monsieur? I have an appointment. My name is Marlowe. Monsieur Marlowe, yes. You are expected. She passed me on to a compassionate white haired man, the secretary to the great man himself great man spoke to me, approved me, shook my hand. Compassionate secretary, full of desolation and sympathy, made me sign some document. You have, Captain Marlowe, you understand, undertaken not to disclose any trade secrets. Right. You are the servant of the company, the servant of an empire. No end of coin to be made, eh? There is a great responsibility to millions of souls, to an ideal. We believe you understand that very well, Captain Marlowe. Oh, yes, I suppose so. Quite. You have been well attested. They have great confidence in you. Oh, that's nice. You will have an examination by our doctor. After that, there are few formalities beyond instructions for your departure and arrival, which I will send you. Thank you. Perhaps, Captain Marlowe, you will be fortunate enough out there to encounter Mr. Kurtz. Mr. Kurtz? Precisely. <laughs> I was evidently supposed to know what this meant. The secretary nodded sagely, but I was none the wiser. Outside in the antechamber, the two old knitters of black wool looked at me with a swift and indifferent placidity that troubled me. My nephew will be here in a moment, Captain Marlowe, to guide you to the office of the doctor. Your nephew is also a servant of the company, madame? Yes. A young, energetic man? Yes. I suppose someday he'll be going out there. My nephew, monsieur, is fond of the saying... I am not such a fool as I look. Good Plato to his disciples. Thank you, madame. Ave. Oratori te saluta. As you wish, monsieur. The company's doctor examined me, evidently thinking of something else for a while. He was an old, unshaven little man in a threadbare coat, his feet in slippers. I asked him if he knew a man named Kurtz. Yes, he'd examined him. Must have been a long time ago, he supposed. He had had a good physique and was said to be brilliant. My own examination was satisfactory, too. Good. Yes, good. Good for up there. I'll do, eh, Doctor? Would you let me measure your head? Measure my head? Yes, it's it's, uh, it's not part of the examination. A sort of hobby of my own. Well, by all means, go ahead and measure my head if you want to. Ah, thank you. What are those? Uh, calipers? Yes, I... Uh, 
I suppose you might call them calipers. <laughs> I always ask leave in the interests of science to measure the crania of those going out there. And when they come back, too? Oh, I never see them when they come back. Those that uh, come back. And moreover, the changes take place inside, you know. Mm, of course they do. <laughs> so you are going out there. Famous. Interesting, too. Ever any madness in your family? Is that question in the interests of science, too, Doctor? It would be interesting for science to watch the mental changes of individuals on the spot. Are you an alienist? Every doctor should be. A little. I have a little theory which you messieurs who go up there must help me to prove. Uh, this is my share in the advantages my country shall reap from the possession of such a magnificent dependency. The mere wealth I leave to others. I, uh, I hope you will pardon me, but you're the first Englishman coming under my office. Oh, I must warn you, I'm hardly a typical Englishman. If I were, I wouldn't be talking like this with you. What you say is rather profound and uh, probably erroneous. <laughs> well, those are the measurements. Avoid irritation more than exposure to the sun. Adieu, uh, Monsieur Marlowe. Uh, how do you English say, eh? Goodbye? In the topics, one must, before everything, keep calm. Adieu. Charlie, dear, that this is the last decent cup of tea you will have for many a long day. I expect so, Aunt Maud. You are leaving immediately? In a week. They received you well at the company. Yes, rather too well, I thought. Too well? I felt someone had been telling them lies about me. My dear Charlie, of course I spoke well of you to my friend. Good gracious, you don't expect to get an appointment without a certain amount of exaggeration, do you? Besides, I have a great deal of confidence in you. I suppose you told your friend I was an exceptional and gifted creature. Piece of good fortune for the company. Man, you don't get hold of every day. The company is very sensitive these days, Charlie. There's been a lot of silly talk, criticism, about treatment of the natives and that kind of thing. Naturally, they're looking for new men of a certain... of a certain caliber. So I hinted you were a man of ideals. Man of business, true, and a master mariner. But also, uh, oh, well, you know the kind of thing. You're an emissary of light. Something like a lower sort of apostle. Good heavens. Well, I'm going to take charge of a Tupney Etney River steamboat with a penny whistle attached. Charlie, dear, there's a more to it than that. The time has come when we must wean those ignorant, savage millions from their horrid ways. Uh, may I venture to hint, Aunt Maud, that the company is run for profit? Oh, you forget, dear Charlie, that the laborer is worthy of his hire. Oh. Don't make those unpleasant noises, Charlie. Have another cup of tea. Thank you, Aunt and it's clear how out of touch with truth women are. Don't be idiot. All of you. Live in a world of your own. Never been anything like it and never can be. Too beautiful altogether. And if you were ever to set it up, it'd go to pieces before the first sunset. Some confounded fact we men have been living contentedly with ever since the day of creation would start up and knock the whole thing over. Your tea? Thank you. You must be sure to wear flannel and be sure to write me often. And before you go... I think you should see Marie Basilier. Who is Marie Basilier? She's the fiancée of a man you will probably meet out there in Africa. Extraordinarily gifted man, I understand. You should see her before you leave. I can get you an introduction. Uh, who is this gifted man? His name is uh, Kurtz. <laughs> In the street, I don't know why, the feeling came to me that I was an imposter. Odd thing that I, who used to clear out for any part of the world at 24 hours' notice, with less thought than most men give to the crossing of the street, had a moment, I, I won't say of hesitation, but of startled pause before this commonplace affair. The best way I can explain it to you is by saying that for a second or two I felt as though instead of going to the center of a continent, I were about to set off for the center of the earth. I went to see Mademoiselle Basilier the day before I sailed. It was twilight. She received me alone in a lofty drawing room with three long windows from floor to ceiling that were like three luminous and bedraped columns. In age, this fiancée of the man Kurtz was perhaps not much more than a girl. 
But in her quiet pride, she was a woman, quite lovely, pale and fair. My engagement with him is not approved by my family. That is why you see me alone like this. I'm sorry to hear that, mademoiselle. There is no need to be sorry, Captain Marlowe. I am perfectly happy. I am happy to be alone with my thoughts of him and await his return. You will forgive my saying how inconceivable it seems to me that Mr. Crutch should go all that long way from you and place himself under the necessity of staying away so long. Ah, but he has been very poor all his life. His mother was a widow without means. That is mainly why my family disapproved. He became impatient of his poverty, and that is what drove him out there. Captain Marlowe, you see, he has gone there because of me. And that is why I'm content to wait. I know he will come back. And I know he will be triumphant. And his mother? She's dead now. He was the only friend I had. You have a capacity for fidelity, mademoiselle. It is a thing I can give him in exchange for all that he is. I left in the French steamer, and she called in every blamed port they have out there, for, as far as I could see, the sole purpose of landing soldiers and custom house officers. I watched the coast, the edge of a colossal jungle, so dark green as to be almost black, fringed with white surf, straight, like a ruled line, along a blue sea whose glitter was blurred by a creeping mist. The sun was fierce, the land seemed to glisten and drip with steam. Once we came upon a man of war anchored off the coast. There wasn't even a shed there, and she was shelling the bush. The greasy, slimy swell swung her up lazily and let her down. In the empty immensity of earth, sky, and water, there she was, incomprehensible, firing into a continent. There is a war, you understand. Hidden out of sight in there is a camp of enemy natives. Nothing seems to happen. What can happen? A merry dance of... Death and trade was like a weary pilgrimage amongst hints for nightmares. It was upward of 30 days before I saw the mouth of the big river. We anchored off the seat of government and I had myself transferred to the other steamer. The captain was a Swede. His name was Larson. It is funny what some people will do for a few francs a month. I wonder what becomes of that kind when it goes up country. In fact, I'll know soon. I'm going up country. So? Well, tell me. Don't be too sure. The other day I took up a man who hanged himself on the road. He was a Swede, too. Hanged himself? Why, in God's name? Who knows? The sun too much for him? Or the country, perhaps? Farther on, a rocky cliff appeared. Mounds of turned up earth by the shore. Houses... Hanging on a hill, the continuous noise of rapids over a scene of inhabited devastation. A lot of people, mostly black and naked, moving about like ants. A jetty projecting into the river, a blinding sunlight. There's your company station. I will send your things up. Four boxes. No. Farewell. I came upon a boiler wallowing in the grass. An undersized railway truck on its back, its wheels in the air. Decaying machinery, stacks of rusty rails, a clinking file of natives fastened together by chains toiling up the slope and baskets full of earth on their heads, their bodies skinny, and their eyes the complete death-like indifference of unhappy savages. I passed a loathsome pit into which other natives had dragged themselves to die. Then at the company buildings I met a white man in a starched collar, light alpaca jacket, snowy trousers, necktie, and varnish. My name is Bertrand. I'm the company's chief accountant. All the bookkeeping is done at this station. How do you do? I'm Marla. I know. Come in. There's a sick man here in the litter. You must forgive me. There's nowhere else to put him. This is your office, Monsieur Bertrand? Yes. But the groans of this sick person have been distracting my attention. Who is he? One of our agents from upcountry. Will he die? Probably. God knows even without this distraction, it's difficult enough to guard against clerical errors in this climate. Hmm. When do I leave for upcountry, Monsieur Bertrand? I hope to organize a caravan to go to the central station in a few days. I say I hope to, with these black beasts one never knows. 
And at the central station, there is the river steamer I'm to take over? If it is in any condition to take over, it has been wrecked. Oh, I see. Uh, Captain Marlowe, in the interior, you will no doubt meet Mr. Court. Court? Our first-class agent, Captain Marlowe. Oh? And furthermore, a very remarkable person. Where is he at the moment? In charge of a trading post, a very important one, in the true ivory country, at the very bottom of there. Sends in as much ivory as all the rest put together. Good for him. Uh, when you see Mr. Kurt, tell him from me that everything here is very satisfactory. I don't like to write to him, but these messengers of ours, you never know who may get hold of your letter at that uh, central station. I left with a caravan of 60 men for a 200-mile tramp. Over an empty land, through long grass, through burnt grass, through thickets. Down and up chilly ravines, up and down stony hills ablaze with heat. And a solitude. A solitude. Nobody, not a hut. Camp, cook, sleep, strike camp, march. Day after day, with the stamp and shuffle of sixty pair of bare feet behind me, each under a sixty-pound load. Now and then a carrier, dead in harness... At rest in the long grass near the path with an empty water gourd and his long staff lying by his side. A great silence around and above. Perhaps on some quiet night, the tremor of far off drums sinking, swelling, a tremor vast, faint, a sound weird, appealing, suggestive, and wild. On the 15th day, I came in sight of the big river again and hobbled into the central station. On a backwater, surrounded by scrub and forest. A border of smelly mud on one side, a crazy fence of rushes on the other three. Oh, Monsieur Marlowe, it is to be said that your steamer is at the bottom of a river. Oh? But it is all right. The manager himself is here. Well, that makes it nice. This is all quite correct. Everybody has behaved splendidly, splendidly. Good. You must go and see the general manager at once. He is waiting. You have been very long on the road, Monsieur Marlowe. No longer than I could help, the Mr. Manager. The stations have to be relieved. There have been so many delays already that I don't know who's dead and who's alive. My dear Mr. Manager, you can hardly hold me accountable for that. I've done 20-odd miles this morning. Do you mind if I sit down? If you wish. The situation is grave. Very grave. There are rumors that are very important stations in jeopardy. It's Chief Mr. Court's very ill. Uh-huh. I hope it's not true. Court, I've heard of Mr. Court's on the coast. Ah. So they talk of him down there. Quite natural. Mr. Court's is the best agent I have. An exceptional man of great importance to the company. You can understand my anxiety. I'm very, very uneasy. The steamer, Monsieur Marlowe. How long will it take you to... How long can I tell? I haven't even seen the wreck yet. Of course. Some months, no doubt. Some months? Three months, shall we say? Well... Three months before we can make a start. How is your health, Monsieur Marlowe? My health? Well enough? I owe my position out here to the fact that I am never ill. Three terms of three years each. Not an illness. Men who come out here, Monsieur Marlowe, should have no entrails. Central Station was a crawl with company agents, white men with long staves in their hands who appeared to do nothing but stroll about suspiciously. I began to think of them as a lot of faithless pilgrims bewitched inside a rotten fence. I went to work with the mechanics, such as they were, on the wretched hulk of that steamer. And every item of supply we needed seemed unobtainable. Nothing in the world was able to penetrate the indomitable stupidity of that undertaking. A stream of rubbishy cottons, beads, and brass wire was swallowed in the depth of darkness. And in return came a precious trickle of ivory. The word ivory was in the air. Constantly. Constantly. One night, a shed full of calico burst into flame. From where I smoked my pipe quietly by my dismantled steamer, I saw them all cutting capers in the light. Their arms lifted high. In the outer darkness, the drums beat... Now, some of the pilgrims flogged a negro nearby who was supposed to have caused the fire in some way. He screeched most horribly. 
Presently, Dupre strode up to me, one of the leading agents. His little forked beard and his gentleman the reserve were reflected in the glare like a papier mache Mephistopheles. <laughs> Enjoying the scene? Watching it, Dupre. Care to walk over to my room for a chat? Well, thank you, yes. If we stroll over this way, we can avoid the little inferno. Don't you ever regret having left the comforts of Europe, Marla? I never find regrets of much value. Besides, I haven't had many of those comforts. I've been at sea most of my life. Ah. But you have many powerful friends in... At the... You know where, eh, Marlowe? I shouldn't have put it that way, Dupre. Naturally. Naturally. Hey, tell me, Dupre, you're supposed to be in charge of the making of bricks here. So far as I can see, there isn't a fragment of bricks anywhere in the station. I am waiting for supplies. Oh. Meantime, you too. I do secretarial work for the manager. Why? No sensible man rejects wantonly the confidence of his superiors. Rivets is what I want. Rivets. Down at the coast station, you kick a loose rivet at every second step. You can fill your pockets with rivets for the trouble of stooping down. If there isn't one rivet to be found where it's wanted. These are among the things that are going to be changed, eh, Marla? God knows, I don't. Ah. <laughs> discretion, discretion. This is the door. I will light a candle. Discretion, eh? Isn't that too much of that commodity? Everyone here spends his time in an air of intrigue. No real work is there. You are stuck with the painting? Stuck, yes. Yeah. Who's it? It was painted by Mr. Kutz. The effect of the torchlight on the face of the woman. Sinister? Yes, it is sinister. A painting of darkness. Dupre, tell me, who is this Mr. Kurtz? What do you know about him? He's the chief of the inner station. Much obliged. You're the brickmaker of the central station. Everyone knows that. He is a prodigy. He is an emissary of pity and science and progress. And devil knows what else. We want, for the guidance of the cause entrusted to us by Europe, so to speak... Higher intelligence, wide sympathies, a singleness of purpose. Who says that? Lots of them. Some even write that. And so, he comes here, a special being, as you ought to know. Why ought I to know? Today he is chief of the best station. Next year he will be assistant manager. Two years more and... But I dare say you know what he will be in two years' time. You are of the new gang. The gang of virtue. The same people who sent him specially also recommended you. Oh, don't uh, say no. I have my own eyes. To trust. Let me say something. I hate and detest a lie. Not because I'm straighter than the rest of us, but because to me there is a taint of death, a flavor of mortality in lives. It's what I want to forget. It makes me miserable and sick, like biting into something rotten. That's why I'm not going to act out a lie by keeping quiet and letting you believe this absurd fancy of yours about me. That's why I want you to, to believe... My dear Marlowe, there is no need. I shall respect your discretion. Say no more. Only you will see Kurtz long before I can have that pleasure. And I wouldn't like him to get a false idea of my disposition. So if you will put in a good word. Kurtz is a universal genius. But even a genius will find it easier to work with adequate tools. Intelligent men. There is the necessity for every man to get on. One does not come out here to gaze at the moon. I've had to strike and fend off, resist and attack according to the demand of whatever sort of life I've blundered into. I've seen the devil of violence and the devil of greed and the devil of hot desire. But by all the stars, those were strong, lusty, red-eyed devils that swayed and drove men. And here in this place, I became acquainted with a flabby, pretending, weak-eyed devil of rapacious and pitiless folly. And I stood appalled. Later, I got the rivets, and by hurling myself at the work, had the steamer almost ready. And one night, 
I overheard the conversation. Am I the manager or am I not? I was ordered to send him out there. It's incredible. It is unpleasant. He asked the administration to be sent there with the idea of showing what he could do. And I was instructed accordingly. Look at the influence that man was here. The climate may do away with this difficulty for you. He is alone there. Yes. Ever since a year ago when he sent his assistant down to me with orders to clear the fellow out of the country and send him no more of the sort. I had rather be alone than have the kind of men you can send. Those were his very words. And nothing since then except the ivory. Lots of it. Prime sort. Lots of ivory. Ah! Why doesn't he ever bring it himself? Got it to once. Bringing it in a fleet of canoes. Then before he got here, he turned back alone and sent the cargo on here with his half-caste clerk in charge. What about the rumor that he's ill? Seriously ill? Probably true. Been ill several times. Never given himself a chance to recover. And it's 200 miles from where he is to the nearest military post with a doctor. Anybody with an hour? Only some pestilential wandering trader. Don't know who he is. One of those scoundrels who snap up ivory from the natives. We won't be free from unfair competition until I get one of those fellows hanged as an example. Hang him? Why not? Anything can be done in this country. At least my health remains. But the rest? Oh, my goodness. All sick. They die so quickly, too. No need to worry, really. Just be patient and trust to the jungle. The jungle does for so many. It will do for Kurtz. We finally set out on that journey into the interior. The manager, three or four pilgrims, and I. My stern paddle banged along when I could keep enough waste battened against the steam pipes to maintain a head of steam. I had a native helmsman who wasn't much good and a native fireman whose knowledge of the white man's magic consisted in knowing that if the water in that transparent thing disappeared, the evil spirit inside the boiler would get angry and take terrible vengeance. We tied ourselves to the matted jungle at night for fear of the unmarked reefs. Going up that river was like traveling back to the earliest beginnings of the world when vegetation rioted on the earth. The big trees were kings. The air was warm, thick, heavy, sluggish. On silvery sandbanks, hippos and alligators sunned themselves. Here was the stillness of an implacable force brooding over an inscrutable intention. It looked at you with a vengeful aspect. I sweated and shivered over that business. For a seaman to scrape the bottom of the thing that's supposed to float all the time under his care is the unpardonable sin. More than once, that old steamer had to be pushed off a shore with 20 cannibals of her crew splashing around. Fine fellows, cannibals, in their place. For us, they were foregoing their familiar diet, and the hippo meat they had brought along as substitute was thrown overboard by the pilgrims when the stench got too much to live with. The cannibals never complained. And the little begrimed steamboat crawled along like a sluggish beetle. We penetrated deeper and deeper into the heart of darkness. At night sometimes, the roll of drums behind the curtain of trees would run up the river and remain sustained as if hovering in the air high over our heads from the first break of day. Whether it meant war, peace, or prayer... We could not tell. We were wanderers on prehistoric earth. We were traveling in the night of first ages. Of those ages that are gone, leaving hardly a sign and no memory. We were a few miles below the inner station when it happened. A white fog, which was the mist of dawn, warm and clammy, began to lift as if in greased grooves before the round ball of the sun, when suddenly... Good God, what's Quiet. the meat? This close to the bank, we'll be butchered. Bad fellow, him come. Quiet, Bad boy. Fellow, what should we do? Get underway, away from the We're shore. We're going to be attacked. We'll starve ourselves. Bad fellow, him come. Marlow, you're in command. Do something. Bad fellow, him You kill. get the boy quiet and I'll do something. And let's have no shooting unless it's necessary. What idiot fired that shot? We'll be butchered if we don't. Don't shoot your phone. This is serious. Keep your head down. Keep down. The air is full of arrows. They may be poisoned. 
battle, if you can call it a battle, lasted only perhaps a few minutes until I could get the steamboat underway and clear of the bank. But it cost me my native helmsman. He looked at me with surprised eyes and was dead. I had to haul him overboard because I didn't like the look about the faces of my cannibal crew. It was only then that I had the sense to go sound the wretched steam whistle. It was sunset when I reached the inner station. Through my glasses, I saw the slope of a hill, a long, decaying building in high grass. In front of it was a row of posts, their upper ends ornamented with what at first I took to be round, curved balls. They weren't that at all. I realized with a shock that they were human heads. At first, the only living thing was a white man near the shore, a curious object, his clothes all of patches, blue, red, and yellow, a veritable harlequin. It was to this harlequin I first spoke when I got ashore. How did you get here? I had been wandering about the river for two years, alone, cut off from everything and everybody. You know the company has it in for vagabond traders like you, don't you? (laughs) What matter? Tell me, why did the natives attack us? They don't want him to go. Courts? Yes. But never mind. You take Kurtz away quick. Quick, I tell you. What will you do? I'll disappear. <laughs> You'll see. They won't catch me. Very well. Perhaps you'd better. Oh. But he has enlarged my mind. This man has enlarged my mind. I dare say. I'll never meet such a man again. You ought to have heard him recite poetry. His own poetry. Poetry? That first night in the forest when I met him, we talked of everything. Oh, he talked. I forgot there was such a thing as sleep. The night did not seem to last an hour. Everything. Everything. Of love, too. Ah, he talked to you of love. It isn't what you think. It was, in general. He made me see things. Things. And you've been with him ever since? Not constantly. There have been breaks, many of them. Oh, I have nursed him through two illnesses, though. Then so often he wandered alone, far in the depths of the forest. I would come to this station and I would have to wait days and days before he would turn up. What was he doing? Exploring or what? Oh, yes. He has discovered lots of villages. A lake, too. Where? Which direction? I don't know... It's dangerous to inquire too much. But most of his expeditions have been for ivory. But he's been cut off from the central station for a year. Had no goods to trade with. (laughs) There's a good lot of cartridges left even yet. (laughs) To speak plainly, he raided the country. Uh, yes. Not uh... alone, surely. Well, he... Ah, so Kurtz got the tribe to follow him. They adored him. What can you expect? He came to them with thunder and lightning. They had never seen anything like it. Very terrible. He could be very terrible. You can't judge Mr. Kurtz as you would an ordinary man. Why? The other day he wanted to shoot me. But I don't judge him. No. Shoot you? What for? Well, I had a small lot of ivory the chief of one village gave me because I shot game for him. Mr. Kurtz wanted the ivory and wouldn't hear reason. He said he would shoot me unless I gave him the ivory and cleared out of the country. He said he had a fancy for it and there was nothing on earth to prevent him killing me jolly well pleased. It was true, too. I gave him the ivory, but I didn't clear out. I couldn't leave him. He's mad. No, no. He was becoming very ill. He's very ill now. Oh, if you'd ever heard him talk, you wouldn't dare hint at such a thing. No, no. You you must take him away before the forest kills him. Me? I don't matter. Who are the natives who attacked us? The fighting men of the lake tribe. Mr. Kurt brought them. Oh, he, he is sick. Very sick now. But even yet, the chiefs come every day to see him. They crawl to him. They crawl to him. Look, I don't want to hear any more about the quaint customs of Mr. Kurtz. 
I don't want to hear about those human heads either stuck up on poles in front of his house. I've heard all I want to hear about Mr. Kurtz and all his works. But those heads are only symbols. Quiet, that's enough. Quite enough. They're bringing him. You'll see him. Now I'm going. I'd better... This is Kurtz they're bringing? Yes, the tribe. And if he does not say the right thing to them, we're all done for. But I'm off anyway. Goodbye, Mr. Uh... Marlowe. Marlowe. And let us hope those friends of yours on the steamboat don't decide to start shooting again. Goodbye. Fortunately, the pilgrims didn't start shooting, and fortunately, Mr. Kurtz did say the right thing to the tribes, whatever the right thing was. They left him with us in a little hut near the shore while they themselves melted into the bush. The drums continued, though. They were nearby. Kurtz was an apparition. A once huge and powerful man. His body now lay on the cock emaciated as if for a winding sheet. He opened his mouth as if he wanted to swallow all the air, all the earth, all the men before him. And he fell back with a groan. Uh, Mr. Kurtz, we have come to save you. Save me. Save the ivory, you mean. Don't tell me. Save me. We have had delays. Uh, I've had to save you. You're interrupting my plans now. You are sick. Sick? Sick? Not so sick as you would like to believe. Never mind. I've carried my ideas out yet. I will return. I'll show you what can be done. You with your little paddling notion. You're interfering. Mr. Kurtz is low. Very low. But there's no disguising the fact he has done more harm than good to the company. He did not see the time was not right for vigorous action. The district is closed to us for a time. On the whole, the trade will suffer. I don't deny there is a remarkable quantity of ivory, mostly fossil. We must save it at all events. But look how precarious the position is. And why? Because the method is unsound. You call it unsound method? Without doubt. Don't you? No method at all. Exactly. I anticipated this. Shows a complete want of judgment. It is my duty to point it out in the proper quarter. Oh, your precious brickmaker, do you pray, will make a readable report for you. What? Oh. Nevertheless, I think Mr. Kurtz is a remarkable man. He was. about you. I'm glad you've come. We're going to take you away, Mr. Kurtz. Your life depends on it. You feel you're in a dream, don't you, Marlow? You have that notion of being captured by the incredible, very essence of dreams. You'll try to remember it later. Try to tell it. Impossible. We live as we dream. Alone. Drums again. Yes. Marlow, however unlikely it may seem to you and that that noxious fool out there, I'm leaving this hut tonight, even if it is for the last time. I have a rendezvous to keep in that forest. You do. You're as good as dead. If I do not, I might as well never have lived. Later, I confess, I fell asleep. When I woke up shortly after midnight, Kurtz was gone. The drums were louder now, and there was chanting, the beginnings of a frenzy of sound, weird and terrifying incantations. The hill was alive with flame. I went out after him alone. I saw a trail, a broad trail through the grass. I remember the exultation with which I said to myself, he can't walk, he's crawling on all fours, I've got him. Two women knitting black wool obtruded themselves upon my memory as most improper persons to be at the other end of such an affair. 
Fiends with antelope horns dancing in the flames. A madness of possession. Unspeakable things. And suddenly there was Kurtz ahead of me. Like a vapor exhaled by the earth. Swaying slightly. Uh, you go away. Hide yourself. You know what you're doing? Perfectly. You'll be lost. Utterly lost. I had immense plans. Yes. If you try to shout, I'll throttle you for good. I was in the threshold of great things. Now for this stupid scoundrel. Your success in Europe is assured in any case. Europe? Ah! Europe is for children. For women. Here we recover the memory of monstrous passions. Oh, I know what you think. Brutal gratifications, you think? Beyond the bounds of permitted aspirations? It is not so simple, my friend. Here one invokes everything. It's for God's self. Go away. It's not for you, any of you. Go away and hide. It's not Kurtz. You are coming back with me. I have only to raise my voice and you're dead, you fool. I know that. Here there is nothing above or below me. I have kept myself loose of the earth. I am alone. You, you don't know whether you're standing on the ground or floating in the air. Nevertheless, if I have to wrestle for your soul, I will. What do you know of my soul? It is beyond you, the reach of any of you. Why don't you go? This is my space. You have no business here. You're sick. You're mad. Don't be childish. My intelligence is perfectly clear. You are concentrated on yourself with horrible intensity. Your soul is mad. Very well. But if you stay with me, you're going to look into hell yourself. Get away while you can. What am I to you? Mr. Kirk. Can you bear the inconceivable mystery of a soul without restraint? Without faith? Without fear? In a blind struggle that began in savage swamps before the world was born? Can you... Uh, Mr. Kirk! Mr. Kirk! <laughs> I got Kurtz back to the steamboat, but how, I can never remember. Also, how I kept those infernal pilgrims from firing into the shore after we cast off, I can never tell. I realized we had to leave that place quickly if ever we were to leave it at all. Tell me. Tell me what you see. I, I can't. The hill is covered with them. Writhing, naked bodies. There are three men with antlers on their heads and bodies caked in some red substance. And down by the water, it seemed to be flailing it with something, and, and they're shaking something at us. It looks it looks like a dried gourd. It isn't a dried gourd. They're shouting something. I can hear them. It sounds satanic. It is. There's a woman. Ah. She's come to the very brink of the river, raising her hands and... Do you understand this? Do I not? lay in the pilot house. And the reaches of the river slid past as the brown current ran swiftly out of the heart of darkness, bearing us down towards the sea. Close and shut it. Can't bear to look at it. The jungle? Jungle. Oh, but I will wring your heart yet. Capable of 
prying in my boxes when I'm not looking. I'll keep them for you. There are some instructions there. What is to be done with my various things? Why, I'll see to it. Some things for the furthering of my ideas. Live rightly. Die. Die. His was an impenetrable darkness. I looked at him as you peer down at a man who is lying at the bottom of a precipice where the sun never shines. Night came on. That you, Mal? Yes. I brought a candle. I'm lying here in the dark, waiting for death. No. Oh, nonsense. I want nothing. Nothing. Only trust. Only trust. I had a brain, Marlowe. Brain. Now it's a weary waste, haunted by shadows. Images of the... Oh. was as though a veil had been rent. I saw on that ivory face the expression of somber pride, the ruthless power of craven terror, of an intense and hopeless despair. Did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation, and surrender during that supreme moment of complete knowledge? He cried out at some image, at some vision. He cried out twice. The horror. The horror. Boy. Oh, boy, come here. Yes, sir. I'm coming, sir. I'm boy, coming. I need your help. Something has happened to you. Mr. Kurt. He's dead. voice was gone. What else had there been? Next day, the pilgrims buried something in a muddy hole. And then the fever struck me and I nearly died myself. In the end, at last, I was back in Europe in that whited sepulcher of a city. There are, Mr. Marlow, certain documents which the company believes you to have in your possession. Oh, the company believes that, does it? Our manager out there and also Mr. Dupre have submitted a report. Oh, yes, your precious pair. They thought they had a right to certain documents, too. Oh, well, we didn't get them. The company, through me, is now making official application for these documents. If you will be good enough... I will not be good enough. The documents aren't yours. They were entrusted to me by the late Mr. Kurtz, and I have his instructions. The company has the right to every bit of information about its territories, Mr. Marlowe. I'm no longer in the employ of the company. Nevertheless, you will understand that the late Mr. Kurtz's knowledge of unexplored regions, coupled with his great abilities and the circumstances in which he had been placed... My dear sir, I have here Mr. Kurtz's report on the suppression of savage customs. You may have that if you wish. That's all you get. He wrote it when he first went out there, and although there was a postscript which he wrote shortly before his death, I've destroyed it... It would only have shocked you. Now, good day. This is not what we had a right to expect. No one has a right to expect anything. Good day. I went to see the lady, the intended wife of the man who was dead. Once again, the dusk was falling. Once again, I had to wait in the lofty drawing room. The tall marble fireplace had a cold and monumental whiteness. A grand piano standing massively in the corner. Dark gleams on the flat surface like a somber and polished sarcophagus. A high door opened, closed. I rose. She 
came forward, all in black, her pale head floating toward me in the dusk. She seemed as though she would remember and mourn forever. I had heard you were coming. Mademoiselle. You see, I have survived. I've brought you this packet, his papers, as he wished. You knew him well. Intimacy grows quickly out there. I knew him as well as it is possible for one man to know another. And you admired him. It was impossible to know him and not to admire him. Was it? He was a remarkable man. It was impossible not to... Love him? Oh, true, oh, true. When you think that no one knew him so well as I. I had all his noble confidence. I knew him best. You did know him best. You were his friend. His friend. You must have been if he had given you this and sent you to me. I feel I can speak to you. And, oh, I must speak. I want you. You who have heard his last words know that I have been worthy of him. It is not pride. Yes, I am proud to know I understood him better than anyone on earth. He told me so himself. And since his mother died, I've had no one, no one to, to, to. The darkness deepened, and the girl talked, easing her pain in the certitude of my sympathy. She talked as thirsty men drink. The sound of her voice seemed to have the accompaniment of all the other sounds full of mystery, desolation, and sorrow I had ever heard. The ripple of the river, the soughing of the trees swayed by the wind, the murmurs of the crowds, the faint ring of incomprehensible words cried from afar, the whisper of a voice speaking from beyond the threshold of an eternal darkness. He drew men towards him by what was death. It is the gift of the great. But you have heard him, you know. Yes, I know. What a loss to me. To us. To the world. Yes. I've been very happy, very fortunate, very proud. Too fortunate. Too happy for a little while. And now I am unhappy for... For life. And of all this, of all his promise, and of all his greatness, of his generous mind, of his noble heart, nothing remains, nothing but a memory. You and I... We shall always remember it. No, it is impossible that all this should be lost. That such a life should be sacrificed to leave nothing but sorrow. Mademoiselle. You know what that plans he said. I knew of them too. I could not perhaps understand, but others know of him. Something must remain. His words at least have not died. His words will remain. And his example. Men looked up to him. His goodness shone in every act. His example... Uh, true, his example too, yes. His example, I forgot that. But I do not. I cannot... I cannot believe. Not yet I cannot believe that I shall never see him again. That nobody will ever see him again. Never, never, never. He died as he lived. His end was in every way worthy of his life. And I was not with him. Everything that could be done. Oh, but I believed in him more than anyone on earth. More than his own mother. More than... Himself. He needed me. Me. I would have treasured every sigh, every word, every sign, every glance. Don't. Forgive me, Captain Marlowe. I, I have mourned so long in silence. I know. You were with him to the last? Yes. I think of his loneliness. Nobody near to understand him as I would have understood. 
Perhaps no one succeeds. To the very end. I heard his very last words. Repeat them. I want... I want something. Something to... To live with. I was on the point of crying at her. Don't you hear them? The dusk was repeating them in a persistent whisper all around us. A whisper that seemed to swell menacingly like the first whisper of a rising wind. The horror. The horror. Captain Marlowe, please, his last word, to live with. Don't you understand? I loved him, I loved him, I loved him. The last word he pronounced was... Your name. had said he wanted only justice. But I couldn't. I could not tell her. It would have been too dark. Too dark altogether. Oh. 